This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chet Chris, London, UK. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 24 Of the Great Bespeak for Miss Snevellicci and the first appearance of Nicholas upon any stage. Nicholas was up betimes in the morning, but he had scarcely begun to dress notwithstanding, when he heard footsteps ascending the stairs, and was presently saluted by the voices of Mr. Folair, the pantomimist, and Mr. Lenville, the tragedian. "'House! house! house!' cried Mr. Folair. "'What ho within there!' said Mr. Lenville, in a deep voice. "'Confound these fellows,' thought Nicholas. "'They've come to breakfast, I suppose. "'I'll open the door directly, if you'll wait an instant.' The gentleman entreated him not to hurry himself, and, to beguile the interval, had a fencing bout with their walking-sticks on the very small landing-place, to the unspeakable discomposure of all the other lodgers downstairs. "'Here, come in,' said Nicholas, when he'd completed his toilet. "'In the name of all that's horrible, don't make that noise outside.' "'An uncommon snug little box, this,' said Mr. Lenville, stepping into the front room, and taking his hat off before he could get in at all. "'Pernicious snug! "'For a man at all particular in such matters, it might be a trifle too snug,' said Nicholas, "'for although it is undoubtedly a great convenience to be able to reach anything you want from the ceiling or the floor, or either side of the room, without having to move from your chair, still these advantages can only be had in an apartment of the most limited size. "'It isn't a bit too confined for a single man,' returned Mr. Lenville. "'Oh, that reminds me. My wife, Mr. Johnson, I hope she'll have some good part in this piece of yours.' "'I glanced at the French copy last night,' said Nicholas. "'It looks very good, I think.' "'What do you mean to do for me, old fellow?' asked Mr. Lenville, poking the struggling fire with his walking-stick, and afterwards wiping it on the skirt of his coat. "'Anything in the gruff-and-grumble way?' "'You turn your wife and child out of doors,' said Nicholas, "'and, in a fit of rage and jealousy, stab your eldest son in the library.' "'Do I, though?' exclaimed Mr. Lenville. "'That's very good business.' "'After which,' said Nicholas, "'you are troubled with remorse till the last act, "'and then you make up your mind to destroy yourself, "'but just as you're raising the pistol to your head, "'a clock strikes ten. "'I see,' said Mr. Lenville. "'Very good.' "'You pause,' said Nicholas. "'You recollect to have heard a clock strike ten in your infancy. "'The pistol falls from your hand. "'You are overcome.' "'you burst into tears, and become a virtuous and exemplary character for ever afterwards. "'Capital!' said Mr. Lenville. "'That's a sure card, a sure card. "'Get the curtain down with a touch of nature like that, and it'll be a triumphant success.' "'Is there anything good for me?' inquired Mr. Folair anxiously. "'Let me see,' said Nicholas. "'You play the faithful and attached servant.' "'You are turned out of doors with the wife and child. "'Always coupled with that infernal phenomenon,' sighed Mr. Folair. "'And we go into poor lodgings where I won't take any wages and talk sentiment, I suppose.' "'Why, yes,' replied Nicholas, "'that is the course of the piece.' "'I must have a dance of some kind, you know,' said Mr. Folair. "'You'll have to introduce one for the phenomenon, "'so you'd better make a pas de deux and save time.' "'There's nothing easier than that,' said Mr. Lenville, observing the disturbed looks of the young dramatist. "'Upon my word, I don't see how it's to be done,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Why, isn't it obvious?' reasoned Mr. Lenville. "'Gadzooks! Who can help seeing the way to do it? You astonish me. "'You get the distressed lady and the little child and the attached servant into the poor lodgings, don't you? "'Well, look here.' "'The distressed lady sinks into a chair "'and buries her face in her pocket-handkerchief. "'What makes you weep, mamma? says the child. "'Don't weep, mamma, or you'll make me weep, too. 
"'And me,' says the favourite servant, rubbing his eyes with his arm. "'What can we do to raise your spirits, dear mamma? says the little child. "'Aye, what can we do?' says the faithful servant. "'Oh, Pierre,' says the distressed lady, "'would that I could shake off these painful thoughts.' "'Try, ma'am, try,' says the faithful servant. "'Rouse yourself, ma'am. Be amused.' "'I will,' says the lady. "'I will learn to suffer with fortitude. "'Do you remember that dance, my honest friend, "'which in happier days you practised with this sweet angel? "'It never failed to calm my spirits then. "'Oh, let me see it once again before I die. "'There it is. Cue for the band. Before I die.' "'And off they go. That's the regular thing, isn't it, Tommy?' "'That's it,' replied Mr. Folair. "'The distressed lady, overpowered by old recollections, "'faints at the end of the dance, and you close in with a picture.' Profiting by these and other lessons, which were the result of the personal experience of the two actors, Nicholas willingly gave them the best breakfast he could, and, when he at length got rid of them, applied himself to his task— by no means displeased to find that it was so much easier than he had at first supposed. He worked very hard all day, and did not leave his room until the evening, when he went down to the theatre whither Smike had repaired before him, to go on with another gentleman as a general rebellion. Here all the people were so much changed that he scarcely knew them. False hair, false colour, false calves, false muscles, they had become different beings, Mr. Lenville was a blooming warrior of most exquisite proportions. Mr. Crummles, his large face shaded by a profusion of black hair, a highland outlaw of most majestic bearing. One of the old gentlemen a jailer, and the other a venerable patriarch. The comic countryman, a fighting man of great valour, relieved by a touch of humour. Each of the master Crummles as a prince in his own right, and the low-spirited lover a desponding captive. There was a gorgeous banquet ready spread for the third act, consisting of two pasteboard vases, one plate of biscuits, a black of bottle, and a vinegar cruet, and, in short, everything was on a scale of the utmost splendour and preparation. Nicholas was standing with his back to the curtain, now contemplating the first scene, which was a Gothic archway about two feet shorter than Mr. Crummles, through which that gentleman was to make his first entrance, and now listening to a couple of people who were cracking nuts in the gallery, wondering whether they made the whole audience, when the manager himself walked familiarly up and accosted him. "'Been in front to-night?' said Mr. Crummles. "'No,' replied Nicholas. "'Not yet. I'm going to see the play.' "'We've had a pretty good let,' said Mr. Crummles. Four front places in the centre, and the whole of the stage-box.' "'Oh, indeed,' said Nicholas. "'A family, I suppose?' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Crummles. "'Yes, it's an affecting thing. "'There are six children, and they never come unless the phenomenon plays.' "'It would have been difficult for any party, family or otherwise, "'to have visited the theatre on a night when the phenomenon did not play.' inasmuch as she always sustained one, and not uncommonly, two or three characters every night. But Nicholas, sympathising with the feelings of a father, refrained from hinting at this trifling circumstance, and Mr. Crummles continued to talk, uninterrupted by him. Six, said that gentleman. "'Pa and Ma eight, Aunt nine, Governess ten, Grandfather and Grandmother twelve. Then there's the footman, who stands outside with a bag of oranges and a jug of toast and water, and sees the play for nothing through the little pane of glass in the box door. It's cheap at a guinea. They gain by taking a box. "'I wonder you allow so many,' observed Nicholas. "'There's no help for it,' replied Mr. Crummles. "'It's always expected in the country. If there are six children, six people come to hold them in their laps.' A family box carries double always. Ring in the orchestra, Grudden. That useful lady did as she was requested, and shortly afterwards the tuning of three fiddles was heard. Which process having been protracted as long as it was supposed that the patience of the audience could possibly bear it, 
was put a stop to by another jerk of the bell, which, being the signal to begin in earnest, set the orchestra playing a variety of popular airs with involuntary variations. If Nicholas had been astonished at the alteration for the better which the gentlemen displayed, the transformation of the ladies was still more extraordinary. When, from a snug corner of the manager's box, he beheld Miss Snevellicci in all the glories of white muslin with a golden hem, and Mrs. Crummles in all the dignity of the outlaw's wife, and Miss Bravassa in all the sweetness of Miss Snevellicci's confidential friend, and Miss Belvorny in the white silks of a page doing duty everywhere and swearing to live and die in the service of everybody, he could scarcely contain his admiration, which testified itself in great applause, and the closest possible attention to the business of the scene. The plot was most interesting. It belonged to no particular age, people, or country, and was perhaps the more delightful on that account, as nobody's previous information could afford the remotest glimmering of what would ever come of it. An outlaw had been very successful in doing something somewhere, and came home in triumph to the sound of shouts and fiddles to greet his wife, a lady of masculine mind, who talked a good deal about her father's bones, which it seemed were unburied, though whether from a peculiar taste on the part of the old gentleman himself, or the reprehensible neglect of his relations, did not appear. This outlaw's wife was somehow or other mixed up with a patriarch, living in a castle a long way off, and this patriarch was the father of several of the characters, but he didn't exactly know which, and was uncertain whether he had brought up the right ones in his castle, or the wrong ones. He rather inclined to the latter opinion, and being uneasy, relieved his mind with a banquet, during which solemnity somebody in a cloak said, Beware, which somebody was known by nobody except the audience to the outlaw himself, who had come there for reasons unexplained, but possibly with an eye to the spoons. There was an agreeable little surprise in the way of certain love passages between the desponding captive and Miss Snevellicci, and the comic fighting man and Miss Bravassa, besides which Mr. Lenville had several very tragic scenes in the dark, while on throat-cutting expeditions, which were all baffled by the skill and bravery of the comic fighting man, who overheard whatever was said all through the piece, and the intrepidity of Miss Snevellicci, who adopted tights, and therein repaired to the prison of her captive lover, with a small basket of refreshments and a dark lantern. At last it came out that the patriarch was the man who had treated the bones of the outlaw's father-in-law with so much disrespect, for which cause and reason the outlaw's wife repaired to his castle to kill him, and so got into a dark room, where, after a good deal of groping in the dark, everybody got hold of everybody else, and took them for somebody besides, which occasioned a vast quantity of confusion, with some pistoling, loss of life, and torchlight. After which the patriarch came forward, and observing with a knowing look that he knew all about his children now, and would tell them when they got inside, said that there could not be a more appropriate occasion for marrying the young people than that. And therefore he joined their hands with the full consent of the indefatigable page, who, being the only other person surviving, pointed with his cap into the clouds, and his right hand to the ground, thereby invoking a blessing, and giving the cue for the curtain to come down, which it did amidst general applause. "'What did you think of that?' asked Mr. Crummles, when Nicholas went round to the stage again. Mr. Crummles was very red and hot, for your outlaws are desperate fellows to shout. "'I think it was very capital indeed,' replied Nicholas. "'Miss Snevellicci in particular was uncommonly good.' "'She's a genius,' said Mr. Crummles. "'Quite a genius, that girl. "'By the by, I've been thinking of bringing out that piece of yours on her bespeak night.' "'When?' asked Nicholas. "'The night of her bespeak, her benefit night, when her friends and patrons bespeak the play,' said Mr. Crummles. "'Oh, I understand,' replied Nicholas. "'You see,' said Mr. Crummles, "'it's sure to go on such an occasion, and even if it should not work up quite as well as we expect, why, it will be her risk, you know, and not ours.' "'Yours, you mean,' said Nicholas. "'I said mine, didn't I?' returned Mr. Crummles. 
and next Monday week, what do you say? You'll have done it, and are sure to be up in the lover's part long before that time. I don't know about long before, replied Nicholas, but by that time I think I can undertake to be ready. Very good, pursued Mr. Crummles. Then we'll call that settled. Now, I want to ask you something else. There's a little, what shall I call it, a little canvassing takes place on these occasions. Among the patrons, I suppose, said Nicholas. Among the patrons. And the fact is that Snevellicci has had so many bespeaks in this place that she wants an attraction. She had a bespeak when her mother-in-law died, and a bespeak when her uncle died, and Mrs. Crummles and myself have had bespeaks on the anniversary of the phenomenon's birthday, and our wedding day, and occasions of that description, so that, in fact, there's some difficulty in getting a good one. Now, won't you help this poor girl, Mr. Johnson, said Crummles, sitting himself down on a drum, and taking a great pinch of snuff as he looked him steadily in the face? How do you mean? rejoined Nicholas. Don't you think you could spare half an hour to-morrow morning to call with her at the houses of one or two of the principal people? murmured the manager in a persuasive tone. Oh, dear me, said Nicholas, with an air of very strong objection. I shouldn't like to do that. The infant will accompany her, said Mr. Crummles. The moment it was suggested to me, I gave permission for the infant to go. There will not be the smallest impropriety. Uh, Miss Snevellicci, sir, is the very soul of honour. It would be of material service. The gentleman from London, author of the new piece, actor in the new piece, uh, first appearance on any boards. It would lead to a great bespeak, Mr. Johnson. I am very sorry to throw a damp upon the prospects of anybody, and more especially a lady, replied Nicholas, but really I must decidedly object to making one of the canvassing party. "'What does Mr. Johnson say, Vincent?' inquired a voice close to his ear, and looking round he found Mrs. Crummles and Miss Snevellicci herself standing behind him. "'He has some objection, my dear,' replied Mr. Crummles, looking at Nicholas. "'Objection!' exclaimed Mrs. Crummles. "'Can it be possible?' "'Oh, I hope not,' cried Miss Snevellicci. "'You surely are not so cruel.' "'Oh, dear me! Well, I, to think of that now, after all, one's looking forward to it.' "'Mr. Johnson will not persist, my dear,' said Mrs. Crummles. "'Think better of him than to suppose it. "'Gallantry, humanity, all the best feelings of his nature "'must be enlisted in this interesting cause, "'which moves even a manager.' said Mr. Crummles, smiling. "'And a manager's wife,' added Mrs. Crummles, in her accustomed tragedy tones. "'Come, come, you will relent. I know you will.' "'It is not in my nature,' said Nicholas, moved by these appeals, "'to resist any entreaty, unless it is to do something positively wrong. And beyond a feeling of pride, I know nothing which should prevent my doing this.' I know nobody here, and nobody knows me. So be it, then. I yield. Miss Snevellicci was at once overwhelmed with blushes and expressions of gratitude, of which latter commodity neither Mr. nor Mrs. Crummles was by any means sparing. It was arranged that Nicholas should call upon her at her lodgings at eleven next morning, and soon after they parted, he, to return home to his authorship, Miss Snevellicci to dress for the afterpiece, and the disinterested manager and his wife to discuss the probable gains of the forthcoming bespeak, of which they were to have two-thirds of the profits by solemn treaty of agreement. At the stipulated hour next morning, Nicholas repaired to the lodgings of Miss Snevellicci, which were in a place called Lombard Street, at the house of a tailor. A strong smell of ironing pervaded the little passage, and the tailor's daughter, who opened the door, appeared in that flutter of spirits which is so often attendant upon the periodical getting up of a family's linen. "'Miss Snevellicci lives here, I believe,' said Nicholas, when the door was opened. The tailor's daughter replied in the affirmative. Uh, "'Will you have the goodness to let her know that Mr. Johnson is here?' said Nicholas. 
"'Oh, if you please, you're to come upstairs,' replied the tailor's daughter with a smile. Nicholas followed the young lady and was shown into a small apartment on the first floor, communicating with a back room, in which, as he judged from a certain half-subdued clinking sound as of cups and saucers, Miss Snevellicci was then taking her breakfast in bed. "'You're to wait, if you please,' said the tailor's daughter, after a short period of absence, during which the clinking in the back room had ceased, and been succeeded by whispering, "'She won't be long.' As she spoke, she pulled up the window-blind, and, having by this means, as she thought, diverted Mr. Johnson's attention from the room to the street, caught up some articles which were airing on the fender, and had very much the appearance of stockings, and darted off. As there were not many objects of interest outside the window, Nicholas looked about the room with more curiosity than he might otherwise have bestowed upon it. On the sofa lay an old guitar, several thumbed pieces of music, and a scattered litter of curl-papers, together with a confused heap of playbills, and a pair of soiled white satin shoes with large blue rosettes. Hanging over the back of a chair was a half-finished muslin apron, with little pockets ornamented with red ribbons, such as waiting women wear on the stage, and, by consequence, are never seen with anywhere else. In one corner stood the diminutive pair of top-boots in which Miss Snevellicci was accustomed to enact the little jockey, and folded on a chair hard by was a small parcel, which bore a very suspicious resemblance to the companion smalls. But the most interesting object of all was perhaps the open scrapbook, displayed in the midst of some theatrical duodecimos that were strewn upon the table and pasted into which scrapbook were various critical notices of Miss Snevellicci's acting, extracted from different provincial journals, together with one poetic address in her honour, commencing, Sing, God of Love, and tell me in what dearth thrice-gifted Snevellicci came on earth, to thrill us with her smile, her tear, her eye. Sing, God of Love, and tell me quickly why. Besides this effusion, there were innumerable complimentary allusions, also extracted from newspapers, such as, We observe from an advertisement in another part of our paper of today, that the charming and highly talented Miss Snevellicci takes her benefit on Wednesday, for which occasion she has put forth a bill of fare that might kindle exhilaration in the breast of a misanthrope. In the confidence that our fellow townsmen have not lost that high appreciation of public utility and private worth for which they have long been so pre-eminently distinguished, we predict that this charming actress will be greeted with a bumper. To Correspondence J. S. is misinformed when he supposes that the highly gifted and beautiful Miss Snevellicci, nightly captivating all hearts at our pretty and commodious little theatre, is not the same lady to whom the young gentleman of immense fortune, residing within a hundred miles of the good city of York, lately made honourable proposals. We have reason to know that Miss Snevellicci is the lady who was implicated in that mysterious and romantic affair, and whose conduct on that occasion did no less honour to her head and heart than do her histrionic triumphs to her brilliant genius." A copious assortment of such paragraphs as these, with long bills of benefits all ending with come early in large capitals, formed the principal contents of Miss Snevellicci's scrapbook. Nicholas had read a great many of these scraps, and was absorbed in a circumstantial and melancholy account of the train of events which had led to Miss Snevellicci's spraining her ankle by slipping on a piece of orange peel flung by a monster in human form, so the paper said, upon the stage at Winchester, when that young lady herself, attired in the coal-scuttle bonnet and walking-dress complete, tripped into the room with a thousand apologies for having detained him so long after the appointed time. "'But really,' said Miss Snevellicci, "'my darling Led, who lives with me here, was taken so very ill in the night that I thought she would have expired in my arms.' "'Such a fate is almost to be envied.' returned Nicholas, but I am very sorry to hear it, nevertheless. What a creature you are to flatter! 
said Miss Snevellicci, buttoning her glove in much confusion. "'If it be flattery to admire your charms and accomplishments,' rejoined Nicholas, laying his hand upon the scrapbook, "'you have better specimens of it here.' "'Oh, you cruel creature, to read such things as those! "'I am almost ashamed to look you in the face afterwards. "'Positively I am,' said Miss Snevellicci, "'seizing the book and putting it away in a closet. "'How careless of lead! "'How could she be so naughty?' "'I thought you had kindly left it here on purpose for me to read,' said Nicholas. "'And really it did seem possible. "'I wouldn't have had you see it for the world,' rejoined Miss Snevellicci. "'I never was so vexed, never. "'But she is a, such a careless thing, there's no trusting her.' "'The conversation was here interrupted by the entrance of the phenomenon, "'who had discreetly remained in the bedroom up to this moment, "'and now presented herself with much grace and lightness, "'bearing in her hand a very little green parasol "'with a broad fringe border and no handle. "'After a few words, of course, they sallied into the street.' The phenomenon was rather a troublesome companion, for first the right sandal came down, and then the left, and these mischances being repaired, one leg of the little white trousers was discovered to be longer than the other. Besides these accidents, the green parasol was dropped down an iron grating, and only fished up again with great difficulty and by dint of much exertion. However, it was impossible to scold her, as she was the manager's daughter, so Nicholas took it all in perfect good humour, and walked on with Miss Snevellicci arm in arm on one side, and the offending infant on the other. The first house to which they bent their steps was situated in a terrace of respectable appearance. Miss Snevellicci's modest double knock was answered by a footboy, who, in reply to her inquiry whether Mrs. Curdle was at home, opened his eyes very wide, grinned very much, and said he didn't know, but he'd inquire. With this he showed them into a parlour, where he kept them waiting, until the two women servants had repaired thither under false pretences to see the play-actors, and having compared notes with them in the passage, and joined in a vast quantity of whispering and giggling, he at length went upstairs with Miss Snevellicci's name. Now, Mrs. Curdle was supposed, by those who were best informed on such points, to possess quite the London taste in matters relating to literature and the drama. And as to Mr. Curdle, he had written a pamphlet of sixty-four pages, post-octavo, on the character of the nurse's deceased husband in Romeo and Juliet, with an inquiry whether he really had been a merry man in his lifetime, or whether it was merely his widow's affectionate partiality that induced her so to report him. He had likewise proved that by altering the received mode of punctuation, any one of Shakespeare's plays could be made quite different, and the sense completely changed. It is needless to say, therefore, that he was a great critic, and a very profound and most original thinker. "'Well, Miss Snevellicci,' said Mrs. Curdle, entering the parlour, "'and how do you do?' Miss Snevellicci made a graceful obeisance, and hoped Mrs. Curdle was well as also Mr. Curdle, who at the same time appeared. Mrs. Curdle was dressed in a morning wrapper, with a little cap stuck upon the top of her head. Mr. Curdle wore a loose robe on his back, and his right forefinger on his forehead, after the portraits of Stern, to whom somebody or other had once said he bore a striking resemblance. "'I venture to call for the purpose of asking whether you would put your name to my bespeak, ma'am.' "'said Miss Snevellicci, producing documents. "'Oh, I really don't know what to say,' replied Mrs. Curdle. "'It's not as if the theatre was in its high and palmy days. Uh, "'You needn't stand, Miss Snevellicci. "'The drama is gone, perfectly gone. "'As an exquisite embodiment of the poet's visions "'and a realisation of human intellectuality, "'gilding with refulgent light our dreamy moments,' and laying open a new and magic world before the mental eye, the drama is gone, perfectly gone, said Mr. Curdle. What man is there now living, who can present before us all those changing and prismatic colours with which the character of Hamlet is invested? exclaimed Mrs. Curdle. What man indeed, upon the stage, said Mr. Curdle, 
with a small reservation in favour of himself. A Hamlet! Pooh! Ridiculous! Hamlet is gone! Perfectly gone! Quite overcome by these dismal reflections, Mr. and Mrs. Curdle sighed, and sat for some short time without speaking. At length the lady, turning to Miss Snevellicci, inquired what play she proposed to have. "'Quite a new one,' said Miss Snevellicci, "'of which this gentleman is the author, and in which he plays, being his first appearance on any stage. Mr. Johnson is the gentleman's name.' "'I hope you have preserved the unities, sir,' said Mr. Curdle. "'The original piece is a French one,' said Nicholas. "'There is abundance of incident, sprightly dialogue, strongly marked characters, "'all unavailing without a strict observance of the unities, sir,' returned Mr. Curdle. "'The unities of the drama before everything.' "'Might I ask you,' said Nicholas, hesitating between the respect he ought to assume, and his love of the whimsical. Might I ask you what the unities are? Mr. Curdle coughed and considered. The unities, sir, he said, are a completeness, a kind of universal dovetailedness with regard to place and time, a sort of general oneness, if I may be allowed to use so strong an expression. I take those to be the dramatic unities, so far as I have been enabled to bestow attention upon them, and I have read much upon the subject, and thought much. I find, running through the performances of this child, said Mr. Curdle, turning to the phenomenon, a unity of feeling, a breadth, a light and shade, a warmth of colouring, a tone, a harmony, a glow, an artistical development of original conceptions, which I look for in vain among older performers. I don't know whether I make myself understood. Perfectly, replied Nicholas. Just so, said Mr. Curdle, pulling up his neckcloth. That is my definition of the unities of the drama. Mrs. Curdle had sat listening to this lucid explanation with great complacency. It being finished, she inquired what Mr. Curdle thought about putting down their names. "'I don't know, my dear. Upon my word, I don't know,' said Mr. Curdle. "'If we do, it must be distinctly understood that we do not pledge ourselves to the quality of the performances. Let it go forth to the world that we do not give them the sanction of our names, but that we confer the distinction merely upon Miss Snevellicci. That being clearly stated, I take it to be, as it were, a duty that we should extend our patronage to a degraded stage, even for the sake of the associations with which it is entwined. "'Have you got two and sixpence for half a crown, Miss Snevellicci?' said Mr. Curdle, turning over four of those pieces of money. Miss Snevellicci felt in all the corners of the pink reticule, but there was nothing in any of them. Nicholas murmured a jest about his being an author, and thought it best not to go through the form of feeling in his own pockets at all. "'Let me see,' said Mr. Curdle. Uh, "'Twice four's eight, uh, four shillings apiece to the boxes, Miss Snevellicci, is exceedingly dear in the present state of the drama. Uh, three half-crowns is seven and six. We shall not differ about sixpence, I suppose. Sixpence will not part us, Miss Snevellicci.' Poor Miss Snevellicci took the three half-crowns, with many smiles and bends, and Mrs. Curdle, adding several supplementary directions relative to keeping the places for them, and dusting the seat, and sending two clean bills as soon as they came out, rang the bell as a signal for breaking up the conference. "'Odd people, those,' said Nicholas, when they got clear of the house. "'I assure you,' said Miss Snevellicci, taking his arm, "'that I think myself very lucky they did not owe all the money, instead of being sixpence short. Now, if you were to succeed, they would give people to understand that they had always patronised you, and if you were to fail, they would have been quite certain of that from the very beginning. At the next house they visited they were in great glory, for there resided the six children who were so enraptured with the public actions of the phenomenon, and who, being called down from the nursery to be treated with a private view of that young lady, proceeded to poke their fingers into her eyes and tread upon her toes, 
and show her many other little attentions peculiar to their time of life. "'I shall certainly persuade Mr. Borham to take a private box,' said the lady of the house, after a most gracious reception. "'I shall only take two of the children, and will make up the rest of the party of gentlemen, your admirers, Miss Snevellicci. "'Augustus, you naughty boy, leave the little girl alone.' This was addressed to a young gentleman, who was pinching the phenomenon behind, apparently with a view of ascertaining whether she was real. "'I am sure you must be very tired,' said the mamma, turning to Miss Snevellicci. "'I cannot think of allowing you to go without first taking a glass of wine. "'Fie, Charlotte, I am ashamed of you. "'Miss Lane, my dear, pray see to the children.' Miss Lane was the governess and this entreaty was rendered necessary by the abrupt behaviour of the youngest Miss Borham, who, having filched the phenomenon's little green parasol, was now carrying it bodily off, while the distracted infant looked helplessly on. "'I am sure where you ever learnt to act as you do,' said good-natured Mrs. Borham, turning again to Miss Snevellicci, "'I cannot understand Emma, don't stare so, laughing in one piece, and crying in the next, and—' "'and so natural in all. Oh, dear! "'I am very happy to hear you express so favourable an opinion,' said Miss Snevellicci. "'It's quite delightful to think you like it.' "'Like it!' cried Mrs. Borham. "'Who can help liking it? "'I would go to the play twice a week, if I could. "'I dote upon it. "'Only you're too affecting sometimes. "'You do put me in such a state, into such fits of crying.' "'Goodness gracious me, Miss Lane, how can you let them torment that poor child so?' The phenomenon was really in a fair way of being torn limb from limb, for two strong little boys, one holding on by each of her hands, were dragging her in different directions as a trial of strength. However, Miss Lane, who had herself been too much occupied in contemplating the grown-up actors to pay the necessary attention to these proceedings, rescued the unhappy infant at this juncture who, being recruited with a glass of wine, were shortly afterwards taken away by her friends, after sustaining no more serious damage than a flattening of the pink gauze bonnet, and a rather extensive creasing of the white frock and trousers. It was a trying morning, for there were a great many calls to make, and everybody wanted a different thing. Some wanted tragedies, and others comedies. Some objected to dancing, some wanted scarcely anything else. Some thought the comic singer decidedly low, and others hoped he would have more to do than he usually had. Some people wouldn't promise to go because other people wouldn't promise to go, and other people wouldn't go at all because other people went. At length, and by little and little, omitting something in this place and adding something in that, Miss Snevellicci pledged herself to a bill of fare which was comprehensive enough if it had no other merit. It included, among other trifles, four pieces, divers songs, a few combats, and several dancers, and they returned home pretty well exhausted with the business of the day. Nicholas worked away at the piece, which was speedily put into rehearsal, and then worked away at his own part, which he studied with great perseverance, and acted, as the whole company said, to perfection. And at length the great day arrived. The crier was sent round in the morning to proclaim the entertainments with the sound of bell in all the thoroughfares, and extra bills of three feet long by nine inches wide were dispersed in all directions, flung down all the areas, thrust under all the knockers, and developed in all the shops. They were placarded on the walls, too, though not with complete success, for an illiterate person having undertaken this office during the indisposition of the regular bill-sticker, a part were posted sideways and the remainder upside down. At half-past five there was a rush of four people to the gallery door. At a quarter before six there were at least a dozen. At six o'clock the kicks were terrific, and when the elder Master Crummles opened the door he was obliged to run behind it for his life. Fifteen shillings were taken by Mrs. Grudden in the first ten minutes. Behind the scenes, the same unwanted excitement prevailed. Miss Snevellicci was in such a perspiration that the paint would scarcely stay on her face. 
Mrs. Crummles was so nervous that she could hardly remember her part. Miss Bravassa's ringlets came out of curl with the heat and anxiety, and even Mr. Crummles himself kept peeping through the hole in the curtain, and running back every now and then to announce that another man had come into the pit. At last the orchestra left off, and the curtain rose upon the new piece. The first scene, in which there was nobody particular, passed off calmly enough, but when Miss Snevelicci went on in the second, accompanied by the phenomenon as child, what a roar of applause broke out! The people in the Borum box rose as one man, waving their hats and handkerchiefs, and uttering shouts of, Bravo! Mrs. Borum and the governess cast wreaths upon the stage, of which some fluttered into the lamps, and one crowned the temples of a fat gentleman in the pit, who, looking eagerly toward the scene, remained unconscious of the honour. The tailor and his family kicked at the panels of the upper boxes till they threatened to come out altogether. The very ginger-beer boy remained transfixed in the centre of the house. A young officer, supposed to entertain a passion for Miss Snevelicci, stuck his glass in his eye as though to hide a tear. Again and again Miss Snevelicci curtsied lower and lower, and again and again the applause came down louder and louder. At length, when the phenomenon picked up one of the smoking wreaths and put it on sideways over Miss Snevelicci's eye, it reached its climax, and the play proceeded. But when Nicholas came on for his crack scene with Mrs. Crummles, what a clapping of hands there was! When Mrs. Crummles, who was his unworthy mother, sneered and called him presumptuous boy, and he defied her, what a tumult of applause came on! When he quarrelled with the other gentleman about the young lady, and producing a case of pistols said that if he was a gentleman, he would fight him in that drawing-room until the furniture was sprinkled with the blood of one if not of two, how boxers, pit and gallery joined in one most vigorous cheer! When he called his mother names, because she wouldn't give up the young lady's property, and she, relenting, caused him to relent likewise, and fall down on one knee and ask her blessing, how the ladies in the audience sobbed! When he was hid behind the curtain in the dark, and the wicked relation poked a sharp sword in every direction save where his legs were plainly visible, what a thrill of anxious fear ran through the house! His air, his figure, his walk, his look, everything he said or did, was the subject of commendation. There was a round of applause every time he spoke, and when, at last, in the pump-and-tub scene, Mrs. Grudden lighted the blue fire, and all the unemployed members of the company came in and tumbled down in various directions, not because that had anything to do with the plot, but in order to finish off with a tableau, the audience, who had by this time increased considerably, gave vent to such a shout of enthusiasm as had not been heard in those walls for many and many a day. In short, the success both of new piece and new actor was complete, and when Miss Snevelicci was called for at the end of the play, Nicholas led her on, and divided the applause. End of chapter 24「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chet Chris, London, UK. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 25. Concerning a young lady from London who joins the company, and an elderly admirer who follows in her train, with an affecting ceremony consequent on their arrival. The new piece, being a decided hit, was announced for every evening of performance until further notice, and the evenings when the theatre was closed were reduced from three in the week to two. Nor were these the only tokens of extraordinary success, for on the succeeding Saturday Nicholas received, by favour of the indefatigable Mrs. Grudden, no less a sum than thirty shillings. 
besides which substantial reward, he enjoyed considerable fame and honour, having a presentation copy of Mr. Curdle's pamphlet forwarded to the theatre, with that gentleman's own autograph, in itself an inestimable treasure, on the fly-leaf, accompanied with a note containing many expressions of approval, and an unsolicited assurance that Mr. Curdle would be very happy to read Shakespeare to him for three hours every morning before breakfast, during his stay in the town. "'I've got another novelty, Johnson,' said Mr. Crummles one morning in great glee. "'What's that?' rejoined Nicholas. "'The pony?' "'No, no, we never come to the pony till everything else has failed,' said Mr. Crummles. "'I don't think we shall come to the pony at all this season.' "'No, no, not the pony.' "'A boy phenomenon, perhaps,' suggested Nicholas. "'There is only one phenomenon, sir,' replied Mr. Crummles impressively, "'and that's a girl.' "'Very true,' said Nicholas. "'I beg your pardon. "'Then I don't know what it is, I am sure.' "'What should you say to a young lady from London?' inquired Mr. Crummles. "'Miss So-and-so of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane?' "'I should say she would look very well in the bills,' said Nicholas. "'You're about right there,' said Mr. Crummles. "'And if you had said she would look very well upon the stage, too, "'you wouldn't have been far out. "'Look here. What do you think of this?' "'With this inquiry Mr. Crummles unfolded a red poster, "'and a blue poster, and a yellow poster.' at the top of each of which public notification was inscribed in enormous characters first appearance of the unrivalled miss patauker of the theatre royal drury lane dear me said nicholas i know that lady then you are acquainted with as much talent as was ever compressed into one young person's body retorted mr crummles rolling up the bills again that is talent of a certain sort of a certain sort "'The blood-drinker,' added Mr. Crummles, with a prophetic sigh. "'The blood-drinker will die with that girl. "'And she's the only sylph I ever saw "'who could stand upon one leg "'and play the tambourine on her other knee, like a sylph.' "'When does she come down?' asked Nicholas. "'We expect her to-day,' replied Mr. Crummles. "'She's an old friend of Mrs. Crummles. "'Mrs. Crummles saw what she could do.' "'Always knew it from the first. "'She taught her, indeed, nearly all she knows. "'Mrs. Crummles was the original blood-drinker.' "'Was she, indeed?' "'Yes. "'She was obliged to give it up, though. Uh, "'Did it disagree with her?' asked Nicholas. "'Not so much with her as with her audiences,' replied Mr. Crummles. "'Nobody could stand it. "'It was too tremendous.' "'You don't quite know what Mrs. Crummles is yet?' "'Nicholas ventured to insinuate that he thought he did. "'No, no, you don't,' said Mr. Crummles. "'You don't indeed. "'I don't, and that's a fact. "'I don't think her country will till she's dead. "'Some new proof of talent bursts from that astonishing woman "'every year of her life. "'Look at her, mother of six children, three of them alive, "'and all upon the stage.' extraordinary cried nicholas ah extraordinary indeed rejoined mr crummles taking a complacent piece of snuff and shaking his head gravely i pledge you my professional word i didn't even know she could dance till her last benefit and then she played juliet and helen mcgregor and did the skipping rope hornpipe between the pieces the very first time i saw that admirable woman johnson said Mr. Crummles, drawing a little nearer, and speaking in the tone of confidential friendship. She stood upon her head on the butt-end of a spear, surrounded with blazing fireworks. "'You astonish me,' said Nicholas. "'She astonished me,' returned Mr. Crummles, with a very serious countenance. "'Such grace, coupled with such dignity. I adored her from that moment.' The arrival of the gifted subject of these remarks put an abrupt termination to Mr. Crummles's eulogium. Almost immediately afterwards, Master Percy Crummles entered with a letter, which had arrived by the general post, and was directed to his gracious mother. 
at sight of the superscription whereof Mrs. Crummles exclaimed, "'From Henrietta Patauker, I do declare!' and instantly became absorbed in the contents. "'Is it?' inquired Mr. Crummles, hesitating. "'Oh, yes, it's all right,' replied Mrs. Crummles, anticipating the question. "'What an excellent thing for her, to be sure!' "'It's the best thing altogether that I ever heard of, I think,' said Mr. Crummles. And then Mr. Crummles, Mrs. Crummles, and Master Percy Crummles all fell to laughing violently. Nicholas left them to enjoy their mirth together, and walked to his lodgings, wondering very much what mystery connected with Miss Patauker could provoke such merriment, and pondering still more on the extreme surprise with which that lady would regard his sudden enlistment in a profession of which she was such a distinguished and brilliant ornament. But, in this latter respect, he was mistaken, for, whether Mr. Vincent Crummles had paved the way, or Miss Patauka had some special reason for treating him with even more than her usual amiability, their meeting at the theatre next day was more like that of two dear friends who had been inseparable from infancy, than a recognition passing between a lady and gentleman who had only met some half a dozen times, and then by mere chance. Nay, Miss Patauka even whispered that she had wholly dropped the Kenwigses in her conversations with the manager's family, and had represented herself as having encountered Mr. Johnson in the very first and most fashionable circles. And on Nicholas receiving this intelligence with unfeigned surprise, she added with a sweet glance, that she had a claim on his good nature now, and might tax it before long. Nicholas had the honour of playing in a slight piece with Miss Patauka that night, and could not but observe that the warmth of her reception was mainly attributable to a most persevering umbrella in the upper boxes. He saw, too, that the enchanting actress cast many sweet looks towards the quarter whence these sounds proceeded, and that every time she did so, the umbrella broke out afresh. Once he thought that a peculiarly shaped hat in the same corner was not wholly unknown to him. But, being occupied with his share of the stage business, he bestowed no great attention upon this circumstance, and it had quite vanished from his memory by the time he reached home. He had just sat down to supper with Smike, when one of the people of the house came outside the door, and announced that a gentleman below stairs wished to speak to Mr. Johnson. "'Well, if he does, you must tell him to come up. That's all I know,' replied Nicholas. "'One of our hungry brethren, I suppose, Smike.' His fellow-lodger looked at the cold meat in silent calculation of the quantity that would be left for dinner next day, and put back a slice he had cut for himself, in order that the visitors' encroachments might be less formidable in their effects. "'It's not anybody who's been here before,' said Nicholas, "'for he is tumbling up every stair. "'Come in, come in. "'In the name of wonder, Mr. Lillivick!' "'It was, indeed, the collector of water-rates, "'who, regarding Nicholas with a fixed look and immovable countenance, "'shook hands with most portentous solemnity, "'and sat himself down in a seat by the chimney-corner. "'Why, when did you come here?' asked Nicholas. "'This morning, sir,' replied Mr. Lillivick. "'Oh, I see. Then you were at the theatre to-night, and it was your um, this umbrella,' said Mr. Lillivick, producing a fat green cotton one with a battered ferrule. "'What did you think of that performance?' Uh, "'So far as I could judge, being on the stage,' replied Nicholas, "'I thought it very agreeable.' "'Agreeable?' cried the collector. I mean to say, sir, that it was delicious. Mr. Lillivick bent forward to pronounce the last word with greater emphasis, and having done so, drew himself up and frowned and nodded a great many times. I say delicious, repeated Mr. Lillivick. Absorbing, fairy-like, tumultuous. And again Mr. Lillivick drew himself up, and again he frowned and nodded. "'Ah,' said Nicholas, a little surprised at these symptoms of ecstatic approbation. "'Yes, she is a clever girl.' "'She is a divinity,' returned Mr. Lillivick, giving a collector's double knock on the ground with the umbrella before mentioned. "'I have known divine actresses before now, sir. 
I used to collect, at least I used to call for, and very often call for, the water rate of the house of a divine actress who lived in my beat for upwards of four year, but never, no, never, sir, of all divine creatures, actresses or no actresses, did I see a diviner one than is Henrietta Patauka. Nicholas had much ado to prevent himself from laughing. Not trusting himself to speak, he merely nodded in accordance with Mr. Lillivick's nods, and remained silent. "'Let me speak a word with you in private,' said Mr. Lillivick. Nicholas looked good-humouredly at Smike, who, taking the hint, disappeared. "'A bachelor is a miserable wretch, sir,' said Mr. Lillivick. "'Is he?' asked Nicholas. "'He is,' rejoined the collector. "'I have lived in the world for nigh sixty years, and I ought to know what it is.' "'You ought to know, certainly,' thought Nicholas, "'but whether you do or not is another question. "'If a bachelor happens to have saved a little matter of money,' said Mr. Lillivick, "'his sisters and brothers and nephews and nieces looked to that money, and not to him. "'Even if, by being a public character, he is the head of the family, "'or, as it may be, the main from which all the other little branches are turned on, they still wish him dead all the while, and get low-spirited every time they see him looking in good health, because they want to come into his little property. You see that? Oh, yes, replied Nicholas, it's very true, no doubt. The great reason for not being married, resumed Mr. Lillivick, is the expense. That's what's kept me off. Or else, Lord, said Mr. Lillivick, snapping his fingers, I might have had fifty women. Fine women? asked Nicholas. "'Fine women, sir,' replied the collector. "'Aye, not so fine as Henrietta Patauka, for she is an uncommon specimen. But such women as don't fall into every man's way, I can tell you. Now suppose a man can get a fortune in a wife instead of with her, eh?' "'Why, then he's a lucky fellow,' replied Nicholas. "'That's what I say.' "'retorted the collector, patting him benignantly on the side of the head with his umbrella. "'Just what I say. "'Henrietta Patauka, the talented Henrietta Patauka, has a fortune in herself, "'and I am going to—' "'To make her Mrs. Lillivick?' suggested Nicholas. "'No, sir, uh, not to make her Mrs. Lillivick,' replied the collector. "'Actresses, sir, always keep their maiden names. That's the regular thing.' But I'm going to marry her, and the day after tomorrow, too. I congratulate you, sir, said Nicholas. Thank you, sir, replied the collector, buttoning his waistcoat. I shall draw her salary, of course, and I hope, after all, that it's nearly as cheap to keep two as it is to keep one. That's a consolation. Surely you don't want any consolation at such a moment, observed Nicholas. Uh, no, replied Mr. Lillivick, shaking his head nervously. "'No, of course not. "'But how come you both here, if you're going to be married, Mr. Lillivick?' asked Nicholas. "'Why, that's what I came to explain to you,' replied the collector of water rate. "'The fact is, we have thought it best to keep it secret from the family.' "'Family?' said Nicholas. "'What family?' "'The Kenwigses, of course,' rejoined Mr. Lillivick. "'If my niece and the children had known a word about it before I came away, "'they'd have gone into fits at my feet.' "'and never have come out of them till I took an oath not to marry anybody. "'Or they'd have got out a commission of lunacy or some dreadful thing,' said the collector, "'quite trembling as he spoke. "'To be sure,' said Nicholas, "'yes, they would have been jealous, no doubt. "'To prevent which,' said Mr. Lillivick, "'Henrietta Patauka, it was settled between us, "'should come down here to her friends, the Crummelses, "'under pretence of this engagement,' "'and I should go down to Guildford the day before, "'and join her on the coach there, which I did, "'and we came down from Guildford yesterday together. "'Now, for fear you should be writing to Mr. Noggs "'and might say anything about us, "'we have thought it best to let you into the secret. "'We shall be married from the Crummelses' lodgings, "'and shall be delighted to see you, "'either before church or at breakfast-time, which you like. "'It uh, won't be expensive, you know,' said the collector.' "'highly anxious to prevent any misunderstanding on this point. "'Just muffins and coffee, "'with perhaps a shrimp or something of that sort for a relish, you know. 
"'Yes, yes, I understand,' replied Nicholas. "'Oh, I shall be most happy to come. "'It will give me the greatest pleasure. "'Where's the lady stopping, with Mrs. Crummles?' Uh, "'Why, no,' said the collector. "'They couldn't very well dispose of her at night, "'and so she is staying with an acquaintance of hers and another young lady. "'They both belong to the theatre. "'Miss Snevellicci, I suppose,' said Nicholas. "'Yes, that's the name. "'And they'll be bridesmaids, I presume?' said Nicholas. "'Why,' said the collector, with a rueful face, "'they will have four bridesmaids. "'I'm afraid they'll make it rather theatrical.' "'Oh, no, not at all,' replied Nicholas, with an awkward attempt to convert a laugh into a cough. "'Who may the four be? Miss Snevellicci, of course, Miss Ledrook, the—the uh, the phenomenon,' groaned the collector. "'Ha, ha!' cried Nicholas. "'I beg your pardon. I don't know what I'm laughing at. Uh, "'Yes, that'll be very pretty. Uh, the phenomenon. Who else?' "'Some young woman or other.' "'replied the collector, rising. "'Some other friend of Henrietta Patauka's. "'Well, you'll be careful not to say anything about it, will you?' "'You may safely depend upon me,' replied Nicholas. "'Won't you take anything to eat or drink?' "'No,' said the collector. "'I haven't any appetite.' "'I should think it was a very pleasant life, the married one, eh?' "'I have not the least doubt of it,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Yes,' said the collector. "'Certainly. Oh, yes. No doubt. Good night.' With these words, Mr. Lillivick, whose manner had exhibited through the whole of this interview a most extraordinary compound of precipitation, hesitation, confidence and doubt, fondness, misgiving, meanness and self-importance, turned his back upon the room and left Nicholas to enjoy a laugh by himself if he felt so disposed. Without stopping to inquire whether the intervening day appeared to Nicholas to consist of the usual number of hours of the ordinary length, it may be remarked that to the parties more directly interested in the forthcoming ceremony, it passed with great rapidity, insomuch that when Miss Patauka awoke on the succeeding morning, in the chamber of Miss Snevellicci, she declared that nothing should ever persuade her that that really was the day which was to behold a change in her condition. "'I never will believe it,' said Miss Patauka. "'I cannot, really. "'It's of no use talking. "'I never can make up my mind to go through with such a trial.' "'On hearing this, Miss Snevellicci and Miss Ledrook, "'who knew perfectly well that their fair friend's mind "'had been made up for three or four years, "'at any period of which time she would have cheerfully "'undergone the desperate trial now approaching "'if she could have found any eligible gentleman "'disposed for the venture, "'began to preach comfort and firmness,' and to say how very proud she ought to feel that it was in her power to confer lasting bliss on a deserving object, and how necessary it was for the happiness of mankind in general that women should possess fortitude and resignation on such occasions, and that although for their parts they held true happiness to consist in a single life, which they would not willingly exchange, no, not for any worldly consideration, still, thank God, if ever the time should come, they hoped they knew their duty too well to repine, but would the rather submit with meekness and humility of spirit to a fate for which Providence had clearly designed them with a view to the contentment and reward of their fellow creatures. "'I might feel it was a great blow,' said Miss Snevellicci, "'to break up old associations and what do you call ems of that kind. "'But I would submit, my dear. I would indeed.' "'So would I,' said Miss Ledrook. "'I would rather court the yoke than shun it. "'I have broken hearts before now, and I am very sorry for it, "'for it's a terrible thing to reflect upon.' "'It is indeed,' said Miss Nevelicci. "'Now, Led, my dear, we must positively get her ready, "'or we shall be too late, we shall indeed.' "'This pious reasoning, and perhaps the fear of being too late, "'supported the bride through the ceremony of robing, after which strong tea and brandy were administered in alternate doses as a means of strengthening her feeble limbs and causing her to walk steadier. "'How do you feel now, my love?' inquired Miss Snevellicci. "'Oh, Lillivick!' cried the bride. "'If you knew what I am undergoing for you!' "'Of course he knows it, love, and will never forget it,' said Miss Ledrook. "'Do you think he won't?' cried Miss Patauka, really showing great capability for the stage. "'Oh, do you think he won't? 
Do you think Lilivick will always remember it? Always, always, always? There is no knowing in what this burst of feelings might have ended, if Miss Snevellicci had not at that moment proclaimed the arrival of the fly, which so astounded the bride that she shook off divers alarming symptoms which were coming on very strong, and running to the glass adjusted her dress, and calmly declared that she was ready for the sacrifice. She was accordingly supported into the coach, and there kept up, as Miss Snevellicci said, with perpetual sniffs of sal volatile, and sips of brandy, and other gentle stimulants, until they reached the manager's door, which was already opened by the two master crummelses, who wore white cockades, and were decorated with the choicest and most resplendent waistcoats in the theatrical wardrobe. By the combined exertions of these young gentlemen, and the bridesmaids, assisted by the coachman, Miss Petauka was at length supported in a condition of much exhaustion to the first floor, where she no sooner encountered the youthful bridegroom than she fainted with great decorum. "'Henrietta Petauka,' said the collector, "'cheer up, my lovely one!' Miss Petauka grasped the collector's hand, but emotion choked her utterance. "'Is the sight of me so dreadful, Henrietta Petauka? said the collector. "'Oh, no, no, no!' rejoined the bride. "'But all the friends, the darling friends of my youthful days, "'to leave them all, it is such a shock!' "'With such expressions of sorrow, "'Miss Petauka went on to enumerate the dear friends of her youthful days one by one, "'and to call upon such of them as were present to come and embrace her. "'This done, she remembered that Mrs. Crummles had been more than a mother to her, and after that that Mr. Crummles had been more than a father to her, and after that that the Master Crummleses and Miss Ninetta Crummles had been more than brothers and sisters to her. These various remembrances being each accompanied with a series of hugs occupied a long time, and they were obliged to drive to church very fast, for fear they should be too late. The procession consisted of two flies, in the first of which were Miss Bravassa, the fourth bridesmaid, Mrs. Crummles, the collector, and Mr. Folair, who had been chosen as his second on the occasion. In the other were the bride, Mr. Crummles, Miss Snevellicci, Miss Ledrook, and the phenomenon. The costumes were beautiful. The bridesmaids were quite covered with artificial flowers, and the phenomenon in particular was rendered almost invisible by the portable arbour in which she was enshrined. Miss Ledrook, who was of a romantic turn, wore in her breast the miniature of some field officer unknown which she had purchased, a great bargain, not very long before. The other ladies displayed several dazzling articles of imitative jewellery, almost equal to real, and Mrs. Crummles came out in a stern and gloomy majesty which attracted the admiration of all beholders. But, Perhaps the appearance of Mr. Crummles was more striking and appropriate than that of any member of the party. This gentleman, who personated the bride's father, had, in pursuance of a happy and original conception, made up for the part by arraying himself in a theatrical wig of a style and pattern commonly known as a brown George, and, moreover, assuming a snuff-coloured suit of the previous century, with grey silk stockings and buckles to his shoes. The better to support his assumed character, he had determined to be greatly overcome, and consequently when they entered the church, the sobs of the affectionate parent were so heart-rending, that the pew-opener suggested the propriety of his retiring to the vestry, and comforting himself with a glass of water before the ceremony began. The procession up the aisle was beautiful. The bride, with the four bridesmaids forming a group previously arranged and rehearsed, the collector, followed by his second, imitating his walk and gestures to the indescribable amusement of some theatrical friends in the gallery, Mr. Crummles, with an infirm and feeble gait, Mrs. Crummles advancing with that stage walk which consists of a stride and a stop alternately. It was the completest thing ever witnessed. The ceremony was very quickly disposed of, and all parties present having signed the register, for which purpose, when it came to his turn, Mr. Crummles carefully wiped and put on an immense pair of spectacles, they went back to breakfast in high spirits, and here they found Nicholas awaiting their arrival. 
"'Now then,' said Crummles, who had been assisting Mrs. Grudden in the preparation, which were on a more extensive scale than was quite agreeable to the collector, "'Breakfast! Breakfast!' No second invitation was required. The company crowded and squeezed themselves at the table as well as they could, and fell to immediately, Miss Patauka blushing very much when anybody was looking, and eating very much when anybody was not looking, Mr. Lillivick going to work as though with a cool resolve that since the good things must be paid for by him, he would leave as little as possible for the Crummelses to eat up afterwards. "'It's very soon done, sir, isn't it?' inquired Mr. Folair of the collector, leaning over the table to address him. Oh, "'What is soon done, sir?' returned Mr. Lillivick. "'The tying up, the fixing oneself with a wife,' replied Mr. Folair. "'It don't take long, does it?' "'No, sir,' replied Mr. Lillivick, colouring. "'It does not take long. "'And what then, sir?' "'Oh, nothing,' said the actor. "'It don't take a man long to hang himself, either, eh? <laughs> Mr. Lillivick laid down his knife and fork, and looked round the table with indignant astonishment. "'To hang himself?' repeated Mr. Lillivick. A profound silence came upon all, for Mr. Lillivick was dignified beyond expression. "'To hang himself?' cried Mr. Lillivick again. "'Is any parallel attempted to be drawn in this company "'between matrimony and hanging?' "'The noose, you know,' said Mr. Folair, a little crestfallen. "'The noose, sir,' retorted Mr. Lillivick. "'Does any man dare to speak to me of a noose and Henrietta P Lillivick, suggested Mr. Crummles. "'And Henrietta Lillivick in the same breath?' said the collector. "'In this house, in the presence of Mr. and Mrs. Crummles, "'who have brought up a talented and virtuous family "'to be blessings and phenomenons, and what not, "'are we to hear talk of nooses?' "'Folair,' said Mr. Crummles, "'deeming it a matter of decency "'to be affected by this allusion to himself and partner, "'I am astonished at you.' "'What are you going on in this way at me for?' urged the unfortunate actor. "'What have I done?' "'Done, sir,' cried Mr. Lillivick. "'Aimed a blow at the whole framework of society.' "'And the best and tenderest feelings,' added Crummles, relapsing into the old man. "'And the highest and most estimable of social ties,' said the collector. "'Noose! As if one was caught, trapped into the married state.' "'pinned by the leg, instead of going into it of one's own accord "'and glorying in the act?' "'I didn't mean to make it out that you were caught and trapped "'and pinned by the leg,' replied the actor. "'I'm sorry for it. I can't say any more.' "'So you ought to be, sir,' returned Mr. Lillivick, "'and I'm glad to hear that you have enough of feeling left to be so.' "'The quarrel appearing to terminate with this reply,' Mrs. Lillivick considered that the fittest occasion, the attention of the company being no longer distracted, to burst into tears, and require the assistance of all four bridesmaids, which was immediately rendered, though not without some confusion, for the room being small and the tablecloth long, a whole detachment of plates were swept off the board at the very first move. Regardless of this circumstance, however, Mrs. Lillivick refused to be comforted, until the belligerents had passed their words that the dispute should be carried no further, which, after a sufficient show of reluctance, they did, and from that time Mr. Folair sat in moody silence, contenting himself with pinching Nicholas's leg when anything was said, and so expressing his contempt both for the speaker and the sentiments to which he gave utterance. There were a great number of speeches made, some by Nicholas, and some by Crummles, and some by the collector, two by the master Crummleses in returning thanks for themselves, and one by the phenomenon in behalf of the bridesmaids, at which Mrs. Crummles shed tears. There was some singing, too, from Miss Ledrook and Miss Bravassa, and very likely there might have been more, if the fly-driver, who stopped to drive the happy pair to the spot where they proposed to take steamboat to ride, had not sent in a peremptory message intimating that if they didn't come directly, he should infallibly demand eighteen pence over and above his agreement. This desperate threat effectually broke up the party. After a most pathetic leave-taking, Mr. Lillivick and his bride departed for Ride, 
where they were to spend the next two days in profound retirement, and whither they were accompanied by the infant who had been appointed travelling bridesmaid on Mr. Lillivick's express stipulation, as the steamboat people, deceived by her size, would, he had previously ascertained, transport her at half price. As there was no performance that night, Mr. Crummles declared his intention of keeping it up till everything to drink was disposed of, but Nicholas, having to play Romeo for the first time on the ensuing evening, contrived to slip away in the midst of a temporary confusion, occasioned by the unexpected development of strong symptoms of inebriety in the conduct of Mrs. Grudden. To this act of desertion he was led not only by his own inclinations, but by his anxiety on account of Smike, who, having to sustain the character of the apothecary, had been as yet wholly unable to get any more of the part into his head than the general idea that he was very hungry, which, perhaps from old recollections, he had acquired with great aptitude. "'I don't know what's to be done, Smike,' said Nicholas, laying down the book. "'I'm afraid you can't learn it, my poor fellow.' "'I'm afraid not,' said Smike, shaking his head. "'I think if you—' "'But that would give you so much trouble.' "'What?' inquired Nicholas. "'Never mind me. "'I think,' said Smike, "'if you were to keep saying it to me in little bits over and over again, "'I should be able to recollect it from hearing you.' "'Do you think so?' exclaimed Nicholas. "'Well said.' "'Let us see who tires first. "'Not I, Smike, trust me. "'Now then, who calls so loud? "'Who calls so loud?' said Smike. "'Who calls so loud?' repeated Nicholas. "'Who calls so loud?' cried Smike. "'Thus they continued to ask each other "'who called so loud over and over again. "'And when Smike had that by heart, "'Nicholas went to another sentence.' and then to two at a time, and then to three, and so on, until at midnight poor Smike found to his unspeakable joy that he really began to remember something about the text. Early in the morning they went to it again, and Smike, rendered more confident by the progress he had already made, got on faster and with better heart. As soon as he began to acquire the words pretty freely, Nicholas showed him how he must come in with both hands spread out upon his stomach, and how he must occasionally rub it, in compliance with the established form, by which people on the stage always denote that they want something to eat. After the morning's rehearsal, they went to work again, nor did they stop, except for a hasty dinner, until it was time to repair to the theatre at night. Never had master a more anxious, humble, docile pupil. Never had pupil a more patient, unwearying, considerate, kind-hearted master. As soon as they were dressed, and at every interval when he was not upon the stage, Nicholas renewed his instructions. They prospered well. The Romeo was received with hearty plaudits and unbounded favour, and Spike was pronounced unanimously, alike by audience and actors, the very prince and prodigy of apothecaries. End of chapter 25「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chet Chris, London, UK. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 26 Is fraught with some danger to Miss Nickleby's peace of mind. The place was a handsome suite of private apartments in Regent Street. The time was three o'clock in the afternoon to the dull and plodding, and the first hour of morning to the gay and spirited. The persons were Lord Frederick Verisoft, and his friend Sir Mulberry Hawk. These distinguished gentlemen were reclining listlessly on a couple of sofas, with a table between them, on which were scattered in rich confusion the materials of an untasted breakfast. Newspapers lay strewn about the room, but these, like the meal, 
were neglected and unnoticed. Not, however, because any flow of conversation prevented the attractions of the journals from being called into request, for not a word was exchanged between the two, nor was any sound uttered, save when one, in tossing about to find an easier resting place for his aching head, uttered an exclamation of impatience, and seemed for a moment to communicate a new restlessness to his companion. These appearances would in themselves have furnished a pretty strong clue to the extent of the debauch of the previous night, even if there had not been other indications of the amusements in which it had been passed. A couple of billiard-balls, all mud and dirt, two battered hats, a champagne-bottle with a soiled glove twisted round the neck to allow of its being grasped more surely in its capacity of an offensive weapon, a broken cane, a card-case without the top, an empty purse, a watch-guard snapped asunder, a handful of silver mingled with fragments of half-smoked cigars and their stale and crumbled ashes, these and many other tokens of riot and disorder hinted very intelligibly at the nature of last night's gentlemanly frolics. Lord Frederick Verisoft was the first to speak. Dropping his slippered foot on the ground and yawning heavily, he struggled into a sitting posture, and turned his dull, languid eyes towards his friend, to whom he called in a drowsy voice. Hello replied Sir Mulberry, turning round. "'How are we going to lie here all day?' said the Lord. "'I don't know that we're fit for anything else,' replied Sir Mulberry. "'Yet a while, at least. I haven't a grain of life in me this morning.' "'Life?' cried Lord Verisoft. "'I feel as if there would be nothing so snug and comfortable as to die at once.' "'Then why don't you die?' said Sir Mulberry, with which inquiry he turned his face away and seemed to occupy himself in an attempt to fall asleep. His hopeful friend and pupil drew a chair to the breakfast-table and essayed to eat, but finding that impossible, lounged to the window, then loitered up and down the room with his hand to his fevered head, and finally threw himself again on his sofa and roused his friend once more. "'What the devil's the matter?' groaned Sir Mulberry, sitting upright on the couch. Although Sir Mulberry said this with sufficient ill-humour, he did not seem to feel himself quite at liberty to remain silent, for, after stretching himself very often, and declaring with a shiver that it was infernal cold, he made an experiment at the breakfast-table, and, proving more successful in it than his less seasoned friend, remained there. "'Suppose,' said Sir Mulberry, pausing with a morsel on the point of his fork, "'suppose we go back to the subject of little Nickleby, eh?' "'Which little Nickleby? The money-lender or the gal?' asked Lord Verisoft. "'You take me, I see,' replied Sir Mulberry. "'The girl, of course.' "'You promised me you'd find her out,' said Lord Verisoft. "'So I did,' rejoined his friend. "'But I've thought further of the matter since then. "'You distrust me in the business. "'You shall find her out yourself.' "'Nay,' remonstrated Lord Verisoft. "'But I say yes,' returned his friend. "'You shall find her out yourself. "'Don't think that I mean when you can. "'I know as well as you that if I did "'you could never get sight of her without me. "'No, I say you shall find her out. "'Shall.' "'and I'll put you in the way. "'Now curse me if you ain't a real, "'davelish, downright, thorough-paced friend,' "'said the young lord, "'on whom this speech had produced a most reviving effect. "'I'll tell you how,' said Sir Mulberry. "'She was at that dinner as a bait for you.' "'No,' cried the young lord. "'What the day as a bait for you?' repeated his friend. "'Old Nickleby told me so himself.' "'What a fine old cock it is!' exclaimed Lord Verisoft. "'A noble rascal!' "'Yes,' said Sir Mulberry. 
"'He knew she was a smart little creature.' "'Smart?' interposed the young lord. "'Pon my soul, Hawk, she's a perfect beauty, a, a picture, a statue, a, a, upon my soul she is.' "'Well,' replied Sir Mulberry, shrugging his shoulders and manifesting an indifference whether he felt it or not, "'that's a matter of taste. If mine doesn't agree with yours, so much the better.' "'Confound it!' reasoned the Lord. "'You were thick enough with her that day, anyhow. "'I could hardly get in a word.' "'Well enough for once, well enough for once,' replied Sir Mulberry. "'But not worth the trouble of being agreeable to again. "'If you seriously want to follow up the niece, "'tell the uncle that you must know where she lives, "'and how she lives, and with whom, "'or you're no longer a customer of his. "'He'll tell you fast enough.' "'Why didn't you say this before?' asked Lord Verisopht. "'Instead of letting me go on burning, consuming, "'dragging out a miserable existence for an age.' "'I didn't know it in the first place,' answered Sir Mulberry carelessly. "'And in the second I didn't believe you were so very much in earnest.' "'Now, the truth was, that in the interval which had elapsed "'since the dinner at Ralph Nickleby's, Sir Mulberry Hawk had been furtively trying by every means in his power to discover whence Kate had so suddenly appeared, and whither she had disappeared. Unassisted by Ralph, however, with whom he had held no communication since their angry parting on that occasion, all his efforts were wholly unavailing, and he had therefore arrived at the determination of communicating to the young lord the substance of the admission he had gleaned from that worthy. To this he was impelled by various considerations, among which the certainty of knowing whatever the weak young man knew was decidedly not the least, as the desire of encountering the usurer's niece again, and using his utmost arts to reduce her pride, and revenge himself for her contempt, was uppermost in his thoughts. It was a politic course of proceeding, and one which could not fail to redound to his advantage in every point of view, since the very circumstance of his having extorted from Ralph Nickleby his real design in introducing his niece to such society, coupled with his extreme disinterestedness in communicating it so freely to his friend, could not but advance his interests in that quarter, and greatly facilitate the passage of coin, pretty frequent and speedy already, from the pockets of Lord Frederick Verisoft to those of Sir Mulberry Hawk. Thus reasoned Sir Mulberry, and in pursuance of this reasoning, he and his friend soon afterwards repaired to Ralph Nickleby's, there to execute a plan of operations concerted by Sir Mulberry himself, avowedly to promote his friend's object, and really to attain his own. They found Ralph at home, and alone. As he led them into the drawing-room, the recollection of the scene which had taken place there seemed to occur to him, for he cast a curious look at Sir Mulberry, who bestowed upon it no other acknowledgment than a careless smile. They had a short conference upon some money matters then in progress, which were scarcely disposed of when the lordly dupe, in pursuance of his friend's instructions, requested with some embarrassment to speak to Ralph alone. "'Alone, eh?' cried Sir Mulberry, affecting surprise. "'Oh, very good.' "'I'll walk into the next room here. "'Don't keep me long, that's all.' "'So saying, Sir Mulberry took up his hat, "'and humming a fragment of a song, "'disappeared through the door of communication "'between the two drawing-rooms, "'and closed it after him. "'Now, my lord,' said Ralph, "'what is it?' "'Nickleby,' said his client, "'throwing himself along the sofa "'on which he had been previously seated, "'so as to bring his lips nearer to the old man's ear.' "'What a pretty creature your niece is!' "'Is she, my lord?' replied Ralph. "'Maybe, maybe. "'I don't trouble my head with such matters.' "'You know she's a devilish fine girl,' said the client. "'You must know that, Nickleby. "'Come, don't deny that.' "'Yes, I believe she is considered so,' replied Ralph. "'Indeed, I know she is. "'If I did not—' "'You are an authority on such points, and your taste, my lord, on all points, indeed, is undeniable.' 
nobody but the young man to whom these words were addressed could have been deaf to the sneering tone in which they were spoken, or blind to the look of contempt by which they were accompanied. But Lord Frederick Verisopht was both, and took them to be complimentary. "'Well,' he said, "'perhaps you're a little right, and perhaps you're a little wrong. A little of both, Nickleby. "'I want to know where this beauty lives, that I may have another peep at her, Nickleby.' "'Really,' Ralph began in his usual tones. "'Don't talk so loud,' cried the other, achieving the great point of his lesson to a miracle. "'I don't want Hawk to hear.' "'You know he's your rival, do you?' said Ralph, looking sharply at him. "'He always is. Damn him!' replied the client. "'And I want to steal a march upon him. Ha, ha, ha! He'll cut up so rough, Nickleby, at our talking together without him.' "'Where does she live, Nickleby? That's all. Only tell me where she lives, Nickleby.' "'He bites,' thought Ralph. "'He bites.' "'Eh, Nickleby, eh?' pursued the client. "'Where does she live?' "'Really, my lord,' said Ralph, rubbing his hands slowly over each other. "'I must think before I tell you.' "'No, not a bit of it, Nickleby. You mustn't think at all,' replied Verisopht. "'Where is it?' "'No good can come of your knowing,' replied Ralph. "'She's been virtuously and well brought up. To be sure, she's handsome, poor, unprotected. Poor girl, poor girl.' Ralph ran over this brief summary of Kate's condition, as if it were merely passing through his own mind, and he had no intention to speak aloud but the shrewd, sly look which he directed at his companion as he delivered it gave this poor assumption the lie. "'I tell you I only want to see her,' cried his client. "'A man may look at a pretty woman without harm, mayn't he? "'Now, where does she live? "'You know you're making a fortune out of me, Nickleby, "'and upon my soul nobody shall ever take me to anybody else.' "'if you only tell me this.' "'As you promise that, my lord,' said Ralph, with feigned reluctance, "'and as I am most anxious to oblige you, and as there's no harm in it, no harm, I'll tell you. "'But you had better keep it to yourself, my lord, strictly to yourself.' "'Ralph pointed to the adjoining room as he spoke, and nodded expressively.' The young lord, feigning to be equally impressed with the necessity of this precaution, Ralph disclosed the present address and occupation of his niece, observing that, from what he heard of the family, they appeared very ambitious to have distinguished acquaintances, and that a lord could doubtless introduce himself with great ease, if he felt disposed. "'Your object being only to see her again,' said Ralph, "'you could effect it at any time you chose by that means.' Lord Verisopht acknowledged the hint, with a great many squeezes of Ralph's hard, horny hand, and whispering that they would now do well to close the conversation, called to Sir Mulberry Hawk that he might come back. "'I thought you'd gone to sleep,' said Sir Mulberry, reappearing with an ill-tempered air. "'Sorry to detain you,' replied the gull, "'but Nickleby has been so amazingly funny that I couldn't tear myself away.' "'No, no,' said Ralph, "'it was all his lordship. "'You know what a witty, humorous, elegant, accomplished man Lord Frederick is. "'Mind the step, my lord. Uh, "'Sir Mulberry, pray give way.' "'With such courtesies as these, and many low bows, "'and the same cold sneer upon his face all the while, "'Ralph busied himself in showing his visitors downstairs, "'and otherwise than by the slightest possible motion about the corners of his mouth, "'returned no show of answer to the look of admiration "'with which Sir Mulberry Hawk seemed to compliment him "'on being such an accomplished and most consummate scoundrel. "'There had been a ring at the bell a few minutes before, "'which was answered by Newman Noggs just as they reached the hall. "'In the ordinary course of business, "'Newman would have either admitted the newcomer in silence "'or have requested him or her to stand aside while the gentleman passed out. "'but he no sooner saw who it was 
than, as if for some private reason of his own, he boldly departed from the established custom of Ralph's mansion in business hours, and looking towards the respectable trio who were approaching, cried, in a loud and sonorous voice, "'Mrs. Nickleby!' "'Mrs. Nickleby!' cried Sir Mulberry Hawk, as his friend looked back and stared him in the face. It was indeed that well-intentioned lady, who, having received an offer for the empty house in the city directed to the landlord, had brought it post-haste to Mr. Nickleby without delay. "'Nobody you know,' said Ralph. Uh, "'Step into the office, my, uh, my, my dear. I'll be with you directly.' "'Nobody I know,' cried Sir Mulberry Hawk, advancing to the astonished lady. "'Is this Mrs. Nickleby, the mother of Miss Nickleby, the delightful creature I had the happiness of meeting in this house the very last time I dined here?' "'But no,' said Sir Mulberry, stopping short. "'No, it can't be. There's the same cast of features, the same indescribable air of no no this lady is too young for that i think you can tell the gentleman brother-in-law if it concerns him to know said mrs nickleby acknowledging the compliment with a graceful bend that kate nickleby is my daughter her daughter my lord cried sir mulberry turning to his friend this lady's daughter my lord "'My lord,' thought Mrs. Nickleby, "'well, I never did.' "'This, then, my lord,' said Sir Mulberry, "'is the lady to whose obliging marriage we owe so much happiness. "'This lady is the mother of sweet Miss Nickleby. "'Do you observe the extraordinary likeness, my lord? "'Nickleby, introduce us.' "'Ralph did so in a kind of desperation.' "'Upon my soul, it's a most delightful thing,' said Lord Frederick, pressing forward. "'How de do?' Mrs. Nickleby was too much flurried by these uncommonly kind salutations, and her regrets at not having on her other bonnet to make any immediate reply, so she merely continued to bend and smile and betray great agitation. Uh, "'And how is Miss Nickleby?' said Lord Frederick. Oh, "'Well, I hope.' Uh, "'She's quite well, I'm obliged to you, my lord,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, recovering. Uh, "'Quite well. She wasn't well for some days after that day she dined here, and I can't help thinking that she caught cold in that hackney coach coming home. Hackney coaches, my lord, are such nasty things that it's almost better to walk at any time, for although I believe a hackney coachman can be transported for life if he has a broken window,' "'Still, they are so reckless that they nearly all have broken windows. "'I once had a swelled face for six weeks, my lord, from riding in a hackney coach. "'I, I think it was a hackney coach,' said Mrs. Nickleby, reflecting. "'Although I'm not quite certain whether it wasn't a chariot. "'At all events, I know it was a dark green, uh, with a very long number, "'beginning with an oart and ending with a nine. "'No, beginning with a nine and ending with a naught. That was it.' "'And, of course, the stamp-office people would know at once "'whether it was a coach or a chariot if any inquiries were made there. "'However that was, there it was with a broken window, "'and there was I for six weeks with a swelled face. "'I think that was the very same hackney-coach that we found out afterwards "'had the top open all the time, "'and we should never even have known it "'if they hadn't charged us a shilling an hour extra for having it open, "'which it seems is the law, or was then, "'and the most shameful law it appears to be.' "'I don't understand the subject, but I should say the Corn Laws could be nothing to that Act of Parliament.' Having pretty well run herself out by this time, Mrs. Nickleby stopped as suddenly as she'd started off, and repeated that Kate was quite well. "'Indeed,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'I don't think she ever was better since she had the whooping cough, scarlet fever, and measles, all at the same time, and that's the fact.' "'Is that letter for me?' growled Ralph, pointing to the little packet Mrs. Nickleby held in her hand. "'For you, brother-in-law,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, "'and I walked all the way up here on purpose to give it to you.' "'All the way up here?' cried Sir Mulberry, seizing upon the chance of discovering where Mrs. Nickleby had come from. "'What a confounded distance! How far do you call it now?' "'How far do I call it?' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Let me see. It's just a mile from our door to the old bailey.' "'No, no, not so much as that,' 
urged Sir Mulberry. "'Oh, it is indeed,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'I appeal to his lordship.' "'I should decidedly say it was a mile,' remarked Lord Frederick, with a solemn aspect. "'It must be. It can't be a yard less,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'All down Newgate Street, all down Cheapside, all up Lombard Street, down Gracechurch Street, and along Thames Street, as far as Spigwiffin's Wharf. Oh, it's a mile.' "'Yes, on second thoughts I should say it was.' replied Sir Mulberry. "'But you don't surely mean to walk all the way back?' "'Oh, no,' rejoined Mrs. Nickleby. "'I shall go back in an omnibus. I didn't travel about in omnibuses when my poor dear Nicholas was alive, brother-in-law, but as it is, you know—' "'Yes, yes,' replied Ralph impatiently. "'And you'd better get back before dark.' Uh, "'Thank you, brother-in-law. So I had,' returned Mrs. Nickleby. "'I think I'd better say good-bye at once.' "'Not stop and rest?' said Ralph who seldom offered refreshments unless something was to be got by it. "'Oh, dear me, no,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, glancing at the dial. "'Lord Frederick,' said Sir Mulberry, "'we are going Mrs. Nickleby's way. We'll see her safe to the omnibus.' "'By all means, yes.' "'Oh, I really couldn't think of it,' said Mrs. Nickleby. But Sir Mulberry Hawk and Lord Verisoft were peremptory in their politeness, and leaving Ralph, who seemed to think not unwisely that he looked less ridiculous as a mere spectator than he would have done if he had taken any part in these proceedings, they quitted the house with Mrs. Nickleby between them, that good lady in a perfect ecstasy of satisfaction, no less with the attention shown her by two titled gentlemen, than with the conviction that Kate might now pick and choose at least between two large fortunes and most unexceptionable husbands. As she was carried away for the moment by an irresistible train of thought, all connected with her daughter's future greatness, Sir Mulberry Hawk and his friend exchanged glances over the top of the bonnet, which the poor lady so much regretted not having left at home, and proceeded to dilate with great rapture, but much respect, on the manifold perfections of Miss Nickleby. "'What a delight! What a comfort! What a happiness this amiable creature must be to you!' said Sir Mulberry, throwing into his voice an indication of the warmest feeling. "'She is indeed, sir,' replied Mrs. Nickleby. "'She's the sweetest-tempered, kindest-hearted creature, and so clever.' "'She looks clever,' said Lord Verisoft, with the air of a judge of cleverness. "'I assure you she is, my lord,' returned Mrs. Nickleby. "'When she was at school in Devonshire, she was universally allowed to be beyond all exception the very cleverest girl there.' "'and there were a great many very clever ones, too, and that's the truth. Twenty-five young ladies, fifty guineas a year without the et ceteras. "'Both the Miss Dowdles, the most accomplished, elegant, fascinating creatures. "'Oh, dear me,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'I never shall forget what pleasure she used to give me and her poor dear papa "'when she was at that school. Never. "'Such a delightful letter every half-year, "'telling us that she was the first pupil in the whole establishment, "'and had made more progress than anybody else.' "'I can scarcely bear to think of it even now. "'The girls wrote all the letters themselves,' added Mrs. Nickleby, "'and the writing-master touched them up afterwards with a magnifying glass and a silver pen. "'At least I think they wrote them, though Kate was never quite certain about that, "'because she didn't know the handwriting of hers again. "'But, anyway, I know it was a circular which they all copied, "'and, of course, it was a very gratifying thing, very gratifying.' "'With similar recollections,' Mrs. Nickleby beguiled the tediousness of the way until they reached the omnibus, which the extreme politeness of her new friends would not allow them to leave until it actually started, when they took their hats, as Mrs. Nickleby solemnly assured her hearers on many subsequent occasions, completely off, and kissed their straw-coloured kid gloves till they were no longer visible. Mrs. Nickleby leant back in the furthest corner of the conveyance, and closing her eyes, resigned herself to a host of most pleasing meditations. Kate had never said a word about having met either of these gentlemen. That, she thought, argues that she strongly prepossessed in favour of one of them. Then the question arose, which one could it be? The Lord was the youngest, and his title was certainly the grandest. Still Kate was not the girl to be swayed by such considerations as these. "'I will never put any constraint upon her inclinations,' 
said Mrs. Nickleby to herself, but upon my word I think there's no comparison between his lordship and Sir Mulberry. Sir Mulberry is such an attentive, gentlemanly creature, so much manner, such a fine man, and has so much to say for himself. I hope it's Sir Mulberry. I think it must be Sir Mulberry. And then her thoughts flew back to her old predictions, and the number of times she had said that Kate, with no fortune, would marry better than other people's daughters with thousands. And as she pictured with the brightness of her mother's fancy all the beauty and grace of the poor girl who had struggled so cheerfully with her new life of hardship and trial, her heart grew too full, and the tears trickled down her face. Meanwhile, Ralph walked to and fro in his little back office, troubled in mind by what had just occurred. To say that Ralph loved or cared for, in the most ordinary acceptation of those terms, any one of God's creatures, would be the wildest fiction. Still there had somehow stolen upon him from time to time a thought of his niece which was tinged with compassion and pity, breaking through the dull cloud of dislike or indifference which darkened men and women in his eyes. There was, in her case, the faintest gleam of light, a most feeble and sickly ray at the best of times, but there it was, and it showed the poor girl in a better and purer aspect than any in which he had looked on human nature yet. "'I wish,' thought Ralph, "'I had never done this, "'and yet it will keep this boy to me "'while there is money to be made. "'Selling a girl, "'throwing her in the way of temptation "'and insult and coarse speech. "'Nearly two thousand pounds profit from him already, though. "'Psha! "'Match-making mothers do the same thing every day.' "'He sat down and told the chances for and against on his fingers.' "'If I'd not put them in the right track to-day,' thought Ralph, "'this foolish woman would have done so. "'Well, if her daughter is as true to herself as she should be, "'from what I've seen, what harm ensues? "'A little teasing, a little humbling, a few tears. "'Yes,' said Ralph aloud, as he locked his iron safe. "'She must take her chance. "'She must take her chance.'" End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 27. Chapter 27. Mrs. Nickleby becomes acquainted with Messrs. Pike and Pluck, whose affection and interest are beyond all bounds. Mrs. Nickleby had not felt so proud and important for many a day, as when, on reaching home, she gave herself wholly up to the pleasant visions which had accompanied her on her way thither. Lady Mulberry Hawk, that was the prevalent idea. Lady Mulberry Hawk, on Tuesday last, at St. George's, Hanover Square, by the Right Reverend the Bishop of Landoff, Mr. Mulberry Hawk, of Mulberry Castle, North Wales, to Catherine, only daughter of the late Nicholas Nickleby, Esquire of Devonshire. Upon my word, cried Mrs. Nicholas Nickleby, it sounds very well. Having dispatched the ceremony, with its attendant festivities to the perfect satisfaction of her own mind, the sanguine mother pictured to her imagination the long train of honors and distinction which could not fail to accompany Kate in her new and brilliant sphere. She would be presented at court, of course, on the anniversary of her birthday, which was upon the 19th of July, at ten minutes past three o'clock in the morning, thought Mrs. Nickleby in parentheses, for I recollect asking what o'clock it was. Sir Mulberry would give a great feast to all his tenants, and would return to them three and a half percent on the amount of their last half-year's rent as would be fully described and recorded in the fashionable intelligence, to the immeasurable delight and admiration of all the readers thereof. Kate's picture, too, would be in at least half a dozen of the annuals, and on the opposite page would appear, in delicate type, lines on contemplating the portrait of Lady Mulberry Hawk, by Sir Dingleby Dabber. Perhaps some one annual, of more comprehensive design than its fellows, might even contain a portrait of the mother of Lady Mulberry Hawk, with lines by the father of Sir Dingleby Dabber. More unlikely things have come to pass. Less interesting portraits had appeared. As this thought occurred to the good lady, 
her countenance unconsciously assumed that compound expression of simpering and sleepiness which, being common to all such portraits, is perhaps one reason why they are always so charming and agreeable. With such triumphs of aerial architecture did Mrs. Nickleby occupy the whole evening after her accidental introduction to Ralph's titled friends, and dreams, no less prophetic and equally promising, haunted her sleep that night. She was preparing for her frugal dinner next day, still occupied with the same ideas, a little softened down perhaps by sleep and daylight, when the girl who attended her, partly for company, and partly to assist in the household affairs, rushed into the room in unwanted agitation, and announced that two gentlemen were waiting in the passage for permission to walk upstairs. "'Bless my heart!' cried Mrs. Nickleby, hastily arranging her cap in front. "'If it should be, dear me, standing in the passage all this time, why don't you go and ask them to walk up, you stupid thing?' While the girl was gone on this errand, Mrs. Nickleby hastily swept into a cupboard all the vestiges of eating and drinking, which she had scarcely done, and seated herself with looks as collected as she could assume when two gentlemen, both perfect strangers, presented themselves. "'How do you do?' said one gentleman, laying great stress on the last word of inquiry. "'How do you do?' said the other gentleman, altering the emphasis, as if to give variety to the salutation. Mrs. Nickleby curtsied and smiled, and curtsied again, and remarked, rubbing her hands as she did so, that she hadn't the, really, the honor to. "'To know us,' said the first gentleman. "'The loss has been ours, Mrs. Nickleby. "'Has the loss been ours, Pike?' "'It has, Pluck,' answered the other gentleman. "'We have regretted it very often, I believe, Pike,' said the first gentleman. "'Very often, Pluck,' answered the second. "'But now,' said the first gentleman, "'now we have the happiness we have pined and languished for. "'We have pined and languished for this happiness, Pike, have we not?' "'You know we have, Pluck,' said Pike reproachfully. "'You hear him, ma'am,' said Mr. Pluck, looking round. "'You hear the unimpeachable testimony of my friend Pike. "'That reminds me. Formalities, formalities. "'Must not be neglected in civilized society. "'Pike, Mrs. Nickleby.' "'Mr. Pike laid his hand upon his heart and bowed low. "'Whether I shall introduce myself with the same formality,' said Mr. Pluck, "'whether I shall say myself that my name is Pluck, "'or whether I shall ask my friend Pike, "'who now being regularly introduced is competent to the office,' to state for me, Mrs. Nickleby, that my name is Pluck. Whether I shall claim your acquaintance on the plain ground of the strong interest I take in your welfare, or whether I shall make myself known to you as the friend of Sir Mulberry Hawk. These, Mrs. Nickleby, are considerations which I leave for you to determine. Any friend of Sir Mulberry Hawk's requires no better introduction to me, observed Mrs. Nickleby graciously. It is delightful to hear you say so, said Mr. Pluck drawing a chair close to Mrs. Nickleby, and sitting himself down. It is refreshing to know that you hold my excellent friend, Sir Mulberry, in such high esteem. A word in your ear, Mrs. Nickleby. When Sir Mulberry knows it, he will be a happy man. I say, Mrs. Nickleby, a happy man. Pike, be seated. My good opinion, said Mrs. Nickleby, and the poor lady exuded in the idea that she was marvelously sly. My good opinion can be of very little consequence to a gentleman like Sir Mulberry. "'Of little consequence!' exclaimed Mr. Puck. "'Pike, of what consequence to our friend Sir Mulberry "'is a good opinion of Mrs. Nickleby?' "'Of what consequence?' echoed Pike. "'Aye,' repeated Pluck. "'Is it of the greatest consequence?' "'Of the very greatest consequence,' replied Pike. "'Mrs. Nickleby cannot be ignorant,' said Mr. Pluck, "'of the immense impression on which that sweet girl has. "'Pluck,' said his friend, "'beware.' "'Pike is right,' muttered Mr. Pluck after a short pause. I was not to mention it. Pike is very right. Thank you, Pike. Well, now, really, thought Mrs. Nickleby within herself, such delicacy as that I never saw. Mr. Pluck, after feigning to be in a condition of great embarrassment for some minutes, resumed the conversation by entreating Mrs. Nickleby to take no heed of what he had inadvertently said, to consider him imprudent, rash, injudicious. The only stipulation he would make in his own favor was that she should give him credit for the best intentions. "'But when,' said Mr. Pluck, "'when I see such sweetness and beauty on the one hand, "'and so much ardor and devotion on the other, "'I, pardon me, Pike, "'I didn't intend to resume that theme. "'Change the subject, Pike.' "'We promised Sir Mulberry and Lord Frederick,' said Pike, "'that we'd call this morning and inquire "'whether you took any cold last night.' "'Not the least in the world last night, sir,' "'replied Mrs. Nickleby, "'with many thanks to his lordship and Sir Mulberry "'for doing me the honor to inquire. "'Not the least.' which is the more singular, as I am really very subject to colds, indeed, very subject. 
"'I had a cold once,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'I think it was in the year eighteen hundred and seventeen. "'Let me see. Four and five or nine, and yes, eighteen hundred and seventeen. "'That I thought I should never get rid of. "'Actually and seriously, that I thought I should never get rid of. "'I was only cured at last by a remedy that I don't know whether you ever happen to hear of, Mr. Pluck. "'You have a gallon of water as hot as you can possibly bear it, with a pound of salt, and a sixpenth worth of the finest bran, and sit with your head in it for twenty minutes every night just before going to bed. At least, I don't mean your head, your feet. It's a most extraordinary cure, a most extraordinary cure. I used it for the first time, I recollect, the day after Christmas Day, and by the middle of April following, the cold was gone. It seems quite a miracle when you come to think of it, for I had had it ever since the beginning of September. What an afflicting calamity, said Mr. Pike. "'Perfectly horrid!' exclaimed Mr. Pluck. "'But it's worth the pain of hearing, only to know that Mrs. Nickleby recovered it, isn't it, Pluck?' cried Mr. Pike. "'That is a circumstance which gives it a thrilling interest,' replied Mr. Pluck. "'But come,' said Pike, as if suddenly recollecting himself. "'We must not forget our mission and the pleasure of this interview. "'We come on a mission, Mrs. Nickleby.' "'On a mission!' exclaimed that good lady, "'to whose mind a definite proposal of marriage for Kate at once presented itself in lively colours.' "'From Sir Mulberry,' replied Pike. "'You must be very dull here.' "'Rather dull, I confess,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'We bring the compliments of Sir Mulberry Hawk, "'and a thousand entreaties that you'll take a seat in the private box at the play tonight,' said Mr. Pluck. "'Oh, dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'I never go out at all, never.' "'And that is the very reason, my dear Mrs. Nickleby, "'why you should go out tonight,' retorted Mr. Pluck. "'Pike, entreat Mrs. Nickleby.' "'Oh, pray do,' said Pike.' "'You positively must,' urged Pluck. "'You are very kind,' said Mrs. Nickleby, hesitating. "'But there is not a but in the case, my dear Mrs. Nickleby,' remonstrated Mr. Pluck. "'Not such a word in the vocabulary. "'Your brother-in-law joins us. "'Lord Frederick joins us. "'Sir Mulberry joins us. "'Pike joins us. "'A refusal is out of the question. "'Sir Mulberry sends a carriage for you, twenty minutes before seven to the moment. "'You'll not be so cruel as to disappoint the whole party, Mrs. Nickleby.' "'You are so very pressing that I scarcely know what to say,' replied the worthy lady. "'Say nothing. Not a word. Not a word, my dearest madam,' urged Mr. Pluck. "'Mrs. Nickleby,' said that excellent gentleman, lowering his voice, "'there is the most trifling, the most excusable breach of confidence of what I am about to say. "'And yet if my friend Pike there overheard it, "'such is that man's delicate sense of honour, Mrs. Nickleby. "'He'd have me out before dinner-time.' Mrs. Nickleby cast an apprehensive glance at the warlike Pike, who had walked to the window, and Mr. Pluck, squeezing her hand, went on. "'Your daughter has made a conquest, a conquest on which I may congratulate you. Sir Mulberry, my dear ma'am, Sir Mulberry is her devoted slave. Hem!' "'Ha!' cried Mr. Pike at this juncture, snatching something from the chimney-piece with a theatrical air. "'What is this? What do I behold?' "'What do you behold, my dear fellow?' asked Mr. Pluck. "'It is the face, the countenance, the expression,' cried Mr. Pike, falling into his chair with a miniature in his hand. "'Feebly portrayed, imperfectly caught, but still, the face, the countenance, the expression.' "'I recognize it at this distance,' exclaimed Mr. Pluck in a fit of enthusiasm. "'Is it not, my dear madam, the fate similitude of?' "'It is my daughter's portrait,' said Mrs. Nickleby with great pride. "'And so it was.' and little Miss La Creevy had brought it home for inspection only two nights before. Mr. Pike no sooner ascertained that he was quite right in his conjecture, that he launched into the most extravagant coniums of the divine original, and in the warmth of his enthusiasm kissed the picture a thousand times, while Mr. Pluck pressed Mrs. Nickleby's hand to his heart, and congratulated her on the possession of such a daughter, with so much earnestness and affection that the tears stood, or seemed to stand, in his eyes. Poor Mrs. Nickleby, who had listened in a state of enviable complacency at first, became at length quite overpowered by these tokens of regard for, and attachment to, the family. And even the servant girl, who had peeped in at the door, remained rooted to the spot in astonishment at the ecstasies of the two friendly visitors. By degrees these raptures subsided, and Mrs. Nickleby went on to entertain her guests with a lament over her fallen fortunes, and a picturesque account of her old house in the country comprising a full description of the different apartments, not forgetting the little storeroom, and a lively recollection of how many steps you went down to get into the garden, and which way you turned when you came out at the parlour door, and what capital fixtures there were in the kitchen. 
This last reflection naturally conducted her into the wash house, where she stumbled upon the brewing utensils, among which she might have wandered for an hour, if the mere mention of those implements had not, by an association of ideas, instantly reminded Mr. Pike that he was amazing thirsty. And I'll tell you what, said Mr. Pike, if you'll send round to the public house for a pot of milk half and half, positively and actually, I'll drink it. And positively and actually Mr. Pike did drink it, and Mr. Pluck helped him, while Mrs. Nickleby looked on in divided admiration of the condescension of the two, and the aptitude with which they accommodated themselves to the pewter pot. In explanation of which seeming marvel, it may here be observed that gentlemen who, like Messrs. Pike and Pluck, lived upon their wits, or not so much, perhaps, upon the presence of their own wits as upon the absence of wits of other people, are occasionally reduced to the very narrow shifts and straits, and are at such periods accustomed to regale themselves in a very simple and primitive manner. At twenty minutes before seven, then, said Mr. Pike, rising, the coach will be here. One more look, one little look, at that sweet face. Ah, here it is, unmoved, unchanged. This, by the way, was a very remarkable circumstance, miniatures being liable to so many changes of expression. Oh, pluck, pluck. Mr. Pluck made no other reply than kissing Mrs. Nickleby's hand with a great show of feeling and attachment. Mr. Pike, having done the same, both gentlemen hastily withdrew. Mrs. Nickleby was commonly in the habit of giving herself credit for a pretty tolerable share of penetration and acuteness, but she had never felt so satisfied with her own sharp-sightedness as she did that day. She had found it all out the night before. She had never seen Sir Mulberry and Kate together, never even heard Sir Mulberry's name, and yet hadn't she said to herself from the very first that she saw how the case stood, and what a triumph it was, for there was now no doubt about it. If these flattering attentions to herself were not sufficient proofs, Sir Mulberry's confidential friend had suffered the secret to escape him in so many words. I am quite in love with that dear Mr. Pluck, I declare I am, said Mrs. Nickleby. There was one great source of uneasiness in the midst of this good fortune, and that was the having nobody by to whom she could confide it. Once or twice she was almost resolved to walk straight to Miss La Creevy's and tell it all to her. But I don't know, thought Miss Nickleby. She is a very worthy person, but I am afraid too much beneath Sir Mulberry's station for us to make a companion of. Poor thing! Acting upon this grave consideration, she rejected the idea of taking the little portrait painter into her confidence and contented herself with holding out sundry vague and mysterious hopes preferment to the servant-girl, who received these obscure hints of dawning greatness with much veneration and respect. Punctual to its time came the promised vehicle, which was no hackney coach, but a private chariot, having behind it a footman, whose legs, although somewhat large for his body, might, as mere abstract legs, have set themselves up for models at the Royal Academy. It was quite exhilarating to hear the clash and bustle with which he banged the door and jumped up behind after Mrs. Nickleby was in. And as that good lady was perfectly unconscious that he applied the gold-headed end of his long stick to his nose, and so telegraphed most disrespectfully to the coachman over her head, she sat in a state of much stuffiness and dignity, not a little proud of her position. At the theatre entrance there was more banging and more bustle, and there were also Messrs. Pike and Pluck waiting to escort her to her box. And so polite were they, that Mr. Pike threatened with many oaths to Smifflegate, a very old man with a lantern who accidentally stumbled in her way, to the great terror of Mrs. Nickleby, who, conjecturing more from Mr. Pike's excitement than any previous acquaintance with the etymology of the world that Smifflegation and bloodshed must be in the main one and the same thing, was alarmed beyond expression lest something should occur. Fortunately, however, Mr. Pike confined himself to mere verbal Smifflegation, and they reached their box with no more serious interruption by the way, than a desire on the part of the same pugnacious gentleman to smash the assistant box-keeper for happening to mistake the number. Mrs. Nickleby had scarcely been put away behind the curtain of the box in an armchair, when Sir Mulberry and Lord Verishopt arrived, arrayed from the crowns of their heads to the tips of their gloves, and from the tips of their gloves to the toes of their boots, in the most elegant and costly manner. Sir Mulberry was a little hoarser than on the previous day, and Lord Verishopt looked rather sleepy and queer from which tokens, as well as from the circumstance of their both being to a trifling extent unsteady upon their legs, Miss Nickleby justly concluded that they had taken dinner. "'We have been... we have been toasting your lovely daughter, Mrs. Nickleby,' whispered Sir Mulberry, sitting down behind her. "'Oh, ho!' thought that knowing lady. "'Wine in, truth out. "'You are very kind, Sir Mulberry.' 
"'No, no, upon my soul,' replied Sir Mulberry Hawk. "'It's you that's kind, upon my soul it is. "'It was so kind of you to come tonight.' "'So very kind of you to invite me, you mean, Sir Mulberry,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, "'tossing her head and looking prodigiously sly. "'I am so anxious to know you, so anxious to cultivate your good opinion, "'so desirous that there should be a delicious kind of harmonious family understanding between us,' "'said Sir Mulberry, that you mustn't think I'm disinterested in what I do. "'I'm infernally selfish. I am, upon my soul I am.' "'I am sure you can't be selfish, Sir Mulberry,' replied Mrs. Nickleby. "'You have much too open and generous a countenance for that.' "'What an extraordinary observer you are,' said Sir Mulberry Hawk. "'Oh, no, indeed. I don't see very far into things, Sir Mulberry,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, in a tone of voice which left the baronet to infer that she saw very far indeed. "'I am quite afraid of you,' said the baronet. "'Upon my soul,' repeated Sir Mulberry, looking round to his companions. "'I am afraid of Mrs. Nickleby. She is so immensely sharp.' Messrs. Pike and Pluck shook their heads mysteriously, and observed together that they had found that out long ago. Upon which Mrs. Nickleby tittered, and Sir Mulberry laughed, and Pike and Pluck roared. "'But where's my brother-in-law, Sir Mulberry?' inquired Mrs. Nickleby. "'I shouldn't be here without him. I hope he's coming.' "'Pike,' said Sir Mulberry, taking out his toothpick and lolling back in his chair, as if he were too lazy to invent a reply to this question. "'Where's Ralph Nickleby?' "'Pluck,' said Pike, imitating the baronet's action and turning the lie over to his friend. "'Where's Ralph Nickleby?' Mr. Pluck was about to return some evasive reply, when the hustle caused by a party entering the next box seemed to attract the attention of all four gentlemen, who exchanged glances of much meaning. The new party began to converse together. Sir Mulberry suddenly assumed the character of a most attentive listener, and implored his friends not to breathe, not to breathe. "'Why not?' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'What is the matter?' "'Hush!' replied Sir Mulberry, laying his hand on her arm. Lord Frederick, do you not recognize the tones of that voice? Devil take me if I didn't think it was the voice of Miss Nickleby. Lor, my lord, cried Miss Nickleby's ma, thrusting her head round the curtain. Why, actually, Kate, my dear Kate. You here, mamma? Is it possible? Possible, my dear? Yes. Why, who? Who on earth is it that you have with you, mamma? said Kate shrinking back as she caught sight of a man smiling and kissing his hand. "'Who do you suppose, my dear?' replied Mrs. Nickleby, bending towards Miss Witterly, and speaking a little louder for that lady's edification. "'There's Mr. Pike, Mr. Pluck, Sir Mulberry Hawk, and Lord Frederick Bearshot. "'Gracious heaven!' thought Kate hurriedly. "'How comes she in such society?' Now Kate thought thus so hurriedly, and the surprise was so great, and moreover brought back so forcefully the recollection of what had passed at Ralph's delectable dinner, that she turned extremely pale, and appeared greatly agitated, which symptoms being observed by Mrs. Nickleby were at once set down by that acute lady as being caused and occasioned by violent love. But, although she was in no small degree delighted by this discovery, which reflected so much credit on her own quickness of perception, it did not lessen her motherly anxiety in Kate's behalf, and accordingly, with a vast quantity of trepidation, she quitted her own box to hasten into that of Miss Witterly. Miss Witterly, keenly alive to the glory of having a lord and baronet among her visiting acquaintances, lost no time in signaling to Mr. Witterly to open the door. And thus it was that in less than thirty seconds Mrs. Nickleby's party had made an eruption into Mrs. Witterly's box, which it filled to the very door, there being, in fact, only room for Messrs. Pike and Pluck to get in their heads and waistcoats. "'My dear Kate,' said Mrs. Nickleby, kissing her daughter affectionately, "'how ill you looked a moment ago. You quite frightened me, I declare.' "'It was mere fancy, Mama. The, the reflection of the lights, perhaps,' replied Kate, glancing nervously around, and finding it impossible to whisper any caution or explanation. "'Don't you see Sir Mulberry Hawk, my dear?' Kate bowed slightly, and biting her lip, turned her head towards the stage. But Sir Mulberry Hawk was not to be so easily repulsed for he advanced with extended hand, and Mrs. Nickleby efficiently informing Kate of this circumstance, she was obliged to extend her own. Sir Mulberry detained it while he murmured a profusion of compliments, which Kate, remembering what had passed between them, rightly considered as so many aggravations of the insult he had already put upon her. Then followed the recognition of Lord Verschopt, and then the greeting of Mr. Pike, and then that of Mr. Pluck, and finally, 
to complete the young lady's mortification, she was compelled at Miss Witterly's request to perform the ceremony of introducing the odious persons whom she regarded with the utmost indignation and abhorrence. "'Mrs. Witterly is delighted,' said Mr. Witterly, rubbing his hands. "'Delighted, my lord, I am sure, with this opportunity of contracting an acquaintance which, I trust, my lord, we shall improve. "'Julia, my dear, you must not allow yourself to be much too excited. "'You must not. Indeed, you must not. "'Mrs. Witterly is of a most excitable nature, Sir Mulberry. "'The snuff of a candle, the wick of a lamp, the bloom on a peach, the down on a butterfly.' You might blow her away, my lord. You might blow her away. Sir Mulberry seemed to think that it would be a great convenience that the lady could be blown away. He said, however, that the delight was mutual, and Lord Vershop added that it was mutual, whereupon Messrs. Pike and Pluck were heard to murmur from a distance that it was very mutual indeed. I take an interest, my lord, said Miss Witterly, with a faint smile, such an interest in the drama. Yes, it's very interesting replied Lord Verschopt. "'I'm always ill after Shakespeare,' said Miss Witterly. "'I scare its exist the next day. I find the reaction so very great after a tragedy, my lord. And Shakespeare is such a delicious creature.' "'Yes,' replied Lord Verschopt. "'He was a clever man.' "'You know, my lord,' said Miss Witterly, after a long silence, "'I find I take so much more interest in his plays, after having been to that dear dull house where he was born in.' "'Were you ever there, my lord?' "'No, never,' replied Lord Verschopt. "'Then really you ought to go, my lord,' returned Miss Witterly in very languid and drawing accents. "'I don't know how it is, but after you've seen the place and written your name in the little book, somehow or other you seem to be inspired. It kindles up quite a fire within one.' "'Yes,' replied Lord Verschopt. "'I shall certainly go there.' "'Julia, my life,' interposed Mr. Witterly. You are deceiving his lordship. Unintentionally, my lord, she is deceiving you. It is your poetical temperament, my dear, your ethereal soul, your fervid imagination, which throws you into a glow of genius and excitement. There is nothing in the place, my dear. Nothing. Nothing. I think there must be something in the place, said Mrs. Nickleby, who had been listening in silence. For soon after I was married, I went to Stratford with my poor dear Mr. Nickleby, in a post-chaise from Birmingham. Was it a post-chaise, though? said Mrs. Nickleby, considering. Yes, it must have been a post-chaise, because I recollect remarking at the time that the driver had a green shade over his left eye. In a post-chaise from Birmingham. And after we had seen Shakespeare's tomb and birthplace, we went back to the inn there, where we slept that night. And I recollect that all night long I dreamt of nothing but a black gentleman, at full length, in plaster of Paris, with a lay-down collar tied with two tassels, leaning against a post and thinking. And when I awoke the next morning and described him to Mr. Nickleby, he said it was Shakespeare, just as he had been when he was alive, which was very curious indeed. Stratford. Stratford, continued Mrs. Nickleby, considering. Yes, I am positive about that, because I recollect I was in the family way with my son Nicholas at the time. And I had been very much frightened by an Italian image boy that very morning. In fact, it was quite a mercy, ma'am, added Mrs. Nickleby, in a whisper to Mrs. Witterly, that my son didn't turn out to be a Shakespeare, and what a dreadful thing that would have been. When Mrs. Nickleby had brought this interesting anecdote to a close, Pike and Pluck, ever zealous in their patron's cause, proposed the adjournment of the detachment of the party into the next box. And so with much skill were the preliminaries adjusted, that Kate, despite all she could say or do to the contrary, had no alternative but to suffer herself to be led away by Sir Mulberry Hawk. Her mother and Mr. Pluck accompanied them, but the worthy lady, pluming herself upon her discretion, took particular care to not so much as look at her daughter during the whole evening, and to seem wholly absorbed in the jokes and conversation of Mr. Pluck, who, having been appointed sentry over Mrs. Nickleby for that especial purpose, neglected on his side no possible opportunity of engrossing her attention. Lord Frederick Verishopt remained in the next box to be talked to by Mrs. Witterly, and Mr. Pike was in attendance to throw in a word or two when necessary. As to Mr. Witterly, he was sufficiently busy in the body of the house, informing such of his friends and acquaintances as happened to be there, that those two gentlemen upstairs, whom they had seen in conversation with Mrs. W., were the distinguished Lord Frederick Verishopt and his most intimate friend, the gay Sir Mulberry Hawk. 
a communication which inflamed several respectable housekeepers with the utmost jealousy and rage, and reduced sixteen unmarried daughters to the very brink of despair. The evening came to an end at last, but Kate had yet to be handed downstairs by the detested Sir Mulberry, and so skillfully were the maneuvers of Messrs. Pike and Pluck conducted that she and the baronet were the last of the party, and were even, without the appearance of effort or design, left at some little distance behind. "'Don't hurry, don't hurry,' said Sir Mulberry, as Kate hastened on, and attempted to release her arm. She made no reply, but still pressed forward. "'Nay, then,' coolly observed Sir Mulberry, stopping her outright. "'You had best not seek to detain me, sir,' said Kate angrily. "'And why not?' retorted Sir Mulberry. "'My dear creature, now why do you keep up the show of displeasure?' show repeated kate indignantly how dare you presume to speak to me sir to address me to come into my presence you look prettier in a passion miss nickleby said sir mulberry hawk stooping down the better to see her face i hold you in the bitterest detestation and contempt sir said kate if you find any attraction in looks of disgust and aversion you let me rejoin my friend sir instantly whatever considerations may have withheld me thus far I will disregard them all, and take a course that even you might feel, if you do not immediately suffer me to proceed. Sir Mulberry smiled, and looking down in her face and retaining her arm, walked towards the door. If no regard for my sex or helpless situation will induce you to desist from this coarse and unmanly persecution, said Kate, scarcely knowing, in the tumult of her passions, what she said, I have a brother who will resent it dearly one day. Upon my soul! exclaimed Sir Mulberry as though quietly communing with himself, passing his arms round her waist as he spoke. She looks more beautiful, and I like her better in this mood, than when her eyes are cast down, and she is in perfect repose. How Kate reached the lobby where her friends were waiting she never knew, but she hurried across it without at all regarding them, and disengaged herself suddenly from her companion, sprang into the coach, and throwing herself into its darkest corner burst into tears. Messrs. Pike and Pluck, knowing their cue, at once threw the party into great commotion by shouting for the carriages, and getting up a violent quarrel with sundry inoffensive bystanders, in the midst of which tumult they put the affrighted Mrs. Nickleby in her chariot, and having got her safely off, turned their thoughts to Mrs. Witterly, whose attention also they had now effectually distracted from the young lady, by throwing her into a state of the utmost bewilderment and consternation. At length the convenience in which she had come rolled off too with its load, and the four worthies, being left alone under the portico, enjoyed a hearty laugh together. There, said Sir Mulberry, turning to his noble friend, didn't I tell you last night that if we could find out where they were going by bribing a servant through my fellow, and then established ourselves close by with the mother, those people's honors would be our own? Why, here it is, done in four and twenty hours. Yes, replied the dupe, but I have been tied to the woman all night. Hear him, said Sir Mulberry, turning to his two friends. Hear this discontented grumbler. Isn't it enough to make a man swear never to help him in his plots and schemes again? Isn't it an infernal shame? Pike asked Pluck whether it was not an infernal shame. And Pluck asked Pike, but neither answered. Isn't it the truth? demanded Verishot. Wasn't it so? Wasn't it so? repeated Sir Mulberry. How would you have had it? How could we have got a general invitation at first sight? Come when you like, go when you like. Stop as long as you like, do what you like, if you, the Lord, had not made yourself agreeable to the foolish mistress of the house. Do I care for this girl, except as your friend? Haven't I been sounding your praises in her ears, and bearing her pretty sulks and peevishness all night for you? What sort of stuff do you think I'm made of? Would I do this for every man? Don't I deserve even gratitude in return? You're a devilishly good fellow, said the poor young Lord, taking his friend's arm. Upon my life, you're a devilishly good fellow, Hawk. And I have done right, have I? demanded Sir Mulberry. Quite right. And like a poor, silly, good-natured, friendly dog as I am, eh? Yes, yes, like a friend, replied the other. Well, then, replied Sir Mulberry, I am satisfied. And now let us go and have our revenge on the German baron and the Frenchman, who cleaned you out so handsomely last night. With these words the friendly creature took his companion's arm and led him away, turning half round as he did so, and bestowing a wink and a contemptuous smile on Messrs. Pike and Pluck, who, 
cramming their handkerchiefs into their mouths to denote their silent enjoyment of the whole proceedings, followed their patron and his victim at a little distance. End of Chapter 27 Recording by James Christopher J.X. Christopher at Yahoo.com Chapter 28 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. This recording by Patty Bregman. Nicholas Nickleby, Chapter 28. Miss Nickleby, rendered desperate by the persecution of Sir Mulberry Hawk and the complicated difficulties and distresses which surround her, appeals as a last resource to her uncle for protection. The ensuing morning brought reflection with it, as morning usually does, but widely different was the train of thought it awakened in the different persons who had been so unexpectedly brought together on the preceding evening by the active agencies of Messrs. Pike and Pluck. The reflections of Sir Mulberry Hawk, if such a term can be applied to the thoughts of a systematic and calculating man of dissipation, whose joys, regrets, pains, and pleasures are all of self, and who would seem to retain nothing of the intellectual faculty but the power to debase himself, and to degrade the very nature whose outward semblance he wears. The reflections of Sir Mulberry Hawk turned upon Kate Nickleby, and were in brief that she was undoubtedly handsome, that her coyness must be easily conquerable by a man of his address and experience, and that the pursuit was one which could not fail to redound in his credit, and greatly to enhance his reputation with the world. Unless this last consideration, no mean or secondary one with Sir Mulberry, should sound strangely in the ears of some, let it be remembered that most men live in a world of their own, and that in the limited circle alone they are ambitious for distinction and applause. Sir Mulberry's world was peopled with profligates, and he acted accordingly. Thus, cases of injustice and oppression and tyranny and the most extravagant bigotry are in constant occurrence among us every day. It is the custom to trumpet forth much wonder and astonishment at the chief actors therein, setting at defiance so completely the opinion of the world. But there is no greater fallacy. It is precisely because they do consult the opinion of their own little world that such things take place at all, and strike the great world dumb with amazement. The reflections of Mrs. Nickleby were of the proudest and most complacent kind. Under the influence of her very agreeable delusion, she straightway sat down and indicted a long letter to Kate, in which she expressed her entire approval of the admirable choice she had made, and extolled Sir Mulberry to the skies, asserting, for the more complete satisfaction of her daughter's feelings, that he was precisely the individual whom she, Mrs. Nickleby, would have chosen for her son-in-law if she had the picking and choosing from all mankind. The good lady then, with the preliminary observation that she might be fairly supposed not to have lived in the world so long without knowing its ways, communicated a great many subtle precepts applicable to the state of courtship and confirmed in their wisdom by her own personal experience. Above all things, she commended a strict maidenly reserve as being not only a very laudable thing in itself, but as tending materially to strengthen and increase a lover's ardour. And I never, added Mrs. Nickleby, was more delighted in my life than to observe last night, my dear, that your good sense had already told you this, with which sentiment and various hints of the pleasure she derived from the knowledge that her daughter inherited so large an instalment of her own excellent sense and discretion to nearly the full measure of which she might hope with care to succeed in time, Mrs. Nickleby concluded a very long and rather illegible letter. Poor Kate was well-nigh distracted on the receipt of four closely written and closely crossed sides of congratulation on the very subject which had prevented her closing her eyes all night and kept her weeping and watching in her chamber. Still worse and more trying was the necessity of rending herself agreeable to Mrs. Witterly, who, being in low spirits after the fatigue of the preceding night, of course expected her companion, 
else wherefore had she board and salary, to be in the best spirits possible. As to Mr. Witterly, he went about all day in a tremor of delight at having shaken hands with a lord, and having actually asked him to come and see him in his own house. The lord himself, not being troubled to any inconvenient extent with the power of thinking, regaled himself with the conversation of Messrs. Pike and Pluck, who sharpened their wit by a plentiful indulgence in various costly stimulants at his expense. It was four in the afternoon, that is, the vulgar afternoon of the sun and the clock, and Mrs. Witterly reclined, according to custom, on the drawing-room sofa, while Kate read aloud a new novel in three volumes entitled The Lady Flabella, which Alphonse, the doubtful, had procured from the library that very morning. And it was a production admirably suited to a lady labouring under Mrs. Witterly's complaint, seeing that there was not a line in it from beginning to end which could, by the most remote contingency, awaken the smallest excitement in any person breathing. Kate read on. Cherissez, said the Lady Flabella, inserting her mouse-like feet in the blue satin slippers which had unwittingly occasioned the half-playful, half-angry altercation between herself and the youthful Colonel Belfilière in the Duke of Mincefenil Salon de Danse on the previous night. Charité, mon cher, donnez-moi de l'eau de clone, s'il vous plaît, mon enfant. Merci, thank you, said the Lady Flabella, as the lively but devoted Charité plentifully besprinkled with the fragrant compound, the Lady Flabella's mouchoir of the finest cambric, edged with richest lace and emblazoned at the four corners with the Flabella crest and gorgeous heraldic bearings of that noble family, Merci, that will do. At that instant, while the Lady Flabella yet inhaled that delicious fragrance by holding the mouchoir to her exquisite but thoughtfully chiselled nose, the door of the boudoir, artfully concealed by rich hangings of silken damask, the hue of Italy's firmament, was thrown open, and with noiseless tread to valet de chambre, clad in sumptuous liveries of peach blossom and gold, advanced into the room followed by a page in bas de soie, silk stockings, who, while they remained at some distance making the most graceful obeisance, advanced to the feet of his lovely mistress, and dropping on one knee, presented on a golden salver gorgeously chased a scented billet. The Lady Flabella, with an agitation she could not repress, hastily tore off the envelope, and broke the scented seal. It was Bilfier, the young, the slim, the low-voiced, her own Bilfier. Oh, charming, interrupted Kate's patroness, who was sometimes taken literally, poetic, really. Read that description again, Miss Nickleby. Kate complied. Sweet indeed, said Miss Witterly, with a sigh. So voluptuous, is it not? So soft. "'Yes, I think it is,' replied Kate gently. "'Very soft.' "'Close the book, Miss Nickleby,' said Miss Witterly. "'I can hear nothing more to-day. "'I should be sorry to disturb the impression of that sweet description. "'Close the book.' "'Kate complied not unwittingly, and as she did so, Mrs. Witterly, "'raising her glass with a languid hand, remarked that she looked pale. "'It was the fright of that, that noise and confusion last night,' said Kate. "'How very odd!' exclaimed Mrs. Witterly, with a look of surprise, and certainly, when one comes to think of it, it was very odd that anything should have disturbed a companion. A steam engine or other ingenious piece of mechanism out of order would have been nothing to it. How did you come to know Lord Frederick and the other delightful creatures, child? asked Mrs. Witterly, still eyeing Kate through her glass. I met them at my uncle's, said Kate, vexed to feel that she was colouring deeply, but unable to keep down the blood which rushed to her face whenever she thought of that man. "'Have you known them long?' "'No,' rejoined Kate, "'not long. I was very glad of the opportunity which that respectable person, your mother, gave us of being known to them,' said Mrs. Witterly, in a lofty manner. "'Some friends of ours were on the very point of introducing us, which makes it quite remarkable.' 
This was said lest Miss Nickleby should grow conceited on the honour and dignity of having known four great people, for Pike and Pluck were included among the delightful creatures who Mrs. Witterly did not know. But as the circumstance had made no impression one way or the other upon Kate's mind, the force of the observation was quite lost upon her. "'They asked permission to call,' said Mrs. Witterly. "'I gave it to them, of course.' "'Do you expect them to-day?' Kate ventured to inquire. Mrs. Witterly's answers was lost, in the noise of a tremendous rapping at the street door, and, before it had ceased to vibrate, there drove up a handsome cabriolet, out of which leaped Sir Mulberry Hawk and his friend Lord Frederick. "'They are here now,' said Kate, rising and hurrying away. "'Miss Nickleby!' cried Mrs. Witterly, perfectly aghast at the companions attempting to quit the room without her permission first had been obtained. "'Pray don't think of going.' "'You are very good,' replied Kate, "'but for goodness' sake don't agitate me by making me speak so much,' said Mrs. Witterly, with great sharpness. "'Dear me, Miss Nickleby, I beg!' It was in vain for Kate to protest that she was unwell, for the footsteps of the knockers, whoever they were, were already on the stairs. She resumed her seat, and had scarcely done so, when the doubtful page darted into the room and announced, Mr. Pike and Mr. Pluck, and Lord Frederick Verschbott, and Sir Mulberry Hawk, all in at one burst. The most extraordinary thing in the world, said Pluck, saluting both ladies with the utmost cordiality, the most extraordinary thing. As Lord Frederick and Sir Mulberry drove up to the door, Pike and I had that instant knocked. That instant knocked, said Pike. No matter how you came, so that you are here, said Mrs. Witterly, who, by dint of lying on the same sofa for three years and a half, had got up a little pantomime of graceful attitudes, and now threw herself into the most striking of the series to astonish the visitors. I am delighted, I am sure." "'And how is Miss Nickleby?' said Sir Mulberry Hawk, accosting Kate in a low voice, not so low, however, but that it reached the ears of Mrs. Witterly. "'Why, she complains of suffering from the fright last night,' said the lady. "'I am sure I don't wonder at it, for my nerves are quite torn to pieces.' "'And yet you look,' observed Sir Mulberry, turning around, "'and yet you look beyond everything,' said Mr. Pike, coming to his patron's assistance, of course, Mr. Pluck said the same. I am afraid Sir Mulberry is a flatterer, my lord, said Mrs. Witterly, turning to that young gentleman who had been sucking the head of his cane in silence and staring at Kate. Oh, devilish, replied the lord, having given utterance to which remarkable sentiment he occupied himself as before. Neither does Miss Nickleby look the worse, said Sir Mulberry, bending his bold gaze upon her. She was always handsome, but upon my soul, ma'am, you seem to have imparted some of your own good looks to her besides. To judge from the glow which suffused the poor girl's countenance after this speech, Mrs. Witterly might, with some slow of reason, have been supposed to have imparted to it some of that artificial bloom which decorated her own. Mrs. Witterly admitted, though not with the best grace in the world, that Kate did look pretty. She began to think, too, that Sir Mulberry was not quite so agreeable a creature as she had at first supposed him, for although a skilful flatterer is a most delightful companion if you can keep him all to yourself, his taste becomes very doubtful when he takes to complimenting other people. Pike, said the watchful Mr. Pluck, observing the effect which the praise of Mrs. Nickleby had produced. Well, Pluck, said Pike. Is there anybody, demanded Mr. Pluck mysteriously, anybody you know, whom Mrs. Wittersley's profile reminds you of? Reminds me of, answered Pike. Of course there is. Who do you mean, said Pluck, in the same mysterious manner? The D of B? The C of B, replied Pike, with the faintest trace of a grin lingering in his countenance. The beautiful sister is the Countess, not the Duchess. True, said Pluck. The C of B. The resemblance is wonderful. "'Perfectly startling,' said Mr. Pike. "'Here was the state of things. "'Mrs. Witterly was declared, upon the testimony of two voracious and competent witnesses, "'to be the very picture of a countess. "'This was one of the consequences of getting into good society. "'Why, she might have moved among groveling people for twenty years and never heard of it. "'How could she, indeed, 
what did they know about countesses the two gentlemen having by the greediness with which this little bait was swallowed tested the extent of mrs Witterly's appetite for adulation proceeded to administer that commodity in very large doses thus affording to sir Marbury hawk an opportunity of pestering miss nickleby with questions and remarks to which she was absolutely obliged to make some reply meanwhile lord frederick enjoyed unmolested the full flavour of the gold knob at the top of his cane as he would have done to the end of the interview if mr Witterly had not come home and caused the conversation to turn to his favourite topic my lord said mr Witterly, i am delighted honoured proud be seated again my lord pray i am proud indeed most proud it was to the secret annoyance of his wife that mr Witterly said all this for although she was bursting with pride and arrogance the illustrious guests believed that their visit was quite a common occurrence and that they had lords and baronets to see them every day in the week but mr Witterly's feelings were beyond the power of suppression it is an honour indeed said mr Witterly. julia my soul will you suffer for this to-morrow suffer cried lord frederick the reaction my lord the reaction said mr Witterly. this violent strain upon the nervous system over my lord what ensues a sinking a depression a lowness a lassitude a debility my lord of sir tumley snuffham was to see that delicate creature in this moment he would not give a a a this for her life in illustration which remark mr Witterly took a pinch of snuff from his box and jerked it lightly into the air as an emblem of instability not that said mr Witterly, looking about him with a serious countenance sir tumley snuffham would not give that for mrs Witterly's existence mr Witterly told this with a kind of sober exultation as if it were no trifling distinction for a man to have a wife in such a desperate state and mrs Witterly sighed and looked on as if she felt an honour but had determined to bear it as meekly as might be mrs Witterly said her husband is sir tumley snuffin's favourite patient i believe i may venture to say that mrs Witterly is the first person who took the new medicine which is supposed to have destroyed a family in kensington gravel pits i believe she was if i am wrong julia my dear you will correct me i believe i was says mrs Witterly in a faint voice as there appeared to be some doubt in the mind of the patron how he could best join in this conversation the indefatigable mr pyke threw himself on to the breach and by way of saying something to the point inquired with reference to the aforesaid medicine whether it was nice no sir it was not it had not even that recommendation said mr w mrs Witterly is quite a martyr observed pyke with a complimentary bow i think i am said mrs Witterly, smiling i think you are my dear julia replied her husband in a tone which seemed to say that he was not vain but still must insist upon their privileges if anybody my lord added mr Witterly, wheeling round to the nobleman will produce to me a greater martyr than mrs Witterly, all i can say is that i shall be glad to see that martyr whether male or female that is all my lord pike and pluck promptly remarked that certainly nothing could be fairer than that and the call having been by the time protracted to the very length they obeyed sir mulberry's look and rose to go this brought sir mulberry himself and lord frederick to their legs also many protestations of friendship and expressions anticipative of the pleasure which must inevitably flow from so happy an acquaintance were exchanged and the visitors departed with renewed assurances that at all times and seasons the mansion of the Witterlys would be honoured by receiving them beneath its roof that they came at all times and seasons that they dined there one day supped the next dined again on the next and were constantly to and fro on all that they made parties to visit public places and met by accident at lounges that upon all these occasions miss nickleby was exposed to the constant and unremitting persecution of sir mulberry hawk who now began to feel his character even in the estimation of his two dependents involved in a successful reduction of her pride that she had no intervals of peace or rest except at those hours when she could sit in her solitary room and weep over the trials of the day 
all these were consequences naturally flowing from the well-laid plans of Sir Mulberry, and their able execution by the auxiliaries Pike and Pluck. And thus, for a fortnight, matters went on. That any but the weakest and silliest of people could have seen in one interview that Lord Frederick very soft, though he was a lord, and Sir Mulberry Hawk, though he was a baronet, were not persons accustomed to be the best possible companions, and were certainly not calculated by habits, manners, tastes, or conversation to shine with any very great luster in the society of ladies, need scarcely be remarked, but with Mrs. Witterly, the two titles were all sufficient. Coarseness became humour, vulgarity softened itself down into the most charming eccentricity, insolence took the guise of an easy absence of reserve, attainable only by those who had had the good fortune to mix with high folks. If the mistress put such a construction upon the behaviour of her new friends, what could the companion urge against them? If they accustomed themselves to very little restraint before the lady of the house, with how much more freedom could they address her paid dependent? Nor was this the worst, as the odious Sir Mulberry Hawk attached himself to Kate with less and less disguise, Mrs. Witterly began to grow jealous of the superior attraction of Miss Nickleby. If this feeling had led to her banishment from the drawing-room when such company was there, Kate would have been only too happy and willing that it should have existed. But unfortunately for her she possessed that native grace and true gentility of manner, and those thousand nameless accomplishments which give to female society its greatest charm. If these be valuable anywhere, they were especially so, where the lady of the house was a mere animated doll. The consequence was that Kate had the double mortification of being an indispensable part of the circle, when Sir Mulberry and his friends were there, and of being exposed, on that very account, to all Miss Witterly's ill-humoured and caprices, when they were gone. She became utterly and completely miserable. Mrs. Witterly never thrown off the mask with regard to Sir Mulberry, but when she was more than usually out of temper, attributed the circumstance, as ladies sometimes do, to nervous indisposition. However, as this dreadful idea that Lord Frederick, very soft, also was somewhat taken with Kate, and that she, Mrs. Witterly, was quite a secondary person, dawned upon that lady's mind and gradually developed itself. She became possessed with a large quantity of highly popular and most virtuous indignation, and felt it her duty as a married lady and a moral member of the society to mention the circumstance to the young person without delay. Accordingly, Mrs. Witterly broke ground next morning during a pause in the novel reading. "'Miss Nickleby,' said Mrs. Witterly, "'I wish to speak to you very gravely. I'm sorry to have to do it upon my word. I'm very sorry, but you leave me no alternative, Miss Nickleby.' Here Mrs. Witterly tossed her head, not passionately, only virtuously, and remarked, with some appearance of excitement, that she feared that palpitation of the heart was coming on again. "'Your behaviour, Miss Nickleby,' resumed the lady, "'is very far from pleasing me, very far. "'I am very anxious indeed that you should do well, "'but you may depend on it, Miss Nickleby. "'You will not, if you go on as you do.' "'Ma'am,' exclaimed Kate proudly, "'don't agitate me by speaking in that way, Miss Nickleby. "'Don't,' said Mrs. Witterly with some violence, "'or you'll compel me to ring the bell.' "'Kate looked at her, but said nothing.' "'You needn't suppose,' resumed Miss, Mrs. Witterly, "'that your looking at me at that way, "'Miss Nickleby will prevent my saying what I am going to say, "'which I feel to be a religious duty. "'You needn't direct your glances toward me,' said Mrs. Witterly, "'with a sudden burst of spite. "'I am not Sir Mulberry, no, nor Sir Frederick, very soft, Miss Nickleby, "'nor am I Mr. Pike, nor Mr. Pluck, either.' Kate looked at her again, but less steadily than before, and, resting her elbow on the table, covered her eyes with her hand. "'If such things had been done when I was a young girl,' said Mrs. Witterly, this, by way, must have been some little time before, "'I don't suppose anybody would have believed it.' "'I don't think they would,' murmured Kate. 
I do not think anybody would, would believe, without actually knowing it, what I seemed doomed to undergo. Don't talk to me of being doomed to undergo, Miss Nickleby, if you please, said Mrs. Witterly, with a shrillness of tone, quite surprising in so great an invalid. I will not be answered, Miss Nickleby. I am not accustomed to be answered, nor will I permit it for an instant. Do you hear? She added, waiting with some apparent inconsistency for an answer. I do hear you, ma'am, replied Kate, with a surprise and with greater surprise than I can express. I have always considered you a particularly well-behaved young person for your station in life, said Mrs. Witterly, and, as you are a person of healthy appearance and neat in your dress and so forth, I have taken an interest in you, as I do still, considering that I owe a sort of duty to that respectable old female, your mother. For these reasons, Miss Nickleby, I must tell you once and for all, and begging you to mind what I say, that I must insist upon your immediately altering your very forward behaviour to the gentlemen who visit at this house. It really is not becoming, said Mrs. Witterly, closing her chaste eyes as she spoke. It is improper, quite improper. Oh! cried Kate, looking upwards and clasping her hands. Is not this, is not this too cruel, too hard to bear? Is it not enough that I should have suffered, as I have, night and day, that I should have sunk in my own estimation from very shame of having been brought into contact with such people, but I must also be exposed to this unjust and most unfounded charge? You will have the goodness to recollect, Miss Nickleby, said Mrs. Witterly, that when you use such terms as unjust and unfounded, you charge me, in effect, with stating that which is untrue, said Kate, with honest indignation. Whether you make this accusation of yourself, or at the promoting of others, is alike to me. I say it is vilely, grossly, willfully untrue. It is possible, cried Kate, that any one of my own sex can have sat by and not have seen the misery of these men have caused me. It is possible that you, ma'am, can have been present and failed to mark the insulting freedom that their every look bespoke. It is possible that you can have avoided seeing that these libertines in their utter disrespect for you and utter disregard of all gentlemanly behavior and almost of decency have had but one object in introducing themselves here, and that the furtherance of their designs upon the friendless, helpless girl who without this humiliating confession might have hoped to receive from one so much her senior something like womanly aid and sympathy? I do not, I cannot believe it. If poor Kate had possessed the slightest knowledge of the world, she certainly would not have ventured, even in the excitement into which she had been lashed, upon such an injudicious speech as this. Its effect was precisely what a more experienced observer would have foreseen. Mrs. Witterly received the attack upon her veracity with exemplary calmness, and listened with the most heroic fortitude to Kate's account of her own sufferings. But allusion being made to her being held in disregard by the gentleman, she evinced a violent emotion, and this blow was no sooner followed up by the remark concerning her seniority that she fell back upon the sofa, uttering dismal screams. "'What is the matter?' cried Mr. Witterly, bouncing into the room. "'Heavens, what do I see? Julia! Julia, look up! My life, look up!' But Julia looked down, most perseveringly, and screamed still louder. So Mr. Witterly rang the bell and danced in a frenzied manner round the sofa on which Mrs. Witterly lay, uttering perpetual cries for Sir Tumley Snuffham, and never once leaving off to ask for any explanation of the scene before him. "'Run for Sir Tumley!' cried Mr. Witterly, menacing the page with both fists. "'I knew it, Miss Nickleby,' he said, looking around with an air of melancholy triumph. "'That society has been too much for her. "'This is all soul, you know, every bit of it.' With this assurance, Mr. Witterly took up the prostrate form of Mrs. Witterly and carried her bodily off to bed. Kate waited until Sir Tumley Snuffham had paid his visit and looked in with a report that— through the special interposition of a merciful providence, thus spake Sir Tumley, Mrs. Witterly had gone to sleep. She then hastily attired herself for walking, and leaving word 
that she should return within a couple of hours, hurried away toward her uncle's house. It had been a good day with Ralph Nickleby, quite a lucky day, as he walked to and fro in his little back room, with his hands clasped behind him, adding up in his own mind all the sums that had been, or would be, netted from the business done since this morning, his mouth was drawn into a hard, stern smile, while the firmness of the lines and curves that made it up, as well as the cunning glance of his cold, bright eye, seemed to tell that if any resolution or cunning would increase the profits, they would not fail to be exerted for the purpose. "'Very good,' said Ralph, in allusion, no doubt, to some proceeding of the day. "'He defies the usurer, does he?' "'Well, we shall see.' "'Honesty is the best policy, is it? "'We'll try that, too.' "'He stopped and then walked on again. "'He is content,' said Ralph, relaxing into a smile, "'to set his known character and conduct against the power of money. "'Dross, as he calls it. "'Why, what a dull blockhead this fellow must be. "'Dross, too, dross. Who's that?' "'Me,' said Newman Noggs, looking in. "'Your niece.' "'What of her?' asked Ralph sharply. "'She's here.' "'Here?' Newman jerked his head toward the little room to signify that she was waiting there. "'What does she want?' asked Ralph. "'I don't know,' rejoined Newman. "'Shall I ask?' he added quickly. "'No,' replied Ralph. "'Show her in. Stay.' He hastily put away a padlock cash-box that was on the table and substituted it instead an empty purse. "'There,' said Ralph. "'Now she may come in.' Newman, with a grim smile at this manoeuvre, beckoned the young lady to advance, and having placed a chair for her, retired, looking stealthily over his shoulder at Ralph as he limped slowly out. Well, said Ralph, roughly enough, but still with something more of kindness in his manner than he would have exhibited toward anybody else. Well, my dear, well, what now? Kate raised her eyes, which were filled with tears, and with an effort to master her emotion strove to speak, but in vain. So drooping her head again, she remained silent. Her face was hidden from his view, but Ralph could see that she was weeping. "'I can guess the cause of this,' thought Ralph, after looking at her for some time in silence. "'I can, I can guess the cause.' "'Well, well,' thought Ralph, for the moment quite disconcerted, as he watched the anguish of his beautiful niece. "'Where is the harm?' Only a few tears, and it's an excellent lesson for her, an excellent lesson. "'What is the matter?' asked Ralph, drawing a chair opposite and sitting down. He was rather taken aback by the sudden firmness with which Kate looked up and answered him. "'The matter which brings me to you, sir,' she said, "'is one which should call the blood up into your cheeks and make you burned here, as it does me to tell. I have been wronged. My feelings have been outraged, insulted.' "'wounded past all healing, and by your friends.' "'Friends?' cried Ralph sternly. "'I have no friends, girl.' "'By the men I saw here, then,' returned Kate quickly. "'If they were no friends of yours, and you knew what they were, "'oh, the more shame on you, uncle, for bringing me among them, "'to have subjected me to what I was exposed to here "'through any misplaced confidence or imperfect knowledge of your guests, "'would have required some strong excuse.' But if you did it, as I now believe you did, knowing them well, it was most dastardly and cruel. Ralph drew back in utter amazement at this plan, speaking, and regarded Kate with the sternest look. But she met his gaze proudly and firmly, and although her face was very pale, it looked more noble and handsome, lighted up as it was, than it had ever appeared before. "'There is some of that boy's blood in you, I see,' said Ralph, speaking in his harshest tones, as something in the flashing eye that reminded him of Nicholas at their last meeting. "'I hope there is,' replied Kate. "'I should be proud to know it. I am young, uncle, and all the difficulties and miseries of my situation have kept it down, but I have been roused to-day beyond all endurance, and come what may I will not, as I am your brother's child, bear these insults longer.' "'What insults, girl?' demanded Ralph sharply. "'Remember what took place here, and ask yourself,' replied Kate, colouring deeply. "'Uncle, you must, I am sure you will, release me from such vile and degrading companionship as I am exposed to now.' 
I do not mean, said Kate, hurrying to the old man and laying her arm upon his shoulder, I do not mean to be angry and violent. I beg your pardon if I have seemed so, dear uncle. But you do not know what I have suffered. You do not indeed. You cannot tell what the heart of a young girl is. I have no right to expect you should. But when I tell you that I am wretched and that my heart is breaking, I am sure you will help me. I am sure, I am sure you will. Ralph looked at her for an instant, then turned his head away and beat his foot nervously upon the ground. I have gone on day after day, said Kate, bending over him and timidly placing her little hand in his, in the hope that this persecution would cease. I have gone on day after day, compelled to assume the appearance of cheerfulness, when I was most unhappy. I have had no counsellor, no adviser, no one to protect me. Mama supposes that these are honourable men, rich and distinguished, and how can I, how can I undeceive them? When she is so happy in these little delusions, which are the only happiness she has, the lady with whom you placed me is not the person to whom you could confine matters of so much delicacy, and I have come at last to you, the only friend I have at hand, almost the only friend I have at all, to entreat and implore you to assist me. How can I assist you, child? said Ralph, rising from his chair and play, pacing up and down the room in, in his old attitude. You have influence with one of these men, I know, rejoined Kate emphatically. Would not a word from you induce them to desist from this unmanly course? No, said Ralph, suddenly turning. At least that I can't say, if it would. Can't say it? No, said Ralph, coming to a dead stop and clasping his hands more tightly behind him. I can't say it. Kate fell back in a step or two and looked at him as if in doubt whether she had heard aright. We are connected in business, said Ralph, poising himself alternately on his toes and heels and looking coolly in his niece's face. In business, and I can't afford to offend them. What is it, after all? We have all our trials, and this is one of yours. Some girls would be proud to have such gallants at their feet. Proud? cried Kate. I don't say, rejoined Ralph, raising his finger, but that you do right to despise them. No, you show your good sense in that. And indeed, I knew from the first you would. Well, in all other respects you are comfortably bestowed. It's not much to bear. If this young lord does dog your footsteps and whisper his driveling inanities in your ears, what of it? It's a dishonorable passion. So be it. It won't last long. Some other novelty will spring up one day, and you will be released. In the meantime... In the meantime, interrupted Kate, with becoming pride and indignation, I am to be the scorn of my own sex, and the toy of the other, justly condemned by all women of right feeling, and despised by all honest and honorable men, sunken in my own esteem, and degraded in every eye that looks upon me. No, not if I work my fingers to the bone, not if I am driven to the roughest and hardest labor. Do not mistake me. I will not disgrace your recommendation. I will remain in the house in which it placed me, until I am entitled to leave it by the terms of my engagement, though, mind, I see these men no more. When I quit it, I will hide myself from them and you, and striving to support my mother by hard service, I will live at least in peace and trust in God to help me. With these words, she waved her hand and quitted the room, leaving Ralph Nickleby mo motionless as a statue. The surprise with which Kate, as she closed the room door, beheld close behind it, Newman Nogg standing bolt upright in a little niche in the wall, like some scarecrow or guy foe, lay in the winter quarters, almost occasioned her to call aloud. But Newman, laying his finger upon his lips, she had the presence of mind to refrain. Don't, said Newman, gliding out of the recess and accompanying her across the hall. Don't cry, don't cry. Two very large tears, by the by, were running down Newman's face as he spoke. "'I see how it is,' said poor Noggs, drawing from his pocket what seemed to be a very old duster, and wiping Kate's eyes with it as gently as if she were an infant. "'You're giving way now.' "'Yes, yes, very good. That's right. I like it. It was right not to give way before him. Yes, yes. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, yes, poor thing.' 
and these disjointed exclamations, Newman wiped his own eyes with the aforementioned duster, and limply to the street door opened it to let her out. "'Don't cry any more,' whispered Newman. "'I shall see you soon, ha, 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 and so shall somebody else, too. Yes, yes, ho, ho.' "'God bless you,' answered Kate, hurrying out. "'God bless you.' "'Same to you,' rejoined Newman, opening the door again, and a little way, to say, "'Ha, ha, ha, ho, ho, ho.' and Newman Noggs opened the door once again to nod cheerfully and laugh, and shut it and shake his head mournfully and cry. Ralph remained in the same attitude till he heard the noise of the closing door. When he shrugged his shoulders, and after a few turns about the room, hasty at first but gradually becoming slower, as he relapsed into himself, sat down before his desk. It is one of those problems of human nature which may be noted down, but not solved although Ralph felt no remorse at that moment for his conduct toward the innocent, true-hearted girl, although his libertine clients had done precisely what he had expected, precisely what he most wished, and precisely what would tend most to his advantage, still he hated them for doing it, from the very bottom of his soul. "'Ugh!' said Ralph, scowling round and shaking his clenched hand as the faces of the two profligates rose up before his mind. You shall pay for this. Oh, you shall pay for this. As the usurer turned for consolation to his books and paper, a performance was going on outside his office door, which would have occasioned him no small surprise, if he could by any means have become acquainted with it. Newman Noggs was the sole actor. He stood at a little distance from the door, with his face toward it, and with the sleeves of his coat turned back at the wrists was occupied in bestowing the most vigorous, scientific, and straightforward blows upon the empty air. At first the sight would have appeared merely a wise precaution in a man of sedentary habits, with the view of opening the chest and strengthening the muscles of the arms, but the intense eagerness and joy depicted in the face of Newman Noggs, which was suffused with perspiration, the surprising energy with which he directed a constant succession of blows toward a particular panel about five feet eight from the ground, and still worked away in the most untiring and persevering manner, would have sufficiently explained to the attentive observer that his imagination was thrashing to within an inch of its life, his body's most active employer, Mr. Ralph Nickleby. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. This recording by Patty Brugman. Chapter twenty nine of Nicholas Nickleby of the proceedings of Nicholas and certain internal divisions in the company of Mr. Vincent Crummles. The unexpected success and favour with which his experiment at Portsmouth had been received induced Mr. Crummles to prolong his stay in that town for a fortnight beyond the period he had originally assigned for the duration of his visit, during which time Nicholas personated a vast variety of characters with undiminished success, and attracted so many people to the theatre, who had never been seen there before, that a benefit was considered by the manager a very promising speculation. Nicholas assenting to the terms proposed, the benefit was had, and by it he realized no less than a sum of twenty pounds. Possessed of this unexpected wealth, his first act was to enclose to honest John Brodie the amount of his friendly loan, which he accompanied with many expressions of gratitude and esteem, and many cordial wishes for his matrimonial happiness. To Newman Noggs he forwarded one half of the sum he had realized, entreating him to take an opportunity of handing it to Kate in secret, and conveying to her the warmest assurances of his love and affection. He made no mention of the way in which he had employed himself, merely informing Newman that a letter addressed to him under his assumed name at the post office, Portsmouth, would readily find him and entreating that worthy friend to write full particulars of the situation of his mother and sister, 
and an account of all the grand things that Ralph Nickleby had done for them since his departure from London. "'You are out of spirits,' said Smike, on the night after the letter had been dispatched. "'Not I,' rejoined Nicholas, with assumed gaiety, for the confession would have made the boy miserable all night. "'I was thinking about my sister, Smike.' "'Sister? Eh? Hey. Is she like you?' inquired Smike. "'Why, so they say,' replied Nicholas, laughing. "'Only a great deal handsomer.' "'She must be very beautiful,' said Smike, after thinking a little while, with his hands folded together and his eyes bent upon his friend. "'Anybody who didn't know you well as I do, my dear fellow, would say that you were an accomplished courtier,' said Nicholas. "'I don't even know what that is,' replied Smike, shaking his head. "'Shall I ever see your sister?' "'To be sure,' cried Nicholas. "'We shall all be together one of these days when we are rich, Smike.' "'How is it you, who are so kind and good to me, have nobody to be kind to you?' asked Smike. "'I cannot make that out.' "'Oh, why, it is a long story,' replied Nicholas, "'and one you would have some difficulty in comprehending, I fear. "'I have an enemy. You understand what that is?' "'Oh, yes, I understand that,' said Smike. "'Well, it is owing to him,' returned Nicholas. "'He is rich and not so easily punished as your old enemy, Mr. Squeers.' He is my uncle, but he is a villain, and he has done me wrong. Has he, though? asked Smike, bending forward eagerly. What is his name? Tell me his name. Ralph. Ralph Nickleby. Ralph Nickleby, repeated Smike. Ralph. I'll get that name by heart. He had muttered it over to himself some twenty times, when a loud knock at the door disturbed him from his occupation. Before he could open it, Mr. Folair the pantomimist, thrust in his head. Mr. Folair's head was usually decorated with a very round hat, unusually high in the crown, and curled up quite tight in the brims. On the present occasion he wore it very much on one side, with the back part forward, in consequence of its being the least rusty. Round his neck he wore a flaming red worsted comforter, whereof the straggling ends peeped out beneath his threadbare Newmarket coat, which was very tight and buttoned all the way up. He carried in one hand one very dirty glove and a cheap dress cane with a glass handle. In short, his whole appearance was unusually dashing and demonstrated a far more scrupulous attention to his toilet than he was in the habit of bestowing upon it. "'Good evening, sir,' said Mr. Folair, taking off the tall hat and running his fingers through his hair. "'I bring a communication—' <clears throat> "'From whom, and what about?' inquired Nicholas. "'You are unusually mysterious to-night.' "'Cold, perhaps,' returned Mr. Folair. "'Cold, perhaps. "'That is the fault of my position, not of myself, Mr. Johnson. "'My position as a mutual friend requires it.' Mr. Folair paused with a most impressive look, and, diving into the hat before noticed, drew from thence a small piece of whitey-brown paper curiously folded, whence he brought forth a note— which it had served to keep clean, and handing it over to Nicholas, said, "'Have the goodness to read that, sir.' Nicholas, in a state of much amazement, took the note and broke the seal, glancing at Mr. Folair as he did so, who, knitting his brow and pursing up his mouth with great dignity, was sitting with his eyes steadily fixed upon the ceiling. It was directed to blank Johnson, E.S.Q., by favour of Augustus Folair, E.S.Q., and the astonishment of Nicholas was in no degree lessened when he found it to be couched in the following laconic terms. Mr. Lenville presents his kind regards to Mr. Johnson, and will feel obliged if he will inform him at what hour tomorrow morning it will be most convenient to him to meet Mr. L. at the theatre for the purpose of having his nose pulled in the presence of the company. Mr. Lenville requests Mr. Johnson not to neglect making an appointment as he has invited two or three professional friends to witness the ceremony, and cannot disappoint them on any account whatever. Portsmouth, Tuesday night. Indignant as he was at this impertinence, there was something so exquisitely absurd in search of a cartel of defiance that Nicholas was obliged to bite his lip and read the note over two or three times before he could muster sufficient gravity and sternness to address the hostile messenger who had not taken his eyes from the ceiling, nor altered the expression of his face in the slightest degree. "'Do you know the contents of this note, sir?' he asked at length. 
"'Yes,' rejoined Mr. Folair, looking round for an instant, and immediately carrying his eyes back to the ceiling. "'And how dare you bring it here, sir?' asked Nicholas, tearing it into little pieces and jerking it in a shower towards the messenger. "'Had you no fear of being kicked downstairs, sir?' Mr. Folair turned his head now, ornamented with several fragments of the note, toward Nicholas, and with the same imperturbable dignity briefly replied, "'No.' Then, said Nicholas, taking up the tall hat and tossing it toward the door, you had better follow that article of your dress, sir, or you may find yourself very disagreeably deceived, and that within a dozen seconds. I say, Johnson, remonstrated Mr. Folair, suddenly losing his dignity, none of that you know, no tricks with the gentleman's wardrobe. Leave the room, returned Nicholas. How could you presume to come here on such an errand, you scoundrel? "'Poo-poo,' said Mr. Folair, unwinding his comforter and gradually letting himself out of it. "'There, that's enough.' "'Enough?' cried Nicholas, advancing toward him. "'Take yourself off, sir.' "'Poo-poo, I tell you,' returned Mr. Folair, waving his hand in deprecation of any further wrap. "'I wasn't in earnest. I only brought it as a joke.' "'You had better be careful how you indulge in such jokes again,' said Nicholas, "'or you may find an allusion to pulling noses rather a dangerous reminder "'for the subject of your facetiousness. "'Was it written in joke, too, pray?' "'No, no, that's the best of it,' returned the actor. "'Right down, earnest, honour bright.' "'Nicholas could not repress a smile at the odd figure before him, "'which at all times more calculated to provoke mirth than anger, was especially so at that moment, when, with one knee upon the ground, Mr. Forlair twirled his old hat upon his head and effected the extremest agony, lest any of the nap should have been knocked off, an ornament which is almost superfluous to say it had not boasted for many months. "'Come, sir,' said Nicholas, laughing in spite of himself, "'have the goodness to explain.' "'Why, well, I'll tell you how it is,' said Mr. Folair, sitting himself down in a chair with great coolness. Since you came here, Lenville has done nothing but second business, and instead of having a reception every night as he used to have, they have let him come on as if he was nobody. What do you mean by a reception? asked Nicholas. Jupiter! exclaimed Mr. Folair. What an unsophisticated shepherd you are, Johnson! Why, applause from the house when you first came on! So he has gone on night after night, never getting a hand, and you getting a couple of rounds at least, and sometimes three till at length he got quite desperate, and had half a mind last night to play Tybalt with a real sword and pink you. Not dangerously, but just enough to lay you up for a month or two. Very considerate, remarked Nicholas. Yes, I think it was under the circumstances, his professional reputation being at stake, said Mr. Folair quite seriously. But his heart failed him, and he cast about for some other way of annoying you, and making himself popular at the same time, for that's the point. Notoriety, notoriety is the thing. Bless you if he had pinked you, said Mr. Folair, stopping to make a calculation in his mind. It would have been worth, uh, it would have been worth eight or ten shillings a week to him. All the town would have come to see the actor who nearly killed a man by mistake. I shouldn't wonder if it had got him an engagement in London. However, he was obliged to try some other mode of getting popular, and this one occurred to him. It's a clever idea, really. If you had shown the white feather and let him pull your nose, he'd have got it into the paper. And if you had sworn the piece against him, it would have been in the paper, too. And he'd have been just as much talked about as you, don't you see? Oh, certainly, rejoined Nicholas, but suppose I were to turn the tables and pull his nose. What then? Would that make his fortune? "'Why, I don't think it would,' replied Mr. Folair, scratching his head, "'because there wouldn't be any romance about it, and he wouldn't be favourably known. "'To tell you the truth, though, he didn't calculate much upon that, "'for you're always so mild-spoken, and are so popular among the women, "'that we didn't suspect you of showing fight. "'If you did, however, he has a way of getting out of it easily, depend upon that.' "'Has he?' rejoined Nicholas. "'We will try to-morrow morning.' In the meantime, you can give whatever account of our interview you like best. Good night. As Mr. Folair was pretty well known among his fellow actors,
for a man who delighted in mischief, and was by no means scrupulous, Nicholas had not much doubt, but that he had secretly prompted the tragedian in the course he had taken, and moreover that he would have carried his mission with a very high hand if he had not been disconcerted by the very unexpected demonstrations with which it had been received. It was not worth his while to be serious with him. However, so he dismissed the pantomimist with a gentle hint that if he offended again it would be under the penalty of a broken head, and Mr. Folliere, taking the caution in exceedingly good part, walked away to confer with his principal, and give such an account of his proceedings as he might think best calculated to carry on the joke. He had no doubt reported that Nicholas was in a state of extreme bodily fear, for when that young gentleman walked with much deliberation down to the theatre next morning at the usual hour, he found all the company assembled in evident expectation, and Mr. Lenville, with his severest stage face, sitting majestically on a table, whistling defiance. Now the ladies were on the side of Nicholas, and the gentlemen, being jealous, were on the side of the disappointed Trigian, so that the latter formed a little group about the redoubtable Mr. Lenville, and the former looked on at a little distance in some trepidation and anxiety. On Nicholas stopping to salute them, Mr. Lenville laughed a scornful laugh and made some general remark touching on the natural history of puppies. "'Oh,' said Nicholas, looking quietly around, "'are you there?' "'Slave,' returned Mr. Lenville, flourishing his right arm and approaching Nicholas with a theatrical stride. But somehow he appeared just at that moment a little startled, as if Nicholas did not look quite so frightened as he has expected." and came all at once to an awkward halt at which the assembled ladies burst into a shrill laugh. "'Object of my scorn and hatred,' said Mr. Linville, "'I hold ye in contempt.' Nicholas laughed in a very unexpected enjoyment of this performance, and the ladies, by way of encouragement, laughed louder than before. Whereat Mr. Linville assumed his bitterest smile, and expressed his opinion that they were minions." "'But they shall not protect ye,' said the Trigian, taking an upward look at Nicholas, beginning at his boots and ending at the crown of his head, and then a downward one, beginning at the crown of his head and ending at his boots, which two looks, as everybody knows, express defiance on the stage. "'They shall not protect ye, boy.' Thus speaking, Mr. Lenville folded his arms and treated Nicholas to that expression of face with which, in melodramatic performances, he was in the habit of regarding the tyrannical kings when they said, Away with him to the deepest dungeon beneath the castle moat, and which, accompanied with a little jingling of fetters, had been known to produce great effect in its time. Whether it was the absence of the fetters or not, it made no very deep impression on Mr. Lenville's adversary, however, but rather seemed to increase the good humour expressed in his countenance, in which stage of the contest one or two gentlemen, who had come at expressly to witness the pulling of Nicholas's nose, grew impatient, murmuring that if it were to be done at all, it had better be done at once, and that if Mr. Lenville didn't mean to do it, he had better say so and not keep them waiting there. Thus urged, the Trigian adjusted the cuff of his right coat sleeve for the performance of the operation, and walked in a very stately manner up to Nicholas, who suffered him to approach to within the requisite distance, and then, without the smallest decomposure, knocked him down. Before the discomfited Trigian could raise his head from the boards, Mrs. Lenville, who, as has been before hinted, was in an interesting state, rushed from the rear rank of ladies, and uttering a piercing scream, threw herself upon the body. "'Do you see this, monster? Do you see this?' cried Mr. Lenville, sitting up and pointing to his prostrate lady, who was holding him very tight around the waist. "'Come,' said Nicholas, nodding his head. "'Apologize for the insolent note you wrote to me last night, and waste no more time in talking.' "'Never!' cried Mr. Lenville. "'Yes, yes, yes!' screamed his wife. "'For my sake, for mine, Lenville, forgo all idle forms unless you would see me a blighted corse at your feet.' This is affecting, said Mr. Lenville, looking around him and drawing the back of his hand across his eyes. The ties of nature are strong. The weak husband and the father, the father that is to be, relents. I apologize. Humbly and submissively, asked Nicholas. 
"'Humbly and submissively,' returned the Tragedian, scowling upward. "'But only to save her, for a time will come.' "'Very good,' said Nicholas. "'I hope Mrs. Lenville may have a good one, "'and when it does come, and you are a father, "'you shall retract it if you have the courage. "'There, be careful, sir, to what lengths your jealousy carries you another time, "'and be careful also, before you venture too far, "'to ascertain your rival's temper.' With this parting advice, Nicholas picked up Mr. Lenville's ash-stick, which had flown out of his hand, and, breaking it in half, threw him the pieces and withdrew, bowing slightly to the spectators as he walked out. The profoundest deference was paid to Nicholas that night, and the people who had been most anxious to have his nose pulled in the morning embraced occasions of taking him aside and telling him, with great feeling, how very friendly they took it that he should have treated that Lenville so properly. He was a most unbearable fellow and on whom they had all, by a remarkable coincidence, at one time or another contemplated the affliction of condign punishment, which they had only been restrained from administering by considerations of mercy. Indeed, to judge from the invariable termination of all these stories, there never was such a charitable and kind-hearted set of people as the male members of Mr. Crummell's company. Nicholas bore his triumph, as he had his success in the little world of the theatre, with the utmost moderation and good humour. The crestfallen Mr. Lenville made an expiring effort to obtain revenge by sending a boy into the gallery to hiss, but he fell a sacrifice to popular indignation and was promptly turned out without having his money back. "'Well, Smike,' said Nicholas, when the first piece was over and he had almost finished dressing to go home, "'is there any letter yet?' "'Yes,' replied Smike. "'I got this one from the post-office.' "'From Newen Noggs,' said Nicholas, casting his eye over the cramped direction. "'It's no easy matter to make his writing out. Let me see, let me see.' By dint of poring over the letter for half an hour, he contrived to make himself master of the contents, which were certainly not of a nature to set his mind at ease. Newman took upon himself to send back the ten pounds, observing that he had ascertained that neither Mrs. Nickleby nor Kate was the a in actual want of money at the moment, and that a time might shortly come when Nicholas might want it more. He entreated him not to be alarmed at what he was about to say. There was no bad news. They were in good health, but he thought circumstances might occur, or were occurring, which would render it absolutely necessary that Kate should have her brother's protection, and if so, Newman said, he would write to him to that effect, either by the next post or the next one but one. Nicholas read this passage very often, and the more he thought of it, the more he began to fear some treachery upon the part of Ralph. Once or twice he felt tempted to repair to London at all hazards without an hour's delay, but a little reflection assured him that if such a step were necessary, Newman would have spoken out and told him so at once. At all events, I should prepare them here for the possibility of my going away suddenly, said Nicholas. I should lose no time in doing that. As the thought occurred to him, he took up his hat and hurried to the green room. Well, Mr. Johnson, said Mrs. Crummles, who was seated there in full regal costume, with the phenomenon as the maiden in her maternal arms, Next week for Ride, then for Winchester, then for— I have some reason to fear, interrupted Nicholas, that before you leave here my career with you will have closed. Closed, cried Mrs. Crummles, raising her hands in astonishment. Closed, cried Miss Nevalici, trembling so much in her tights that she actually laid her hand upon the shoulder of the manageress for support. Why, he don't mean to say he's going, exclaimed Mrs. Grudgeon, making her way toward Mrs. Crummles hoity-toity nonsense. The phenomenon, being of an affectionate nature, and moreover excitable, raised a loud cry, and Mrs. Belvoini and Miss Bravassa actually shed tears. Even the male performers stopped in their conversation and echoed the word, going? Although some among them, and they had been the loudest in their congratulations that day, winked at each other as though they would not be sorry to lose such a favoured rival, an opinion, indeed, which the honest Mr. Follier, who was already dressed for the savage, openly stated in so many words to a demon with whom he was sharing a pot of porter, 
Nicholas briefly said that he feared it would be so, although he could not yet speak with any degree of certainty, and getting away as soon as he could, went home to con Newman's letter once more, and speculate upon it afresh. How trifling all that had been occupying his time and thoughts for many weeks seemed to him during that sleepless night, and how constantly and incessantly present to his imagination was the one idea that Kate, in the midst of some great trouble and distress, might even then be looking, and vainly too, for him. End of chapter 29《Chapter Thirty of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. This recording by Patty Brugman. Nicholas Nickleby, Chapter Thirty. Festivities are held in honor of Nicholas, who suddenly withdraws himself from the society of Mr. Vincent Crummles and his theatrical companions. Mr. Vincent Crummles was no sooner acquainted with the public announcement which Nicholas had made relative to the probability of his shortly ceasing to be a member of the company than he evinced many tokens of grief and consternation, and, in the extremity of his despair, even held out certain vague promises of a speedy improvement not only in the amount of his regular salary, but also in the contingent emoluments appertaining to his authorship. Finding Nicholas bent upon quitting the society, for he had now determined that, even if no further tidings came from Newman, he would at all hazards ease his mind by repairing to London, and ascertaining the exact position of his sister. Mr. Crummles was fain to content himself by calculating the chances of his coming back again, and taking prompt and energetic measures to make the most of him before he went away. "'Let me see,' said Mr. Crummles, taking off his outlaw's wig, the better to arrive at a cool-headed view of the whole case. "'Let me see. This is Wednesday night. We'll have the posters out first thing in the morning, announcing positively your last appearance for tomorrow. "'But perhaps it may not be my last appearance, you know,' said Nicholas." "'Unless I am summoned away, I should be sorry to inconvenience you by leaving before the end of the week.' "'So much the better,' returned Mr. Crummles. "'We can have positively your last appearance on Thursday, re-engagement for one more night on Friday, and yielding to the wishes of numerous influential patrons who were disappointed in obtaining seats on Saturday. "'That ought to bring three very decent houses.' "'Then I am to make three last appearances, am I?' inquired Nicholas, smiling. "'Yes,' rejoined the manager, scratching his head with an air of some vexation. Three is not enough, and it's very bungling and irregular not to have more. "'But if we can't help it, we can't. "'So there's no use in talking. "'A novelty would be very desirable. "'You couldn't sing a comic song on the pony's back, could you?' "'No,' replied Nicholas. "'I couldn't, indeed.' "'It has drawn money before,' said Mr. Crummles, with a look of disappointment. "'What do you think of a brilliant display of fireworks?' "'That it would be rather expensive,' replied Nicholas dryly. Eight pence would do it,' said Mr. Crummles. "'You, on the top of a pair of steps, with the phenomenon in an attitude, "'farewell on a transparency behind, and nine people at the wings with a squib in each hand, all the dozen and a half going off at once. It would be very grand. Awful from the front. Quite awful. As Nicholas appeared by no means impressed with the solemnity of the proposed effect, but, on the contrary, received the proposition in the most irreverent manner, and laughed at it very heartily, Mr. Crummles abandoned the project in its birth, and gloomily observed that they must make up the best bill they could with combats and hornpipes and so stick to the legitimate drama. For the purpose of carrying this object into instant execution, the manager at once repaired to a small dressing-room adjacent, where Mrs. Crummles was then occupied in exchanging the habiliments of a melodramatic 
empress for the ordinary attire of matrons in the nineteenth century, and with the assistance of this lady and the accomplished Mrs. Grudden, who had quite a genius for making out bills, being a great hand at throwing in the notes of admiration, and knowing from long experience exactly where the largest capitals ought to go, he seriously applied himself to the composition of the poster. Hi-ho! sighed Nicholas, as he threw himself back in the prompter's chair, after telegraphing the needful directions to Smike, who had been playing the meagre tailor in the interlude, with one skirt to his coat, and a little pocket-handkerchief with a large hole in it, and a woolen nightcap, and a red nose, and other distinctive marks peculiar to tailors on the stage. Hi-ho! I wish all this were over. Over, Mr. Johnson, repeated a female voice behind him, in a kind of plaintive surprise. It was an ungallant speech, certainly, said Nicholas, looking up to see who the speaker was, and recognizing Miss Snevelecki. I would not have made it if I had known you had been within hearing. "'What a dear that Mr. Digby is,' said Miss Snivellecki, as the tailor went off in the opposite side, at the end of the piece, with great applause. Smike's theatrical name was Digby. "'I'll tell him presently, for his gratification, that you said so,' returned Nicholas. "'Oh, you naughty thing,' rejoined Miss Snivellecki. "'I don't know, though, that I should much mind his knowing my opinions of him. With some other people, indeed, it might be—' Here Miss Snevellecki stopped, as though waiting to be questioned. But no questioning came, for Nicholas was thinking about more serious matters. "'How kind it is of you,' resumed Miss Snevellecki, after a short silence, "'to sit waiting here for him night after night, night after night, no matter how tired you are, and taking so much pains with him, and doing it all with as much delight and readiness as if you were coining gold by it.' "'He well deserves all the kindness I can show him, and a great deal more,' said Nicholas. "'He is the most grateful, single-hearted, affectionate creature that ever breathed.' "'So odd, too,' remarked Miss Snevellecki, isn't he?' "'God help him and those who have made him say so. He is indeed,' rejoined Nicholas, shaking his head. "'He is such a devilish close chap,' said Mr. Foiler, who had come up a little before and now joined in the conversation. "'Nobody can ever get anything out of him.' What should they get out of him? asked Nicholas, turning round with some abruptness. Zooks! What a fire eater you are, Johnson, returned Mr. Folair, pulling up the heel of his dancing shoe. I'm only talking of a natural curiosity of the people here to know what he has been about all his life. Poor fellow, it is pretty plain, I should think, that he has not the intellect to have been about anything of much importance to them or anybody else, said Nicholas. A eh, rejoined the actor, contemplating the effect of his face in the lamp reflector. But that involves the whole question, you know. What question? asked Nicholas. Why, the who he is, and what he is, and how you two, who are so different, came to be such close companions, replied Mr. Folair, delighted with the opportunity of saying something disagreeable. That's in everybody's mouth. "'The everybody of the theatre, I suppose,' said Nicholas contemptuously. "'In it and out of it, too,' replied the actor. "'Why, you know, Lenville says—' "'I thought I had silenced him effectively,' interrupted Nicholas, reddening. "'Perhaps you have,' rejoined the immovable Mr. Folair. "'If you have, he said this before he was silenced. "'Lenville says that you're a regular stick of an actor, "'and that it's only the mystery about you that has caused you to go down— with the people here, and that Crummles keeps it up, for his own sake. The Lendl says he don't believe there's anything at it at all, except your having got into a scrape and ran away from somewhere for doing something or other. Oh, said Nicholas, forcing a smile. That's a part of what he says, added Mr. Folair. I mention it as the friend of both parties, and in strict confidence. I don't agree with him, you know. He says he takes Digby to be more knave than fool. And old Fluggers, who does the heavy business, you know. He says that when he delivered messages at Covent Garden the season before last, there used to be a pickpocket hovering about the coach stand who had exactly the face of Digby, though, as he very properly says, Digby may not have been the same, but only his brother or some near relation. Oh, cried Nicholas again. "'Yes,' said Mr. Folair, with undisturbed calmness. "'That's what they say. 
I thought I'd tell you, because really you ought to know. Oh, here's this blessed phenomenon at last. Ugh, you little imposition. I should like to... Quite ready, my darling. Humbug. Ring up, Mrs. G., and let the favourite wake him. Uttering in a loud voice such of the latter allusions as were complimentary to the unconscious phenomenon, and giving the rest in a confidential aside to Nicholas, Mr. Folair followed the ascent of the curtain with his eyes, regarded with a sneer the reception of Miss Crummles as the maiden, and, falling back a step or two to advance with the better effect, uttered a preliminary howl, and went on, chattering his teeth and brandishing his tin tomahawk, as the Indian savage. So, these are some of the stories they invent about us, and bandy about from mouth to mouth, thought Nicholas. If a man would commit an expiable offence against any society, large or small, let him be successful. They will forgive him any crime but that. You surely don't mind what that malicious creature says, Mr. Johnson, observed Miss Snivellecki in her most winning tones. Not I, replied Nicholas. If I were going to remain here, I might think it worth my while to embroil myself. As it is, let them talk till they are hoarse. But here, added Nicholas, as Smike approached, here comes the subject of a person of their good nature, so let he and I say good night together. No, I will not let either of you say anything of the kind, returned Miss Snevelecki. You must come home and see my mamma, who only came to Portsmouth to-day and is dying to behold you. Led, my dear, persuade Mr. Johnson. Oh, I'm sure, returned Miss Ledbrook with considerable vivaciousness, if you can't persuade him. Miss Ledbrook said no more, but intimate, intimated by dexterous playfulness that if Miss Snivellecki couldn't persuade him, nobody could. Mr. and Mrs. Lillivick have taken lodgings in our house and share our sitting-room for the present, said Miss Snivellecki. Won't that induce you? Surely, returned Nicholas, I can require no possible inducement beyond your invitation. "'Oh, no, I dare say,' rejoined Miss Snivellecki. And Miss Ledrook said, "'Upon my word,' upon which Miss Snivellecki said that Miss Ledrook was a giddy thing, and Miss Ledrook said that Miss Snivellecki should needn't colour up quite so much, and Miss Snivellecki beat Miss Ledrook, and Miss Ledrook beat Miss Snivellecki. "'Come,' said Miss Ledrook, "'it's high time we were there, or we shall have poor Mrs. Snivellecki thinking that you have run away with her daughter, Mr. Johnson.' "'And then we shall have a pretty to-do.' "'Oh, my dear Led,' remonstrated Miss Snevelecki, "'how you do talk.' Miss Ledrook made no answer, but taking Smike's arm in hers, left her friend and Nicholas to follow at their pleasure, which it pleased them, or rather pleased Nicholas, who had no great fancy for a tete-a-tete -tete under the circumstances, to do at once. There were not wanting matters of conversation when they reached the street, for it turned out that Miss Snevellecki had a small basket to carry home, and Miss Ledrook a small bandbox, both containing such minor articles of theatrical costume as the lady performers usually carried to and fro every evening. Nicholas would insist upon carrying the basket, and Miss Snevellecki would insist upon carrying it herself, which gave rise to a struggle, in which Nicholas captured the basket and the bandbox likewise. Then Nicholas said, that he wondered what could possibly be inside the basket, and attempted to peep in, whereat Miss Snevellecki screamed and declared that if she thought he had seen, she was sure that she should faint away. This declaration was followed by a similar attempt on the bandbox, and similar demonstrations on the part of Miss Ledbrook, and then both ladies vowed that they wouldn't move a step further until Nicholas had promised that he wouldn't offer to peep in again. At last Nicholas pledged himself to betray no further curiosity, and they walked on, both ladies giggling very much and declaring they never had seen such a wicked creature in all their born days, never. Lightening the way with such pleasantry as this, they arrived at the tailor's house in no time, and here they made quite a little party, there being present besides Mr. Lillivick and Mrs. Lillivick. Not only Miss Snevellecki's mamma, but her papa also. And an uncommonly fine man Miss Snevellecki's papa was, with a hook nose and a white forehead, and a curly black hair and high cheekbones, and altogether quite a handsome face, only a little pimply as though with drinking. 
He had a very broad chest, had Miss Snevellicci's papa, and he wore a threadbare blue dress coat buttoned with gilt buttons tight across it, and he no sooner saw Nicholas come into the room than he wiped the two forefingers of his right hand in between the two centre buttons, and sticking his other arm gracefully akimbo seemed to say, Now here I am, my buck, and what have you got to say to me? Such was, and in such an attitude sat Miss Snevellicci's papa, who had been in a profession ever since he had first played the ten-year-old imps in the Christmas pantomimes, who could sing a little, dance a little, fence a little, act a little, and do everything a little, but not much, who had been sometimes in the ballet and sometimes in the chorus at every theatre in London, who was always selected in virtue of his figure to play the military visitors and the speechless nobleman, who always wore a smart dress and came on arm in arm with a smart lady in short petticoats, and always did it too with such an air that people in the pit had been several times known to cry out bravo under the impression that he was somebody. Such was Miss Snevellicci's papa, upon whom some envious persons cast the imputation that he occasionally beat Miss Snevellicci's mamma who was still a dancer, with a neat little figure and some remains of good looks, and who now sat as she danced, being rather too old for the full glare of the footlights in the background. To these good people Nicholas was presented with much formality. The introduction being completed, Miss Snevellicki's papa, who was scented with rum and water, said that he was delighted to make the acquaintance of a gentleman so highly talented, and furthermore remarked, that there hadn't been such a hit made, no, not since the first appearance of his friend Mr. Glavermelly at the Coburg. You have seen him, sir, said Miss Snevellicki's papa. No, really, I never did, replied Nicholas. You never saw my friend Glavermelly, sir, said Miss Snevellicki's papa. Then you have never seen acting, sir. If he had lived... Oh, he is dead, is he? interrupted Nicholas. "'He is,' said Mr. Snevellicki. "'But he isn't in Westminster Abbey, more's the shame. "'He was a... well, no matter. "'He is gone to that bourne from whence no traveller returns. "'I hope he is appreciated there.' "'So saying, Miss Snevellicki's papa rubbed the tip of his nose "'with a very yellow silk handkerchief, "'and gave the company to understand that these recollections overcame him. "'Well, Mr. Lillivick, said Nicholas, and how are you?' "'Quite well, sir,' replied the collector. "'There is nothing like the married state, sir, depend upon it.' "'Indeed,' said Nicholas, laughing. "'Nothing like it, sir,' replied Mr. Lillywick solemnly. "'How do you think?' whispering the collector, drawing him aside. "'How do you think she looks to-night?' "'As handsome as ever,' replied Nicholas, glancing at the late Miss Pecktower. "'Why, there's an air about her, sir,' whispered the collector, "'that I never saw in anybody... "'Look at her. Now she moves to put the kettle on. "'There. Isn't it fascination, sir?' "'You're a lucky man,' said Nicholas. "'Ha, ha, ha,' rejoined the collector. "'No, do you think I am, eh, though?' "'Perhaps I may be. Perhaps I may be. "'I say, I couldn't have done much better if I had been a young man, could I? "'You couldn't have done much better yourself, could you, eh? "'Could you, with such inquiries?' and many more such mr lillywick jerked his elbow into nicholas's side and chuckled till his face became quite purple in the attempt to keep down his satisfaction by this time the cloth had been laid under the superintendence of all the ladies upon two tables put together one being high and narrow and the other low and broad there were oysters at the top sausages at the bottom a pair of snuffers in the centre and baked potatoes wherever it was most convenient to put them Two additional chairs were brought in from the bedroom. Miss Snevellicki sat at the head of the table, and Mr. Lillivick at the foot, and Nicholas had not only the honour of sitting next to Miss Snevellicki, but of having Miss Snevellicki's mamma on his right hand, and Miss Snevellicki's papa over the way. In short, he was the hero of the feast, and when the table was cleared and something warm introduced, Miss Snevellicki's papa got up and proposed his health in a speech containing such affecting allusions to the coming departure that Miss Snevellicki's wept, and was compelled to retire into the bedroom. 
hush don't take any notice of it said miss ledbrook peeping in from the bedroom say when she comes back that she exerts herself too much miss ledrick eked out this speech with so many mysterious nods and frowns before she shut the door again that a profound silence came upon all the company during which miss snevelecki's papa looked very big indeed several sizes larger than life at everybody in turn but particularly at nicholas and kept on perpetually emptying his tumbler and filling it again until the ladies returned in a cluster with Miss Snevelecki among them. "'You needn't alarm yourself a bit, Mr. Snevelecki,' said Mrs. Lillivick. "'She is only a little weak and nervous. She has been so ever since this morning.' "'Oh,' said Mr. Snevelecki, "'that's all, is it?' "'Oh, yes, that's all. Don't make a fuss about it,' cried all the ladies together. Now this was not exactly the kind of reply suited to Mr. Snevelecki's importance as a man and a father, so he picked out the unfortunate Mrs. Snevelecki, and asked her what the devil she meant by talking to him in that way. "'Dear me, dear me,' said Mrs. Snevelecki. "'Don't call me your dear, ma'am,' said Mr. Snevelecki, "'if you please.' "'Pray, pa, don't,' interrupted Miss Snevelecki. "'Don't what, my child? Talk in that way.' "'Why not?' said Mr. Snevelecki. "'I hope you don't suppose there's anybody here who is to prevent my talking as I like.' "'Nobody wants to, Pa,' rejoined his daughter. "'Nobody would if they did want to,' said Mr. Snevelecki. "'I am not ashamed of myself. Snevelecki is my name. "'I'm to be found in Broadcourt, Bow Street, when I'm in town. "'If I'm not at home, let any man ask for me at the stage door. "'Damn, they know me at the stage door, I suppose. "'Most men have seen my portrait at the cigar shop round the corner. "'I've been mentioned in the newspapers before now, haven't I? "'Talk.' "'I'll tell you what, if I found out that any man had been tampering with the affections of my daughter, I wouldn't talk. I'd astonish him without talking. That's my way.' So saying, Mr. Snevelecki struck the palm of his left hand three smart blows with his clenched fist, pulled a phantom nose with his right thumb and forefinger, and swallowed another glass full of the draught. "'That's my way,' repeated Mr. Snevelecki. "'Most public characters have their failings.' but the truth is that Mr. Snevelecki was a little addicted to drinking, or, if the whole truth must be told, that he was scarcely ever sober. He knew in his cups three distinct stages of intoxication, the dignified, the quarrelsome, the amorous. When professionally engaged, he never got beyond the dignified. In private circles, he went through all three, passing from one to another, with a rapidity of transition often rather perplexing to those who had not the honour of his acquaintance. Thus Mr. Snevelecki had no sooner swallowed another glassful than he smiled upon all present in happy forgetfulness of having exhibited symptoms of pugnacity and proposed the ladies bless their hearts in a most vivacious manner. "'I love em said Mr. Snevelecki, looking around the table. "'I love em every one.' "'Not every one,' reasoned Mr. Lillivick mildly. "'Yes, every one,' repeated Mr. Snevelecki. "'That would include the married ladies, you know,' said Mr. Lillivick. "'I love them, too,' said Mr. Snevelecki. The collector looked into the surrounding faces, with an aspect of grave astonishment, seeming to say, "'This is a nice man,' and appeared a little surprised that Mrs. Lillivick's manner yielded no evidences of horror and indignation. "'One good turn deserves another,' said Mr. Snevelecki. "'I love them, and they love me. "'And if this avowal were not made sufficient disregard "'and defiance of all moral obligations, "'what did Mr. Snevelecki do? "'He winked, winked openly and undisguisedly, "'winked with his right eye upon Henrietta Lillivick. "'The collector fell back in his chair in the intensity of his astonishment if anybody had winked at her as Henrietta Peck Tower, it would have been indecorous in the last degree. But as Mrs. Lillivick, while he thought of it in a cold perspiration and wondered whether it was possible that he could be dreaming, Mr. Snevelecki repeated the wink, and drinking to Mrs. Lillivick in a dumb show, actually blew her a kiss. Mr. Lillivick left his chair, walked straight up to the other end of the table, and fell upon him, literally fell upon him instantaneously. 
Mr. Lillivick was no light weight, and consequently, when he fell upon Mr. Snevelecki, Mr. Snevelecki fell under the table. Mr. Lillivick followed him, and the ladies screamed. "'What is the matter with the men? Are they mad?' cried Nicholas, diving under the table, dragging up the collector by main force, and thrusting him all doubled up into a chair as if he had been a stuffed figure. "'What do you mean to do? What do you want to do? What is the matter with you?' While Nicholas raised up the collector, Smike had performed the same office for Mr. Snevelecki, who now regarded his late adversary in tipsy amazement. "'Look here, sir,' replied Mr. Lillivick, pointing to his astonished wife. "'Here is purity and elegance combined, whose feelings have been outraged, violated, sir.' "'Lor, what nonsense he talks!' exclaimed Mrs. Lillivick, in answer to the inquiring look of Nicholas. "'Nobody has said anything to me.' said henrietta cried the collector didn't i see him mr lillivick couldn't bring himself to utter the word but he counterfeited the motion of the eye well cried mrs lillivick do you suppose nobody is ever to look at me a pretty thing to be married indeed if that was the law you didn't mind it answered the collector mind it repeated mrs lillivick contemptuously you ought to go down on your knees and beg everybody's pardon that you ought pardon my dear said the dismayed collector yes and mine first replied mrs lillivick do you suppose i ain't the best judge of what's proper and what's improper well, to be sure cried all the ladies do you suppose we shouldn't be the first to speak if there was anything that ought to be taken notice of do you suppose they don't know, sir? said Miss Snevelecki's papa, pulling up his collar and muttering something about a punching of heads, and being only withheld by considerations of age. With which Miss Snevelecki's papa looked steadily and sternly at Mr. Lillivick for some seconds, and then rising deliberately from his chair, kissed all the ladies all around, beginning with Mrs. Lillivick. The unhappy collector looked piteously at his wife as if to see whether there was any one trait of Miss Patauker left in Mrs. Lillivick, and finding too surely that there was not, begged pardon of all the company with great humility, and sat down such a crestfallen, dispirited, disenchanted man, that despite all his selfishness and dotage, he was quite an object of compassion. Miss Snevelecki's papa, being greatly exalted by the triumphs, and incontestable proof of his popularity with the fair sex quickly grew convivial, not to say uproarious, volunteering more than one song of no inconsiderable length, and regaling the social circle between whiles with recollections of divers splendid women who had been supposed to entertain a passion for him, several of whom he toasted by name, taking occasion to remark at the same time that if he had been a little more alive to his own interest, he might have been rolling at that moment in his chariot and four. These reminiscences appeared to awaken no very torturing pangs in the breast of Mrs. Snevelecki, who was sufficiently occupied in discanting to Nicholas upon the manifold accomplishments and merits of her daughter. Nor was the young lady herself at all behindhand in displaying her choicest allurements. But these, heightened as they were by the artifices of Miss Ledrook, had no effect whatever in increasing the attentions of Nicholas, who, with the precedent of Miss Squeers, still fresh in his memory, steadily resisted every fascination, and placed so strict a guard upon his behaviour, that when he had taken his leave, the ladies were unanimous in pronouncing him quite a monster of insensibility. Next day the posters appeared in due course, and the public were informed, in all colours of the rainbow, and in letters afflicted with every possible variation of spinal deformity, how that Mr. Johnson would have the honour of making his last appearance that evening, and how that an early application for places was requested in consequence of the extraordinary overflow attendant on his performances. It being a remarkable fact in theatrical history, but one long since established beyond dispute, that it is a hopeless endeavour to attract people to a theatre unless they can first be brought to believe that they will never get into it. Nicholas was somewhat at a loss on entering the theatre at night to account for the unusual perturbation and excitement visible in the countenances of all the company, but he was not long in doubt as to the cause. 
for before he could make any inquiry respecting it, Mr. Crummles approached, and in an agitated tone of voice, informed him that there was a London manager in the boxes. "'It's the phenomenon. Depend upon it, sir,' said Mr. Crummles, dragging Nicholas to the little hole in the curtain, that he might look through at the London manager. "'I have not the smallest doubt it's the fame of the phenomenon. That's the man. In him the great coat and no shirt collar. She shall have ten pound a week, Johnson. So she shall not appear on the London boards for a farthing less. They shan't engage her either.' unless they engage Mrs. Crummles also. Twenty pound a week for the pair, or I'll tell you what I'll throw in myself and the two boys, and they shall have the family for thirty. I can't say fairer than that. They must take us all, if none of us will go without the others. That's the way of some London people do, and it always answers. Thirty pound a week. It's too cheap, Johnson. It's dirt cheap. Nicholas replied that it certainly was, and Mr. Vincent Crummles, taking several huge pinches of snuff to compose his feelings, hurried away to tell Mrs. Crummles that he had quite settled the only terms that could be accepted, and had resolved not to abate one single farthing. When everybody was dressed and the curtain went up, the excitement occasioned by the presence of the London manager increased a thousandfold. Everybody happened to know that the London manager had come down specifically to witness his or her performance, and all were in a flutter of anxiety and expectation. Some of those who were not on in the first scene hurried to the wings, and there stretched their necks to have a peep at him. Others stole up into the two little private boxes over the stage doors, and from that position reconnoitred the London manager. Once the London manager was seen to smile. He smiled at the comic countryman's pretending to catch a blue bottle while Mrs. Crummles was making her greatest effect. "'Very good, my fine fellow,' said Mr. Crummles, shaking his fist at the comic countryman when he came off. "'You leave this company next Saturday night.' In the same way, everybody who was on stage beheld an audience, but one individual. Everybody played to the London manager. When Mr. Lenville, in a sudden burst of passion, called the Emperor a miscreant, and then, biting his glove, said, "'But I must dissemble,' instead of looking gloomily at the boards and... So, waiting for his cue, as is proper in such cases, he kept his eye fixed upon the London manager. When Miss Bravassa sang her song at her lover, who, according to custom, stood ready to shake hands with her between the verses, they looked not at each other, but at the London manager. Mr. Crummles died point-blank at him, and when the two guards came in to take the body off after a very hard death, it was seen to open his eyes and glance at the London manager. At length the London manager was discovered to be asleep, and shortly after that he woke up and went away, whereupon all the company fell foul of the unhappy comic countryman, declaring that his buffoonery was the sole cause. And Mr. Crummles said that he had put up with it long enough, but that he couldn't stand it any longer, and therefore would feel obliged by his looking out for another engagement. All this was the occasion of much amusement to Nicholas, whose only feeling upon the subject was one of sincere satisfaction that the great man went away before he appeared. He went through his part in the last two pieces as briskly as he could, and having been received with unbounded favour and unprecedented applause, so said the bills for the next day, which had been printed an hour or two before, he took Smike's arm and walked home to bed. With the post next morning came a letter from Newman Noggs, very inky, very short, very dirty, very small, and very mysterious, urging Nicholas to return to London instantly, not to lose an instant, to be there at night, if possible. "'I will,' said Nicholas. "'Heaven knows I have remained here for the best, and sorely against my own will. But even now I have dallied too long. What can have happened? Smike, my good fellow, here, take my purse.' put our things together, and pay what little debts we owe, quick, and we shall be in time for the morning coach. I will only tell them that we are going, and will return to you immediately. So saying, he took his hat, and hurrying away to the lodgings of Mr. Crummles, applied his hand to the knocker with such hearty good will that he awakened that gentleman, who was still in bed, and caused Mr. Boof, the pilot, to take his morning's pipe very nearly out of his mouth, 
in the extremity of his surprise. The door being opened, Nicholas ran upstairs without any ceremony, and bursting into the darkened sitting-room on the one pair front, found that the two Master Crummles had sprung out of the sofa-bed, and were putting on their clothes with great rapidity, under the impression that it was the middle of the night, and the next house was on fire. Before he could undeceive them, Mr. Crummles came down in a flannel gown and nightcap, and to him Nicholas briefly explained that circumstances had occurred which rendered it necessary for him to repair to London immediately. "'So good-bye,' said Nicholas. "'Good-bye, good-bye.' He was halfway downstairs before Mr. Crummles had sufficiently recovered his surprise to gasp out something about the posters. "'I can't help it,' replied Nicholas. "'Set whatever I may have earned this week against them, or, if that will not repay you, say at once what will. Quick, quick!' "'We'll cry quits about that,' returned Crummles. "'But can't we have one last night more?' "'Not an hour, not a minute,' replied Nicholas impatiently. "'Won't you stop to say something to Mrs. Crummles?' asked the manager, following him down to the door. "'I couldn't stop if it were to prolong my life a score of years,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Here, take my hand, and with it my hearty thanks. "'Oh, that I should have been fooling here!' Accompanying these words, with an impatient stamp upon the ground, he tore himself from the manager's detaining grasp, and, darting rapidly down the street, was out of sight in an instant. "'Dear me, dear me,' said Mr. Crummles, looking wistfully toward the point at which he had just disappeared. "'If he only acted like that, what a deal of money he'd draw! He should have kept upon the circuit. He'd have been very useful to me. But he don't know what's good for him.' He is an impetuous youth, young man, are rash, very rash. Mr. Crummles, being in a moralizing mood, might possibly have moralized for some minutes longer if he had not mechanically put his hand towards his waistcoat pocket, where he was accustomed to keeping his snuff. The absence of any pocket at all, in the unusual direction, suddenly recalled to his recollection the fact that he had no waistcoat on, and this leading him to a contemplation of the extreme scantiness of his attire, he shut the door abruptly, and retired upstairs with great precipitation. Smike had made good speed while Nicholas was absent, and with his help everything was soon ready for their departure. They scarcely stopped to take a morsel of breakfast, and in less than half an hour arrived at the coach office, quite out of breath with the haste they had made to reach it in time. There were yet a few minutes to spare, so, having secured the places, Nicholas hurried into a slop-seller's hard by, and bought Smike a great coat. It would have been rather large for a substantial yeoman, but the shopman averring, and with considerable truth, that it was a most uncommon fit, Nicholas would have purchased it in his impatience if it had not been twice the size. As they hurried up to the coach, which was now in the open street, and all ready for starting, Nicholas was not a little astonished to find himself suddenly clutched in a close and violent embrace, which nearly took him off his legs, nor was his amazement at all lessened by hearing the voice of Mr. Crummles exclaim, "'It is he, my friend, my friend!' "'Bless my heart!' cried Nicholas, struggling in the manager's arms. "'What are you about?' The manager made no reply, but strained him to his breast again, exclaiming as he did so, "'Farewell, my noble, my lion-hearted boy!' In fact, Mr. Crummles, who could never lose any opportunity for professional display, had turned out for the express purpose of taking a public farewell of Nicholas, and to render it the more imposing he was now, to the young gentleman's most profound annoyance, inflicting upon him a rapid succession of stage embraces, which, as everybody knows, are performed by the embracers laying his or her chin on the shoulder of the object of affection and looking over it. This Mr. Crummles did, in the highest style of melodrama, pouring forth at the same time all of the most dismal forms of farewell he could think of, out of the stock pieces. Nor was this all, for the elder Master Crummles was going through a similar ceremony with Smike, for Percy Crummles, with a very little second-hand camelet cloak worn theatrically over his left shoulder, stood by in the attitude of an attendant officer waiting to convey the two victims to the scaffold. The lookers-on laughed very heartily, and as it was as well to put a good face upon the matter, 
Nicholas laughed too, when he had succeeded in disengaging himself, and rescuing the astonished Smike, climbed up to the coach roof after him, and kissed the hand in honour of the absent Mrs. Crummles as they rolled away. End of chapter 30《Nicholas Nickleby》Chapter 31 by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. This recording by Patty Brugman.《Nicholas Nickleby》Chapter 31 Of Ralph Nickleby and Newman Noggs and some wise precautions, the success or failure of which will appear in the sequel. In blissful unconsciousness that his nephew was hastening at utmost speed of four good horses toward his sphere of action, and that every passing minute diminished the distance between them, Ralph Nickleby sat that morning occupied in his customary avocations, and yet unable to prevent his thoughts wandering from time to time back to the interview which had taken place between himself and his niece on the previous day. At such intervals, after a few moments of abstraction, Ralph would mutter some peevish interjection, and apply himself with renewed steadiness of purpose to the ledger before him. But again and again the same train of thought came back, despite all his efforts to prevent it, confusing him in his calculations, and utterly distracting his attention from the figures over which he bent. At length Ralph laid down his pen, and threw himself back in his chair as though he had made up his mind to allow the obtrusive current of reflection to take its own course, and, by giving it full scope, to rid himself of it effectually. "'I am not a man to be moved by a pretty face,' muttered Ralph sternly. "'There is a grinning skull beneath it, and men like me, who look and work below the surface, see that, and not its delicate covering. And yet I almost like the girl, or should, if she had been less proudly and squeamishly brought up. If the boy were drowned or hanged, and the mother dead, this house should be her home. I wish they were, with all my soul. Notwithstanding the deadly hatred which Ralph felt toward Nicholas, and the bitter contempt with which he sneered at poor Mrs. Nickleby, notwithstanding the baseness with which he had behaved, and then was behaving, and would behave again if his interest prompted him toward Kate herself, Still there was, strange though it may seem, something humanizing and even gentle in his thoughts at that moment. He thought of what his home might be if Kate were there. He placed her in an empty chair, looked upon her, heard her speak. He felt again upon his arm the gentle pressure of the trembling hand. He strewed his costly rooms with the hundred silent tokens of feminine presence and occupation. He came back again to the cold fireside in the silent, dreary splendor and in that one glimpse of a better nature, born as it was in selfish thoughts, the rich man felt himself friendless, childless, and alone. Gold for the instant lost its luster in his eyes, for there were countless treasures of the heart which it could never purchase. A very slight circumstance was sufficient to banish such reflections from the mind of such a man, as Ralph looked vacantly out across the yard toward the window on the other office, he became suddenly aware of the earnest observation of Newton Noggs, who, with his red nose almost touching the glass, feigned to be mending a pen with a rusty fragment of a knife, but was in reality staring at his employer with a countenance of the closest and most eager scrutiny. Ralph exchanged his dreamy posture for his accustomed business attitude. The face of Newman disappeared, and the train of thought took to flight all simultaneously, and in an instant. After a few minutes Ralph rang the bell. Newman answered the summons, and Ralph raised his eyes stealthily to his face, as if he almost feared to read there a knowledge of his recent thoughts. There was not the smallest speculation, however, in the countenance of Newman Noggs, if it be possible to imagine a man with two eyes in his head, and both wide open, looking in no direction whatever, and seeing nothing, Newman appeared to be that man, while Ralph Nickleby regarded him. "'How now?' growled Ralph. "'Oh, 
said Newman, throwing some intelligence into his eyes all at once and dropping them on his master. I thought you rang. With which laconic remark Newman turned round and hobbled away. Stop, said Ralph. Newman stopped, not at all disconcerted. I did ring. I knew you did. Then why did you offer to go if you know that? I thought you rang to say you didn't ring, replied Newman. You often do. How dare you pry and peer and stare at me, sirrah? demanded Ralph. Stare, cried Newman, at you, ha, ha, which was all the explanation Newman deigned to offer. Be careful, sir, said Ralph, looking steadily at him. Let me have no drunken fooling here. Do you see this parcel? It's big enough, rejoined Newman. Carry it into the city to cross in Broad Street and leave it there quick. Do you hear? Newman gave a dogged kind of nod to express an affirmative reply, and leaving the room for a few seconds returned with his hat. Having made various ineffective attempts to fit the parcel, which was some two feet square, into the crown thereof, Newman took it under his arm and after putting on his fingerless gloves with great precision and nicety, keeping his eyes fixed upon Mr. Ralph Nickleby all the time, he adjusted his hat upon his head with as much care, real or pretended, as if it were a brand new one of the most expensive quality, and at last departed on his errand. He executed his commission with great promptitude and dispatch, only calling at one public house for half a minute, and even that be said to be in his way, for he went in one door and came out at the other. But as he returned, and had got on so far homeward as the strand, Newman began to loiter with that uncertain air of a man who has not quite made up his mind whether to halt or go straight forward. After a very short consideration, the former inclination prevailed, and making towards the point he had laid in his mind, Newman knocked, a modest double knock, or rather a nervous single one, at Miss Le Crevy's door. It was opened by a strange servant, on whom the odd figure of the visitor did not appear to make the most favourable impression possible, inasmuch as she no sooner saw him than she very nearly closed it, and placing herself in the narrow gap, inquired what he wanted, but Newman merely uttered the monosyllable Noggs, as if it were some cabalistic word at sound of which bolts would fly back and doors open, pushed briskly past and gained the door of Miss Le Crevy's sitting-room, before the astonished servant could offer any opposition. "'Walk in, if you please,' said Miss Le Crevy, in reply to the sound of Newman's knuckles, and in he walked accordingly. "'Bless us!' cried Miss Le Crevy, staring at Newman, bolted in. "'What did you want, sir?' "'You have forgotten me,' said Newman, with an inclination of head. I wonder at that, that nobody should remember me who knew me in other days is natural enough, but there are few people who, seeing me once, forget me now. He glanced as he spoke at his shabby clothes and paralytic limb, and slightly shook his head. I did forget you, I declare, said Miss La Crevy, rising to receive Newman, who met her halfway, and I am ashamed of myself for doing so, for you are a kind, good creature, Mr. Noggs. "'Sit down and tell me all about Miss Nickleby. "'Poor dear thing, I haven't seen her for this many a week.' "'How's that?' asked Newman. "'Why, in tr the truth is, Mr. Noggs,' said Miss La Crevy, "'that I have been out on a visit, "'the first visit I have made for fifteen years.' "'That is a long time,' said Newman sadly. "'So it is a very long time to look back upon in years, though,' "'Somehow or other, thank heaven, the solitary days roll away peacefully and happily enough,' replied the miniature painter. "'I have a brother, Mr. Noggs, the only relation I have, and all that time I never saw him once. Not that we ever quarrelled, but he was apprenticed down in the country, and he got married there, and new ties and affections springing up about him. He forgot a poor little woman like me, as it was very reasonable he should, you know.' "'Don't suppose that I complain about that, because I always said to myself, "'It is very natural. "'Poor dear John is making his way in the world, "'and he has a wife to tell his cares and troubles to, "'and children now to play about him. "'So God bless him in them. "'And send we may all meet together one day, "'where we shall part no more. "'But what do you think, Mr. Noggs? 
said the miniature painter, brightening up and clapping her hands, of that very same brother coming up to London at last, and never resting till he found me out. What do you think of his coming here, and sitting down in that very chair, and crying like a child because he was so glad to see me? What do you think of his insisting on taking me down all the way into the country to his own house? Quite a sumptuous place, Mr. Noggs, with a large garden, and I don't know how many fields, and a man in livery waiting at table, and cows and horses and pigs, and I don't know what besides, and making me stay a whole month, and pressing me to stop there all my life, yes, all my life. And so did his wife, and so did the children, and there were four of them. And one, the eldest girl of all, they, they had named her after me, eight good years before they had indeed. I never was so happy, in all my life I never was. The worthy soul hid her face in her handkerchief, and sobbed aloud, for it was the first opportunity she had had of unburdening her heart, and it would have its way. But bless my life, said Miss La Crevy, wiping her eyes after a short pause, and cramming her handkerchief into her pocket with a great bustle and dispatch. What a foolish creature I must have been to you, Mr. Noggs. I shouldn't have said anything about it. Only I wanted to explain to you how it was I hadn't seen Miss Nickleby. "'Have you seen the old lady?' asked Newman. "'You mean Mrs. Nickleby,' said Miss La Crevy. "'Then I tell you what, Mr. Noggs, if you want to keep the good books in that quarter, "'you had better not call her the old lady any more, "'for I suspect she wouldn't be best pleased to hear you. "'Yes, I went there the night before last, "'but she was quite on the high ropes about something.' and was so grand and mysterious that I couldn't make anything of her. So, to tell you the truth, I took it into my head to be grand, too, and came away in state. I thought she would have come around again before this, but she hasn't been here. About Miss Nickleby, said Newman. Why, she was here twice while I was away, returned Miss La Crevy. I was afraid she mightn't like to have me calling on her among those great folks in what's-its-name place, so I thought I'd wait a day or two, and if I didn't see her, write. "'Ah!' exclaimed Newman, cracking his fingers. "'However, I want to hear all the news about them from you,' said Miss La Crevy. "'How is the old rough-and-tough monster of Golden Square?' "'Well, of course. "'Such people always are. "'I don't mean how is he in health, but how is he going on? "'How is he behaving himself?' "'Damn him!' cried Newman, dashing his cherished hat on the floor, "'like a false hound!' "'Gracious, Mr. Noggs, you quite terrify me,' exclaimed Miss La Crevy, turning pale. "'I should have spoilt his features yesterday afternoon, if I could have afforded it,' said Newman, moving restlessly about, and shaking his fist at a portrait of Mr. Canning over the mantelpiece. "'I was very near it. I was obliged to put my hands in my pockets and keep him there very tight. I shall do it some day in that little back parlour. I know I shall.' I should have done it before now, if I hadn't been afraid of making bad worse. I shall double-lock myself in with him, and have it out before I die. I'm quite certain of it. I shall scream if you don't compose yourself, Mr. Noggs, said Miss La Crevy. I'm sure I shan't be able to help it. Never mind, rejoined Newman, darting violently to and fro. He's coming up to-night. I wrote to tell him. He little thinks I know. He little thinks I care, cunning scoundrel. He don't think that. Not he, not he. Never mind, I'll thwart him. I, Newman Noggs, ho, ho, the rascal. Lashing himself up to an extravagant pitch of fury, Newman Noggs jerked himself about the room with the most eccentric motion ever beheld in a human being, now sparring at little miniatures on the wall, and now giving himself violent thumps on the head as if to heighten the delusion until he sank down into his former seat quite breathless and exhausted. There, said Newman, picking up his hat. That's done me good. Now I'm better, and I'll tell you all about it. It took some little time to reassure Miss La Crevy, who had been almost frightened out of her senses by this remarkable demonstration. But that done, Newman faithfully related all he, that had passed in the interview between Kate and her uncle, prefacing his narrative with a statement of his previous suspicion on the subject and his reasons for forming them, and concluding with a little communication of the step he had taken in secretly writing to Nicholas. 
Though little Miss La Crevy's indignation was not so singularly displayed as Newman's, it was scarcely inferior in violence and intensity. Indeed, if Ralph Nickleby had happened to make his appearance in the room at that moment, there is some doubt whether he would not have found Miss La Crevy a more dangerous opponent than even Newman Noggs himself. "'God forgive me for saying so,' said Miss La Crevy, as a wind-up to all her expressions of anger, "'but I really feel as if I could stick this into him with pleasure.' It was not a very awful weapon that Miss La Crevy held, it being, in fact, nothing more or less than a black-lead pencil. But discovering a mistake, the little portrait painter exchanged it for a mother-of-pearl fruit knife, wherewith, in proof of her desperate thought, she made a lunge as she spoke, which would have scarcely disturbed the crumbs of half quartern loaf. "'She won't stop where she is after tonight,' said Newman. "'That's a comfort.' "'Stop!' cried Miss La Crevy. She should have left there weeks ago. If we had known this, rejoined Newman, but we didn't. Nobody could properly interfere but her mother or brother. The mother's weak, the poor thing weak. The dear young man will be here tonight. Heart alive, cried Miss La Crevy. He will do something desperate, Mr. Noggs, if you tell him all at once. Newman left off rubbing his hands and assuming a thoughtful look. Depend upon it said Miss La Crevy earnestly. If you are not very careful in breaking out the truth to him, he will do something violent upon his uncle, or one of these men that will bring some terrible calamity upon his own head and grief and sorrow to us all. I never thought of that, rejoined Newman, his countenance failing more and more. I came to ask you to receive his sister in case he brought her here, but... But this is a matter of much greater importance, interrupted Miss La Crevy, that you might have been sure of before you came, but the end of this nobody can foresee unless you are very guarded and careful. "'What can I do?' cried Newman, scratching his head, and with an air of great vexation and perplexity. "'If he was to talk of pistoling them all, I should be very obliged to say, "'Certainly, serve him right.' Miss La Crevy could not suppress a small shriek on hearing this, and instantly set about extorting a solemn pledge from Newman, that he would use his utmost endeavours to pacify the wrath of Nicholas, which after some demure was conceded. They then consulted together on the safest and surest mode of communicating to him the circumstances which had rendered his presence necessary. He must have time to cool before he can possibly do anything, said Miss La Crevy. That is of greatest consequence. He must not be told until late at night. But he'll be in town between six and seven this evening, replied Newman. I can't keep it from him when he asks me. Then you must go out, Mr. Noggs, said Miss La Crevy. You can easily have been kept away by business and must not return until nearly midnight. Then he'll come straight here, retorted Newman. I suppose so, observed Miss La Crevy, but he won't find me at home, for I'll go straight to the city the instant you leave, make up matters with Mrs. Nickleby, and take her away to the theatre so that he may not even know where his sister lives. Upon further discussion, this appeared the safest and most feasible mode of proceeding that could possibly be adopted. Therefore, it finally determined that the matter should be so arranged. Newman, after listening to many supplementary cautions and entreaties, took his leave of Miss La Crevy and trudged back to Golden Square, ruminating as he went upon a vast number of possibilities and impossibilities, which crowded upon his brain and rose out of the conversation that had just terminated. End of chapter 31. Recorded by Patty Brugman. Chapter 32 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 32 relating chiefly to some remarkable conversation and some remarkable proceedings to which it gives rise. "'London at last!' cried Nicholas, throwing back his greatcoat and rousing Smike from a long nap. "'It seemed to me as though we should never reach it.' "'And yet you came along at a tidy pace, too,' observed the coachman, looking over his shoulder at Nicholas with no very pleasant expression of countenance. "'Ay, I know that,' was the reply. "'But I have been very anxious to be at my journey's end, and that makes the way seem long.' 
"'Well,' remarked the coachman, "'if the way seemed long with such cattle as you've sat behind, "'you must have been most uncommon anxious.' "'And so saying, he let out his whiplash, "'and touched up a little boy on the calves of his legs by way of emphasis. "'They rattled on through the noisy, bustling, crowded streets of London, "'now displaying long double rows of brightly burning lamps, "'dotted here and there with the chemist's glaring lights, "'and illuminated besides with the brilliant flood "'that streamed from the windows of the shops, "'where sparkling jewellery, silks, and velvets of the richest colours, "'the most inviting delicacies, "'and most sumptuous articles of luxurious ornament, "'succeeded each other in rich and glittering profusion. "'Streams of people apparently without end poured on and on, "'jostling each other in the crowd and hurrying forward, "'scarcely seeming to notice the riches that surrounded them on every side, "'while vehicles of all shapes and makes, "'mingled up together in one moving mass, like running water, "'lent their ceaseless roar to swell the noise and tumult. "'As they dashed by the quickly changing and ever-varying objects, "'it was curious to observe in what a strange procession they passed before the eye. "'Emporiums of splendid dresses, the materials brought from every quarter of the world, "'tempting stores of everything to stimulate and pamper the sated appetite, "'and give new relish to the oft-repeated feast, "'vessels of burnished gold and silver,' wrought into every exquisite form of vase and dish and goblet, guns, swords, pistols, and patent engines of destruction, screws and irons for the crooked, clothes for the newly born, drugs for the sick, coffins for the dead, and churchyards for the buried, all these jumbled each with the other, and flocking side by side, seemed to flit by in motley dance like the fantastic groups of the old Dutch painter, and with the same stern moral for the unheeding restless crowd." nor were there wanting objects in the crowd itself to give new point and purpose to the shifting scene. The rags of the squalid ballad-singer fluttered in the rich light that showed the goldsmith's treasures. Pale and pinched-up faces hovered about the windows, where was tempting food. Hungry eyes wandered over the profusion guarded by one thin sheet of brittle glass, an iron wall to them. Half-naked shivering figures stopped to gaze at Chinese shawls and golden stuffs of India. There was a christening party at the largest coffin-makers, and a funeral hatchment had stopped some great improvements in the bravest mansion. Life and death went hand in hand, wealth and poverty stood side by side, repletion and starvation laid them down together. But it was London, and the old country lady inside, who had put her head out of the coach-window a mile or so this side Kingston, and cried out to the driver that she was sure he must have passed it, and forgotten to set her down, was satisfied at last. Nicholas engaged beds for himself and Smike at the inn where the coach stopped, and repaired, without the delay of another moment, to the lodgings of Newman Noggs, for his anxiety and impatience had increased with every succeeding minute, and were almost beyond control. There was a fire in Newman's garret, and a candle had been left burning. The floor was cleanly swept, the room was as comfortably arranged as such a room could be, and meat and drink were placed in order upon the table. Everything bespoke the affectionate care and attention of Newman Noggs, but Newman himself was not there. "'Do you know what time he will be home?' inquired Nicholas, tapping at the door of Newman's front neighbour. "'Ah, Mr. Johnson,' said Crowl, presenting himself. "'Welcome, sir. How well you're looking. I never could have believed—' "'Pardon me,' interposed Nicholas. "'My question I am extremely anxious to know.' "'Why, he has a troublesome affair of business,' replied Crowl, "'and he will not be home before twelve o'clock. He was very unwilling to go, I can tell you, but there was no help for it. However, he left word that you were to make yourself comfortable till he came back, and that I was to entertain you, which I shall be very glad to do. In proof of his extreme readiness to exert himself for the general entertainment, Mr. Crowell drew a chair to the table as he spoke, and helping himself plentifully to the cold meat, invited Nicholas and Smike to follow his example. Disappointed and uneasy, Nicholas could touch no food, so, after he had seen Smike comfortably established at the table, he walked out, despite a great many dissuasions uttered by Mr. Crowell with his mouth full, and left Smike to detain Newman in case he returned first. As Miss La Creevy had anticipated, Nicholas betook himself straight to her house. Finding her from home, he debated within himself for some time whether he should go to his mother's residence, and so compromise her with Ralph Nickleby. Fully persuaded, however, that Newman would not have solicited him to return unless there was some strong reason which required his presence at home, he resolved to go there, and hastened eastwards with all speed. Mrs. Nickleby would not be at home, the girl said, until past twelve or later. She believed Miss Nickleby was well, but she didn't live at home now, nor did she come home except very seldom. She couldn't say where she was stopping, but it was not at Madame Montalini's. She was sure of that. 
With his heart beating violently, and apprending he knew not what disaster, Nicholas returned to where he had left Smike. Newman had not been home. He wouldn't be till twelve o'clock. There was no chance of it. Was there no possibility of sending to fetch him, if it were only for an instant, or forwarding to him one line of writing to which he might return a verbal reply? That was quite impracticable. He was not at Golden Square, and probably had been sent to execute some commission at a distance. Nicholas tried to remain quietly where he was, but he felt so nervous and excited that he could not sit still. He seemed to be losing time unless he was moving. It was an absurd fancy, he knew, but he was wholly unable to resist it. So he took up his hat and rambled out again. He strolled westward this time, pacing the long streets with hurried footsteps, and agitated by a thousand misgivings and apprehensions which he could not overcome. He passed into Hyde Park, now silent and deserted, and increased his rate of walking, as if in the hope of leaving his thoughts behind. They crowded upon him more thickly, however, now there were no passing objects to attract his attention, and the one idea was always uppermost, that some stroke of ill-fortune must have occurred so calamitous in its nature that all were fearful of disclosing it to him. The old question arose again and again. What could it be? Nicholas walked till he was weary, but was not one bit the wiser and indeed he came out of the park at last a great deal more confused and perplexed than when he went in. He had taken scarcely anything to eat or drink since early in the morning, and felt quite worn out and exhausted. As he returned languidly towards the point from which he had started, along one of the thoroughfares which lie between Park Lane and Bond Street, he passed a handsome hotel, before which he stopped mechanically. "'An expensive place, I dare say,' thought Nicholas but a pint of wine and a biscuit are so great, debauch, wherever they are had. And yet, I don't know. He walked on a few steps, but looking wistfully down the long vista of gas-lamps before him, and thinking how long it would take to reach the end of it, and being besides in that kind of mood in which a man is most disposed to yield to his first impulse, and being besides strongly attracted to the hotel, in part by curiosity, and in part by some odd mixture of feelings which he would have been troubled to define, Nicholas turned back again, and walked into the coffee-room. It was very handsomely furnished. The walls were ornamented with the choicest specimens of French paper, enriched with a gilded cornice of elegant design. The floor was covered with a rich carpet, and two superb mirrors, one above the chimney-piece and one at the opposite end of the room, reaching from floor to ceiling, multiplied the other beauties and added new ones of their own to enhance the general effect. There was a rather noisy party of four gentlemen in a box by the fireplace, and only two other persons present, both elderly gentlemen, and both alone. Observing all this in the first comprehensive glance with which a stranger surveys a place that is new to him, Nicholas sat himself down in the box next to the noisy party, with his back towards them, and postponing his order for a pint of claret until such time as the waiter and one of the elderly gentlemen should have settled a disputed question relative to the price of an item in the bill of fare, took up a newspaper and began to read. He had not read twenty lines, and was in truth himself dozing, when he was startled by the mention of his sister's name. Little Kate Nickleby were the words that caught his ear. He raised his head in amazement, and as he did so, saw by the reflection in the opposite glass, that two of the party behind him had risen, and were standing before the fire. "'It must have come from one of them,' thought Nicholas. He waited to hear more with a countenance of some indignation, for the tone of speech had been anything but respectful, and the appearance of the individual, whom he presumed to have been the speaker, was coarse and swaggering. This person, so Nicholas observed in the same glance at the mirror which had enabled him to see his face, was standing with his back to the fire conversing with a younger gentleman, who stood with his back to the company, wore his hat, and was adjusting his shirt-collar by the aid of the glass. They spoke in whispers, now and then bursting into a loud laugh, but Nicholas could catch no repetition of the words, nor anything sounding at all like the words which had attracted his attention. At length the two resumed their seats, and more wine being ordered, the party grew louder in their mirth. Still there was no reference made to anybody with whom he was acquainted, and Nicholas became persuaded that his excited fancy had either imagined the sounds altogether, or converted some other words into the name which had been so much in his thoughts. "'It is remarkable, too,' thought Nicholas, "'if it had been Kate, or Kate Nickleby, I should not have been so much surprised, but little Kate Nickleby!' The wine coming at the moment prevented his finishing the sentence. He swallowed a glassful, and took up the paper again. At that instant, "'Little Kate Nickleby!' cried the voice behind him. "'I was right,' muttered Nicholas, as the paper fell from his hand. 
and it was the man I supposed. "'As there was a proper objection to drinking her in heel-taps,' said the voice, "'we'll give her the first glass in the new magnum. Little Kate Nickleby!' "'Little Kate Nickleby!' cried the other three, and the glasses were set down empty. Keenly alive to the tone and manner of this slight and careless mention of his sister's name in a public place, Nicholas fired at once, but he kept himself quiet by a great effort, and did not even turn his head. "'The jade!' said the same voice which had spoken before. "'She's a true Nickleby, a worthy imitator of her old Uncle Ralph. She hangs back to be more sought after. So does he, nothing to be got out of Ralph unless you follow him up, and then the money comes doubly welcome, and the bargain doubly hard, for you're impatient, and he isn't. Oh, infernal cunning!' "'Infernal cunning!' echoed two voices." Nicholas was in a perfect agony as the two elderly gentlemen opposite rose one after the other and went away, lest they should be the means of his losing one word of what was said. But the conversation was suspended as they withdrew, and resumed with even greater freedom when they had left the room. "'I am afraid,' said the younger gentleman, "'that the old woman has grown jealous and locked her up. Upon my soul it looks like it.' "'If they quarrel and little Nickleby goes home to her mother, so much the better,' said the first." "'I can do anything with the old lady. "'She'll believe anything I tell her.' "'Egad, that's true,' returned the other voice. "'Ha, ha, ha! Poor devil!' The laugh was taken up by the two voices which always came in together, and became general at Mrs. Nickleby's expense. Nicholas turned burning hot with rage, but he commanded himself for the moment, and waited to hear more. What he heard need not be repeated here. Suffice it that as the wine went round, he heard enough to acquaint him with the characters and designs of those whose conversation he overheard, to possess him with the full extent of Ralph's villainy, and the real reason of his own presence being required in London. He heard all this and more. He heard his sister's sufferings derided, and her virtuous conduct jeered at and brutally misconstrued. He heard her name bandied from mouth to mouth, and herself made the subject of coarse and insolent wagers, free speech, and licentious jesting. The man who had spoken first led the conversation, and indeed almost engrossed it, being only stimulated from time to time by some slight observation from one or other of his companions. To him, then, Nicholas addressed himself when he was sufficiently composed to stand before the party, and force the words from his parched and scorching throat. "'Let me have a word with you, sir,' said Nicholas. "'With me, sir?' retorted Sir Mulberry Hawk, eyeing him in disdainful surprise. "'I said with you.' replied Nicholas, speaking with great difficulty, for his passion choked him. "'A mysterious stranger, upon my soul!' exclaimed Sir Mulberry, raising his wine-glass to his lips, and looking round upon his friends. "'Will you step apart with me for a few minutes, or do you refuse?' said Nicholas sternly. Sir Mulberry merely paused in the act of drinking, and bade him either name his business or leave the table. Nicholas drew a card from his pocket, and threw it before him. "'There, sir,' said Nicholas, "'my business you will guess.' A momentary expression of astonishment, not unmixed with some confusion, of Sir Mulberry as he read the name, but he subdued it in an instant, and tossing the card to Lord Verisoft, who sat opposite, drew a toothpick from a glass before him, and very leisurely applied it to his mouth. "'Your name and address?' said Nicholas, turning paler as his passion kindled. "'I shall give you neither,' replied Sir Mulberry." "'If there is a gentleman in this party,' said Nicholas, looking round, and scarcely able to make his white lips form the words, "'he will acquaint me with the name and residence of this man.' There was dead silence. "'I am the brother of the young lady who has been the subject of conversation here,' said Nicholas. "'I denounce this person as a liar, and impeach him as a coward. If he has a friend here, he will save him the disgrace of the paltry attempt to conceal his name, and utterly useless one.' for I will find it out, nor leave him until I have. Sir Mulberry looked at him contemptuously, and, addressing his companions, said, Let the fellow talk, I have nothing serious to say to boys of his station, and his pretty sister shall save him a broken head if he talks till midnight. You are a base and spiritless scoundrel, said Nicholas, and shall be proclaimed so to the world. I will know you, I will follow you home if you walk the streets till morning." Sir Mulberry's hand involuntarily closed upon the decanter, and he seemed for an instant about to launch it at the head of his challenger. But he only filled his glass and laughed in derision. Nicholas sat himself down, directly opposite to the party, and, summoning the waiter, paid his bill. 
"'Do you know that person's name?' he inquired of the man in an audible voice, pointing out Sir Mulberry as he put the question. Sir Mulberry laughed again, and the two voices, which had always spoken together, echoed the laugh, but rather feebly. "'That gentleman, sir,' replied the waiter, who, no doubt, knew his cue, and answered with just as little respect, and just as much impertinence as he could safely show, "'No, sir, I do not, sir.' "'Here, you, sir,' cried Sir Mulberry, as the man was retiring. "'Do you know that person's name?' "'Name, sir? No, sir.' "'Then you'll find it there.' said Sir Mulberry, throwing Nicholas's card towards him. "'And when you have made yourself master of it, put that piece of pasteboard in the fire, do you hear me?' The man grinned, and, looking doubtfully at Nicholas, compromised the matter by sticking the card in the chimney-glass. Having done this, he retired. Nicholas folded his arms, and, biting his lip, sat perfectly quiet, sufficiently expressing by his manner, however, a firm determination to carry his threat of following Sir Mulberry home, into steady execution. It was evident, from the tone in which the younger member of the party appeared to remonstrate with his friend, that he objected to this course of proceeding, and urged him to comply with the request which Nicholas had made. Sir Mulberry, however, who was not quite sober, and who was in a sullen and dogged state of obstinacy, soon silenced the representations of his weak young friend, and further seemed, as if to save himself from a repetition of them, to insist on being left alone. However this might have been, the young gentleman and the two who had always spoken together actually rose to go after a short interval, and presently retired, leaving their friend alone with Nicholas. It will be very readily supposed that to one in the condition of Nicholas the minutes appeared to move with leaden wings indeed, and that their progress did not seem the more rapid from the monotonous ticking of a French clock, or the shrill sound of its little bell which told the quarters. But there he sat, and in his old seat on the opposite side of the room reclined Sir Mulberry Hawk with his legs upon the cushion, and his handkerchief thrown negligently over his knees, finishing his magnum of claret with the utmost coolness and indifference. Thus they remained in perfect silence for upwards of an hour. Nicholas would have thought for three hours at least, but that the little bell had only gone four times. Twice or thrice he looked angrily and impatiently round, but there was Sir Mulberry, in the same attitude, putting his glass to his lips from time to time, and looking vacantly at the wall, as if he were wholly ignorant of the presence of any living person. At length he yawned, stretched himself, and rose, walked coolly to the glass, and having surveyed himself therein, turned round and honoured Nicholas with a long and contemptuous stare. Nicholas stared again with right good will. Sir Mulberry shrugged his shoulders, smiled slightly, rang the bell, and ordered the waiter to help him on with his greatcoat. The man did so and held the door open. "'Don't wait,' said Sir Mulberry, and they were alone again. Sir Mulberry took several turns up and down the room, whistling carelessly all the time, stopped to finish the last glass of claret which he had poured out a few minutes before, walked again, put on his hat, adjusted it by the glass, drew on his gloves, and, at last, walked slowly out. Nicholas, who had been fuming and chafing until he was nearly wild, darted from his seat and followed him so closely that before the door had swung upon its hinges after Sir Mulberry's passing out, they stood side by side in the street together. There was a private cabriolet in waiting. The groom opened the apron and jumped out to the horse's head. "'Will you make yourself known to me?' asked Nicholas in a suppressed voice. "'No,' replied the other fiercely, and confirming the refusal with an oath. "'No.' "'If you trust to your horse's speed, you will find yourself mistaken,' said Nicholas. I will accompany you. By heaven I will, if I hang on to the footboard. You shall be horsewhipped if you do, returned Sir Mulberry. You are a villain, said Nicholas. You are an errand boy, for aught I know, said Sir Mulberry Hawk. I am the son of a country gentleman, returned Nicholas. Your equal in birth and education, and your superior, I trust, in everything besides. I tell you again, Miss Nickleby is my sister. Will you, or will you not, answer for your unmanly and brutal conduct? "'To a proper champion, yes. To you, no,' returned Sir Mulberry, taking the reins in his hand. "'Stand out of the way, dog. William, let go her head.' "'You had better not,' cried Nicholas, springing on the step as Sir Mulberry jumped in, and catching at the reins. "'He has no command over the horse, mind. You shall not go. You shall not, I swear, till you have told me who you are.' The groom hesitated, for the mare, who was a high-spirited animal, and thoroughbred, 
plunged so violently that he could scarcely hold her. "'Leave go, I tell you!' thundered his master. The man obeyed. The animal reared and plunged as though it would dash the carriage into a thousand pieces, but Nicholas, blind to all sense of danger, and conscious of nothing but his fury, still maintained his place and his hold upon the reins. "'Will you unclasp your hand? Will you tell me who you are? No! No!' In less time than the quickest tongue could tell it, these words were exchanged, and Sir Mulberry, shortening his whip, applied it furiously to the head and shoulders of Nicholas. It was broken in the struggle. Nicholas gained the heavy handle, and with it laid open one side of his antagonist's face from the eye to the lip. He saw the gash, knew that the mare had darted off at a wild, mad gallop, a hundred lights danced in his eyes, and he felt himself flung violently upon the ground. He was giddy and sick, but staggered to his feet directly, roused by the loud shouts of the men who were tearing up the street, and screaming to those ahead to clear the way. He was conscious of a torrent of people rushing quickly by. Looking up, could discern the cabriolet whirled along the foot-pavement with frightful rapidity, then heard a loud cry, the smashing of some heavy body, and the breaking of glass, and then the crowd closed in, in the distance, and he could see or hear no more. The general attention had been entirely directed from himself to the person in the carriage, and he was quite alone. Rightly judging that under such circumstances it would be madness to follow, he turned down a by-street in search of the nearest coach-stand, finding, after a minute or two, that he was reeling like a drunken man, and aware for the first time of a stream of blood that was trickling down his face and breast. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 33. In which Mr. Ralph Nickleby is relieved, by a very expeditious process, from all commerce with his relations. Smike and Newman Noggs, who in his impatience had returned home long before the time agreed upon, sat before the fire, listening anxiously to every footstep on the stairs, and the slightest sound that stirred within the house, for the approach of Nicholas. Time had worn on, and it was growing late. He had promised to be back in an hour, and his prolonged absence began to excite considerable alarm in the minds of both, as was abundantly testified by the blank looks they cast upon each other at every new disappointment. At length a coach was heard to stop, and Newman ran out to light Nicholas up the stairs. Beholding him in the trim described at the conclusion of the last chapter, he stood aghast in wonder and consternation. "'Don't be alarmed,' said Nicholas." hurrying him back into the room. There is no harm done, beyond what a basin of water can repair. "'No harm!' cried Newman, passing his hands hastily over the back and arms of Nicholas, as if to assure himself that he had broken no bones. "'What have you been doing?' "'I know all,' interrupted Nicholas. "'I have heard a part and guessed the rest. But before I remove one jot of these stains, I must hear the whole from you. You see, I am collected. My resolution is taken. Now, my good friend, speak out.' for the time for any palliation or concealment is past, and nothing will avail Ralph Nickleby now. "'Your dress is torn in several places, and you walk lame, and I am sure you are suffering pain,' said Newman. "'Let me see to your hurts first. "'I have no hurts to see to, beyond a little soreness and stiffness that will soon pass off,' said Nicholas, seating himself with some difficulty. "'But if I had fractured every limb and still preserved my senses, you should not bandage one till you had told me what I have the right to know. "'Come,' said Nicholas, giving his hand to Noggs. You had a sister of your own, you told me once, who died before you fell into misfortune. Now think of her, and tell me, Newman. Yes, I will, I will, said Noggs. I'll tell you the whole truth. Newman did so. Nicholas nodded his head from time to time, as it corroborated the particulars he had already gleaned, but he fixed his eyes upon the fire and did not look round once. His recital ended, Newman insisted upon his young friend stripping off his coat, and allowing whatever injuries he had received to be properly tended. Nicholas, after some opposition, at length consented, and, while some pretty severe bruises on his arms and shoulders were being rubbed with oil and vinegar, and various other efficacious remedies which Newman borrowed from the different lodgers, related in what manner they had been received. The recital made a strong impression on the warm imagination of Newman, for when Nicholas came to the violent part of the quarrel, he rubbed so hard as to occasion him the most exquisite pain, 
which he would not have exhibited, however, for the world, it being perfectly clear that, for the moment, Newman was operating on Sir Mulberry Hawk, and had quite lost sight of his real patient. This martyrdom over, Nicholas arranged with Newman that while he was otherwise occupied next morning, arrangements should be made for his mother's immediately quitting her present residence, and also for dispatching Miss La Creevy to break the intelligence to her. He then wrapped himself in Smike's greatcoat, and repaired to the inn where they were to pass the night, and where, after writing a few lines to Ralph, the delivery of which was to be entrusted to Newman next day, he endeavoured to obtain the repose of which he stood so much in need. Drunken men, they say, may roll down precipices, and be quite unconscious of any serious personal inconvenience when their reason returns. The remark may possibly apply to injuries received in other kinds of violent excitement. Certain it is that although Nicholas experienced some pain on first awakening next morning, he sprung out of bed as the clock struck seven, with very little difficulty, and was soon as much on the alert as if nothing had occurred. Merely looking into Smike's room, and telling him that Newman Noggs would call for him very shortly, Nicholas descended into the street, and calling a hackney coach, bade the man drive to Miss Wittitterly's, according to the direction which Newman had given him on the previous night. It wanted a quarter to eight when they reached Cadogan Place. Nicholas began to fear that no one might be stirring at that early hour, when he was relieved by the sight of a female servant employed in cleaning the doorsteps. By this functionary he was referred to the doubtful page, who appeared with dishevelled hair and a very warm and glossy face, as of a page who had just got out of bed. By this young gentleman he was informed that Miss Nickleby was then taking her morning's walk in the gardens before the house. On the question being propounded whether he could go and find her, the page desponded and thought not, but being stimulated with a shilling, the page grew sanguine and thought he could. "'Say to Miss Nickleby that her brother is here, and in great haste to see her,' said Nicholas. The plated buttons disappeared with an alacrity most unusual to them, and Nicholas paced the room in a state of feverish agitation, which made the delay even of a minute insupportable. He soon heard a light footstep which he well knew, and before he could advance to meet her, Kate had fallen on his neck and burst into tears. "'My darling girl,' said Nicholas, as he embraced her, "'how pale you are!' "'I have been so unhappy here, dear brother,' sobbed poor Kate, "'so very, very miserable. "'Do not leave me here, dear Nicholas, or I shall die of a broken heart.' "'I will leave you nowhere,' answered Nicholas. "'Never again, Kate,' he cried, moved in spite of himself, as he folded her to his heart. "'Tell me that I acted for the best. "'Tell me that we parted because I feared to bring misfortune on your head, "'that it was a trial to me no less than to yourself, "'and that if I did wrong it was in ignorance of the world and unknowingly.' "'Why should I tell you what we know so well?' returned Kate soothingly. "'Nicholas, dear Nicholas, how can you give way thus?' "'It is such bitter reproach to me to know what you have undergone,' returned her brother, "'to see you so much altered, and yet so kind and patient. "'God!' cried Nicholas, clenching his fists and suddenly changing his tone and manner. "'It sets my whole blood on fire again. "'You must leave here with me directly. "'You should not have slept here last night, but that I knew all this too late. "'To whom can I speak before we drive away?' This question was most opportunely put, for at that instant Mr. Wittitterly walked in, and to him Kate introduced her brother, who at once announced his purpose, and the impossibility of deferring it. "'The quarter's notice,' said Mr. Wittitterly, with the gravity of a man on the right side, "'is not yet half expired. Therefore—' "'Therefore,' interposed Nicholas, "'the quarter's salary must be lost, sir. "'You will excuse this extreme haste, "'but circumstances require that I should immediately remove my sister, "'and I have not a moment's time to lose. "'Whatever she brought here I will send for, if you will allow me, "'in the course of the day.' "'Mr. Wittitterly bowed, but offered no opposition to Kate's immediate departure.' with which, indeed, he was rather gratified than otherwise, Sir Tumley Snuffim having given it as his opinion that she rather disagreed with Mrs. Wittitterly's constitution. "'With regard to the trifle of salary that is due,' said Mr. Wittitterly, "'I will—' here he was interrupted by a violent fit of coughing— "'I will owe it to Miss Nickleby.' Mr. Wittitterly, it should be observed, was accustomed to owe small amounts, and to leave them owing— all men have some little pleasant way of their own, and this was Mr. Wittitterly's. "'If you please,' said Nicholas. And once more, offering a hurried apology for so sudden a departure, he hurried Kate into the vehicle, and bade the man drive with all speed into the city. 
To the city they went accordingly, with all the speed the hackney coach could make, and as the horses happened to live at Whitechapel, and to be in the habit of taking their breakfast there, when they breakfasted at all, they performed the journey with greater expedition than could reasonably have been expected. Nicholas sent Kate upstairs a few minutes before him, that his unlooked-for appearance might not alarm his mother, and when the way had been paved, presented himself with much duty and affection. Newman had not been idle, for there was a little cart at the door, and the effects were hurrying out already. Now, Mrs. Nickleby was not the sort of person to be told anything in a hurry, or rather to comprehend anything of peculiar delicacy or importance, on a short notice. Wherefore, although the good lady had been subjected to a full hour's preparation by little Miss La Creevy, and was now addressed in the most lucid terms by both Nicholas and his sister, she was in a state of singular bewilderment and confusion, and could by no means be made to comprehend the necessity of such hurried proceedings." "'Why don't you ask your uncle, my dear Nicholas, what he can possibly mean by it?' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'My dear mother,' returned Nicholas, "'the time for talking has gone by. There is but one step to take, and that is to cast him off with the scorn and indignation he deserves. Your own honour and good name demand that, after the discovery of his vile proceedings, you should not be beholden to him one hour, even for the shelter of these bare walls.' "'To be sure,' said Mrs. Nickleby, crying bitterly, "'he is a brute, a monster, and the walls are very bare, and want painting too, and I have had the ceiling whitewashed at the expense of eighteen pence, which is a very distressing thing, considering that it is so much gone into your uncle's pocket. I never could have believed it, never.' "'Nor I, nor anybody else,' said Nicholas. "'Lord bless my life!' exclaimed Mrs. Nickleby. "'to think that that Sir Mulberry Hawk "'should be such an abandoned wretch "'as Miss La Creevy says he is, Nicholas, my dear, "'when I was congratulating myself every day "'on his being an admirer of our Kate's, "'and thinking what a thing it would be for the family "'if he was to become connected with us "'and use his interest to get you "'some profitable government place. "'There are very good places to be got "'about the court, I know, "'for a friend of ours, Miss Cropley at Exeter, "'my dear Kate, you recollect, he had one, and I know that it was the chief part of his duty to wear silk stockings and a bag wig like a black watch-pocket, and to think that it should come to this, after all, oh, dear, dear, it's enough to kill one, that it is. With which expressions of sorrow, Mrs. Nickleby gave fresh vent to her grief, and wept piteously. As Nicholas and his sister were by this time compelled to superintend the removal of the few articles of furniture, Miss La Creevy devoted herself to the consolation of the matron, and observed, with great kindness of manner, that she must really make an effort and cheer up. "'Oh, I dare say, Miss La Creevy,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, with a petulance not unnatural in her unhappy circumstances, "'it's very easy to say cheer up, but if you had as many occasions to cheer up as I have had—and there,' said Mrs. Nickleby, stopping short, "'think of Mr. Pike and Mr. Plunk, two of the most perfect gentlemen that ever lived, what am I to say to them? What can I say to them? Why, if I was to say to them, I'm told your friend Sir Mulberry is a base wretch, they'd laugh at me. They will laugh no more at us, I take it, said Nicholas, advancing. Come, mother, there's a coach at the door, and until Monday, at all events, we will return to our old quarters. Where everything is ready, and a hearty welcome into the bargain, added Miss La Creevy. Now let me go with you downstairs. But Mrs. Nickleby was not to be so easily moved, for first she insisted on going upstairs to see that nothing had been left, and then on going downstairs to see that everything had been taken away, and when she was getting into the coach she had a vision of a forgotten coffee-pot on the back kitchen hob, and after she was shut in, a dismal recollection of a green umbrella behind some unknown door. At last Nicholas, in a condition of absolute despair, ordered the coachman to drive away, and in the unexpected jerk of a sudden starting, Mrs. Nickleby lost a shilling among the straw, which, fortunately, confined her attention to the coach until it was too late to remember anything else. Having seen everything safely out, discharged the servant, and locked the door, Nicholas jumped into a cabriolet and drove to a by-place near Golden Square where he had appointed to meet Noggs, and so quickly had everything been done that it was barely half-past nine when he reached the place of meeting. "'Here is the letter for Ralph,' said Nicholas, "'and here is the key. When you come to me this evening, not a word of last night.' "'Ill news travels fast, and they will know it soon enough. "'Have you heard if he was much hurt?' "'Newman shook his head. "'I will ascertain that myself without loss of time,' said Nicholas. 
"'You had better take some rest,' returned Newman. "'You are fevered and ill.' Nicholas waved his hand carelessly, and, concealing the indisposition he really felt, now that the excitement which had sustained him was over, took a hurried farewell of Newman Noggs and left him. Newman was not three minutes' walk from Golden Square, but in the course of that three minutes he took the letter out of his hat and put it in again twenty times at least. First the front, then the back, then the sides, then the superscription, then the seal, were objects of Newman's admiration. Then he held it at arm's length as if to take in the whole at one delicious survey, and then he rubbed his hands in a perfect ecstasy with his commission. He reached the office, hung his hat on its accustomed peg, laid the letter and key upon the desk, and waited impatiently until Ralph Nickleby should appear. After a few minutes the well-known creaking of his boots was heard on the stairs, and then the bell rung. "'Has the post come in?' "'No. "'Any other letters?' "'One.' Newman eyed him closely and laid it on the desk. "'What's this?' asked Ralph, taking up the key. "'Left with the letter. A boy brought them, quarter of an hour ago or less.' Ralph glanced at the direction, opened the letter, and read as follows. "'You are known to me now. There are no reproaches I could heap upon your head which would carry them with one thousandth part of the groveling shame that this assurance will awaken even in your breast. Your brother's widow and her orphan child spurn the shelter of your roof, and shun you with disgust and loathing. Your kindred renounce you, for they know no shame but the ties of blood which bind them in name to you. You are an old man, and I leave you to the grave. May every recollection of your life cling to your false heart, and cast their darkness on your deathbed. Ralph Nickleby read this letter twice, and, frowning heavily, fell into a fit of musing. The paper fluttered from his hand and dropped upon the floor, but he clasped his fingers as if he held it still. Suddenly he started from his seat, and, thrusting it all crumpled into his pocket, turned furiously to Newman Noggs, as though to ask him why he lingered. But Newman stood unmoved, with his back towards him, following up, with the worn and blackened stump of an old pen, some figures in an interest table which was pasted against the wall, and apparently quite abstracted from every other object. End of chapter 33《Chapter Thirty Four of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirty Four. Wherein Mr. Ralph Nickleby is visited by persons with whom the reader has been already made acquainted. "'What a demnition long time you have kept me ringing at this confounded old cracked tea-kettle of a bell, every tinkle of which is enough to throw a strong man into blue convulsions upon my life and soul, oh, damn it!' said Mr. Mantalini to Newman Noggs, scraping his boots as he spoke, on Ralph Nickleby's scraper. "'I didn't hear the bell more than once,' replied Newman. "'Then you are most immensely and outrageously deaf,' said Mr. Mantalini, "'as deaf as a demnition post.' Mr. Mantalini had got by this time into the passage, and was making his way to the door of Ralph's office with very little ceremony, when Newman interposed his body, and, hinting that Mr. Nickleby was unwilling to be disturbed, inquired whether the client's business was of a pressing nature. "'It is most damnably particular,' said Mr. Mantalini. "'It is to melt some scraps of dirty paper into bright, shining, chinking, tinkling, demmed mint sauce.' Newman uttered a significant grunt, and, taking Mr. Mantalini's proffered card, limped with it into his master's office. As he thrust his head in at the door, he saw that Ralph had resumed the thoughtful posture into which he had fallen after perusing his nephew's letter, and that he seemed to have been reading it again, as he once more held it open in his hand. The glance was but momentary, for Ralph, being disturbed, turned to demand the cause of the interruption. As Newman stated it, the cause himself swaggered into the room, and grasping Ralph's horny hand with uncommon affection, vowed that he had never seen him looking so well in all his life. "'There is quite a bloom upon your demmed countenance,' said Mr. Mantalini, seating himself unbidden, and arranging his hair and whiskers. "'You look quite juvenile and jolly, damn it!' "'We are alone,' returned Ralph tartly. "'What do you want with me?' "'Good!' cried Mr. Mantalini, displaying his teeth. "'What did I want? Yes, ha, ha, very good. What did I want? Ha, ha, oh, dem. "'What do you want, man?' demanded Ralph sternly. "'Demnition discount,' returned Mr. Mantalini, with a grin, and shaking his head waggishly. "'Money is scarce,' said Ralph. 
"'Damned scarce, or I shouldn't want it,' interrupted Mr. Mantellini. "'The times are bad, and one scarcely knows whom to trust,' continued Ralph. "'I don't want to do business just now. In fact, I would rather not. But, as you are a friend, how many bills have you there?' Two, returned Mr. Mantellini. "'What is the gross amount?' "'Dem trifling. Five and seventy. "'And the dates?' Two months and four. "'I'll do them for you. Mind, for you. I wouldn't for many people. For five and twenty pounds,' said Ralph, deliberately. "'Oh, dim it!' cried Mr. Mantellini, whose face lengthened considerably at this handsome proposal. "'Why, that leaves you fifty, retorted Ralph. "'What would you have? Let me see the names.' "'You are so dimmed hard, Nickleby,' remonstrated Mr. Mantellini. "'Let me see the names,' replied Ralph, impatiently extending his hand for the bills. "'Well, they are not sure, but they are safe enough. Do you consent to the terms, and will you take the money? I don't want you to do so. I would rather you didn't.' "'Demn it, Nickleby, can't you—' began Mr. Mantellini. "'No,' replied Ralph, interrupting him. "'I can't. Will you take the money? Down, mind. No delay. No going into the city and pretending to negotiate with some other party who has no existence and never had. Is it a bargain, or is it not?' Ralph pushed some papers from him as he spoke, and carelessly rattled his cash-box, as though by mere accident. The sound was too much for Mr. Mantellini. He closed the bargain directly it reached his ears, and Ralph told the money out upon the table. He had scarcely done so, and Mr. Mantellini had not yet gathered it all up, when a ring was heard at the bell, and immediately afterwards Newman ushered in no less a person than Madame Mantellini, at sight of whom Mr. Mantellini evinced considerable discomposure, and swept the cash into his pocket with remarkable alacrity. "'Oh, you are here!' said Madame Mantellini, tossing her head. "'Yes, my life and soul I am,' replied her husband, dropping on his knees and pouncing with kitten-like playfulness upon a stray sovereign. "'I am here, my soul's delight, upon Tom Tiddler's ground, picking up the demnition gold and silver.' "'I am ashamed of you,' said Madame Mantellini, with much indignation. "'Ashamed? Of me, my joy? It knows it is talking dem charming sweetness, but naughty fibs,' returned Mr. Mantellini. "'It knows it is not ashamed of its own populorum tibi.' Whatever were the circumstances which had led to such a result, it certainly appeared as though the populorum tibi had rather miscalculated, for the nonce, the extent of his lady's affection. Madame Mantellini only looked scornful in reply, and turning to Ralph, begged him to excuse her intrusion." "'Which is entirely attributable,' said Madame, "'to the gross misconduct and most improper behaviour of Mr. Mantellini. "'Of me, my essential juice of pineapple?' "'Of you,' returned his wife. "'But I will not allow it. "'I will not submit to be ruined by the extravagance and profligacy of any man. "'I call Mr. Nickleby to witness the course I intend to pursue with you.' "'Pray don't call me to witness anything, ma'am,' said Ralph. "'Settle it between yourselves, settle it between yourselves.' "'No, I must beg you, as a favor," said Madame Mantellini, "'to hear me give him notice of what is my fixed intention to do. "'My fixed intention, sir,' repeated Madame Mantellini, "'darting an angry look at her husband. "'Will she call me sir?' cried Mantellini. "'Me, who dote upon her with the demdest ardor? "'She, who coils her fascinations round me like a pure angelic rattlesnake? "'It will be all up with my feelings. "'She will throw me into a demmed state.' "'Don't talk of feelings, sir,' rejoined Madame Mantellini, seating herself and turning her back upon him. "'You don't consider mine.' "'I do not consider yours my soul!' exclaimed Mr. Mantellini. "'No,' replied his wife. And notwithstanding various blandishments on the part of Mr. Mantellini, Madame Mantellini still said no, and said it too with such determined and resolute ill-temper that Mr. Mantellini was clearly taken aback. "'His extravagance, Mr. Nickleby,' said Madame Mantellini, addressing herself to Ralph, who leant against his easy-chair with his hands behind him, and regarded the amiable couple with the smile of the supremest and most unmitigated contempt. "'His extravagance is beyond all bounds.' "'I should scarcely have supposed it,' answered Ralph sarcastically. "'I assure you, Mr. Nickleby, however, that it is,' returned Madame Mantellini. "'It makes me miserable. I am under constant apprehensions, and in constant difficulty. And even this,' said Madame Mantellini, wiping her eyes, "'is not the worst. He took some papers of value out of my desk this morning without asking my permission.' Mr. Mantellini groaned slightly, and buttoned his trousers-pocket. 
"'I am obliged,' continued Madame Montalini, "'since our late misfortunes, to pay Miss Knag a great deal of money for having her name in the business, and I really cannot afford to encourage him in all his wastefulness. As I have no doubt that he came straight here, Mr. Nickleby, to convert the papers I have spoken of into money, and as you have assisted us very often before, and are very much connected with us in this kind of matters, I wish you to know the determination at which his conduct has compelled me to arrive.' Mr. Montalini groaned once more from behind his wife's bonnet, and, fitting a sovereign into one of his eyes, winked with the other at Ralph. Having achieved this performance with great dexterity, he whipped the coin into his pocket, and groaned again with increased penitence. "'I have made up my mind,' said Madame Montalini, as tokens of impatience manifested themselves in Ralph's countenance, to allowance him. "'To do that, my joy?' inquired Mr. Montalini, who did not seem to have caught the words." "'To put him,' said Madame Montalini, looking at Ralph, and prudently abstaining from the slightest glance at her husband, lest his many graces should induce her to falter in her resolution, "'to put him upon a fixed allowance, and I say that if he has a hundred and twenty pounds a year for his clothes and pocket-money, he may consider himself a very fortunate man.' Mr. Montalini waited, with much decorum, to hear the amount of the proposed stipend, but when it reached his ears he cast his hat and cane upon the floor, and drawing out his pocket-handkerchief, gave vent to his feelings in a dismal moan. "'Damnition!' cried Mr. Mantellini, suddenly skipping out of his chair, and as suddenly skipping into it again, to the great discomposure of his lady's nerves. "'But no! It is a demmed horrid dream! It is not reality! No!' Comforting himself with this assurance, Mr. Mantellini closed his eyes, and waited patiently till such time as he should wake up. "'A very judicious arrangement,' observed Ralph with a sneer, "'If your husband will keep within it, ma'am, as no doubt he will.' "'Damn it!' exclaimed Mr. Mantellini, opening his eyes at the sound of Ralph's voice. "'It is a horrid reality. She is sitting there before me. There is the graceful outline of her form. It cannot be mistaken. There is nothing like it. The two countesses had no outlines at all, and the dowager's was a demmed outline. Why is she so excruciatingly beautiful that I cannot be angry with her even now?' "'You have brought it upon yourself, Alfred,' returned Madame Montalini, still reproachfully, but in a softened tone. "'I am a demmed villain,' cried Mr. Montalini, smiting himself on the head. "'I will fill my pockets with change for a sovereign in halfpence and drown myself in the Thames, but I will not be angry with her even then, for I will put a note in the two-penny post as I go along to tell her where the body is. She will be a lovely widow. I shall be a body. Some handsome women will cry. She will laugh demnably. "'Alfred, you cruel, cruel creature!' said Madame Montalini, sobbing at the dreadful picture. "'She calls me cruel. Me! Me! Who for her sake will become a demmed, damp, moist, unpleasant body!' exclaimed Mr. Montalini. "'You know it almost breaks my heart even to hear you talk of such a thing,' replied Madame Montalini. "'Can I live to be mistrusted?' cried her husband. "'Have I cut my heart into a demmed extraordinary number of little pieces, "'and given them all away, one after another, "'to the same little engrossing demnition captivator? "'And can I live to be suspected by her? Demn it, no, I can't!' "'Ask Mr. Nickleby whether the sum I have mentioned is not a proper one,' "'reasoned Madame Montalini. "'I don't want any sum,' replied her disconsolate husband. "'I shall require no demmed allowance. I will be a body.' On this repetition of Mr. Montalini's fatal threat, Madame Montalini wrung her hands and implored the interference of Ralph Nickleby, and after a great quantity of tears and talking, and several attempts on the part of Mr. Montalini to reach the door, preparatory to straightway committing violence upon himself, that gentleman was prevailed upon with difficulty to promise that he wouldn't be a body. This great point attained, Madame Montalini argued the question of the allowance, and Mr. Montalini did the same taking occasion to show that he could live with uncommon satisfaction upon bread and water, and go clad in rags, but that he would not support existence with additional burden of being mistrusted by the object of his most devoted and disinterested affection. This brought fresh tears into Madame Montalini's eyes, which, having just begun to open to some few of the demerits of Mr. Montalini, were only open a very little way, and could be easily closed again. The result was, that without quite giving up the allowance question, Madame Montalini postponed its further consideration, and Ralph saw, clearly enough, that Mr. Montalini had gained a fresh lease of his easy life, and that, for some time longer at all events, his degradation and downfall were postponed. "'But it will come soon enough,' thought Ralph. "'All love—bah, that I should use the cant of boys and girls—is fleeting enough, 
though that which has its sole root in the admiration of a whiskered face like that of yonder baboon perhaps lasts the longest as it originates in the greater blindness and is fed by vanity meantime the fools bring grist to my mill so let them live out their day and the longer it is the better these agreeable reflections occurred to ralph nickleby as sundry small caresses and endearments supposed to be unseen were exchanged between the objects of his thoughts if you have nothing more to say my dear to mr nickleby said madame mantalini we will take our leaves i am sure we have detained him much too long already mr mantalini answered in the first instance by tapping madame mantalini several times on the nose and then by remarking in words that he had nothing more to say damn it i have though he added almost immediately drawing ralph into a corner here's an affair about your friend sir mulberry such a demmed extraordinary out of the way kind of thing as never was eh "'What do you mean?' asked Ralph. "'Don't you know, Demet? asked Mr. Mantalini. "'I see by the paper that he was thrown from his cabriolet last night, and severely injured, and that his life is in some danger,' answered Ralph with great composure. "'But I see nothing extraordinary in that. Accidents are not miraculous events, when men live hard, and drive after dinner.' "'Woo!' cried Mr. Mantalini, in a long, shrill whistle. "'Then don't you know how it was?' "'Not unless it was as I have just supposed,' replied Ralph, shrugging his shoulders carelessly, as if to give his questioner to understand that he had no curiosity upon the subject. "'Demit, you amaze me!' cried Montalini. Ralph shrugged his shoulders again, as if it were no great feat to amaze Mr. Montalini, and cast a wistful glance at the face of Newman Noggs, which had several times appeared behind a couple of panes of glass in the room door it being a part of newman's duty when unimportant people called to make various feints of supposing that the bell had rung for him to show them out by way of a gentle hint to such visitors that it was time to go don't you know said mr mantalini taking ralph by the button that it wasn't an accident at all but a demmed furious manslaughtering attack made upon him by your nephew what snarled ralph clenching his fists and turning a livid white Demet Nickleby, you're as great a tiger as he is,' said Montalini, alarmed at these demonstrations. "'Go on,' cried Ralph. "'Tell me what you mean. What is this story? Who told you? Speak,' growled Ralph. "'Do you hear me?' "'Gad, Nickleby,' said Mr. Montalini, retreating towards his wife, "'what a damnable fierce old evil genius you are. You're enough to frighten the life and soul out of her little delicious wits, flying all at once into such a blazing, ravaging, raging passion as never was, Demet.' "'Psha!' rejoined Ralph, forcing a smile. It is but manner. It is demmed uncomfortable private madhouse sort of a manner, said Mr. Montalini, picking up his cane. Ralph affected to smile, and once more inquired from whom Mr. Montalini had derived his information. From Pike, and a demmed fine pleasant gentlemanly dog it is, replied Montalini. Demnition pleasant, and a tip-top sawyer. And what said he? asked Ralph, knitting his brows. That it happened this way, that your nephew met him at a coffee-house, fell upon him with the most damnable ferocity, followed him to his cab, swore he would ride home with him, if he rode upon the horse's back or hooked himself on to the horse's tail, smashed his countenance, which is a demmed fine countenance in its natural state, frightened the horse, pitched out Sir Mulberry and himself, and— And was killed? interposed Ralph with gleaming eyes. Was he? Is he dead? Mr. Montalini shook his head. Ugh! said Ralph, turning away. "'Then he has done nothing. Stay,' he added, looking round again. "'He broke a leg or an arm, or put a shoulder out, or fractured his collar-bone, or ground a rib or two. His neck was saved for the halter, but he got some painful and slow-healing injury for his trouble. Did he? You must have heard that, at least.' "'No,' rejoined Montalini, shaking his head again. "'Unless he was dashed into such little pieces that they blew away, he wasn't hurt, for he went off as quiet and comfortable as—as—as as, as demnition,' said Mr. Montalini rather at a loss for a simile. "'And what,' said Ralph, hesitating a little, "'what was the cause of the quarrel?' "'You are the demdest knowing hand,' replied Mr. Montalini, in an admiring tone. "'The cunningest, rummest, superlativest old fox! Oh, dem, to pretend now not to know that it was the little bright-eyed niece, the softest, sweetest, prettiest—' "'Alfred!' interposed Madame Montalini. "'She is always right,' rejoined Mr. Montalini soothingly. "'And when she says it is time to go, it is time. "'And go she shall, and when she walks along the streets with her own tulip, "'the women shall say with envy that she has got a demmed fine husband, "'and the men shall say with rapture, he has got a demmed fine wife, "'and they shall both be right and neither wrong, upon my life and soul. "'Oh, demn it!' 
with which remarks and many more no less intellectual and to the purpose mr montalini kissed the fingers of his gloves to ralph nickleby and drawing his lady's arm through his led her mincingly away so so muttered ralph dropping into his chair this devil is loose again and thwarting me as he was born to do at every turn he told me once there should be a day of reckoning between us sooner or later i'll make him a true prophet for it shall surely come are you at home asked newman suddenly popping in his head no replied ralph with equal abruptness newman withdrew his head but thrust it in again you're quite sure you're not at home are you said newman what does the idiot mean cried ralph testily he has been waiting nearly ever since they first came in and may have heard your voice that's all said newman rubbing his hands who has demanded ralph wrought by the intelligence that he had just heard and by his clerk's provoking coolness to an intense pitch of irritation the necessity of a reply was superseded by the unlooked-for entrance of a third party the individual in question who bringing his one eye for he had but one to bear on ralph nickleby made a great many shambling bows and sat himself down in an armchair with his hands on his knees and his short black trousers drawn up so high in the legs by the exertion of seating himself that they scarcely reached below the tops of his wellington boots why this is a surprise said ralph bending his gaze upon the visitor and half smiling as he scrutinized him attentively i should know your face mr squeers ah replied that worthy and you'd have knowed it better sir if it hadn't been for all that i've been a-going through just lift that little boy off the tall stool in the back office and tell him to come in here will you my man said squeers addressing himself to newman oh he's lifted hisself off my son sir little wackford what do you think of him sir for a specimen of the dotha boys hall feeding ain't he fit to bust out of his clothes and start the seams and make the very buttons fly off with his fatness here's flesh cried squeers turning the boy about and indenting the plumpest parts of his figure with divers pokes and punches to the great discomposure of his son and heir here's firmness here's solidness why you can hardly get up enough of him between your finger and thumb to pinch him anywheres in however good condition master squeers might have been he certainly did not present this remarkable compactness of person for on his father's closing his fingers and thumb in illustration of his remark he uttered a sharp cry and rubbed the place in the most natural manner possible well remarked squeers a little disconcerted i had him there but that's because we breakfasted early this morning and he hasn't had his lunch yet why you couldn't shut a bit of him in a door when he's had his dinner look at them tears sir said squeers with a triumphant air as master wackford wiped his eyes with the cuff of his jacket there's oiliness he looks well indeed returned ralph who for some purposes of his own seemed desirous to conciliate the schoolmaster but how is mrs squeers and how are you mrs squeers sir replied the proprietor of dotha boys is as she always is a mother to them lads and a blessing and a comfort and a joy to all them as knows her one of our boys gorging hisself with vittles and then turning in that's their way got a abscess on him last week to see how she operated upon him with a penknife oh lor said squeers heaving a sigh and nodding his head a great many times what a member of society that woman is mr squeers indulged in a retrospective look for some quarter of a minute as if this allusion to his lady's excellences had naturally led his mind to the peaceful village of dotheboys near greta bridge in yorkshire and then looked at ralph as if waiting for him to say something have you quite recovered that scoundrel's attack asked ralph i've only just done it if i've done it now replied squeers i was one blessed bruise sir said squeers touching first the roots of his hair and then the toes of his boots from here to there vinegar and brown paper vinegar and brown paper from morning to night i suppose there was a matter of half a ream of brown paper stuck upon me from first to last as i laid all of a heap in our kitchen plastered all over you might have thought i was a large brown paper parcel chock full of nothing but groans did i groan loud wackford or did i groan soft asked mr squeers appealing to his son loud replied wackford was the boys sorry to see me in such a dreadful condition wackford or was they glad asked mr squeers in a sentimental manner gl eh cried squeers turning sharp round sorry rejoined his son oh said squeers catching him a smart box on the ear then take your hands out of your pockets and don't stammer when you're asked a question hold your noise sir in a gentleman's office or i'll run away from my family and never come back any more and then what would become of all them precious and forlorn lads as would be let loose on the world without their best friend at their elbers 
"'Were you obliged to have medical attendance?' inquired Ralph. "'Ay, was I,' rejoined Squeers, "'and a precious bill the medical attendant brought in, too. "'But I paid it, though.' Ralph elevated his eyebrows in a manner which might be expressive of either sympathy or astonishment, just as the beholder was pleased to take it. "'Yes, I paid it every farthing,' replied Squeers, who seemed to know the man he had to deal with, too well to suppose that any blinking of the question would induce him to subscribe towards the expenses. "'I wasn't out of pocket by it after all, either.' "'No,' said Ralph. "'Not a half-penny,' replied Squeers. "'The fact is, we have only one extra with our boys, and that is for doctors, when required, and not then unless we're sure of our customers, do you see?' "'I understand,' said Ralph. "'Very good,' rejoined Squeers. "'Then, after my bill was run up, we picked out five little boys, sons of small tradesmen, as was sure pay, that had never had the scarlet fever, and we sent one to a cottage where they'd got it, and he took it, and then we put the four others to sleep with him, and they took it, and then the doctor came and attended em once all round, and we divided my total among em, and added it on to their little bills, and the parents paid it. Ha! 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 "'And a good plan, too,' said Ralph, eyeing the schoolmaster stealthily. "'I believe you,' rejoined Squeers. "'We always do it. "'Why, when Mrs. Squeers was brought to bed with little Wackford here, "'we ran the hooping cough through a half a dozen boys, "'and charged her expenses among them, monthly nurse included. "'Ha! Ha! Ha!' "'Ralph never laughed, but on this occasion he produced the nearest approach to it that he could, "'and waiting until Mr. Squeers had enjoyed the professional joke to his heart's content, "'inquired what had brought him to town.' "'Some bothering law business,' replied Squeers, scratching his head, "'connected with an action, for what they call neglect of a boy. "'I don't know what they would have. "'He had as good grazing, that boy had, as there is about us.' "'Ralph looked as if he did not quite understand the observation. "'Grazing,' said Squeers, raising his voice, "'under the impression that, as Ralph failed to comprehend him, he must be deaf. "'When a boy gets weak and ill and don't relish his meals, "'we give him a change of diet.' turn him out for an hour or so every day into a neighbor's turnip field, or sometimes, if it's a delicate case, a turnip field and a piece of carrots, alternately, and let him eat as many as he likes. There ain't better land in the country than this perverse lad grazed on, and yet he goes and catches cold and indigestion and what not, and then his friends brings a lawsuit against me. Now, you'd hardly suppose, added Squeers, moving in his chair with the impatience of an ill-used man, that people's ingratitude would carry them quite as far as that, would you? "'A hard case, indeed,' observed Ralph. "'You don't say more than the truth when you say that,' replied Squeers. "'I don't suppose there's a man going as possesses the fondness for youth that I do. "'There's youth to the amount of eight hundred pound a year at Dotha Boys Hall at this present time. "'I'd take sixteen hundred pound worth if I could get him, "'and be as fond of every individual twenty pound among em as nothing should equal it.' "'Are you stopping at your old quarters?' asked Ralph. "'Yes, we are at the Saracen,' replied Squeers, "'and as it don't want very long to the end of the half-year, "'we shall continue to stop there till I've collected the money, "'and some new boys, too, I hope. "'I've brought little Wackford up on purpose to show to parents and guardians. "'I shall put him in the advertisement this time. "'Look at that boy, himself a pupil. "'Why, he's a miracle of high feeding, that boy is.' "'I should like to have a word with you,' said Ralph, "'who had both spoken and listened mechanically for some time, "'and seemed to have been thinking.' "'As many words as you like, sir,' rejoined Squeers. "'Wackford, you go and play in the back office, "'and don't move about too much, or you'll get thin, and that won't do. "'You haven't got such a thing as twopence, Mr. Nickleby, have you?' "'said Squeers, rattling a bunch of keys in his coat-pocket, "'and muttering something about its being all silver. "'I think I have,' said Ralph, very slowly, "'and producing, after much rummaging in an old drawer, "'a penny, a half-penny, and two farthings. "'Thank ye,' said Squeers, bestowing it upon his son.' "'Here, you go and buy a tart. Mr. Nickleby's man will show you where. And mind, you buy a rich one. Pastry,' added Squeers, closing the door on Master Wackford, "'makes his flesh shine a good deal, and parents thinks that's a healthy sign.' With this explanation, and a peculiarly knowing look to eke it out, Mr. Squeers moved his chair so as to bring himself opposite to Ralph Nickleby at no great distance off, and having planted it to his entire satisfaction, sat down. "'Attend to me.' said Ralph, bending forward a little. Squeers nodded. "'I am not to suppose,' said Ralph, "'that you are dolt enough to forgive or forget, very readily, the violence that was committed upon you, or the exposure which accompanied it?' "'Devil a bit,' replied Squeers, tartly. 
"'or to lose an opportunity of repaying it with interest, if you could get one,' said Ralph. "'Show me one and try,' rejoined Squeers. "'Some such object it was that induced you to call on me?' said Ralph, raising his eyes to the schoolmaster's face. N -n -n "'No, I don't know about that,' replied Squeers. "'I thought that if it was in your power to make me, besides the trifle of money you sent, any compensation—' "'Ah!' cried Ralph, interrupting him. "'You needn't go on.' After a long pause, during which Ralph appeared absorbed in contemplation, he again broke silence by asking, "'Who is this boy that he took with him?' Squeer stated his name. "'Was he young or old, healthy or sick, tractable or rebellious? Speak out, man,' retorted Ralph. "'Why, he wasn't young,' answered Squeers. "'That is, not young for a boy, you know.' "'That is, he was not a boy at all, I suppose,' interrupted Ralph." "'Well,' returned Squeers, briskly, as if he felt relieved by the suggestion, "'he might have been nigh twenty. "'He wouldn't seem so old, though, to them as didn't know him, "'for he was a little wanting here, touching his forehead. "'Nobody at home, you know, if you knocked ever so often.' "'And you did knock pretty often, I dare say,' muttered Ralph. "'Pretty well,' returned Squeers, with a grin. "'When you wrote to acknowledge the receipt of this trifle of money, as you call it,' said Ralph, "'You told me his friends had deserted him long ago, "'and that you had not the faintest clue or trace to tell you who he was. "'Is that the truth?' "'It is, worse luck,' replied Squeers, "'becoming more and more easy and familiar in his manner "'as Ralph pursued his inquiries with the less reserve. "'It's fourteen years ago, by the entry in my book, "'since a strange man brought him to my place one autumn night "'and left him there, paying five pound five for his first quarter in advance.' He might have been five or six year old at that time, not more. "'What more do you know about him?' demanded Ralph. "'Devilish little, I am sorry to say,' replied Squeers. "'The money was paid for some six or eight year, and then it stopped. He had given an address in London, had this chap, but when it came to the point, of course nobody knowed anything about him. So I kept the lad out of—' "'Out of—' "'Charity?' suggested Ralph dryly. "'Charity, to be sure,' returned Squeers, rubbing his knees— and when he begins to be useful in a certain sort of way, this young scoundrel of a Nickleby comes and carries him off. But the most vexatious and aggravating part of the whole affair is, said Squeers, dropping his voice, and drawing his chair still closer to Ralph, that some questions have been asked about him at last, not of me, but, in a roundabout sort of way, of people in our village, so that just when I might have had all arrears paid up, perhaps— and perhaps, who knows, such things have happened in our business before, a present besides for putting him out to a farmer, or sending him to sea, so that he might never turn up to disgrace his parents, supposing him to be a natural boy, as many of our boys are. Damn me, if that villain of a Nickleby don't collar him in open day, and commit as good as highway robbery upon my pocket. "'We will both cry quits with him before long,' said Ralph, laying his hand on the arm of the Yorkshire schoolmaster. "'Quits!' echoed Squeers. "'Ah!' and I should like to leave a small balance in his favour, to be settled when he can. I only wish Mrs. Squeers could catch hold of him. Bless her heart, she'd murder him, Mr. Nickleby. She would, as soon as eat her dinner. We will talk of this again, said Ralph. I must have time to think of it, to wound him through his own affections and fancies. If I could strike him through this boy— Strike him how you like, sir, interrupted Squeers. Only hit him hard enough, that's all. And with that I'll say good morning. "'Here, just chuck that little boy's hat off that corner peg, and lift him off the stool, will you?' Brawling these requests to Newman Noggs, Mr. Squeers betook himself to the little back office, and fitted on his child's hat with parental anxiety, while Newman, with his pen behind his ear, sat, stiff and immovable, upon his stool, regarding the father and son by turns with a broad stare. "'He's a fine boy, Auntie said Squeers, throwing his head a little on one side, and falling back to the desk, the better to estimate the proportions of little Wackford. "'Very,' said Newman. "'Pretty well swelled out, ain't he?' pursued Squeers. "'He is the fatness of twenty boys he has.' "'Ah!' replied Newman, suddenly thrusting his face into that of Squeers. "'He has the fatness of twenty. More! He's got it all! God help that others! Ha, ha, O oh Lord!' Having uttered these fragmentary observations, Newman dropped upon his desk and began to write with most marvellous rapidity. "'Why, what does the man mean?' cried Squeers, colouring. "'Is he drunk?' Newman made no reply. "'Is he mad?' said Squeers. But still Newman betrayed no consciousness of any presence save his own, 
So Mr. Squeers comforted himself by saying that he was both drunk and mad, and, with this parting observation, he led his hopeful son away. In exact proportion as Ralph Nickleby became conscious of a struggling and lingering regard for Kate, had his detestation of Nicholas augmented. It might be that to atone for the weakness of inclining to any one person, he held it necessary to hate some other more intensely than before, but such had been the course of his feelings. And now, to be defied and spurned, to be held up to her in the worst and most repulsive colours, to know that she was taught to hate and despise him, to feel that there was infection in his touch and taint in his companionship, to know all this, and to know that the mover of it all was that same boyish poor relation who had twitted him in their very first interview, and openly bearded and braved him since, wrought his quiet and stealthy malignity to such a pitch that there was scarcely anything he would not have hazarded to gratify it, if he could have seen his way to some immediate retaliation. But, fortunately for Nicholas, Ralph Nickleby did not, and although he cast about all that day, and kept a corner of his brain working on the one anxious subject through all the round of schemes and business that came with it, night found him at last, still harping on the same theme, and still pursuing the same unprofitable reflections. "'When my brother was such as he,' said Ralph, "'the first comparisons were drawn between us, always in my disfavour. He was open, liberal, gallant, gay, I, a crafty hunks of cold and stagnant blood, with no passion but love of saving, and no spirit beyond a thirst for gain. I recollected it well when I first saw this whipster, but I remember it better now. He had been occupied in tearing Nicholas's letter into atoms, and as he spoke he scattered it in a tiny shower about him. Recollections like these, pursued Ralph with a bitter smile, flock upon me, when I resign myself to them, in crowds and from countless quarters. As a portion of the world affect to despise the power of money, I must try and show them what it is. And being by this time in a pleasant frame of mind for slumber, Ralph Nickleby went to bed. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter thirty five of Nicholas Nickleby. Read by As Pistachio in Waxaw, North Carolina. Smike becomes known to Mrs. Nickleby and Kate. Nicholas also meets with new acquaintances. Brighter days seem to dawn upon the family. Having established his mother and sister in the apartments of the kind-hearted miniature painter, and ascertained that Sir Mulberry Hawk was in no danger of losing his life, Nicholas turned his thoughts to poor Smike, who, after breakfasting with Newman Noggs, had remained in a disconsolate state, at that worthy creature's lodgings, waiting, with much anxiety, for further intelligence of his protector. As he will be one of our own little household, wherever we live, or whatever fortune is in reserve for us, thought Nicholas, I must present the poor fellow in due form. They will be kind to him for his own sake, and if not, on that account solely, to the full extent I could wish, they will stretch a point, I am sure, for mine. Nicholas said they, but his misgivings were confined to one person. He was sure of Kate— but he knew his mother's peculiarities, and was not quite so certain that Smike would find favour in the eyes of Mrs. Nickleby. However, thought Nicholas, as he departed on his benevolent errand, she cannot fail to become attached to him, when she knows what a devoted creature he is, and as she must quickly make the discovery, his probation will be a short one. "'I was afraid,' said Smike, overjoyed to see his friend again, that you had fallen into some fresh trouble. The time seemed so long, at last, that I almost feared you were lost. Lost, replied Nicholas gaily. You will not be rid of me so easily, I promise you. I shall rise to the surface many thousand times yet, and the harder the thrust that pushes me down, the more quickly I shall rebound, Smike. But come, my errand here is to take you home. Home, faltered Smike drawing timidly back. "'Aye,' rejoined Nicholas, taking his arm. "'Why not?' "'I had such hopes once,' said Smike. 
day and night, day and night for many years, I longed for home till I was weary, and pined away with grief. But now—' "'And what now?' asked Nicholas, looking kindly in his face. "'What now, old friend?' "'I could not part from you to go to any home on earth,' replied Smike, pressing his hand. "'Except one, except one. I shall never be an old man, and if your hand placed me in the grave, and I could think, before I died, that you would come and look upon it sometimes, with one of your kind smiles, and in the summer weather, when everything was alive, not dead like me, I could go to that home almost without a tear.' "'Why do you talk thus, poor boy, if your life is a happy one with me?' said Nicholas. "'Because I should change, not those about me. And if they forgot me, I should never know it,' replied Smike. "'In the churchyard we are all alike, but here there are none like me. I am a poor creature, but I know that.' "'You are a foolish, silly creature,' said Nicholas cheerfully. "'If that is what you mean, I grant you that.' "'Why, here's a dismal face for ladies' company. "'My pretty sister, too, whom you have so often asked me about. "'Is this your Yorkshire gallantry? "'For shame, for shame!' "'Smike brightened up and smiled. "'When I talk of home,' pursued Nicholas, "'I talk of mine, which is yours, of course. "'If it were defined by any particular four walls and a roof, "'God knows I should be sufficiently puzzled to say whereabouts it lay. "'But that is not what I mean.' When I speak of home, I speak of the place where, in default of a better, those I love are gathered together, and if that place were a gypsy's tent or a barn, I should call it by the same good name notwithstanding. And now, for what is my present home, which, however alarming your expectations may be, will neither terrify you by its extent nor its magnificence." So saying, Nicholas took his companion by the arm, and saying a great deal more to the same purpose, and pointing out various things to amuse and interest him as they went along, led the way to Miss La Creevy's house. "'And this, Kate,' said Nicholas, entering the room where his sister sat alone, "'is the faithful friend and affectionate fellow-traveller whom I prepared you to receive.' Poor Smike was bashful, and awkward, and frightened enough at first— but Kate advanced towards him so kindly, and said in such a sweet voice how anxious she had been to see him after all her brother had told her, and how much she had to thank him for having comforted Nicholas so greatly in their very trying reverses, that he began to be very doubtful whether he should shed tears or not, and became still more flurried. However, he managed to say, in a broken voice, that Nicholas was his only friend— and that he would lay down his life to help him. And Kate, although she was so kind and considerate, seemed to be so wholly unconscious of his distress and embarrassment that he recovered almost immediately, and felt quite at home. Then Mrs. La Creevy came in, and to her Smike had to be presented also, and Miss La Creevy was very kind too, and wonderfully talkative, not to Smike, for that would have made him uneasy at first, but to Nicholas and his sister. Then after a time she would speak to Smike himself now and then, asking him whether he was a judge of likenesses, and whether he thought that picture in the corner was like herself, and whether he didn't think it would have looked better if she had made herself ten years younger, and whether he didn't think, as a matter of general observation, that young ladies looked better not only in pictures, but out of them too, than old ones with many more small jokes and facetious remarks, which were delivered with such good humour and merriment, that Smike thought, within himself, that she was the nicest lady he had ever seen, even nicer than Mrs. Gruden, of Mr. Vincent Crummel's theatre, and she was a nice lady too, and talked perhaps more, but certainly louder, than Miss La Creevy. At length the door opened again, and a lady in mourning came in, and Nicholas, kissing the lady in mourning affectionately, and calling her his mother, led her towards the chair from which Smike had risen when she entered the room. "'You are always kind-hearted and anxious to help the oppressed, my dear mother,' said Nicholas, "'so you will be favourably disposed towards him, I know.' "'I am sure, my dear Nicholas,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, looking very hard at her new friend, and bending to him with something more of majesty than the occasion seemed to require, 
"'I am sure any friend of yours has, as indeed he naturally ought to have, and must have, of course, you know, a great claim upon me. And, of course, it is a very great pleasure to me to be introduced to anybody you take an interest in. There can be no doubt about that, none at all, not in the least in the world,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'At the same time, I must say, Nicholas, my dear, as I used to say to your poor dear papa, when he would bring gentlemen home to dinner, and there was nothing in the house, that if he had come the day before yesterday—no, uh, I, I don't mean the day before yesterday now, I should have said, perhaps, the year before last—we should have been better able to entertain him.' with which remarks Mrs. Nickleby turned to her daughter, and inquired in an audible whisper whether the gentleman was going to stop all night. "'Because if he is Kate, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'I don't see that it's possible for him to sleep anywhere, and that's the truth.' Kate stepped gracefully forward, and without any show of annoyance or irritation, breathed a few words into her mother's ear. "'La, Kate, my dear!' said Mrs. Nickleby, shrinking back. "'How you do tickle one! Of course I understand that, my love, without your telling me. And I said the same to Nicholas, and I am very much pleased. You didn't tell me, Nicholas, my dear,' added Mrs. Nickleby, turning round with an air of less reserve than she had before assumed, "'what your friend's name is.' "'His name, mother,' replied Nicholas, "'is Smike.' The effect of this communication was by no means anticipated." but the name was no sooner pronounced than Mrs. Nickleby dropped upon a chair and burst into a fit of crying. "'What is the matter?' exclaimed Nicholas, running to support her. "'It's so like Pike!' cried Mrs. Nickleby. "'So exactly like Pike! Oh, don't speak to me. I shall be better presently.' And after exhibiting every symptom of slow suffocation in all its stages, and drinking about a teaspoonful of water from a full tumbler, and spilling the remainder, Mrs. Nickleby was better, and remarked, with a feeble smile, that she was very foolish, she knew. "'It's a weakness in our family,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'so of course I can't be blamed for it. Your grandmamma, Kate, was exactly the same, precisely. The least excitement, the slightest surprise, she fainted away directly.' I have heard her say, often and often, that when she was a young lady, and before she was married, she was turning a corner into Oxford Street one day, when she ran against her own hairdresser, who, it seems, was escaping from a bear. The mere suddenness of the encounter made her faint away directly. Wait, though, added Mrs. Nickleby, pausing to consider. Let me be sure I'm right. Was it her hairdresser who had escaped from a bear, or was it a bear who had escaped from her hairdresser's? I declare I can't remember just now. But the hairdresser was a very handsome man, I know, and quite a gentleman in his manners, so that it has nothing to do with the point of the story. Mrs. Nickleby, having fallen imperceptibly into one of her retrospective moods, improved in temper from that moment and glided by an easy exchange of the conversation, occasionally into various other anecdotes, no less remarkable for their strict application to the subject in hand. "'Mr. Smike is from Yorkshire, Nicholas, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, after dinner, and when she had been silent for some time. "'Certainly, mother,' replied Nicholas. "'I see you have not forgotten his melancholy history.' "'Oh, dear, no!' cried Mrs. Nickleby. "'Ah, melancholy indeed! "'You don't happen, Mr. Smike, "'ever to have dined with the Grimbles of Grimble Hall, "'somewhere in the North Riding, do you?' "'said the good lady, addressing herself to him. "'A very proud man, Sir Thomas Grimble, "'with six grown-up and most lovely daughters, "'and the finest park in the county. "'My dear mother,' reasoned Nicholas, "'do you suppose that the unfortunate outcast of a Yorkshire school "'was likely to receive many cards of invitation "'from the nobility and gentry in the neighbourhood? "'Well, really, my dear, I don't know why it should be so very extraordinary,' "'said Mrs. Nickleby. "'I know that when I was in school, "'I always went at least twice every half-year to the Hawkinses at Taunton Vale, "'and they are much richer than the Grimbles, "'and connected with them in marriage.' "'So, you see, it is not very unlikely, after all.' Having put down Nicholas in this triumphant manner, Mrs. Nickleby was suddenly seized with a forgetfulness of Smike's real name, 
and an irresistible tendency to call him Mr. Slammons, which circumstance she attributed to the remarkable similarity of the two names in point of sound, both beginning with an S, and moreover being spelt with an M. But whatever doubt there might be on this point, there was none as to his being a most excellent listener, which circumstance had considerable influence in placing them on the very best terms, and inducing Mrs. Nickleby to express the highest opinion of his general deportment and disposition. Thus the little circle remained, on the most amicable and agreeable footing, until the Monday morning, when Nicholas withdrew himself from it for a short time, seriously to reflect upon the state of his affairs, and to determine, if he could, upon some course of life, which would enable him to support those who were so entirely dependent upon his exertions. Mr. Crummles occurred to him more than once, but although Kate was acquainted with the whole history of his connection with that gentleman, his mother was not, and he foresaw a thousand fretful objections on her part to his seeking a livelihood upon the stage. There were graver reasons, too, against his returning to that mode of life, independently of those arising out of its spare and precarious earnings, and his own internal conviction that he could never hope to aspire to any great distinction, even as a provincial actor, how could he carry his sister from town to town, and place to place, and debar her from any other associates than those with whom he would be compelled, almost without distinction, to mingle? "'It won't do,' said Nicholas, shaking his head. "'I must try something else.' It was much easier to make this resolution than to carry it into effect. With no greater experience of the world than he had acquired for himself in his short trials, with a sufficient share of headlong rashness and precipitation, qualities not altogether unnatural at his time of life, with a very slender stock of money, and a still more scanty stock of friends, what could he do? Egad, said Nicholas, I'll try that register's office again. He smiled at himself as he walked away with a quick step, for an instant before he had been internally blaming his own precipitation. He did not laugh himself out of the intention, however, for on he went, picturing to himself as he approached the place all kinds of splendid possibilities, and impossibilities too, for that matter, and thinking himself, perhaps with good reason, very fortunate to be endowed with so buoyant and sanguine a temperament. The office looked just the same as when he had left it last, and indeed, with one or two exceptions, there seemed to be the very same placards in the window that he had seen before. There were the same unimpeachable masters and mistresses in want of virtuous servants, and the same virtuous servants in want of unimpeachable masters and mistresses, and the same magnificent estates for the investment of capital, and the same enormous quantities of capital to be invested in estates and, in short, the same opportunities of all sorts for people who wanted to make their fortunes. And a most extraordinary proof of it was of the national prosperity, that people had not been found to avail themselves of such advantages long ago. As Nicholas stopped to look in at the window, an old gentleman happened to stop too, and Nicholas, carrying his eye along the window-panes from left to right, in search of some capital text placard, which should be applicable to his own case, caught sight of this old gentleman's figure, and instinctively withdrew his eyes from the window to observe the same more closely. He was a sturdy old fellow in a broad-skirted blue coat, made pretty large to fit easily, and with no particular waist, his bulky legs clothed in drab breeches and high gaiters, and his head protected by a low-crowned, broad-brimmed white hat, such as a wealthy grazier might wear. He wore his coat buttoned, and his dimpled double chin rested on the folds of a white neckerchief. Not one of your stiff, starched, apoplectic cravats, but a good, easy, old-fashioned white neckcloth, that a man might go to bed in, and be none the worse for. But what principally attracted the attention of Nicholas was the old gentleman's eye. Never was such a clear, twinkling, honest, merry, happy eye as that. And there he stood, looking a little upward, with one hand thrust into the breast of his coat, and the other playing with his old-fashioned gold watch-chain, his head thrown a little on one side, and his hat a little more on one side than his head, 
but that was evidently accident, not his ordinary way of wearing it, with such a pleasant smile, playing about his mouth, and such a comical expression of mingled slyness, simplicity, kind-heartedness, and good-humour lighting up his jolly old face, that Nicholas would have been content to have stood there and looked at him until evening, and to have forgotten, meanwhile, that there was such a thing as a soured mind, or a crabbed countenance, to be met with in the whole wide world. But even a very remote approach to this gratification was not to be made, for although he seemed quite unconscious of having been the subject of observation, he looked casually at Nicholas, and the latter, fearful of giving offence, resumed his scrutiny of the window instantly. Still the old gentleman stood there, glancing from placard to placard, and Nicholas could not forbear raising his eyes to his face again. Grafted upon the quaintness and oddity of his appearance was something so indescribably engaging, and bespeaking so much worth, and there were so many little lights hovering about the corners of his mouth and eyes, that it was not a mere amusement, but a positive pleasure and delight to look at him. This being the case, it is no wonder that the old man caught Nicholas in the fact more than once. At such times Nicholas coloured and looked embarrassed, for the truth is that he had begun to wonder whether the stranger could, by any possibility, be looking for a clerk or secretary, and thinking this, he felt as if the old gentleman must know it. Long as all this takes to tell, it was not more than a couple of minutes in passing. As the stranger was moving away, Nicholas caught his eye again, and, in the awkwardness of the moment, stammered out an apology. "'No offence, oh, no offence,' said the old man. This was said in such a hearty tone, and the voice was so exactly what it should have been from such a speaker, and there was such a cordiality in the manner, that Nicholas was emboldened to speak again. "'A great many opportunities here, sir,' he said, half smiling as he motioned towards the window. "'A great many people willing and anxious to be employed have seriously thought so very often, I dare say,' replied the old man. "'Poor fellows, poor fellows!' He moved away as he said this, but seeing that Nicholas was about to speak, good-naturedly slackened his pace, as if he were unwilling to cut him short. After a little of that hesitation which may be sometimes observed between two people on the street, who have exchanged a nod, and are both uncertain whether they shall turn back and speak or not, Nicholas found himself at the old man's side. "'You were about to speak, young gentleman? What were you going to say?' "'Merely that I almost hoped, I mean to say thought, you had some object in consulting those advertisements,' said Nicholas. "'Aye, aye. What object now, what object?' returned the old man, looking slyly at Nicholas. "'Did you think I wanted a situation now, eh? Did you think I did?' Nicholas shook his head. "'Ha, ha!' laughed the old gentleman, rubbing his hands and wrists as if he were washing them. "'A very natural thought, at all events, after seeing me gazing at those bills. I thought the same of you, at first. Upon my word, I did.' "'If you had thought so at last, too, sir, you would not have been far from the truth,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Eh?' cried the old man, surveying him from head to foot. "'What? Dear me, no, no! Well-behaved young gentleman, reduced to such a necessity! No, 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 no!' Nicholas bowed, and bidding him good morning, turned upon his heel. Uh, stay said the old man beckoning him into a by-street where they could converse with less interruption what do you mean eh merely that your kind face and manner both so unlike any i have ever seen tempted me into an avowal which to any other stranger in this wilderness of london i should not have dreamt of making returned nicholas wilderness yes it is good it is a wilderness said the old man with much animation it was a wilderness to me once. I came here barefoot. I have never forgotten it. Thank God! And he raised his hat from his head, and looked very grave. "'What is the matter? What is it? How did it all come about?' said the old man, laying his hand on the shoulder of Nicholas, and walking him up the street. "'Your... eh?' laying his finger on the sleeve of his black coat. "'Who is it for, eh?' "'My father,' replied Nicholas. Ah, said the old gentleman quickly, bad thing for a young man to lose his father. 
Widowed mother, perhaps? Nicholas sighed. Brothers and sisters, too, eh? One sister, rejoined Nicholas. Poor thing, poor thing. You are a scholar, too, I dare say, said the old man, looking wistfully into the face of the young one. I have been tolerably well educated, said Nicholas. Fine thing, said the old gentleman. Education a great thing, a very great thing. I never had any. I admire it the more in others. A very fine thing. Yes, yes. Tell me more of your history. Let me hear it all. No impertinent curiosity. No, 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 no. There was something so earnest and guileless in the way in which all this was said, and such a complete disregard of all conventional restraints and coldness, that Nicholas could not resist it. Among men who have any sound and sterling qualities, there is nothing so contagious as pure openness of heart. Nicholas took the infection instantly, and ran over the main points of his little history without reserve, merely suppressing names, and touching as lightly as possible upon his uncle's treatment of Kate. The old man listened with great attention, and when he had concluded, drew his arm eagerly through his own. "'Don't say another word, not another word,' said he. "'Come along with me. We mustn't lose a minute.' So saying, the old gentleman dragged him back into Oxford Street, and hailing an omnibus on its way to the city, pushed Nicholas in before him, and followed himself. As he appeared in a most extraordinary condition of restless excitement, and whenever Nicholas offered to speak, immediately interposed with, "'Don't say another word, my dear sir, on any account. Not another word.' The young man thought it better to attempt no further interruption." Into the city they journeyed accordingly, without interchanging any conversation, and the farther they went, the more Nicholas wondered what the end of the adventure could possibly be. The old gentleman got out, with great alacrity, when they reached the bank, and once more, taking Nicholas by the arm, hurried him along Threadneedle Street, and through some lanes and passages on the right, until they, at length, emerged in a quiet, shady little square. Into the oldest and cleanest-looking house of business in the square he led the way. The only inscription on the doorpost was, Cherryable Brothers. But from a hasty glance at the directions of some packages which were lying about, Nicholas supposed that the brothers Cherryable were German merchants. Passing through a warehouse which presented every indication of a thriving business, Mr. Cherryable, for such Nicholas supposed him to be, from the respect which had been shown him by the warehousemen and porters whom they passed, led him into a little partitioned-off counting-house, like a large glass case, in which counting-house there sat, as free from dust and blemish as if he had been fixed into the glass case before the top was put on, and had never come out since, a fat, elderly, large-faced clerk, with silver spectacles and a powdered head. "'Is my brother in his room, Tim?' said Mr. Cherrybull, with no less kindness of manner than he had shown to Nicholas. "'Yes, he is, sir,' replied the fat clerk, turning his spectacle-glasses towards his principal, and his eyes towards Nicholas. "'But Mr. Trimmers is with him.' "'Aye, and what has he come about, Tim?' said Mr. Cherrybull. "'He is getting up a subscription for the widow and a family of a man who was killed in the East India docks this morning,' rejoined Tim. "'Smashed, sir, by a cask of sugar.' "'He is a good creature,' said Mr. Cherrybull, with great earnestness. "'He is a kind soul. I am very much obliged to Trimmers. Trimmers is one of the best friends we have. He makes a thousand cases known to us that we should never discover ourselves. I am very much obliged to Trimmers.' Saying which, Mr. Cherrybull rubbed his hands with infinite delight, and Mr. Trimmers, happening to pass the door that instant, on his way out, shot after him, and caught him by the hand. "'I owe you a thousand thanks, Trimmers, ten thousand thanks. I take it very friendly of you, very friendly indeed,' said Mr. Cherrybull, dragging him into a corner to get out of hearing. "'How many children are there? And what has my brother Ned given, Trimmers?' "'There are six children,' replied the gentleman, "'and your brother has given us twenty pounds. My brother Ned is a good fellow.' "'And you're a good fellow, too, Trimmers,' said the old man, shaking him by both hands with trembling eagerness. "'Put me down for another twenty. Or stop a minute, stop a minute. We mustn't look ostentatious. Put me down ten pound, and Tim Lincolnwater ten pound, 
A check for twenty pound for Mr. Trimmers, Tim. God bless you, Trimmers, and come and dine with us some day this week. You'll always find a knife and fork, and we shall be delighted. Now, my dear sir, check from Mr. Lincolnwater, Tim. Smashed by a cask of sugar and six poor children. Oh, dear, 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 dear. Talking on in this strain as fast as he could, to prevent any friendly remonstrances from the collector of the subscription on the large amount of his donation, Mr. Cherrybull led Nicholas, equally astonished and affected by what he had seen and heard in this short space, to the half-open door of another room. "'Brother Ned,' said Mr. Cherrybull, tapping with his knuckles and stooping to listen, "'are you busy, my dear brother, or can you spare time for a word or two with me?' "'Brother Charles, my dear fellow,' replied a voice from the inside, so like in its tones to that which had just spoken, that Nicholas started, and almost thought it was the same. "'Don't ask me such a question, but come in directly.' They went in without further parley. What was the amazement of Nicholas, when his conductor advanced, and exchanged a warm greeting with another old gentleman, the very type and model of himself?' The same face, the same figure, the same coat, waistcoat and neckcloth, the same breeches and gaiters, nay, there was the very same white hat hanging against the wall. As they shook each other by the hand, the face of each lighted up by beaming looks of affection, which would have been most delightful to behold in infants, and which, in men so old, was inexpressibly touching. Nicholas could observe that the last old gentleman was something stouter than his brother, this, and a slight additional shade of clumsiness in his gait and stature, formed the only perceptible difference between them. Nobody could have doubted their being twin brothers. "'Brother Ned,' said Nicholas's friend, closing the room door, "'here is a young friend of mine, whom we must assist. We must make proper inquiries into his statements, in justice to him as well as to ourselves, and if they are confirmed, as I feel assured they will be, we must assist him, we must assist him, Brother Ned.' "'It is enough, my dear brother, that you say we should,' returned the other. "'When you say that, no further inquiries are needed. He shall be assisted. "'What are his necessities, and what does he require? "'Where is Tim Lincolnwater? Let us have him here.' Both the brothers, it may be here remarked, had a very emphatic and earnest delivery. Both had lost nearly the same teeth, which imparted the same peculiarity to their speech— and both spoke as if, besides possessing the utmost serenity of mind that the kindliest and most unsuspecting nature could bestow, they had, in collecting the plums from fortune's choicest pudding, retained a few for present use, and kept them in their mouths. "'Where is Tim Lincolnwater?' said Brother Ned. "'Stop, stop, stop,' said Brother Charles, taking the other aside. "'I've a plan, my dear brother, I've a plan.' "'Tim is getting old, and Tim has been a faithful servant, Brother Ned. "'And I don't think pensioning Tim's mother and sister "'and buying a little tomb for the family when his poor brother died "'was a sufficient recompense for his faithful services.' "'No, no, no,' replied the other, "'certainly not. "'Not half enough, not half.' "'If we could lighten Tim's duties,' said the old gentleman, and prevail upon him to go into the country now and then, and sleep in the fresh air, besides, two or three times a week, which he could if he began business an hour later in the morning. Old Tim Lincolnwater would grow young again in time, and he's three good years our senior now. Old Tim Lincolnwater young again, eh, Brother Ned, eh? Why, I recollect old Tim Lincolnwater quite a little boy, don't you? Ha, <laughs> ha! Poor Tim, poor Tim! and the fine old fellows laughed pleasantly together, each with a tear of regard for old Tim Lincolnwater, standing in his eye. "'But hear this first, hear this first, Brother Ned,' said the old man, hastily placing two chairs, one on each side of Nicholas. "'I'll tell it you myself, Brother Ned, because the young gentleman is modest and a scholar, Ned, and I shouldn't feel it right that he should tell us his story over and over again as if he was a beggar, or as if we doubted him. No, no, no.' "'No, no, no,' returned the other, nodding his head gravely. "'Very right, my brother, very right.' "'He will tell me if I'm wrong, if I make a mistake,' said Nicholas's friend. "'But whether I do or not, he'll be very much affected, Brother Ned, "'remembering the time when we were two friendless lads, "'and earned our first shilling in this great city.' "'The twins pressed each other's hands in silence, "'and in his own homely manner 
Brother Charles related the particulars he had heard from Nicholas. The conversation which ensued was a long one, and when it was over, a secret conference of almost equal duration took place between Brother Ned and Tim Lincolnwater in another room. It is no disparagement to Nicholas to say that before he had been closeted with the two brothers ten minutes, he could only wave his hand at every fresh expression of kindness and sympathy, and sob like a little child. At length Brother Ned and Tim Lincolnwater came back together. When Tim instantly walked up to Nicholas, and whispered in his ear in a very brief sentence, for Tim was ordinarily a man of few words, that he had taken down the address in the Strand, and would call upon him that evening at eight. Having done which, Tim wiped his spectacles and put them on, preparatory to hearing what more the brothers Cheryble had got to say. "'Tim,' said Brother Charles, "'you understand that we have an intention of taking this young gentleman into the counting-house.' Brother Ned remarked that Tim was aware of that intention, and quite approved of it, and Tim, having nodded, and said he did, drew himself up, and looked particularly fat and very important. After which there was a profound silence. "'I'm not coming an hour later in the morning, you know,' said Tim, breaking out all at once, and looking very resolute. "'I'm not going to sleep in the fresh air, no, nor I'm not going into the country, either.' "'A pretty thing at this time of day, certainly. Fuh! "'Damn your obstinacy, Tim Lincolnwater,' said Brother Charles, "'looking at him without the faintest spark of anger, "'and with a countenance radiant with attachment to the old clerk. "'Damn your obstinacy, Tim Lincolnwater. What do you mean, sir?' "'It's forty-four year,' said Tim, making a calculation in the air with his pen, "'and drawing an imaginary line before he cast it up. Forty-four year next May, since I first kept the books of Cheryble Brothers. I've opened the safe every morning all that time, Sundays excepted, as the clock struck nine, and gone over the house every night at half-past ten, except on foreign post nights and then twenty minutes before twelve, to see the doors fastened and the fires out. I've never slept out of the back attic one single night— there's the same mignonette box in the middle of the window, and the same four flower-pots, two on each side, that I brought with me when I first came. There ain't, I've said it again and again, and I'll maintain it. There ain't such a square as this in the world, I know there ain't, said Tim, with sudden energy, and looking sternly about him. Not one. For business or pleasure, in summer time or winter, I don't care which, there's nothing like it. There's not such a spring in England as the pump under the archway. There's not such a view in England as the view out of my window. I've seen it every morning before I shaved, and I ought to know something about it. I have slept in that room, added Tim, sinking his voice a little, for four and forty year, and if it wasn't inconvenient and didn't interfere with business, I should request leave to die there. Damn you, Tim Lincolnwater, how dare you talk about dying! roared the twins by one impulse, and blowing their old noses violently. "'That's what I've got to say, Mr. Edwin and Mr. Charles,' said Tim, squaring his shoulders again. "'This isn't the first time you've talked about superannuating me, but if you please, we'll make it the last, and drop the subject for evermore.' With these words Tim Lincolnwater stalked out, and shut himself up in his glass case with the air of a man who had had his say, and was thoroughly resolved not to be put down. The brothers exchanged looks, and coughed some half-dozen times without speaking. "'He must be done something with, Brother Ned,' said the other warmly. "'We must disregard his old scruples. They can't be tolerated or borne. He must be made a partner, Brother Ned, and if he won't submit to it peaceably, we must have recourse to violence.' "'Quite right,' replied Brother Ned, nodding his head as a man thoroughly determined. "'Quite right, my dear brother.' If he won't listen to reason, we must do it against his will, and show him that we are determined to exert our authority. We must quarrel with him, Brother Charles. We must, we certainly must have a quarrel with Tim Lincolnwater, said the other. But in the meantime, my dear brother, we are keeping our young friend, and the poor lady and her daughter will be anxious for his return. So let us say good-bye for the present. And there, there, take care of that box, my dear sir, and, no, no, not a word now, but be careful of the crossings, and—' And with any 
disjointed and unconnected words which would prevent Nicholas from pouring forth his thanks, the brothers hurried him out, shaking hands with him all the way, and affecting very unsuccessfully, they were poor hands at deception, to be wholly unconscious of the feelings that completely mastered him. Nicholas's heart was too full to allow of his turning into the street until he had recovered some composure. When he at last glided out of the dark doorway corner, in which he had been compelled to halt, he caught a glimpse of the twins stealthily peeping in at one corner of the glass case, evidently undecided whether they should follow up their late attack without delay, or for the present postpone laying further siege to the inflexible Tim Lincolnwater. To recount all the delight and wonder which the circumstances just detailed awakened at Miss La Creevy's, and all the things that were done, said, thought, expected, hoped, and prophesied in consequence, is beside the present course and purpose of these adventures. It is sufficient to state, in brief, that Mr. Timothy Lincolnwater arrived punctual to his appointment, that, oddity as he was, and jealous as he was bound to be, of the proper exercise of his employer's most comprehensive liberality, he reported strongly and warmly in favour of Nicholas, and that, next day, he was appointed to the vacant stool in the counting-house of Cherrybull Brothers, with a present salary of one hundred and twenty pounds a year. "'And I think, my dear brother,' said Nicholas's first friend, "'that if we were to let them that little cottage at Bow, which is empty, "'at something under the usual rent now, eh, Brother Ned?' "'For nothing at all,' said Brother Ned. "'We are rich, and should be ashamed to touch the rent under such circumstances as these. "'Where is Tim Lincolnwater? "'For nothing at all, my dear brother, for nothing at all.' "'Perhaps it would be better to say something, Brother Ned,' suggested the other mildly, it would help to preserve habits of frugality, you know, and remove any painful sense of overwhelming obligations. We might say fifteen pound or twenty pound, and if it was punctually paid, make it up to them in some other way. And I might secretly advance a small loan towards a little furniture. And you might secretly advance another small loan, Brother Ned. And if we find them doing well, as we shall, there's no fear, no fear. We can change loans into gifts." carefully, Brother Ned, and by degrees, and without pressing upon them too much. What do you say now, Brother? Brother Ned gave his hand upon it, and not only said it should be done, but had it done too, and in one short week Nicholas took possession of the stool, and Mrs. Nickleby and Kate took possession of the house, and all was hope, bustle, and light-heartedness, there surely never was such a week of discoveries and surprises as the first week of that cottage. Every night when Nicholas came home, something new had been found out. One day it was a grapevine, and another day it was a boiler, and another day it was the key of the front parlour closet at the bottom of the water-butt, and so on through a hundred items. Then this room was embellished with a muslin curtain, and that room was rendered quite elegant by a window-blind, and such improvements were made as no one would have supposed possible. Then there was Miss La Creevy, who had come out in the omnibus to stop a day or two, and help, and who was perpetually losing a very small brown paper parcel of tin tacks, and a very large hammer, and running about with her sleeves tucked up at the wrists, and falling off pairs of steps and hurting herself very much. And Mrs. Nickleby, who talked incessantly, and did something now and then, but not often, and Kate, who busied herself noiselessly everywhere, and was pleased with everything, and Smike, who made the garden a perfect wonder to look upon, and Nicholas, who helped and encouraged them every one, all the peace and cheerfulness of home restored, with such new zest imparted to every frugal pleasure, and such delight to every hour of meeting, as misfortune and separation alone could give." In short, the poor Nicklebys were social and happy, while the rich Nickleby was alone and miserable. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens Chapter 36 Private and Confidential Relating to Family Matters Showing how Mr. Kenwigs underwent violent agitation and how Mrs. Kenwigs was as well as could be expected. It might have been seven o'clock in the evening, and it was growing dark in the narrow streets near Golden Square, when Mr. Kenwigs sent out for a pair of the cheapest white kid gloves, those at fourteen pence, and selecting the strongest which happened to be the right-hand one, walked downstairs with an air of pomp and much excitement, and proceeded to muffle the knob of the street-door knocker therein. Having executed this task with great nicety, Mr. Kenwigs pulled the door to after him, and just stepped across the road to try the effect from the opposite side of the street. Satisfied that nothing could possibly look better in its way, Mr. Kenwigs then stepped back again, and calling through the keyhole to Morlina to open the door, vanished into the house, and was seen no longer. Now, considered as an abstract circumstance, there was no more obvious cause or reason why Mr. Kenwigs should take the trouble of muffling this particular knocker than there would have been for muffling the knocker of any nobleman or gentleman resident ten miles off, because, for the greater convenience of the numerous lodgers, the street door always stood wide open, and the knocker was never used at all. The first floor, the second floor, and the third floor had each a bell of its own, as to the attics, no one ever called on them. If anyone wanted the parlours, they were close at hand, and all he had to do was walk straight into them, while the kitchen had a separate entrance down the area steps. As a question of mere necessity and usefulness, therefore, this muffling of the knocker was thoroughly incomprehensible. But knockers may be muffled for other purposes than those of mere utilitarianism, as, in the present instance, was clearly shown. There are certain plight forms and ceremonies which must be observed in civilised life, or mankind relapse into their original barbarism. No genteel lady was ever yet confined. Indeed, no genteel confinement can possibly take place without the accompanying symbol of a muffled knocker. Mrs. Kenwigs was a lady of some pretensions to gentility. Mrs. Kenwigs was confined. And therefore, Mr. Kenwigs tied up the silent knocker on the premises in a white kid glove. I'm not quite certain neither, said Mr. Kenwigs, arranging his shirt collar and walking slowly upstairs, whether, as it's a boy, I won't have it in the papers. Pondering upon the advisability of this step, and the sensation it was likely to create in the neighbourhood, Mr. Kenwigs betook himself to the sitting-room, where various extremely diminutive articles of clothing were airing on a horse before the fire, and Mr. Lumley, the doctor, was dandling the baby, that is, the old baby, not the new one. "'It's a fine boy, Mr. Kenwigs,' said Mr. Lumby, the doctor. "'You consider him a fine boy, do you, sir?' returned Mr. Kenwigs. "'It's the finest boy I ever saw in all my life,' said the doctor." I never saw such a baby. It is a pleasant thing to reflect upon, and furnishes a complete answer to those who contend for the gradual degeneration of the human species, that every baby born into the world is a finer one than the last. I never saw such a baby, said Mr. Lumby, the doctor. Morlina was a fine baby, remarked Mr. Kenwigs, as if this were rather an attack by implication upon the family. They were all fine babies, said Mr. Lumby, and Mr. Lumby went on nursing the baby with a thoughtful look, whether he was considering under what head he could best charge the nursing in the bill was best known to himself. During this short conversation, Miss Morlina, as the eldest of the family and natural representative of her mother during her indisposition, had been hustling and slapping the three younger Miss Kenwigses without intermission, which considerate and affectionate conduct brought tears into the eyes of Mr. Kenwigs, and caused him to declare that, in the understanding and behaviour, that child was a woman. 
"'She will be a treasure to the man she marries, sir,' said Mr. Kenwigs, half aside. "'I think she'll marry above her station, Mr. Lumby.' "'I shouldn't wonder at all,' replied the doctor. "'You never see a dance, sir, did you?' asked Mr. Kenwigs. The doctor shook his head. "'Aye,' said Mr. Kenwigs, as though he pitied him from his heart. "'Then you don't know what she's capable of.' All this time there had been a great whisking in and out of the other room. The door had been opened and shut very softly about twenty times a minute, for it was necessary to keep Mrs. Kenwigs quiet, and the baby had been exhibited to a score or two of deputations from a select body of female friends who had assembled in the passage and about the street door to discuss the event in all its bearings. Indeed, the excitement extended itself over the whole street, and groups of ladies might be seen standing at the doors, some in the interesting condition in which Mrs. Kenwigs had last appeared in public relating their experiences of similar occurrences. Some few acquired great credit from having prophesied the day before yesterday exactly when it would have come to pass. Others again related how that they had guessed what it was. Directly they saw Mr. Kenwigs turn pale and run up the street as hard as ever he could go. Some said one thing and some another, but all talked together and all agreed upon two points. First, that it was very meritorious and highly praiseworthy in Mrs. Kenwigs to do as she had done, and secondly, that there was never such a skilful and scientific doctor as that Mr. Lumby. In the midst of this general hubbub, Dr. Lumby sat in the first floor front, as before related, nursing the deposed baby, and talking to Mr. Kenwigs. He was a stout, bluff-looking gentleman, with no shirt-collar to speak of, and a beard that had been growing since yesterday morning, for Dr. Lumby was popular, and the neighbourhood was prolific, and there had been no less than three other knockers muffled, one after the other, within the last forty-eight hours. "'Well, Mr. Kenwigs,' said Dr. Lumby, "'this makes six. You'll have a fine family in time, sir.' "'I think six is almost enough, sir,' returned Mr. Kenwigs. "'Poo, poo!' said the doctor. "'Nonsense! Not half enough!' With this, the doctor laughed, but he didn't laugh half as much as a married friend of Mrs. Kenwigs's, who had just come in from the sick chamber to report progress, and taken a small sip of brandy and water, and who seemed to consider it one of the best jokes ever launched upon society. "'They're not altogether dependent upon good fortune, neither,' said Mr. Kenwigs, taking his second daughter on his knee. "'They have expectations.' "'Oh, indeed,' said Mr. Lumby, the doctor." "'And very good ones, too, I believe, haven't they?' asked the married lady. "'Why, ma'am,' said Mr. Kenwigs, "'it's not exactly for me to say what they may be, or what they may not be. "'It's not for me to boast of any family with which I have the honour to be connected. "'At the same time, Mrs. Kenwigs's is, I should say,' said Mr. Kenwigs abruptly, "'and raising his voice as he spoke, "'that my children might come into a matter of a hundred pound apiece, perhaps.' perhaps more, but certainly that. And a very pretty little fortune, said the married lady. There are some relations of Mrs. Kenwigs's, said Mr. Kenwigs, taking a pinch of snuff from the doctor's box, and then sneezing very hard, for he wasn't used to it, that might leave their hundred pound apiece to ten people, and yet not go begging when they had done it. Ah, I know who you mean, observed the married lady, nodding her head. "'I made mention of no names, and I wish to make mention of no names,' said Mr. Kenwigs, with a portentous look. "'Many of my friends have met a relation of Mrs. Kenwigs's in this very room, as would do honour to any company. That's all.' "'I've met him,' said the married lady, with a glance towards Dr. Lumby. "'It's naturally very gratifying to my feelings as a father to see such a man as that, a kissing and taking notice of my children,' pursued Mr. Kenwigs. It's naturally very gratifying to my feelings as a man, to know that man. It will be naturally very gratifying to my feelings as a husband, to make that man acquainted with this event. Having delivered his sentiments in this form of words, Mr. Kenwigs arranged his second daughter's flaxen tail, and bade her be a good girl, and mind what her sister, Morlina, said. That girl grows more like her mother every day, 
said Mr. Lumby, suddenly stricken with an enthusiastic admiration of Morlina. There, rejoined the married lady, what I always say, what I always did say. She's the very picture of her. Having thus directed the general attention to the young lady in question, the married lady embraced the opportunity of taking another sip of the brandy and water, and a pretty long sip, too. Yes, there is a likeness, said Mr. Kenwigs, after some reflection, but such a woman as Mrs. Kenwigs was afore she was married. Good gracious, such a woman! Mr. Lumby shook his head with great solemnity, as though to imply that he supposed that she must have been rather a dazzler. "'Talk of fairies!' cried Mr. Kenwigs. "'I never see anybody so light to be alive, never. "'Such manners, too. "'So playful, and yet so severely proper. "'As for her figure, it isn't generally known,' said Mr. Kenwigs, dropping his voice. "'But her figure was such at the time "'that the sign of the Britannia over in the Holloway Road was painted from it. "'But only see what it is now,' urged the married lady. "'Does she look like the mother of six? "'Quite ridiculous!' cried the doctor. "'She looks a deal more like her own daughter,' said the married lady. "'So she does,' assented Mr. Lumby. "'A great deal more.' "'Mr. Kenwigs was about to make some further observations, "'most probably in confirmation of this opinion, "'when another married lady, "'who had looked in to keep up Mrs. Kenwigs's spirits, and help to clear off anything in the eating and drinking way that might be going about, put in her head to announce that she had just been down to answer the bell, and that there was a gentleman at the door who wanted to see Mr. Kenwigs most particular. Shadowy visions of his distinguished relation flitted through the brain of Mr. Kenwigs, as this message was delivered, and under their influence he dispatched Morlina to show the gentleman up straight away. Why? "'I do declare,' said Mr. Kenwigs, standing opposite the door so as to get the earliest glimpse of the visitor as he came upstairs. "'It's Mr. Johnson. How do you find yourself, sir?' Nicholas shook hands, kissed his old pupils all round, entrusted a large parcel of toys to the guardianship of Morlina, bowed to the doctor and the married ladies, and inquired after Mrs. Kenwigs in a tone of interest, which went to the very heart and soul of the nurse, who had come in to warm some mysterious compound in a little saucepan over the fire. "'I ought to make a hundred apologies to you for calling at such a season,' said Nicholas, "'but I was not aware of it until I had rung the bell, "'and my time is so fully occupied now "'that I feared it might be some days before I could possibly come again.' "'No time like the present, sir,' said Mr. Kenwigs. "'The situation of Mrs. Kenwigs, sir, "'is no obstacle to a little conversation between you and me, I hope.' "'You are very good,' said Nicholas. "'At this juncture, proclamation was made by another married lady "'that the baby had begun to eat like anything, "'whereupon the two married ladies, already mentioned, "'rushed tumultuously into the bedroom to behold him in the act. "'The fact is,' resumed Nicholas, "'that before I left the country, where I have been for some time past, "'I undertook to deliver a message to you, "'Aye, aye,' said Mr. Kenwigs. "'And I have been,' added Nicholas, "'already in town for some days, "'without having had an opportunity of doing so.' "'It's no matter, sir,' said Mr. Kenwigs. "'I dare say it's none the worse for keeping cold. "'Message from the country,' said Mr. Kenwigs, ruminating. "'That's curious. "'I don't know anybody in the country.' "'Miss Petalka,' suggested Nicholas. "'Oh, from her, is it?' said Mr. Kenwigs. "'Oh, dear, yes. Ah! "'Mrs. Kenwigs will be glad to hear from her. "'Henrietta Petalka, eh? "'How odd things come about now, "'that you should have met her in the country. "'Well!' "'Hearing this mention of their old friend's name, "'the four Miss Kenwigses gathered round Nicholas, "'open-eyed and mouthed, to hear more. "'Mr. Kenwigs looked a little curious, too, "'but quite comfortable and unsuspecting. "'The message relates to family matters,' said Nicholas, hesitating. "'Oh, never mind,' said Kenwigs, glancing at Mr. Lumby, "'who, having rashly taken charge of little Lillivick, "'found nobody disposed to relieve him of his precious burden. "'All friends here.' 
Nicholas hemmed once or twice, and seemed to have some difficulty in proceeding. At Portsmouth, Henrietta Petauka is, observed Mr. Kenwigs. Yes, said Nicholas. Mr. Lillivick is there. Mr. Kenwigs turned pale, but he recovered and said, That was an odd coincidence also. The message is from him, said Nicholas. Mr. Kenwigs appeared to revive. He knew that his niece was in a delicate state, and had, no doubt, sent word that they were to forward full particulars. Yes, that was very kind of him. So like him, too. He desired me to give his kindest love, said Nicholas. Very much obliged to him, I'm sure. Your great uncle Lillivick, my dears, interposed Mr. Kenwigs, condescendingly explaining it to the children. His kindest love, resumed Nicholas, and to say that he had no time to write, but that he was married to Miss Pitalka. Mr. Kenwigs started from his seat with a petrified stare, caught his second daughter by her flaxen tail, and covered his face with his pocket handkerchief. Morlina fell, all stiff and rigid, into the baby's chair, as she had seen her mother fall when she fainted away, and the two remaining little Kenwigses shrieked in affright. "'My children! My defrauded, swindled infants!' cried Mr. Kenwigs, pulling so hard in his vehemence at the flaxen tail of his second daughter that he lifted her up on tiptoe and kept her for some seconds in that attitude. "'Villain! Ass! Traitor!' "'Drat the man!' cried the nurse, looking angrily around. "'What does he mean by making that noise here?' "'Silence, woman!' said Mr. Kenwigs fiercely. "'Hey, won't be silent!' returned the nurse. "'Be silent yourself, you wretch! Have you no regard for your baby?' "'No!' returned Mr. Kenwigs. "'More shame for you!' retorted the nurse. "'Ugh! You unnatural monster!' "'Let him die!' cried Mr. Kenwigs in a torrent of his wrath. "'Let him die! He has no expectations, no property to come into. "'We want no babies here,' said Mr. Kenwigs recklessly. "'Take him away! Take him away to the fondling!' With these awful remarks, Mr. Kenwigs sat himself down in a chair and defied the nurse, who made the best of her way into the adjoining room and returned with a stream of matrons declaring that Mr. Kenwigs had spoken blasphemy against his family, and must be raving mad. Appearances were certainly not in Mr. Kenwigs's favour, for the exertion of speaking with so much vehemence, and yet in such a tone, as should prevent his lamentations reaching the ears of Mrs. Kenwigs, had made him very black in the face, besides which, the excitement of the occasion, and an unwanted indulgence in various strong cordials to celebrate it, had swollen and dilated his features to a most unnatural extent. But Nicholas and the doctor, who had been passive at first, doubting very much whether Mr. Kenwigs could be in earnest, interfering to explain the immediate cause of his condition, the indignation of the matrons was changed to pity, and they implored him, with much feeling, to go quietly to bed. The attention, said Mr. Kenwigs, looking around with a plaintive air, the attention that I've shown to that man, the hisettas he has eat, and the pints of ale he has drunk, in this house! It's very trying and very hard to bear, we know, said one of the married ladies, but think of your dear darling wife. Oh yes, and what she's been a undergoing of, only this day, cried a great many voices. There's a good man, do. The presents that had been made to him, said Mr. Kenwigs, reverting to his calamity, the pipes, the snuff-boxes, a pair of india-rubber galoshes that cost six and six. Ah! It won't bear thinking of, indeed, cried the matrons generally, but it'll all come home to him, never fear. Mr. Kenwigs looked darkly upon the ladies, as if he would prefer its all coming home to him, as there was nothing to be got by it, but he said nothing and resting his head upon his hand, subsided into a kind of doze. Then the matrons again expatiated on the expediency of taking the good gentleman to bed, observing that he would be better to-morrow, and that they knew what was the wear and tear of some men's minds when their wives were taken as Mrs. Kenwigs had been that day, and that it did him great credit, and that there was nothing to be ashamed of in it. Far from it, they liked to see it, they did, for it showed a good heart. And one lady, observed, 
as a case bearing upon the present, that her husband was often quite light-headed from anxiety on similar occasions, and that once, when her little Johnny was born, it was nearly a week before he came to himself again, during the whole of which time he did nothing but cry, "'Is it a boy? Is it a boy?' in a manner which went to the hearts of all his hearers. At length, Morlina, who quite forgot she had fainted when she found she was not noticed, announced that a chamber was ready for her afflicted parent, and Mr. Kenwigs, having partially smothered his four daughters in the closeness of his embrace, accepted the doctor's arm on one side, and the support of Nicholas on the other, and was conducted upstairs to a bedroom which had been secured for the occasion. Having seen him sound asleep, and heard him snore most satisfactorily, and having further presided over the distribution of the toys, to the perfect contentment of all the little Kenwigses, Nicholas took his leave. The matrons dropped off one by one, with the exception of six or eight particular friends, who had determined to stop all night. The lights in the houses gradually disappeared. The last bulletin was issued that Mrs. Kenwigs was as well as could be expected, and the whole family were left to their repose. End of chapter 36「Nicholas Nickleby, Chapter 37 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Nicholas Nickleby, by Charles Dickens – Chapter 37 – Nicholas finds further favour in the eyes of the brothers Cheeryble and Mr. Timothy Linkinwater. The brothers give a banquet on a great annual occasion. Nicholas, on returning home from it, receives a mysterious and important disclosure from the lips of Mrs. Nickleby. The square in which the counting-house of the brothers Cheeryble was situated, although it might not wholly realise the very sanguine expectations which a stranger would be disposed to form on hearing the fervent encomiums bestowed upon it by Tim Linkinwater, was, Nevertheless, a sufficiently desirable nook in the heart of a busy town like London, and one which occupied a high place in the affectionate remembrances of several grave persons domiciled in the neighbourhood, whose recollections, however, dated from a much more recent period, and whose attachment to the spot was far less absorbing than were the recollections and attachment of the enthusiastic Tim. And let not those whose eyes have been accustomed to the aristocratic gravity of Grosvenor Square and Hanover Square, the dowager barrenness and frigidity of Fitzroy Square, or the gravel walks and garden seats of the squares of Russell and Euston, suppose that the affections of Tim Linkinwater, or the inferior lovers of this particular locality, had been awakened and kept alive by any refreshing association with leaves however dingy, or grass however bare and thin. The city square has no enclosure save the lamppost in the middle, and no grass but the weeds which spring up around its base. It is a quiet, little frequented, retired spot, favourable to melancholy and contemplation, an appointment of long waiting, and up and down its every side the appointed saunters idly by the hour, together wakening the echoes with the monotonous sound of his footsteps on the smooth, worn stones, and counting, first the windows, and then the very bricks of the tall, silent houses that hem him round about. In winter time, the snow will linger there, long after it has melted from the busy streets and highways. The summer's sun holds it in some respect, and while he darts his cheerful rays sparingly into the square, keeps his fiery heat and glare for noisier and less imposing precincts. It is so quiet that you could almost hear the ticking of your own watch when you stop to cool in its refreshing atmosphere. There is a distant hum of coaches, not of insects, but no other sound disturbs the stillness of the square. The ticket porter leans idly against the post at the corner, comfortably warm but not hot, although the day is broiling. 
His white apron flaps languidly in the air. His head gradually droops upon his breast. He takes very long winks with both eyes at once. Even he is unable to withstand the soporific influence of the place, and is gradually falling asleep. But now he starts into full wakefulness, recoils a step or two, and gazes out before him with eager wildness in, in his eye. Is it a job, or a boy at marbles? Does he see a ghost, or hear an organ? No. Sight more unwanted still. There is a butterfly in the square, a real live butterfly. Astray from flowers and sweets, and fluttering among the iron heads of the dusty area railings. But if there were not many matters immediately without the doors of Cheerable Brothers, to engage the attention or distract the thoughts of the young clerk, there were not a few within to interest and amuse him. There was scarcely an object in the place, animate or inanimate, which did not partake in some degree of the scrupulous method and punctuality of Mr. Timothy Linkinwater. Punctual as the counting-house dial, which he maintained to be the best timekeeper in London, next after the clock of some old, hidden, unknown church hard by, for Tim held the fabled goodness of that at the horse guards to be a pleasant fiction invented by jealous West Enders. The old clerk performed the minutest actions of the day and arranged the minutest articles in the little room in a precise and regular order which could not have been exceeded if it had actually been a real glass case fitted with the choicest curiosities. Paper, pens, ink, ruler, sealing wax, wafers, Pounce box, string box, fire box, Tim's hat, Tim's scrupulously folded gloves, Tim's other coat, looking precisely like a back view of himself as it hung against the wall. All had their accustomed inches of space. Except the clock, there was not such an accurate and unimpeachable instrument in existence as the little thermometer which hung behind the door. There was not a bird of such methodical and business-like habits in all the world as the blind blackbird, who dressed and dozed away his days in a large snug cage and had lost his voice. From old age, years before Tim first bought him, there was not such an eventful story in the whole range of anecdote as Tim could tell concerning the acquisition of that very bird. How, compassionating his starved and suffering condition, he had purchased him, with a view of humanely terminating his wretched life, how he determined to wait three days and see whether the bird revived, how, before half the time was out, the bird did revive, and how he went on reviving and picking up his appetite and good looks until he gradually became what, what you see him now, sir, Tim would say, glancing proudly at the cage. And with that, Tim would utter a melodious chirrup and cry, Vic? And Dick, who for any sign of life he had previously given, might have been a wooden or stuffed representation of a blackbird indifferently executed, would come to the side of the cage in three small jumps and thrusting his bill between the bars, turn his sightless head towards his old master, and at that moment it would be very difficult to determine which of the two was the happier, the bird or Timothy Linkinwater. Nor was this all. Everything gave back, besides, some reflection of the kindly spirit of the brothers. The warehousemen and porters were such sturdy, jolly fellows that it was a treat to see them. Among the shipping announcements and steam packet lists which decorated the counting-house wall were designs for almshouses, statement of charities and plans for new hospitals. A blunderbuss and two swords hung above the chimney-piece for the terror of the evil-doers. But the blunderbuss was rusty and shattered, and the swords were broken and edgeless. Elsewhere, their open display in such a condition would have realised a smile, but there, it seemed as though even violent and offensive weapons partook of the reigning influence and became emblems of mercy and forbearance. Such thoughts as these occurred to Nicholas very strongly, on the morning when he first took possession of the vacant stool and looked about him more freely and at ease than he had before enjoyed an opportunity of doing. Perhaps they encouraged and stimulated him to exertion, 
for, during the next two weeks, all his spare hours, late at night and early in the morning, were incessantly devoted to acquiring the mysteries of bookkeeping and some other forms of mercantile account. To these he applied himself with such steadiness and perseverance that, although he brought no greater amount of previous knowledge to the subject than, than certain dim recollections of two or three very long sums entered into a ciphering book at school, and relieved to parental inspection by the effigy of a fat swan tastefully flourished by the writing master's own hand, he found himself, at the end of a fortnight, in a condition to report his proficiency to Mr. Linkinwater, and to claim his promise that he, Nicholas Nickleby, should now be allowed to assist him in his graver labours. It was a sight to behold Tim Linkinwater slowly bring out a massive ledger and day book, and, after turning them over and over, and affectionately dusting their backs and sides, open the leaves here and there, and cast his eyes, half mournfully, half proudly, upon the fair and unblotted entries. Four and forty year next May, said Tim. Many new ledgers since then. Four and forty year. Tim closed the book again. Come, come, said Nicholas. I am all impatience to begin. Tim Linkingwater shook his head with an air of mild reproof. Mr. Nickleby was not sufficiently in impressed with the deep and awful nature of his undertaking. Suppose there should be any mistake, any scratching out. Young men are adventurous. It is extraordinary what they will rush upon, sometimes, without even taking the precaution of sitting himself down upon his stool, but standing leisurely at the desk, and with a smile upon his face, actually a smile. There was no mistake about it. Mr. Linkinwater often mentioned it afterwards. Nicholas dipped his pen into the inkstand before him and plunged into the books of Cheerable Brothers. Tim Linkinwater turned pale and, tilting up his stool on the two legs nearest Nicholas, looked over his shoulder in breathless anxiety. Brother Charles and Brother Ned entered the counting house together, but Tim Linkinwater, without looking round, impatiently waved his hand as a caution that profound silence must be observed, and followed the nib of the inexperienced pen with trained and eager eyes. The brothers looked on with smiling faces, but Tim Linkinwater smiled not, nor moved for some minutes. At length he drew a long, slow breath, and still maintaining his position on the tilted stool, glanced at Brother Charles, secretly pointed, with the feather of his pen towards Nicholas, and nodded his head in a grave and resolute manner, plainly signifying, he'll do. Brother Charles nodded again, and exchanged a laughing look with Brother Ned. But just then, Nicholas stopped to refer to some other page, and Tim Linkinwater, unable to contain his satisfaction any longer, descended from his stool, and caught him rapturously by the hand. He has done it, said Tim looking round at his employers, and shaking his head triumphantly. His capital B's and D's are exactly like mine. He dots all his small I's and crosses every T as he writes it. There ain't such a young man as this in all London, said Tim, clapping Nicholas on the back. Not one. Don't tell me the city can't produce his equal. I challenge the city to do it. With this casting down of his gauntlet, Tim Linkinwater struck the desk such a blow with his clenched fist that the old blackbird tumbled off his perch with the start it gave him and actually uttered a feeble croak in the extremity of his astonishment. "'Well said, Tim! Well said, Tim Linkinwater!' cried Brother Charles, scarcely less pleased than Tim himself, and clapping his hands gently as he spoke. "'I knew our young friend would take great pains.' and I was quite certain he would succeed in no time. Didn't I say so, young brother Ned? You did, dear brother, certainly, my dear brother, you said so. And you are quite right, replied Ned. Quite right. Tim Linkinwater is excited, but he is justly excited, properly excited. Tim is a fine fellow. Tim Linkinwater, sir, you're a fine fellow. Here's a pleasant thing to think of, said Tim, wholly regardless of this address to himself, and raising his spectacles from the ledger to the brothers. Here's a pleasant thing. 
Do you suppose I haven't often thought of what would become of these books when I was gone? Do you suppose I haven't often thought that things might go on, irregular and untidy here, after I was taken away? But now, said Tim, extending his forefinger towards Nicholas, now, when I've shown him a little more, I'm satisfied. The business will go on when I'm dead, as well as it did when I was alive, just the same, and I shall have the satisfaction of knowing that there never were such books, never were such books, no, nor never will be such books as the books of Cheeryble Brothers. Having thus expressed his sentiments, Mr. Linkingwater gave vent to a short laugh, indicative of defiance to the cities of London and Westminster, and turning again to his desk, quietly carried seventy-six from the last column he had added up, and went on with his work. "'Tim Linkingwater, sir,' said Brother Charles. "'Give me your hand, sir. This is your birthday. How dare you talk about anything else till you have been wished many happy returns of the day, Tim Linkingwater? God bless you, Tim. God bless you.' "'My dear brother,' said the other, seizing Tim's disengaged fist, "'Tim Linkingwater looks ten years younger than he did on his last birthday.' "'Brother Ned, my dear boy,' returned the other old fellow. "'I believe that Tim Linkingwater was born a hundred and fifty years old, "'and is gradually coming down to five and twenty, "'for he's younger every birthday than he was the year before.' "'So he is, Brother Charles, so he is,' replied Brother Ned. "'There's not a doubt about it.' "'Remember, Tim,' said Brother Charles, "'that we dine at half-past five today instead of two o'clock.' We always depart from our usual custom on this anniversary, as you very well know, Tim Linkingwater. Mr. Nickleby, my dear sir, you will make one. Tim Linkingwater, give me your snuff-box as a remembrance to Brother Charles and myself of an attached and faithful rascal, and take that in exchange as a feeble mark of our respect and esteem, and don't open it until you go to bed and never say another word upon the subject, or I'll kill the blackbird. A dog. He should have a golden cage half a dozen years ago, as if it would have made him or his master a bit the happier. Now, Brother Ned, my dear fellow, I'm ready. At half-past five, remember, Mr. Nickleby. Tim Linkingwater, sir. Take care of Mr. Nickleby at half-past five. Now, Brother Ned. Chattering away thus, according to custom, to prevent the possibility of any thanks, or acknowledgement being expressed on the other side, the twins trotted off, arm in arm, having endowed Tim Linkingwater with a costly gold snuff-box, enclosing a banknote worth more than its value ten times told. At a quarter past five o'clock, punctual to the minute, arrived, according to annual usage, Tim Linkingwater's sister, and a great to-do there was between Tim Linkingwater's sister and the old housekeeper, respecting Tim Linkingwater's sister's cap, which had been dispatched per boy from the house of the family where Tim Linkingwater's sister boarded, and had not yet come to hand, notwithstanding that it had been packed up in a bandbox, and the bandbox in a handkerchief, and the handkerchief tied on to the boy's arm, and notwithstanding to that the place of its consignment had been duly set forth at full length on the back of an old letter, and the boy enjoined, under pain of diverse horrible penalties, the full extent of which the eye of man could not foresee, to deliver the same with all possible speed, and not to loiter by the way. Tim Linkingwater's sister lamented, the housekeeper condoled and both kept thrusting their heads out of the second-floor window to see if the boy was coming, which would have been highly satisfactory, and upon the whole tantamount to his being come, as the distance to the corner was not quite five yards, when, all of a sudden, and when he was least expected, the messenger, carrying the bandbox with elaborate caution, appeared in an exactly opposite direction, puffing and panting for breath, and flushed with recent exercise, as well he might be, for he had taken the air in the first instance behind a hackney coach that went to Camberwell, and had followed two punches afterwards, and had seen the stilts home to their own door. The cap was all safe, however, 
That was one comfort, and it was no use scolding him, that was another. So the boy went upon his way rejoicing, and Tim Linkinwater's sister presented herself to the company below stairs, just before five minutes after the half-hour had struck by Tim Linkinwater's own infallible clock. The company consisted of the brothers Cheeryble, Tim Linkinwater, a ruddy-faced, white-headed friend of Tim's, who was a superannuated bank clerk, and Nicholas, who was presented to Tim Linkinwater's sister with much gravity and solemnity. The party being now completed, Brother Ned rang for dinner, and dinner, being shortly afterwards announced, led Tim Linkinwater's sister into the next room, where it was set forth with great preparation. Then, Brother Ned took the head of the table, and Brother Charles the foot, and Tim Linkinwater's sister sat on the left hand of Brother Ned, and Tim Linkinwater himself on his right, and an ancient butler of apoplectic appearance and with very short legs took up his position at the back of Brother Ned's armchair, and, waving his right arm preparatory to taking off the covers with a flourish, stood bolt upright and motionless. For these and all other blessings, Brother Charles, said Ned. Lord, make us truly thankful, Brother Ned, said Charles. Whereupon the apoplectic butler whisked off the top of the soup tureen and shot, all at once, into a state of violent activity. There was abundance of conversation, and little fear of its ever flagging, for the good humour of the glorious old twins drew everybody out, and Tim Linkinwater's sister went off into a long and circumstantial account of Tim Linkinwater's infancy. Immediately, after the very first glass of champagne, taking care to premise that she was very much Tim's junior, and had only become acquainted with the facts from their being preserved and handed down in the family. This history concluded, Brother Ned related how, that exactly thirty-five years ago, Tim Linkinwater was suspected to have received a love letter, and how that vague information had been brought to the counting-house of his having been seen walking down Cheapside with an uncommonly handsome spinster, at which there was a roar of laughter and Tim Linkinwater, being charged with blushing and called upon to explain, denied that this accusation was true, and further, that there would have been any harm in it if it had been, which last position occasioned the superannuated bank clerk to laugh tremendously and to declare that it was the very best thing he had ever heard in his life, and that Tim Linkinwater might say a great many things before he said anything which could beat that. There was one little ceremony peculiar to the day, both the matter and manner of which made a very strong impression upon Nicholas. The cloth having been removed and the decanters sent round for the first time, a profound silence succeeded, and in the cheerful faces of the brothers there appeared an expression not of absolute melancholy, but of quiet thoughtfulness, very unusual at a festive table. As Nicholas, struck by this sudden altercation, was wondering what it could portend, the brothers rose together, and the one at the top of the table, leaning forward towards the other, and speaking in a low voice as if he were addressing him individually, said, Brother Charles, my dear fellow, there is another association connected with this day, which must never be forgotten, and never can be forgotten, by you and me. This day, which brought into the world a most faithful and excellent and exemplary fellow, took from it the kindest and very best of parents, the very best of parents to us both, I wish that she could have seen us in our prosperity and shared it, and had the happiness of knowing how dearly we loved her in it, as we did when we were two poor boys, but that was not to be. My dear brother, the memory of our mother. Good Lord, thought Nicholas, and there are scores of people of their own station knowing all this, and twenty thousand times more who wouldn't ask these men to dinner because they eat with their knives and never went to school. But there was no time to moralise, for the joviality again became very brisk, and the decanter of port being nearly out, Brother Ned pulled the bell, which was instantly answered by the apoplectic butler. 
David, said Brother Ned. Sir, replied the butler, a magnum of the double diamond, David, to drink the health of Mr. Linkinwater. Instantly, by a feat of dexterity which was the admiration of all the company, and had been annually for some years past, the apoplectic butler, bringing his left hand from behind the small of his back, produced the bottle with the corkscrew already inserted, uncorked it at a jerk, and placed the magnum and the cork before his master with the dignity of conscious cleverness. Ha! said Brother Ned, first examining the cork, and afterwards filling his glass, while the old butler looked complacently and amiably on, as if it were all his own property. But the company were quite welcome to make free with it. This looks well, David. It ought to, sir, replied David. You'd be troubled to find such a glass of wine as is our double diamond, and that Mr. Linkingwater knows very well. That was laid down when Mr. Linkingwater first come, that wine was, gentlemen. Nay, David, nay. I wrote the entry in the cellar book myself, sir, if you please, asked said David, in the tone of a man quite confident in the strength of his facts. Mr. Linkingwater had only been here twenty years, sir, when that pipe of double diamond was laid down. David is quite right. Quite right, Brother Charles, said Ned. Are the people here, David? Outside the door, sir, replied the butler. Show em in, David, show em in. At this bidding, the older butler placed before his master a small tray of clean glasses, and opening the door, admitted the jolly porters and warehousemen whom Nicholas had seen below. They were four in all, and as they came in, bowing and grinning and blushing, the housekeeper and cook and housemaid brought up the rear. Seven, said Brother Ned, filling a corresponding number of glasses with the double diamond. And David, eight, there. Now you're all of you to drink the health of your best friend, Mr. Timothy Linkinwater, and wish him health, a long life, and many happy returns of this day, both for his own sake and that of your old masters, who consider him an inestimable treasure. Tim Linkinwater, sir, your health. Devil take you, Tim Linkinwater, sir. God bless you. With this singular contradiction of terms, Brother Ned gave Tim Linkinwater a slap on the back which made him look, for the moment, almost as apoplectic as the butler, and tossed off the contents of his glass in a twinkling. The toast was scarcely drunk with all honour to Tim Linkingwater, when the sturdiest and jolliest subordinate elbowed himself a little in advance of his fellows, and exhibiting a very hot and flushed countenance, pulled a single lock of grey hair in the middle of his forehead as a respectful salute to the company, and delivered himself as follows, rubbing the palms of his hands very hard on a blue cotton handkerchief as he did so. We're allowed to take a liberty once a year, gentlemen, and if you please, we'll take it now. There be no time like the present, and no two birds in the hand worth one in the bush, as is well known, leastways in a contrary sense, which the meaning is the same. A pause, the butler unconvinced. What we mean to say is that there never was, looking at the butler, such, looking at the cook, noble, excellent, looking everywhere and seeing nobody, free, generous-spirited masters, as them as has treated us so handsome this day, and here's thanking of em for all their goodness, as is so constancy a diffusing of itself over everywhere, and wishing they may live long and die happy. When the foregoing speech was over, and it might have been much more elegant and much less to the purpose, the whole body of subordinates under command of the apoplectic butler gave three soft cheers which, to that gentleman's great indignation, were not very regular, inasmuch as the women persisted in giving an immense number of little shrill hurrahs among themselves, in utter disregard of the time. This done, they withdrew. Shortly afterwards, Tim Linkingwater's sister withdrew. In reasonable time after that, the sitting was broken up for tea and coffee, and a round game of cards. At half past ten, late hours for the square, there appeared a little tray of sandwiches and a bowl of bishop, which bishop coming on the top of the double diamond and other excitements 
had such an effect upon Tim Linkingwater that he drew Nicholas aside and gave him to understand confidentially that it was quite true about the uncommonly handsome spinster and that she was to the full as good-looking as she had been described more so indeed but that she was in too much of a hurry to change her condition and consequently while tim was courting her and thinking of changing his got married to somebody else after all i dare say it was my fault said tim i'll show you a print i have got upstairs one of these days it cost me five and twenty shillings. I bought it as soon as we were cool to each other. Don't mention it, but it's the most extraordinary accidental likeness you ever saw. Her very portrait, sir. By this time it was past eleven o'clock, and Tim Linkinwater's sister declaring that she ought to have been home a full hour ago. The coach was procured, into which she was handed with great ceremony by Brother Ned, while Brother Charles imparted the fullest directions to the coachman and besides paying the man a shilling over and above his fare, in order that he might take the utmost care of the lady, all but choked him with a glass of spirits of uncommon strength, and then nearly knocked all the breath out of his body in his energetic endeavours to knock it in again. At length, the coach rumbled off, and Tim Linkingwater's sister, being now fairly on her way home, Nicholas and Tim Linkingwater's friend, took their leaves together, and left old Tim and the worthy brothers to their repose. As Nicholas had some distance to walk, it was considerably past midnight by the time he reached home, where he found his mother and Smike sitting up to receive him. It was long after their usual hour of retiring, and they had expected him at the very latest two hours ago. But the time had not hung heavily on their hands, for Mrs Nickleby had entertained Smike with a genealogical account of her family by the mother's side, comprising biographical sketches of the principal members, and Smike had sat wondering what it was all about, and whether it was learnt from a book, or said out of Mrs Nickleby's own head, so that they got on together very pleasantly. Nicholas could not go to bed without expatiating on the excellences and munificence of the brothers Cheery Bull, and relating the great success which had attended his efforts that day. But, before he had said a dozen words, Mrs. Nickleby, with many sly winks and nods, observed that she was sure Mr. Smike must be quite tired out, and that she positively must insist on his not sitting up a minute longer. A most biddable creature he is, to be sure, said Mrs. Nickleby, when Smike had wished them good night and left the room. I know you'll excuse me, Nicholas, my dear, but I don't like to do this before a third person. Indeed, before a young man it would not be quite proper, though really, after all, I don't know what harm there is in it. I expect that to be sure. It's not a very becoming thing. Though some people say it is very much so. And really, I don't know why it should not be. If it's well got up, and the borders are small platted. Of course, a good deal depends upon that. With which preface, Mrs Nickleby took her nightcap from between the leaves of a very large prayer book where it had been folded up small, and proceeded to tie it on, talking away, in her usual discursive manner all the time. People may say what they like, observed Mrs Nickleby, but there's a great deal of comfort in a nightcap, as I'm sure you would confess, Nicholas, my dear, if you would only have strings to yours and wear it like a Christian, instead of sticking it upon the very top of your head like a blue coat boy. You needn't think of it as unmanly, or quizzical thing to be particular about your nightcap, for I have often heard your poor dear papa and the Reverend Mr. What's-His-Name, who used to read prayers in that old church with the curious little steeple, that the weathercock was blown off the night week before you were born. I have often heard them say that the young men at college are uncommonly particular about their nightcaps, and that the Oxford nightcaps are quite celebrated for their strength and goodness, so much so, indeed, that the young men never dream of going to bed without them, and I believe it's admitted on all hands that they know what's good and don't coddle themselves. Nicholas laughed, and entering no further into the subject of this lengthened harangue, reverted to the pleasant tone of the little birthday party, and, as Mrs Nickleby, instantly became very curious respecting it, and made a great number of inquiries touching what they had had for dinner, and how it was put on table, and whether it was overdone or underdone, and who was there, 
and what the Mr. Cheerybles said, and what, Mr. what Nicholas said, and what the Mr. Cheerybles said when he said that. Nicholas described the festivities at full length, and also the occurrences of the morning. Late as it is, said Nicholas, I am almost selfish enough to wish that Kate had been up to hear all this. I was all impatience, as I came along to tell her. Why, Kate, said Mrs. Nickleby, putting her feet upon the fender and drawing her chair close to it, as if settling herself for a long talk. Kate has been in bed, oh, a couple of hours, and I'm very glad, Nicholas, my dear, that I prevailed upon her not to sit up, for I wished very much to have an opportunity of saying a few words to you. I am naturally anxious about it, and of course it's a very delightful and consoling thing to have a grown-up son that one can put confidence in and advise with. Indeed, I don't know any use there would be in having sons at all, unless people could put confidence in them. Nicholas stopped in the middle of a sleepy yawn as his mother began to speak, and looked at her with fixed attention. There was a lady in our neighbourhood, said Mrs. Nickleby. Speaking of sons puts me in mind of it. A lady in our neighbourhood when we lived near Dawlish. I think her name was Rogers. Indeed, I'm sure it was. If it wasn't Murphy, which is the only doubt I have. Is it about her mother that you wish to speak to me? said Nicholas qu quietly. About her? cried Mrs. Nickleby. Good gracious, Nicholas, my dear. How can you be so ridiculous? But that was always the way with your poor dear papa. Just his way. Always wondering. Never able to fix his thoughts on any one subject for two minutes together. I think I see him now, said Mrs. Nickleby, wiping her eyes, looking at me while I was talking to him about his affairs, just as if his ideas were in a state of perfect conglomeration. Anybody who had come in upon us suddenly would have supposed I was confusing or, and distracting him instead of making things plainer. Upon my word they would. I am very sorry, mother, that I should inherit this unfortunate slowness of apprehension, said Nicholas kindly, but I'll do my best to understand you, if you'll only go straight on. Indeed I will. Your poor pa, said Mrs. Nickleby pondering, he never knew till it was too late what I would have had him do. This was undoubtedly the case, inasmuch as the deceased Mr. Nickleby had not arrived at the knowledge. Then he died. Neither had Mrs. Nickleby herself, which is, in some sort, an explanation of the circumstance. However, said Mrs. Nickleby, drying her tears, this has nothing to do, certainly nothing whatever to do, with a gentleman in the next house. I should suppose that the gentleman in the next house has as little to do with us, returned Nicholas. There can be no doubt, said Mrs. Nickleby, that he is a gentleman, and has the manners of a gentleman, and the appearance of a gentleman, although he does wear smalls and grey worsted stockings. That may be eccentricity, or he may be proud of his legs. I don't see why he shouldn't be. The Prince Regent was proud of his legs, and so was Daniel Lambert, who was also a fat man. He was proud of his legs. So was Miss Biffin, she was. No, added Mrs. Nickleby, correcting herself. I think she had only toes, but the principle is the same. Nicholas looked on, quite amazed at the introduction of this new theme, which seemed just as Mrs. Nickleby had expected him to be. You may well be surprised, Nicholas, my dear, she said. I am sure I was. It came upon me like a flash of fire and almost froze my blood. The bottom of his garden joins the bottom of ours, and, of course, I had several times seen him sitting among the scarlet beans in his little arbour, or working at his little hotbeds. I used to think he stared rather, but I didn't take any particular notice of that, as we were newcomers, and he might be curious to see what we were like. But when he began to throw his cucumbers over our wall... To throw his cucumbers over our wall? repeated Nicholas in great astonishment. Yes, Nicholas, my dear, replied Mrs. Nickleby in a very serious tone. His cucumbers over our wall, and vegetable marrows likewise. Confound his impudence, said Nicholas, firing immediately. What does he mean by that? I don't think he means it impertinently at all, replied Mrs. Nickleby. What? said Nicholas. 
cucumbers and vegetable marrows flying at the heads of the family as they walk in their own garden and not meant impertinently why mother nicholas stopped short for there was an indescribable expression of placid triumph mingled with a modest confusion lingering between the borders of mrs nickleby's nightcap which arrested his attention suddenly he must be a very weak and foolish and inconsiderate man said mrs nickleby blamable indeed at least i suppose other people would consider him so of course i can't be expected to express any opinion on that point especially after always defending your poor dear papa when other people blamed him for making proposals to me and to be sure there can be no doubt that he has taken a very singular way of showing it still at the same time his attentions are that is as far as it goes and to a certain extent of course a flattering sort of thing and although i should never dream of marrying again with a dear girl like kate still unsettled in life surely mother such an idea never entered your brain for an instant said nicholas bless my heart nicholas my dear returned his mother in a peevish tone isn't that precisely what i am saying if you would only let me speak of course i never gave it a second thought and i am surprised and astonished that you should suppose me capable of such a thing all i say is what step is the best to take so as to reject these advances civilly and delicately and without hurting his feelings too much and driving him to despair or anything of that kind my goodness me exclaimed mrs nickleby with a half simper suppose he was to go doing anything rash to himself could i ever be happy again nicholas despite his vexation and concern nicholas could scarcely help smiling as he rejoined now do you think mother that such a result would be likely to ensue from the most cruel repulse upon my word my dear i don't know returned mrs nickleby really i don't know i am sure there was a case in the day before yesterday's paper extracted from one of the french newspapers about a journeyman shoemaker who was jealous of a young girl in an adjoining village because she wouldn't shut herself up in an airtight three pair of stairs and charcoal herself to death with him and who went and hid himself in the wood with a sharp pointed knife and rushed out as she was passing by with a few friends and killed himself first then all the friends and then her no mm. killed all the friends first and then herself and then himself which is quite frightful to think of somehow or other added mrs nickleby after a momentary pause they always are journeymen shoemakers who do these things in france according to the papers i don't know how it is something in the leather i suppose but this man who is not a shoemaker what has he done mother what has he said inquired nicholas fretted almost beyond endurance but looking nearly as resigned and patient as mrs nickleby herself you know there is no language of vegetables which converts a cucumber into a formal declaration of attachment my dear replied mrs nickleby tossing her head and looking at the ashes in the grate he has done and said all sorts of things is there no mistake on your part asked nicholas mistake cried Nick mrs nickleby lord nicholas my dear do you suppose i don't know when a man's in earnest well well muttered nicholas every time i go to the window said mrs nickleby he kisses one hand and lays the other upon his heart of course it's very foolish of him to do so and i dare say you'll say it's very wrong but he does it very respectfully very respectfully indeed and very tenderly extremely tenderly so far he deserves the greatest credit there can be no doubt about that then there are the presents which come pouring over the wall every day and very fine they certainly are very fine we had one of the cucumbers at dinner yesterday and think of pickling the rest for the next winter and last evening added mrs nickleby with increased confusion he called gently over the wall as i was walking the garden and proposed marriage and an elopement his voice is as clear as a bell or a musical glass very like a musical glass indeed but of course i didn't listen to it then the question is nicholas my dear what am i to do does kate know, know of this asked nicholas i have not said a word about it yet answered his mother then for heaven's sake rejoined nicholas rising do not 
for it would make her very unhappy. And with regard to what you should do, my dear mother, do what your good sense and feeling, and respect for my father's memory would prompt. There are a thousand ways in which you can show your dislike of these preposterous and doting attentions. If you act as decidedly as you ought, and they are still continued, and to your annoyance, I can speedily put a stop to them. But I should not interfere in a matter so ridiculous, and attach importance to it, until you have vindicated yourself. Most women can do that, but especially one of your age and condition in circumstances like these which are unworthy of a serious thought i would not shame you by seeing to take them to heart or to treat them earnestly for an instant absurd old idiot so saying nicholas kissed his mother and bade her good night and they retired to their respective chambers to do mrs nickleby justice her attachment to her children would have prevented her seriously contemplating a second marriage even if she could have so far conquered her recollections of her late husband as to have any stronger inclinations that way. But, although there was no evil, and little real selfishness in Mrs. Nickleby's heart, she had a weak head and a vain one, and there was something so flattering in being sought, and vainly sought, in marriage at this time of day, that she could not dismiss the passion of the unknown gentleman quite so summarily or lightly as Nicholas appeared to deem becoming. As to its being preposterous and doting and ridiculous, thought Mrs. Nickleby, communing with herself in her own room, I don't see that at all. It's hopeless on his part, certainly. But why should he be an absurd old idiot? I confess I don't see. He is not to be supposed to know it's hopeless. Poor fellow! He is to be pitied, I think. Having made these reflections... Mrs. Nickleby looked in her little dressing-glass, and walking backward a few steps from it, tried to remember who it was who used to say that when Nicholas was one and twenty, he would have more the appearance of her brother than her son. Not being able to call the authority to mind, she extinguished her candle, and drew up the window-blind to admit the light of morning, which had, by this time, begun to dawn. "'It's a bad light to distinguish objects in,' murmured Mrs. Nickleby, peering into the garden. "'And my eyes are not very good. I was short-sighted from a child. "'But, upon my word, I think there's another large vegetable marrow sticking, at this moment, "'on the broken glass bottles at the top of the wall.'" End of chapter 37 Read by Ewan Bayliss Chapter 38 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 38. Comprises certain particulars arising out of a visit of a condolence, which may prove important hereafter. Smike unexpectedly encounters a very old friend, who invites him to his house, and will take no denial. Quite unconscious of the demonstrations of their amorous neighbour, or their effects upon the susceptible bosom of her mamma, Kate Nickleby had, by this time, begun to enjoy a settled feeling of tranquillity and happiness, to which, even in occasional and transitory glimpses, she had long been a stranger. Living under the same roof with the beloved brother from whom she had been so suddenly and hardly separated, with a mind at ease, and free from any persecutions which could call a blush into her cheek or a pang into her heart, she seemed to have passed into a new state of being. Her former cheerfulness was restored, her step regained its elasticity and lightness, the colour which had forsaken her cheek visited it once again, and Kate Nickleby looked more beautiful than ever. Such was the result to which Miss La Creevy's ruminations and observations led her, when the cottage had been, as she emphatically said, thoroughly got to rights from the chimney-pots to the street-door-scraper, 
and the busy little woman had at length a moment's time to think about its inmates. "'Which I declare I haven't had since I first came down here,' said Miss La Creevy, "'for I had thought of nothing but hammers, nails, screwdrivers, and gimlets, morning, noon, and night.' "'You never bestow one thought upon yourself, I believe,' returned Kate, smiling. "'Upon my word, my dear, when there are so many pleasanter things to think of, I should be a goose if I did,' said Miss La Creevy. "'By the by, I have thought of somebody, too. Do you know that I observe a great change in one of this family, a very extraordinary change?' "'In whom?' asked Kate anxiously. "'Not in—' "'Not in your brother, my dear,' returned Miss La Creevy, anticipating the close of the sentence. "'For he is always the same affectionate, good-natured, clever creature, with the spice of the—I won't say who—in him, when there's any occasion, that he was when I first knew you. No. Smike!' as he will be called, poor fellow, for he won't hear of an Mr. before his name, is greatly altered, even in this short time. How? asked Kate. Not in health? No, perhaps not in health exactly, said Miss La Creevy, pausing to consider, though he is a worn and feeble creature, and has that in his face which it would wring my heart to see in yours. No, not in health. How, then? I scarcely know said the miniature painter. But I have watched him, and he has brought the tears into my eyes many times. It is not a very difficult matter to do that, certainly, for I am easily melted. Still, I think these came with good cause and reason. I am sure that since he has been here he has grown, from some strong cause, more conscious of his weak intellect. He feels it more. It gives him greater pain to know that he wanders sometimes and cannot understand very simple things. I have watched him when you have not been by, my dear, sit brooding by himself with such a look of pain as I could scarcely bear to see, and then get up and leave the room so sorrowfully and in such dejection that I cannot tell you how it has hurt me. Not three weeks ago he was a light-hearted, busy creature, overjoyed to be in a bustle, and as happy as the day was long. Now he is another being, the same willing, harmless, faithful, loving creature, but the same in nothing else. "'Surely this will all pass off,' said Kate. "'Poor fellow!' "'I hope,' returned her little friend, with a gravity very unusual in her, "'it may. I hope, for the sake of that poor lad, it may. "'However,' said Miss La Creevy, relapsing into the cheerful, chattering tone which was habitual to her, "'I have said my say, and a very long say it is, and a very wrong say, too. "'I shouldn't wonder at all. I shall cheer him up to-night at all events, for he is to be my squire all the way to the Strand. I shall talk on and on and on, and never leave off till I have roused him into a laugh at something. So the sooner he goes, the better for him, and the sooner I go, the better for me. I am sure, or else I shall have my maid gallivanting with somebody who may rob the house. Though what there is to take away besides tables and chairs I don't know, except the miniatures. And he is a clever thief who can dispose of them to any great advantage, for I can't, I know, and that's the honest truth. So saying, little Miss La Creevy hid her face in a little flat bonnet, and herself in a very big shawl, and fixing herself tightly into the latter by means of a large pin, declared that the omnibus might come as soon as it pleased, for she was quite ready. But there was still Mrs. Nickleby to take leave of, and long before that good lady had concluded some reminiscences bearing upon and appropriate to the occasion, the omnibus arrived. This put Miss La Creevy in a great bustle, in consequence whereof, as she secretly rewarded the servant-girl with eighteen pence behind the street door, she pulled out of her reticule ten pennyworth of half-pence, which rolled into all possible corners of the passage, and occupied some considerable time in the picking up. This ceremony had, of course, to be succeeded by a second kissing of Kate and Mrs. Nickleby, and a gathering together of the little basket and the brown-paper parcel, during which proceedings— the omnibus, as Miss La Creevy protested, swore so dreadfully that it was quite awful to hear it. At length, and at last, it made a feint of going away, and then Miss La Creevy darted out and darted in, apologising with great volubility to all the passengers, and declaring that she wouldn't purposefully have kept them waiting on any account whatever. While she was looking about for a convenient seat, the conductor pushed Smike in, and cried that it was all right, though it wasn't, and away went the huge vehicle, with the noise of half a dozen brewers' drays at least. Leaving it to pursue its journey at the pleasure of the conductor aforementioned, 
who lounged gracefully on his little shelf behind, smoking an odiferous cigar, and leaving it to stop, or go on, or gallop, or crawl, as that gentleman deemed expedient and advisable, this narrative may embrace the opportunity of ascertaining the condition of Sir Mulberry Hawk, and to what extent he had, by this time, recovered from the injuries consequent on being flung violently from his cabriolet, under the circumstances already detailed. With a shattered limb, a body severely bruised, a face disfigured by half-healed scars, and pallid from the exhaustion of recent pain and fever, Sir Marbury Hawke lay stretched upon his back, on the couch to which he was doomed to be a prisoner for some weeks yet to come. Mr. Pike and Mr. Pluck sat drinking hard in the next room, now and then varying the monotonous murmurs of their conversation with a half-smothered laugh, while the young lord, the only member of the party who was not thoroughly irredeemable, and who really had a kind heart, sat beside his mentor, with a cigar in his mouth, and read to him, by the light of a lamp, such scraps of intelligence from a paper of the day as were most likely to yield him interest or amusement. "'Curse those hounds!' said the invalid, turning his head impatiently towards the adjoining room. "'Will nothing stop their infernal throats?' Messrs. Pike and Pluck heard the exclamation, and stopped immediately, winking to each other as they did so, and filling their glasses to the brim as some recompense for the deprivation of speech. "'Damn!' muttered the stick sick man between his teeth, and writhing impatiently in his bed. "'Isn't this mattress hard enough, and the room dull enough, and pain bad enough, but they must torture me? What's the time?' "'Half-past eight, replied his friend. "'Here!' "'Draw the table nearer, and let us have the cards again,' said Sir Mulberry. "'More piquet. Come!' It was curious to see how eagerly the sick man, debarred from any change of position save the mere turning of his head from side to side, watched every motion of his friend in the progress of the game, and with what eagerness and interest he played, and yet how warily and coolly. His address and a skill were more than twenty times a match for his adversary, who could make little head against them even when fortune favoured him with good cards, which was not often the case. Sir Mulberry won every game, and when his companion threw down the cards and refused to play any longer, thrust forth his wasted arm and caught up the stakes with a boastful oath and the same hoarse laugh, though considerably lower in tone, that had resounded in Ralph Nickleby's dining-room months before. While he was thus occupied, his man appeared, to announce that Mr. Ralph Nickleby was below, and wished to know how he was to-night. "'Better,' said Sir Mulberry, impatiently. Uh, "'Mr. Nickleby wishes to know, sir.' "'I tell you better,' replied Sir Mulberry, striking his hand upon the table. The man hesitated for a moment or two, and then said that Mr. Nickleby had requested permission to see Sir Mulberry Hawk, if it was not inconvenient. "'It is inconvenient. I can't see him. I, I can't see anybody.' said his master, more violently than before. "'You know that, you blockhead!' "'I'm very sorry, sir,' returned the man. "'But uh, Mr. Nickleby pressed so much, sir.' The fact was that Ralph Nickleby had bribed the man, who, being anxious to earn his money with a view to future favours, held at the door in his hand, and ventured to linger still. "'Did he say whether he had any business to speak about?' inquired Sir Mulberry, after a little impatient consideration. Uh, "'No, sir. He said he wished to see you, sir. Uh, particularly, Mr. Bickleby said, sir.' "'Oh, tell him to come up. Here!' Yeah, cried Sir Mulberry, calling the man back as he passed his hand over his disfigured face. "'Move that lamp and put it on the stand behind me. Uh, wheel that table away and place a chair here. No, further off. Uh, leave it so.' The man obeyed these directions, as if he quite comprehended the motive with which they were dictated, and left the room. Lord Frederick Verisoft, remarking that he would look in presently, strolled into the adjoining apartment, and closed the folding door behind him. Then was heard a subdued footstep on the stairs, and Ralph Nickleby, hat in hand, crept softly into the room, with his body bent forward as if in profound respect, and his eyes fixed upon the face of his worthy client. "'Well, Nickleby,' said Sir Mulberry, motioning him to the chair by the couch-side, and waving his hand in assumed carelessness. I, "'I've had a bad accident, you see.' "'I see,' rejoined Ralph, with the same steady gaze. 
bad indeed. I, I should not have known you, Sir Mulberry. Dear, dear, th this is bad. Ralph's manner was one of profound humility and respect, and the low tone of voice was that which the gentlest consideration for a sick man would have taught a visitor to assume. But the expression of his face, Sir Mulberry's been averted, was in extraordinary contrast, and as he stood in his usual attitude, calmly looking on the prostrate form before him, all that part of his features which was not cast into shadow by his protruding and contracted brows bore the impress of a sarcastic smile. "'Sit down,' said Sir Mulberry, turning towards him, as though by a violent effort. "'Am I a sight that you stand gazing there?' As he turned his face, Ralph recoiled a step or two, and making as though he were irresistibly impelled to express astonishment, but was determined not to do so, sat down with well-acted confusion. I, "'I have inquired at the door, Sir Mulberry, every day,' said Ralph, uh, "'twice a day, indeed, at first, and to-night, presumably one old acquaintance, and past point transactions by which we have mutually benefited in some degree, I could not resist soliciting admission to your chamber. Have you—' "'Have you suffered much?' said Ralph, bending forward, and allowing the same harsh smile to gather upon his face as the other closed his eyes. "'More than enough to please me, and less than enough to please some broken-down hacks that you and I know of, and who lay their ruin between us, I dare say,' returned Sir Mulberry, tossing his arm restlessly upon the coverlet. Ralph shrugged his shoulders in deprecation of the intense irritation with which this had been said, for there was an aggravating, cold distinctness in his speech and manner, which so grated on the sick man that he could scarcely endure it. "'And what is it, these past transactions, that brought you here to-night?' asked Sir Mulberry. "'Nothing,' replied Ralph. "'There are some bills of my lord's which need renewal, but let them be till you are well. I—I I, I came,' said Ralph, speaking more slowly and with harsher emphasis, I came to say how grieved I am that any relative of mine, although disowned by me, should have inflicted such punishment on you as—' "'Punishment?' interposed Sir Mulberry. "'I know it has been a severe one,' said Ralph, wilfully mistaking the meaning of the interruption, "'and that has made me the more anxious to tell you that I disown this vagabond, that I acknowledge him as no kin of mine, and that I leave him to take his deserts from you, and every man besides.' "'You may wring his neck, if you please. I shall not interfere.' "'This story that they tell me has, has got abroad, then, has it?' asked Sir Mulberry, clenching his hands and teeth. "'Noised in all directions,' replied Ralph. "'Every club and gaming-room has rung with it. There has been a good song made about it, as I am told,' said Ralph, looking eagerly at his questioner. "'I have not heard it myself, not being in the way of such things, but I have been told it's even printed.' for private circulation. But that's all over town, of course. "'It's a lie!' said Sir Marbury. I, "'I tell you, it's a lie! It's all a lie that the mare took fright!' "'They say he frightened her,' observed Ralph, in the same unmoved and quiet manner. "'Some say he frightened you, but that's a lie, I know. I have said that boldly, oh, a score of times. I'm a peaceable man, but I can't hear folks tell that of you. No, no.' When Sir Mulberry found coherent words to utter, Ralph bent forward with his hand to his ear, and a face as calm as if its every line of sternness had been cast in iron. "'When I am off this cursed bed,' said the invalid, actually striking at his broken leg in the ecstasy of his passion, "'I'll have such revenge as never man had yet. By God I will! Accident favouring him? He has marked me for a week or two, but I'll put a mark on him that she shall carry to his grave!' I'll slit his nose and ears, flog him, maim him for life. I'll do more than that. I'll drag that pattern of chastity, that, that, that pink of prudery, the delicate sister through. It might have been that even Ralph's cold blood tingled in his cheeks at that moment. It might have been that Sir Mulberry remembered that, knave and usurer as he was, he must in some early time of infancy have twined his arm about her father's neck. He stopped, and menacing with his hand, confirmed the unuttered threat with a tremendous oath. "'It is a galling thing,' said Ralph, after a short term of silence, during which he had eyed the sufferer keenly, to, to think that the man about town, the rake, the roué, 
the rook of twenty seasons should be brought to this pass by a mere boy. Sir Marbury darted a wrathful look at him, but Ralph's eyes were bent upon the ground, and his face wore no other expression than one of thoughtfulness. A raw, slight stripling, continued Ralph, against a man whose very weight might crush him, to say nothing of his skill in— I'm right, I think, said Ralph, raising his eyes. You were a patron of the ring once, were you not? The sick man made an impatient gesture, which Ralph chose to consider as one of acquiescence. Ah, he said, I, I thought so. That was before I knew you, but I was pretty sure I couldn't be mistaken. He is light and active, I suppose, but those were slight advantages compared with yours. Luck, luck! These hangdog outcasts have it. He'll need the most he has when I am well again, said Sir Marbury Hawk. Let him fly where he will. Oh, returned Ralph quickly, he doesn't dream of that. He is here, good sir, waiting your pleasure, here in London, walking the streets at noonday, carrying it off jauntily, uh, looking for you, I swear, said Ralph, his face darkening, and his own hatred getting the upper hand of him for the first time, as this gay picture of Nicholas presented himself. If we were only citizens of a country where it would, could be safely done, I'd give good money to have him stabbed to the heart and rolled into the kennel for the dogs to tear. As Ralph, somewhat to the surprise of his old client, vented this little piece of sound family feeling, and took up his hat preparatory to departing, Lord Frederick Verisvot looked in. Well, "'What in the devil's name, Hawk, have you and Nickleby been talking about?' said the young man. "'I never heard such an insufferable rat. Groat, 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 bow, wow, wow. What's it all been about?' "'Sir Mulberry has been angry, my lord,' said Ralph, looking towards the couch. "'Not about money, I hope. Nothing has gone wrong in business, has it, Nickleby?' Uh, "'No, my lord, no,' returned Ralph. "'On that point we always agree. Sir Mulberry has been calling to mind the cause of—' There was neither necessity nor opportunity for Ralph to proceed, for Sir Mulberry took up the theme and vented his threats and oaths against Nicholas, almost as ferociously as before. Ralph, who was no common observer, was surprised to see that as this tirade proceeded, the manner of Lord Frederick Verisoft, who at the commencement had been twirling his whiskers with a most dandified and listless air, underwent a complete alteration. He was still more surprised when, Sir Mulberry ceasing to speak, the young lord angrily, and almost unaffectedly, requested never to have the subject renewed in his presence. "'Mind that, Hawk,' he added, with unusual energy, "'I never will be a party to, or permit, if I can help it, a cowardly attack upon this young fellow.' Hardly, interrupted his friend. Yes, said the other, turning full upon him. If you had told me who you were, if you had given him your card and found out afterwards that his station or character prevented your fighting him, it would have been bad enough then. Upon my soul it would have been bad enough then. As it is, you did wrong. I did wrong, too, not to interfere, and I am sorry for it. What happened to you afterwards was as much the consequence of accident as design, and more your fault than his and it shall not, with my knowledge, be cruelly visited upon him. It shall not indeed. With this emphatic repetition of his concluding words, the young lord turned upon his heel, but before he had reached the adjoining room he turned back again, and said, with even greater vehemence than he had displayed before, I do believe now, upon my honour I do believe, that the sister is as virtuous and modest a young lady as she is a handsome one, and of the brother I say this, that he acted as her brother should, and in a manly and spirited manner, and I only wish with all my heart and soul that any one of us came out of this manner half as well as he does. So saying, Lord Frederick Verisoft walked out of the room, leaving Sir Ralph Nickleby and Sir Mulberry in most unpleasant astonishment. "'Is this your pupil?' asked Ralph softly, "'or has he come fresh from some country parson?' "'Green fools take these fits sometimes,' replied Sir Mulberry Hawk, biking his lip and pointing to the door. "'Leave him to me.' Ralph exchanged a familiar look with his old acquaintance, for they had suddenly grown confidential again in this alarming surprise. And he took his way home, thoughtfully and slowly. While these things were being said and done, and long before they were concluded, the omnibus had disgorged Miss La Creevy and her escort, and they had arrived at her own door. 
Now, the good nature of the little miniature painter would by no means allow of Smike's walking back again until he had been previously refreshed with just a sip of something comfortable and a mixed biscuit or so. And Smike, entertaining no objection either to the sip of something comfortable or the mixed biscuit, but considering on the contrary that they would be a very pleasant preparation for a walk to Bow, it fell out that he delayed much longer than he originally intended, and that it was some half-hour after dusk when he set forth on his journey home. There was no likelihood of his losing his way, for it lay quite straight before him, and he walked into town with Nicholas and back alone almost every day. So Mr. Creevy and he shook hands with mutual confidence, and being charged with more kind remembrances to Mrs. and Miss Nickleby, Smike started off. At the foot of Ludgate Hill he turned a little out of the road to satisfy his curiosity by having a look at Newgate. After staring up at the sombre walls from the opposite side of the way, with great care and dread for some minutes, he turned back again into the old track and walked briskly through the city, stopping now and then to gaze in at the window of some particularly attractive shop, then running for a little way, then stopping again, and so on, as any other country lad might do. He had been gazing for a long time through a jeweller's window, wishing he could take some of the beautiful trinkets home as a present, and imagining what delight they would afford if he could, when the clocks struck three-quarters past eight. Roused by the sound, he hurried on at a very quick pace, and was crossing the corner of a by-street, when he felt himself violently brought to, with a jerk so sudden that he was obliged to cling to a lamp-post to save himself from falling. At the same moment a small boy clung tight round his leg, and a shrill cry of, "'Here he is, father! Hooray!' vibrated in his ears. Smike knew that voice too well. He cast his despairing eyes downward towards the form from which it had proceeded, and, shuddering from head to foot, looked round. Mr. Squeers had hooked him in the coat-collar with the handle of his umbrella, and was hanging on at the other end with all his might and main. The cry of triumph proceeded from Master Wackford, who, regardless of all his kicks and struggles, clung to him with the tenacity of a bulldog. One glance showed him this and in that one glance the terrified creature became utterly powerless and unable to utter a sound. "'Here's a go!' cried Mr. Squeers, gradually coming hand over hand down the umbrella, and only unhooking it when he had got tight hold of the victim's collar. "'Here's a delicious go! Wackford, my boy, call up one of them coaches!' "'A coach, father!' cried little bit Wackford. "'Yes, a coach, sir,' replied Squeers feasting his eyes upon the countenance of Smike. "'Damn the expense! Let's have him in a coach!' "'What's he been a-doing of?' asked a labourer with a hod of bricks against whom and a fellow labourer Mr. Squares had backed on the first jerk of the umbrella. "'Everything!' replied Mr. Squares, looking fixedly at his old pupil in a sort of rapturous trance. "'Everything! Running away, sir! Joining in bloodthirsty attacks upon his master! There's nothing that's bad that he hasn't done!' Oh, what a delicious go is in this here, good lord! The man looked from Squeers to Smike, but such mental faculties as the poor fellow possessed had utterly deserted him. The coach came up, Master Wackford entered, Squeers pushed in his prize, and following close at his heels, pulled up the glasses. The coachman mounted his box and drove slowly off, leaving the two bricklayers and an old apple woman and a town made little boy returning from an evening school who had been the only witnesses of the scene, to meditate upon it at their leisure. Mr. Squeers sat himself down on the opposite seat to the unfortunate Smike, and planting his hands firmly on his knees, looked at him for some five minutes, when, seeming to recover from his trance, he uttered a loud laugh, and slapped his old pupil's face several times, taking the right and left sides alternately. "'It isn't a dream,' said Squeers. "'That's real flesh and blood. I know the feel of it.' And being quite assured of his good fortune by these experiments, Mr. Squeers administered a few boxes on the ear, lest the entertainment should seem to partake of sameness, and laughed louder and longer at every one. "'Your mother will be fit to jump out of her skin, my boy, when she hears of this,' said Squeers to his son. "'How won't she, though, father?' replied Master Wackford. "'To think,' said Squeers, "'that you and me should be turning out of a street "'and come upon him at the very nick, 
and that I should have him tight at only one cast of the umbrella, as if I'd hooked him with a grappling iron. Ha, ha, ha! Didn't I catch hold of his leg neither, father? said little Wackford. You did like a good un, me boy, said Mr. Squares, patting his son's head. And you shall have the best button over jacket and whiskert that the next new boy brings down as a reward of merit. Mind that. You always keep on in the same pass, and do them things that you see your father do, and when you die you'll go right slap to heaven and no questions asked. Improving the occasion in these words, Mr. Squeers patted his son's head again, and then patted Smike's, but harder, and inquired in a bantering tone how he'd find himself by this time. "'I must go home,' replied Smike, looking wildly around. "'Oh, to be sure you must. You're about right there,' replied Mr. Squeers. "'You'll go home very soon, you will. You'll find yourself at the peaceful village of Dootherboys in Yorkshire in something under a week's time, my young friend. And the next time you get away from there, I give you leave to keep away. Where's the clothes you run off in, you ungrateful robber?' said Mr. Squeers, in a severe voice. Smike glanced at the neat attire which the care of Nicholas had provided for him, and wrung his hands. "'Do you know that I could hang you up outside of the old bailey for making away with them articles of property?' said Squeers. "'Do you know that it's a hanging matter, and I ain't quite certain from where it ain't to anatomy one besides, to walk off with upwards of a valley of five pound from a dwelling-house? Eh? Do you know that? What do you suppose was the worth of them clothes you had?' Do you know that that Wellington boot you wore cost eight and twenty shillings when it was a pair, and the shoes seven and six? But you came to the right shop for mercy when you came to me, and thank your stars as it is me as has got to serve you with the article. Anybody not in Mr. Squeers's confidence would have supposed that he was quite out of article in question, instead of having a large stock on hand ready for all comers nor would the opinion of sceptical persons have undergone much alteration when he followed up the remark by poking Smike in the chest with the ferrule of his umbrella, and dealing a smart shower of blows with the ribs of the same instrument upon his head and shoulders. "'I never threshed a boy in an acne coach before,' said Mr. Squeers, when he stopped to rest. "'There's inconvenience in it, but the novelty gives us a sort of relish, too.' Poor Smike! He warded off the blows as well as he could, and now shrunk into a corner of the coach, with his head resting upon his hands and his elbows on his knees. He was stunned and stupefied, and had no more idea than any act of his would enable him to escape from the all-powerful squares, now that he had no friend to speak to or to advise with, than he had had in all the weary years of his Yorkshire life which preceded the arrival of Nicholas. The journey seemed endless. Street after street was entered and left behind and still they went jolting on. At last Mr. Squeers began to thrust his head out of the window every half minute, and to bawl a variety of directions to the coachman. And after passing with some difficulty through several mean streets which the appearance of the houses and the bad state of the road denoted to have been recently built, Mr. Squeers suddenly tugged at the check string with all his might, and cried, Stop! What are you pulling a man's arm off for? said the coachman, looking angrily down. "'That's the house,' replied Squeers. "'The second of them four little houses, one story high with green shutters. "'There's blast plate on the door with the name of Snawley.' "'Couldn't you say that without wrenching a man's limb off his body?' inquired the coachman. "'No,' bawled Squeers. "'Say another word and I'll summons you for having a broken window. Stop!' Obedient to this direction, the coach stopped at Mr. Snawley's door. Mr. Snawley may be remembered as the sleek and sanctified gentleman who confided two sons, in law, to the parental care of Mr. Squares, as narrated in the fourth chapter of this history. Mr. Snawley's house was on the extreme borders of some new settlements adjoining Somers Town, and Mr. Squares had taken lodgings therein for a short time, as his stay was longer than usual, and the Saracen, having experience of Master Wackford's appetite, had declined to receive him on any other terms than as a full-grown customer. "'Here we are,' said Squeers, hurrying Smike into the little parlour, where Mr. Snawley and his wife were taking a lobster supper. "'Here's the vagrant, the felon, the, the, the rebel, the monster of unthankfulness!' "'What, the boy that ran away?' cried Snawley, resting his knife and fork upright on the table, and opening his eyes to their full width. "'The very boy,' said Squeers, 
putting his fist close to Smike's nose, and drawing it away again, and repeating the process several times with a vicious aspect. "'If there wasn't a lady present, I'd fetch him such a—' "'Never mind, I'll owe it him.' And here Mr. Squares related how, and in what manner, and when, and where, he had picked up the runaway. "'It's clear that there's been a bit of providence in it, sir,' said Mr. Snawley, casting down his eyes with an air of humility, and elevating his fork, with a bit of lobster on the top of it, towards the ceiling. "'Providence is against him, no doubt,' replied Mr. Squeers, scratching his nose. "'Of course that was to be expected. Anybody might have known that.' "'Hard-heartedness and evil doing will never prosper, sir,' said Mr. Snawley. "'Never was such a thing known,' rejoined Squeers, taking a little roll of notes from his pocket-book, to see that they were all safe. "'I have been, Mr. Snawley,' said Mr. Squeers, when he had satisfied himself upon this point. "'I have been that chap's benefactor, feeder, teacher, and clother. I have been that chap's classical, commercial, mathematical, philosophical, and trigonometrical friend. My son, my only son, Wackford, has been his brother. Mrs. Squeers has been his mother, grandmother, aunt, ah, oh, I may say uncle, too, all in one. She never cottoned to anybody except them two engaging and delightful boys of yours, as she cottoned to this chap. What's my return? What's come of me milk of human kindness? It turns into curds and whey when I look at him. Well, it may, sir, said Mrs. Snawley. Oh, well, it may, sir. Where has he been all this time? inquired Snawley. Has he been living with— Ah, sir, interposed Squeers, confronting him again. Have you been a-living with that there devilish Nickleby, sir? But no threats or cuffs could elicit from Smike one word of reply to this question, for he had internally resolved that he would rather perish in the wretched prison to which he was again about to be consigned than utter one syllable which could involve his first and true friend. He had already called to mind the strict injunctions of secrecy as to his past life which Nicholas had laid upon him when they travelled from Yorkshire and a confused and perplexed idea that his benefactor might have committed some terrible crime in bringing him away, which would render him liable to heavy punishment if detected, had contributed, in some degree, to reduce him to his present state of apathy and terror. Such were the thoughts. If to visions so imperfect and undefined as those which wandered through his enfeebled brain the term can be applied, which were present to the mind of Smike and rendered him deaf alike to intimidation and persuasion. Finding every effort useless, Mr. Squeers conducted him to a little back room upstairs where he was to pass the night, and taking the precaution of removing his shoes and coat and waistcoat, and also of locking the door on the outside, lest he should muster up sufficient energy to make an attempt at escape, that worthy gentleman left him to his meditations. What those meditations were, and how the poor creature's heart sunk within him when he thought. What did he for a moment cease to think, of his late home and the dear friends and familiar faces with which it was associated, cannot be told. To prepare the mind for such a heavy sleep, its growth must be stopped by rigour and cruelty in childhood. There must be years of misery and suffering, lightened by no ray of hope. The chords of the heart which beat a quick response to the voice of gentleness and affection must have rusted and broken in their secret places, and bear the lingering echo of no old word of love or kindness. Gloomy indeed must have been the short day, and dull the long, long twilight preceding such a night of intellect as his. There were voices which would have roused him even then but their welcome tones could not penetrate there, and he crept to bed the same listless, hopeless, blighted creature that Nicholas had first found him at the Yorkshire School. End of chapter 38 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 39 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 39. In which another old friend encounters Smike very opportunely, and to some purpose. 
The night, fraught with so much bitterness to one poor soul, had given place to a bright and cloudless summer morning, when a north country mail coach traversed with cheerful noise the yet silent streets of Islington, and, giving brisk note of its approach with the lively winding of the guard's horn, clattered onward to its halting place hard by the post office. The only outside passenger was a burly, honest looking countryman on the box, who, with his eyes fixed upon the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, appeared so rapt in admiring wonder as to be quite insensible to all the bustle of getting out the bags and parcels, until one of the coach windows being let sharply down, he looked round and encountered a pretty female face which was just then thrust out. See there, lass, bawled the countryman, pointing towards the object of his admiration. There be Paul's church. He got he be a sizable one, he be. Goodness, John, I shouldn't have thought it could have been half the size. What a monster! Monster! You're about right there, I reckon, Mrs. Browdie, said the countryman, good humouredly, as he came slowly down in his huge top coat. And what does thy take yon place to be? None thou over there. He never come near it gin you thrive for twelve months. It's now but a post office. Ha <laughs> ha! They need to charge for double either as a post office. What's thou think of that? E God, if that's only a post office, I'd like to see where the Lord Mayor of London lives. So saying, John Browdie, for it was he, opened the coach door, and tapping Mrs. Browdie, late Miss Price, on the cheek as he looked in, burst into a boisterous fit of laughter. Wee, said John, dang my bootins if she ain't been asleep again. She's been asleep all night, and was all yesterday, except for a minute or two now and then, replied John Browdie's choice. "'and I was very sorry when she woke, for she's been so cross.' The subject of these remarks was a slumbering figure, so muffled in shawl and cloak that it would have been a matter of impossibility to guess at its sex, but for a brown beaver bonnet and green veil which ornamented the head, and which, having been crushed and flattened for two hundred and fifty miles, in that particular angle of the vehicle from which the lady's snores now proceeded, presented an appearance sufficiently ludicrous, to have moved less risible muscles than those of John Browdie's ruddy face. Hallo! cried John, twitching one end of the dragged veil. Come, waken up, will he? After several burrowings into the old corner, and many exclamations of impatience and fatigue, the figure struggled into a sitting posture, and there, under a mass of crumpled beaver and surrounded by a semicircle of blue curl papers, were the delicate features of Miss Fanny Squeers. "'Oh, Tilda!' cried Miss Squeers. "'How you been kicking of me through this blessed night?' "'Well, I do like that,' replied her friend, laughing, "'when you've had nearly the whole coach to yourself.' "'Don't deny it, Tilda,' said Miss Squeers impressively, "'because you have, and it's no use to go attempting to say you haven't. "'You mightn't have known it in your sleep, Tilda, "'but I haven't closed my eyes for a single wink, "'and so I think I am to be believed.' "'With which reply, Miss Squeers adjusted the bonnet and veil, which nothing but supernatural interference and an utter suspension of nature's laws could have reduced to any shape or form, and evidently flattering herself that it looked uncommonly neat, brushed off the sandwich crumbs and bits of biscuit which had accumulated in her lap, and, availing herself of John Browdie's proffered arm, descended from the coach. No, said John, when a hackney coach had been called and the ladies and the luggage hurried in. "'Gang to the Sarah's head, ma'am.' "'To the where?' cried the coachman. "'Lord, Mr. Brodie,' interrupted Miss Squeers, "'the idea. Sarah's and Zed.' "'Surely,' said John, "'I knowed it was something about Sarah's son Zed. "'Does I know that?' Oh, "'Why, I know that,' replied the coachman gruffly, "'as he banged at the door. "'Tilda, dear, really,' remonstrated Miss Squeers, "'we shall be taken for I don't know what.' "'Let them take us as they find us,' said John Browdie. "'We don't come to London to do nought but joy ourselves.' "'I hope not, Mr. Browdie,' replied Miss Squeers, looking singularly dismal. "'Well, then,' said John, "'it's no matter. "'I've only been a married man four days, "'a kind of poor old father dying and putting it off. "'Here be a wedding party, bride and bridesmaid and the groom. "'If a moment don't dare him join himself now, when ought he, eh? "'Drat it all, that's what I want to know.' that he might begin to enjoy himself at once and lose no time, Mr. Browdie gave his wife a hearty kiss, and succeeded in wresting another from Miss Squeers, 
after a maidenly resistance of scratching and struggling on the part of that young lady, which was not quite over when they reached the Saracen's head. Here the party straightway retired to rest, the refreshment of sleep being necessary after so long a journey, and here they met again about noon to a substantial breakfast, spread by direction of Mr. John Browdie in a small private room upstairs, commanding an uninterrupted view of the stables. To have seen Miss Squeers now, divested of the brown beaver, the green veil, and the blue curl papers, and arrayed in all the virgin splendour of a white frock and spencer, with a white muslin bonnet and an imitative damask rose in full bloom on the inside here thereof, her luxuriant crop of hair arranged in curls so tight that it was impossible that they could come out by any accident, and her bonnet cap trimmed with little damask roses, which might be supposed to be so many promising scions of the sprig rose, to have seen all this, and to have seen the broad damask belt, matching both the family rose and the little roses, which encircled her slender waist, and by happy ingenuity took off from the shortness of the spencer behind, to have beheld all this, and to have taken further into account the coral bracelets, rather short of beads and with a very visible black string, which clasped her wrists, and the coral necklace which rested on her neck, supporting, outside her frock, a lonely Cornelian heart, typical of her own disengaged affections. To have contemplated all these mute but expressive appeals to the purest feelings of our nature might have thawed the frost of age, and added new and indistinguishable fuel to the fire of youth. The waiter was touched. Waiter as he was, he had human passions and feelings, and he looked very hard at Miss Squeers as he handed the muffins. "'Is—' asked Miss Squeers, with dignity. "'Beg your pardon, Miss?' "'My pa,' repeated Miss Squeers. "'Is he in?' "'In where, Miss?' "'In here, in the house,' replied Miss Squeers. "'My pa, Mr. Wackford Squeers. "'He's stopping here. Is he at home?' "'I didn't know there was any gentleman of that name in the house, Miss,' replied the waiter. "'There may be in the coffee-room.' "'May be. Very pretty in this, indeed. "'Here was Miss Squeers, who had been depending all the way to London "'upon showing her friends how much at home she would be, "'and how much respectful notice her name and connections would excite, "'told that her father might be there.' "'As if he was a feller,' observed Miss Squeers, with emphatic indignation. "'You better inquire, man, said John Browdie. "'I know not another pigeon pie with—' "'Dang that chap,' muttered John, looking into the empty dish as the waiter retired. "'Says he call this a pie? Three young pigeons and a trifling matter of steak and a crust so light "'that you don't know where it's been in your mouth and where it's gone? "'I wonder how many pies goes to a breakfast?' "'After a short interval, which John the ham and a cold round of beef— the waiter returned with another pie, and the information that Mr. Squeers was not stopping in the house, but he, that he came every day, and that directly he arrived he should be shown upstairs. With this he retired, and he had not retired two minutes when he returned with Mr. Squeers and his hopeful son. "'Why, who'd have thought of this?' said Mr. Squeers, when he had saluted the party, and received some private family intelligence from his daughter. "'Who indeed, Pa?' replied the young lady spitefully. "'But you see, Tilda is married at last.' "'And I stand threat for a sort of London, schoolmaster,' said John, vigorously attacking the pie. "'One of them things that young men do when they get married,' returned Squeers, "'and has run through with their money like nothing at all. "'How much better wouldn't it be now to save it up for the education of any little boys, for instance?' "'They come on you,' said Mr. Squeers, in a moralising way, "'before you're aware of it.' Mine did upon me. "'Will he pick a bit?' said John. "'I won't myself,' returned Squeers. "'But if you just let little Wackford tuck into something fat, I'll be obliged to you.' "'Give it him in his fingers, else the waiter charges it on, and there's lots of profit on this sort of victuals without that. If you hear the waiter coming, sir, shove it in your pocket and look out the window. Do you hear?' "'I'm away, father,' replied the dutiful Wackford. "'Well,' said Squeers, turning to his daughter, "'it's your turn to be married next. "'You must make haste.' "'Oh, I'm in no hurry,' said Miss Squeers, very sharply. "'No, Fanny?' cried her old friend, with some archness. "'No, Tilda,' replied Miss Squeers, shaking her head vehemently. "'I can wait.' "'So can the young man, it seems, Fanny,' observed Mrs. Fry Bridie. "'They ain't drawed into it by me, Tilda,' retorted Miss Squeers. "'No,' returned her friend, "'that's exceedingly true.' 
The sarcastic tone of this reply might have provoked a rather acrimonious retort from Miss Squeers, who, besides being of a constitutionally vicious temper, aggravated just now by travel and recent jolting, was somewhat irritated by old recollections and the failure of her own designs upon Mr. Browdie, and the acrimonious retort might have led to a great many other retorts, which might have led to heaven knows what, if the subject of conversation had not been at that precise moment accidentally changed by Mr. Squeers himself. "'What do you think?' said that gentleman. "'Who do you suppose we've laid hands on, Wackford and me?' "'Pa, not Mr.' Miss Squeers was unable to finish the sentence, but Mrs. Browdie did it for her, and added, "'Nickleby?' "'No,' said Squeers, "'but next door to him, though.' "'You can't mean Smike!' cried Miss Squeers, clapping her hands. "'Yes, I can, though,' rejoined her father. "'I've got him hard and fast.' "'What?' exclaimed John Browdie, pushing his way to place. "'Got that poor dumb scoundrel? Where?' "'Why, in the top back room at my lodging,' replied Squeers, "'with him on one side and the key on the other.' "'At thy lodging? These gossest him that thou lodging? Ha, ha, ha! The schoolmaster again all England! Give us the on, man. I'm damned, but I must shake thee by the on for that.' "'Got him him at thy lodging!' "'Yes,' replied Squeers, staggering in his chair under the congratulatory blow on the chest which the stout Yorkshireman dealt him. "'Thank ye. Uh, don't do it again. You mean it kindly, I know, but, but it hurts, rather. "'Yes, there he is. That's not so bad, is it?' "'Bad,' replied John Browdie. "'It's enough to scare him under here till on.' "'I thought it would surprise you a bit,' said Squeers, rubbing his hands. "'It was pretty neatly done, and pretty quick, too.' "'How were it?' inquired John, sitting down close to him. "'Tell us all about it, Moon. Come, quick!' Although he could not keep pace with John Browdie's impatience, Mr. Squeers related the lucky chance by which Smike had fallen into his hands as quickly as he could, and, except when he was interrupted by the admiring remarks of his auditors, paused not in the recital until he had brought it to an end. "'For fear he should give me the slip, by any chance,' observed Squeers, when he had finished, looking very cunning, I've taken three outsides for to-morrow morning, for Wackford and him and me, and have arranged to leave the accounts of the new boys to the agent, don't you see? So it's very lucky you come to-day, or you'd have missed us. And as it is, unless you could come and tea with me to-night, we shan't see anything more of you before we go away. Don't say another word, returned the Yorkshireman, shaking by the hand. We come if it was twenty mile. Now would you, though? returned Mr. Squeers, who had not expected quite such a ready acceptance of his invitation, or he would have considered twice before he gave it. John Browdie's own reply was another squeeze of the hand, and an assurance that they would not begin to see London till to-morrow, so that they might be at Mr. Snawley's at six o'clock without fail. And after some further conversation, Mr. Squeers and his son departed. During the remainder of the day, Mr. Browdie was in a very odd and excitable state, bursting occasionally into an explosion of laughter, and then taking up his hat and running into the coach-yard to have it out by himself. He was very restless, too, constantly walking in and out and snapping his fingers, and dancing scraps of uncouth country dances, and, in short, conducting himself in such a very extraordinary manner, that Miss Squeers opined he was going mad, and begging her dear Tilda not to distress herself, communicated her suspicions in so many words. Mrs. Browdie, however, without discovering any great alarm, observed that she had seen him so once before, and that although he was almost sure to be ill after it, it would not be anything very serious, and therefore he was better left alone. The result proved her to be perfectly for correct, for, while they were all sitting in Mr. Snawley's parlour that night, and just as it was beginning to get dusk, John Browdie was taken so ill, and seized with such an alarming dizziness in the head, that the whole company were thrown into the utmost consternation. His good lady, indeed, was the only person present who retained a presence of mind enough to observe that if he were allowed to lie down on Mr. Squeers's bed for an hour or so, and left entirely to himself, he would be sure to recover again almost as quickly as he had been taken ill. Nobody could refuse to try the effect of so reasonable a proposal before sending for a surgeon. Accordingly, John was supported upstairs with great difficulty. Being a monstrous weight, and regularly tumbling down two steps every time they hoisted him up three, and being laid on the bed, was left in charge of his wife, who, after a short interval, reappeared in the parlour, with the gratifying intelligence 
that he had fallen fast asleep. Now the fact was, that at that particular moment, John Browdie was sitting on the bed with the reddest face ever seen, cramming the corner of the pillow into his mouth to prevent his roaring out loud with laughter. He had no sooner succeeded in suppressing this emotion than he slipped off his shoes, and creeping to the adjoining room where the prisoner was confined, turned the key which was on the outside, and darting in, covered Smike's mouth with his huge hand before he could utter a sound. "'Odds bobs! Does thee not know me, man?' whispered the Yorkshireman to the bewildered lad. "'Browdy! Chap has met thee after the schoolmaster was banged!' "'Yes, yes!' cried Smike. "'Oh, help me!' "'Help thee!' replied John, stopping his mouth again the instant he had said this much. "'They didn't need help if thee weren't as silly youngster as ever draw breath. What did he come here for, then?' "'He brought me! Oh, he brought me!' cried Smike. "'Brought thee!' replied John. "'Why didn't he punch his head, or lay thyself down and kick, and squeal out for the police? I've had licked a dozen such as him when I was young as thee.' "'But thee bowiest a poor broken dawn chap,' said John sadly. "'And God forgive me for bragging o'er one of his weakest creatures.' Smike opened his mouth to speak, but John Browdy stopped him. "'Stand still,' said the Yorkshireman, "'and don't speak a morsel, or talk till I tell ye.' With this caution, John Browdy shook his head significantly, and, drawing a screwdriver from his pocket, took off the box of the lock in a very deliberate and workmanlike manner, and laid it, together with the implement, on the floor. "'See thou said John. "'Thou be thy doing. Now go away.' Smike looked vacantly at him, as if unable to comprehend his meaning. "'I say, coot away,' repeated John hastily. "'Does thee know where thou livest? Thee dost? Will, are yon thy claws or schoolmaster's?' "'Mine,' replied Smike, as the Yorkshireman hurried him to the adjoining room, and pointed out a pair of shoes and a coat which were lying on a chair. "'On with them, said John, forcing the wrong arm to the wrong sleeve, and winding the tails of the coat round the fugitive's neck. "'Now follow me, and when thee gets this outside door, turn to the right, and they won't see thee pass.' "'But, but, but he'll hear me shut the door,' replied Smike, trembling from head to foot. "'Then don't shut it at all,' retorted John Browdy. "'Dang it! They'd be in a fear of the schoolmaster taking cold, I hope.' "'No, no, no,' said Smike, his teeth chattering in his head. B -b "'But he brought me back before, and will again. He will. He will indeed.' "'He will, he will,' replied John impatiently. "'He won't, he won't. Look ye. I want to do this neighbourly like and let them think thee gotten away thyself. But if he comes out o' that parlour a whiles they're clearing off, he might have mercy on his old bones, for I won't. If he finds it out soon after, I'll put thee on a wrong scent, I warrant he.' But if thee keepest the good heart, thee be at home before thou knowest thee's gotten off. Come! Smike, who comprehended just enough of this to know it was intended as encouragement, prepared to follow with tottering steps, when John whispered in his ear, "'They'll just tell young master that I've spliced to Tiddy Price, and to be heard on at the Saracen by Lather, and that I beat jealous of un. Dang it! I like to boost when I think of that night. God, I think he's seen ee now, a powdering away at the thin bread and butter. It was rather a ticklish recollection for John just then, for he was within an ace of breaking out into a loud guffaw. Restraining himself, however, just in time by a great effort, he glided downstairs, hauling Smike behind him, and placing himself close to the parlour door to confront the first person that might come out, signed to him to make off. Having got so far, Smike needed no second bidding. Opening the house door gently, and casting a look of mingled gratitude and terror at his deliverer, he took the direction which had been indicated to him, and sped away like the wind. The Yorkshireman remained on his post for a few minutes, but, finding that there was no pause in the confrontation inside, crept back again unheard, and stood listening over the stair-rail for a full hour. Everything remaining perfectly quiet, he got into Mrs. Squeers's bed, once more, and drawing the clothes over his head, laughed till he was nearly smothered. If there could only have been somebody by to see how the bedclothes shook, and to see the Yorkshireman's great red face and round head appear above the sheets every now and then, like some jovial monster coming to the surface to breathe, and once more dived down, convulsed with the laughter which came bursting forth afresh, that somebody would have been scarcely less amused than John Browdie himself. End of chapter 39 Recording by Simon Evers 
Chapter Forty of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ariel Lipshaw. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty. In which Nicholas falls in love. He employs a mediator whose proceedings are crowned with unexpected success excepting in one solitary particular. Once more out of the clutches of his old persecutor, it needed no fresh stimulation to call forth the utmost energy and exertion that Smike was capable of summoning to his aid. Without pausing for a moment to reflect upon the course he was taking, or the probability of its leading him homewards or the reverse, he fled away with surprising swiftness and constancy of purpose, borne upon such wings as only fear can wear and impelled by imaginary shouts in the well-remembered voice of Squeers, who, with a host of pursuers, seemed to the poor fellow's disordered senses to press hard upon his track. Now left at a greater distance in the rear, and now gaining faster and faster upon him, as the alternations of hope and terror agitated him by turns. Long after he had become assured that these sounds were but the creation of his excited brain, he still held on, at a pace which even weakness and exhaustion could scarcely retard. It was not until the darkness and quiet of a country road recalled him to a sense of external objects, and the starry sky above warned him of the rapid flight of time, that, covered with dust and panting for breath, he stopped to listen and look about him. All was still and silent. A glare of light in the distance, casting a warm glow upon the sky, marked where the huge city lay. Solitary fields, divided by hedges and ditches, through many of which he had crashed and scrambled in his flight, skirted the road, both by the way he had come and upon the opposite side. It was late now. They could scarcely trace him by such paths as he had taken, and if he could hope to regain his own dwelling, it must surely be at such a time as that, and under cover of the darkness. This, by degrees, became pretty plain, even to the mind of Smike. He had, at first, entertained some vague and childish idea of travelling into the country for ten or a dozen miles, and then returning homewards by a wide circuit, which should keep him clear of London. So great was his apprehension of traversing the streets alone, lest he should again encounter his dreaded enemy. But yielding to the conviction which these thoughts inspired, he turned back, and taking the open road, though not without many fears and misgivings, made for London again with scarcely less speed of foot than that with which he had left the temporary abode of Mr. Squeers. By the time he re-entered it, at the western extremity, the greater part of the shops were closed. Of the throngs of people who had been tempted abroad after the heat of the day, but few remained in the streets, and they were lounging home. But of these he asked his way from time to time, and by dint of repeated inquiries he at length reached the dwelling of Newman Noggs. All that evening Newman had been hunting and searching in byways and corners for the very person who now knocked at his door, while Nicholas had been pursuing the same inquiry in other directions. He was sitting, with a melancholy air, at his poor supper, when Smike's timorous and uncertain knock reached his ears. Alive to every sound, in his anxious and expectant state, Newman hurried downstairs, and uttering a cry of joyful surprise, dragged the welcome visitor into the passage and up the stairs, and said not a word until he had him safe in his own garret, and the door was shut behind them, when he mixed a great mugful of gin and water, and holding it to Smike's mouth, as one might hold a bowl of medicine to the lips of a refractory child, commanded him to drain it to the last drop. Newman looked uncommonly blank when he found that Smike did little more than put his lips to the precious mixture. He was in the act of raising the mug to his own mouth, with a deep sigh of compassion for his poor friend's weakness, when Smike, beginning to relate the adventures which had befallen him, arrested him half-way, and he stood listening, with the mug in his hand. It was odd enough to see the change that came over Newman as Smike proceeded. At first he stood, rubbing his lips with the back of his hand, as a preparatory ceremony towards composing himself for a draught. Then, at the mention of Squeers, he took the mug under his arm, and, opening his eyes very wide, looked on, in the utmost astonishment. When Smike came to the assault upon himself in the hackney-coach, he hastily deposited the mug upon the table, and limped up and down the room in a state of the greatest excitement, stopping himself with a jerk every now and then, 
as if to listen more attentively. When John Browdie came to be spoken of, he dropped, by slow and gradual degrees, into a chair, and rubbing his hands upon his knees, quicker and quicker as the story reached its climax, burst, at last, into a laugh, composed of one loud sonorous ha-ha, having given vent to which, his countenance immediately fell again as he inquired, with the utmost anxiety, whether it was probable that John Browdie and Squeers had come to blows. "'No, I think not,' replied Smike. I don't think he could have missed me till I had got quite away." Newman scratched his head with a shout of great disappointment, and once more lifting up the mug, applied himself to the contents, smiling meanwhile over the rim, with a grim and ghastly smile at Smike. "'You shall stay here,' said Newman. "'You're tired. Fagged. I'll tell them you're come back. They have been half mad about you. Mr. Nicholas—' "'God bless him!' cried Smike. "'Amen!' returned Newman. He hasn't had a minute's rest or peace. No more has the old lady, nor Miss Nickleby. No, no. Has she thought about me? said Smike. Has she, though? Oh, has she, has she? Don't tell me so if she has not. She has, cried Newman. She is as noble-hearted as she is beautiful. Yes, yes, cried Smike. Well said. So mild and gentle, said Newman. Yes, yes, cried Smike, with increasing eagerness. And yet— with such a true and gallant spirit," pursued Newman. He was going on in his enthusiasm, when, chancing to look at his companion, he saw that he had covered his face with his hands, and that tears were stealing out between his fingers. A moment before, the boy's eyes were sparkling with unwonted fire, and every feature had been lighted up with an excitement which made him appear, for the moment, quite a different being. "'Well, well,' muttered Newman, as if he were a little puzzled. It has touched me more than once to think such a nature should have been exposed to such trials. This poor fellow, yes, yes, he feels that too. It softens him, makes him think of his former misery. Ha! That's it? Yes, that's hum. It was by no means clear, from the tone of these broken reflections, that Newman Noggs considered them as explaining, at all satisfactorily, the emotion which had suggested them. He sat, in a musing attitude, for some time, regarding Smike occasionally with an anxious and doubtful glance, which sufficiently showed that he was not very remotely connected with his thoughts. At length he repeated his proposition that Smike should remain where he was for that night, and that he, Noggs, should straightway repair to the cottage to relieve the suspense of the family. But as Smike would not hear of this, pleading his anxiety to see his friends again, they eventually sallied forth together and the night being by this time far advanced, and Smike being besides so footsore that he could hardly crawl along, it was within an hour of sunrise when they reached their destination. At the first sound of their voices outside the house, Nicholas, who had passed a sleepless night, devising schemes for the recovery of his lost charge, started from his bed and joyfully admitted them. There was so much noisy conversation, and congratulation, and indignation, that the remainder of the family were soon awakened, and Smike received a warm and cordial welcome, not only from Kate, but from Mrs. Nickleby also, who assured him of her future favour and regard, and was so obliging as to relate, for his entertainment and that of the assembled circle, a most remarkable account, extracted from some work the name of which she had never known, of a miraculous escape from some prison, but what one she couldn't remember, effected by an officer whose name she had forgotten, confined for some crime which she didn't clearly recollect. At first Nicholas was disposed to give his uncle credit for some portion of this bold attempt, which had so nearly proved successful, to carry off Smike, but on more mature consideration he was inclined to think that the full merit of it rested with Mr. Squeers. Determined to ascertain, if he could, through John Browdie, how the case really stood, he betook himself to his daily occupation, meditating, as he went, on a great variety of schemes for the punishment of the Yorkshire schoolmaster, all of which had their foundation in the strictest principles of retributive justice, and had but the one drawback of being wholly impracticable. "'A fine morning, Mr. Lincolnwater,' said Nicholas, entering the office. "'Ah!' replied Tim, "'talk of the country, indeed. What do you think of this now, for a day, a London day, eh?' "'It's a little clearer out of town,' said Nicholas. "'Clearer,' echoed Tim Lincolnwater. "'You should see it from my bedroom window.' "'You should see it from mine,' replied Nicholas, with a smile. 
pooh pooh said tim lincolnwater don't tell me country bow was quite a rustic place to tim nonsense what can you get in the country but new-laid eggs and flowers i can buy new-laid eggs in leadenhall market any morning before breakfast and as to flowers it's worth a run upstairs to smell my mignonette or to see the double wallflower in the back attic window at number six in the court there is a double wallflower at number six in the court is there said nicholas yes is there replied tim and planted in a cracked jug without a spout there were hyacinths there this last spring blossoming in but you'll laugh at that of course at what at their blossoming in old blacking bottles said tim not i indeed returned nicholas tim looked wistfully at him for a moment as if he were encouraged by the tone of this reply to be more communicative on the subject and sticking behind his ear a pen that he had been making and shutting up his knife with a smart click said they belong to a sickly bedridden humpbacked boy and seem to be the only pleasure mr nickleby of his sad existence how many years is it said tim pondering since i first noticed him quite a little child dragging himself about on a pair of tiny crutches well well not many but though they would appear nothing if i thought of other things they seem a long long time when i think of him it is a sad thing said tim breaking off to see a little deformed child sitting apart from other children who are active and merry watching the games he is denied the power to share in he made my heart ache very often it is a good heart said nicholas that disentangles itself from the close avocations of every day to heed such things you were saying that the flowers belonged to this poor boy said tim that's all when it is fine weather and he can crawl out of bed he draws a chair close to the window and sits there looking at them and arranging them all day long he used to nod at first and then we came to speak formerly when i called to him of a morning and asked him how he was he would smile and say better but now he shakes his head and only bends more closely over his old plants it must be dull to watch the dark housetops and the flying clouds for so many months but he is very patient is there nobody in the house to cheer or help him asked nicholas his father lives there i believe replied tim and other people too but no one seems to care much for the poor sickly cripple i have asked him very often if i can do nothing for him his answer is always the same nothing his voice is growing weak of late but i can see that he makes the old reply he can't leave his bed now so they have moved it close beside the window and there he lies all day now looking at the sky and now at his flowers which he still makes shift to trim and water with his own thin hands at night when he sees my candle he draws back his curtain and leaves it so till i am in bed it seems such company to him to know that i am there that i often sit at my window for an hour or more that he may see i am still awake and sometimes i get up in the night to look at the dull melancholy light in his little room and wonder whether he is awake or sleeping the night will not be long coming said tim when he will sleep and never wake again on earth we have never so much as shaken hands in all our lives and yet i shall miss him like an old friend are there any country flowers that could interest me like these do you think or do you suppose that the withering of a hundred kinds of the choicest flowers that blow called by the hardest latin names that were ever invented would give me one fraction of the pain that i shall feel when these old jugs and bottles are swept away as lumber country cried tim with a contemptuous emphasis don't you know that i couldn't have such a court under my bedroom window anywhere but in london with which inquiry tim turned his back and pretending to be absorbed in his accounts took an opportunity of hastily wiping his eyes when he supposed nicholas was looking another way whether it was that tim's accounts were more than usually intricate that morning or whether it was that his habitual serenity had been a little disturbed by these recollections it so happened that when nicholas returned from executing some commission and inquired whether mr charles cheeryble was alone in his room tim promptly and without the smallest hesitation replied in the affirmative although somebody had passed into the room not ten minutes before and tim took especial and particular pride in preventing any intrusion on either of the brothers when they were engaged with any visitor whatsoever i'll take this letter to him at once said nicholas if that's the case and with that he walked to the room and knocked at the door no answer another knock and still no answer he can't be here thought nicholas i'll lay it on his table so nicholas opened the door and walked in 
and very quickly he turned to walk out again, when he saw, to his great astonishment and discomfiture, a young lady upon her knees at Mr. Cheeryble's feet, and Mr. Cheeryble beseeching her to rise, and entreating a third person, who had the appearance of the young lady's female attendant, to add her persuasions to his, to induce her to do so. Nicholas stammered out an awkward apology, and was precipitately retiring, when the young lady, turning her head a little, presented to his view the features of the lovely girl whom he had seen at the register office on his first visit long before. Glancing from her to the attendant, he recognized the same clumsy servant who had accompanied her then, and between his admiration of the young lady's beauty and the confusion and surprise of this unexpected recognition, he stood stock still, in such a bewildered state of surprise and embarrassment that for the moment he was quite bereft of the power either to speak or move. "'My dear ma'am, my dear young lady,' cried Brother Charles, in violent agitation, "'pray don't, not another word, I beseech and entreat you, I implore you, I beg of you, to rise. We—we we are not alone.' As he spoke, he raised the young lady, who staggered to a chair, and swooned away. "'She has fainted, sir,' said Nicholas, darting eagerly forward. "'Poor dear, poor dear,' cried Brother Charles, "'where is my brother Ned? Ned, my dear brother, come here, pray.' "'Brother Charles, my dear fellow,' replied his brother, hurrying into the room. "'What is the—ah, what?' "'Hush, hush, not a word for your life, brother Ned,' returned the other. "'Ring for the housekeeper, my dear brother. Call Tim Lincolnwater. "'Here, Tim Lincolnwater, sir. Mr. Nickleby, my dear sir, leave the room, I beg and beseech of you.' "'I think she is better now,' said Nicholas, who had been watching the patient so eagerly that he had not heard the request. "'Poor bird!' cried brother Charles, gently taking her hand in his, and laying her head upon his arm— "'Brother Ned, my dear fellow, you will be surprised, I know, to witness this in business hours, but—' Here he was again reminded of the presence of Nicholas, and, shaking him by the hand, earnestly requested him to leave the room, and to send Tim Lincolnwater without an instant's delay. Nicholas immediately withdrew, and on his way to the counting-house met both the old housekeeper and Tim Lincolnwater, jostling each other in the passage and hurrying to the scene of action with extraordinary speed. Without waiting to hear his message, Tim Lincolnwater darted into the room, and presently afterwards Nicholas heard the door shut and locked on the inside. He had abundance of time to ruminate on this discovery, for Tim Lincolnwater was absent during the greater part of an hour, during the whole of which time Nicholas thought of nothing but the young lady, and her exceeding beauty, and what could possibly have brought her there, and why they made such a mystery of it. The more he thought of all this, the more it perplexed him, and the more anxious he became to know who and what she was. "'I should have known her among ten thousand, thought Nicholas. And with that he walked up and down the room, and recalling her face and figure, of which he had a peculiarly vivid remembrance, discarded all other subjects of reflection, and dwelt upon that alone. At length Tim Lincolnwater came back, provokingly cool, and with papers in his hand and a pen in his mouth, as if nothing had happened. "'Is she quite recovered?' said Nicholas, impetuously. "'Who?' returned Tim Lincolnwater. "'Who?' repeated Nicholas. "'The young lady!' "'What do you make, Mr. Nickleby?' said Tim, taking his pen out of his mouth. "'What do you make of four hundred and twenty-seven times three thousand two hundred and thirty-eight? "'Nay,' returned Nicholas, "'what do you make of my question first? "'I asked you about the young lady,' said Tim Lincolnwater, putting on his spectacles. "'To be sure.' "'Yes. Oh, she's very well.' "'Very well, is she?' returned Nicholas. "'Very well,' replied Mr. Lincolnwater, gravely. "'Will she be able to go home to-day?' asked Nicholas. "'She's gone,' said Tim. "'Gone?' "'Yes.' "'I hope she has not far to go,' said Nicholas, looking earnestly at the other. "'Aye,' replied the immovable Tim. "'I hope she hasn't.' Nicholas hazarded one or two further remarks, but it was evident that Tim Lincolnwater had his own reasons for evading the subject, and that he was determined to afford no further information respecting the fair unknown, who had awakened so much curiosity in the breast of his young friend. Nothing daunted by this repulse, Nicholas returned to the charge next day, emboldened by the circumstance of Mr. Lincolnwater being in a very talkative and communicative mood. But directly he resumed the theme, Tim relapsed into a state of most provoking taciturnity, and from answering in monosyllables came to returning no answers at all, save such as were to be inferred from several grave nods and shrugs, which only served to whet that appetite for intelligence in Nicholas, which had already attained a most unreasonable height. 
foiled in these attempts, he was fain to content himself with watching for the young lady's next visit, but here again he was disappointed. Day after day passed, and she did not return. He looked eagerly at the superscription of all the notes and letters, but there was not one among them which he could fancy to be in her handwriting. On two or three occasions he was employed on business which took him to a distance, and had formerly been transacted by Tim Lincolnwater. Nicholas could not help suspecting that, for some reason or other, he was sent out of the way on purpose, and that the young lady was there in his absence. Nothing transpired, however, to confirm this suspicion, and Tim could not be entrapped into any confession or admission tending to support it in the smallest degree. Mystery and disappointment are not absolutely indispensable to the growth of love, but they are, very often, its powerful auxiliaries. Out of sight, out of mind, is well enough as a proverb applicable to cases of friendship, though absence is not always necessary to hollowness of heart, even between friends, and truth and honesty, like precious stones, are perhaps most easily imitated at a distance, when the counterfeits often pass for real. Love, however, is very materially assisted by a warm and active imagination, which has a long memory, and will thrive for a considerable time on very slight and sparing food. Thus it is that it often attains its most luxuriant growth in separation and under circumstances of the utmost difficulty. And thus it was that Nicholas, thinking of nothing but the unknown young lady, from day to day and from hour to hour, began at last to think that he was very desperately in love with her, and that never was such an ill-used and persecuted lover as he. Still, though he loved and languished after the most orthodox models, and was only deterred from making a confidant of Kate by the slight considerations of having never, in all his life, spoken to the object of his passion, and having never set eyes upon her, except on two occasions, on both of which she had come and gone like a flash of lightning, or, as Nicholas himself said, in the numerous conversations he held with himself, like a vision of youth and beauty much too bright to last— his ardour and devotion remained without its reward. The young lady appeared no more, so there was a great deal of love wasted, enough indeed to have set up half a dozen young gentlemen, as times go, with the utmost decency, and nobody was a bit the wiser for it, not even Nicholas himself, who, on the contrary, became more dull, sentimental, and lackadaisical every day. While matters were in this state, the failure of a correspondent of the brothers Cheerable in Germany imposed upon Tim Lincolnwater and Nicholas the necessity of going through some very long and complicated accounts, extending over a considerable space of time. To get through them with the greater dispatch, Tim Lincolnwater proposed they should remain at the counting-house for a week or so until ten o'clock at night. To this, as nothing damped the zeal of Nicholas in the service of his kind patrons, not even romance, which has seldom business habits, he cheerfully assented. On the very first night of these later hours, at nine exactly, there came, not the young lady herself, but her servant, who, being closeted with brother Charles for some time, went away, and returned next night at the same hour, and on the next, and on the next again. These repeated visits inflamed the curiosity of Nicholas to the very highest pitch. Tantalized and excited beyond all bearing, and unable to fathom the mystery without neglecting his duty, he confided the whole secret to Newman Noggs, imploring him to be on the watch next night, to follow the girl home, to set on foot such inquiries relative to the name, condition, and history of her mistress as he could without exciting suspicion, and to report the result to him with the least possible delay. Beyond all measure proud of this commission, Newman Noggs took up his post in the square on the following evening, a full hour before the needful time, and planting himself behind the pump and pulling his hat over his eyes, began his watch with an elaborate appearance of mystery, admirably calculated to excite the suspicion of all beholders. Indeed, diverse servant-girls who came to draw water, and sundry little boys who stopped to drink the ladle were almost scared out of their senses, by the apparition of Newman Noggs looking stealthily round the pump, with nothing of him visible but his face, and that wearing the expression of a meditative ogre. Punctual to her time, the messenger came again, and after an interview of rather longer duration than usual, departed. Newman had made two appointments with Nicholas one for the next evening, conditional on his success, and one the next night following, which was to be kept under all circumstances. The first night he was not at the place of meeting, 
a certain tavern about halfway between the city and Golden Square, but on the second night he was there before Nicholas and received him with open arms. "'It's all right,' whispered Newman. "'Sit down. Sit down. There's a dear young man, and let me tell you all about it.' Nicholas needed no second invitation, and eagerly inquired what was the news. "'There's a great deal of news,' said Newman, in a flutter of exultation. "'It's all right. Don't be anxious. I don't know where to begin. Never mind that. Keep up your spirits. It's all right.' "'Well,' said Nicholas eagerly, "'yes?' "'Yes,' replied Newman. "'That's it.' "'What's it?' said Nicholas. "'The name! The name, my dear fellow!' "'The name's Bobster,' replied Newman. "'Bobster!' repeated Nicholas indignantly. "'That's the name,' said Newman. "'I remember it by Lobster.' "'Bobster!' repeated Nicholas more emphatically than before. "'That must be the servant's name.' "'No, it ain't,' said Newman, shaking his head with great positiveness. "'Miss Cecilia Bobster.' "'Cecilia, eh?' returned Nicholas, muttering the two names together over and over in every variety of tone to try the effect. "'Well, Cecilia is a pretty name.' "'Very. And a pretty creature, too,' said Newman. "'Who?' said Nicholas. "'Miss Bobster.' "'Why, where have you seen her?' demanded Nicholas. "'Never mind, my dear boy,' retorted Noggs, clapping him on the shoulder. "'I have seen her. You shall see her. I've managed it all.' "'My dear Newman!' cried Nicholas, grasping his hand. "'Are you serious?' "'I am,' replied Newman. "'I mean it all, every word. "'You shall see her to-morrow night. "'She consents to hear you speak for yourself. "'I persuaded her. "'She is all affability, goodness, sweetness, and beauty.' "'I know she is. "'I know she must be, Newman,' said Nicholas, wringing his hand. "'You are right,' returned Newman. "'Where does she live?' cried Nicholas. "'What have you learnt of her history? "'Has she a father?' "'Mother? Any brothers? Sisters? What did she say? How came you to see her? Was she not very much surprised? Did you say how passionately I have longed to speak to her? Did you tell her where I had seen her? Did you tell her how, and when, and where, and how long, and how often I have thought of that sweet face which came upon me in my bitterest distress, like a glimpse of some better world? Did you, Newman? Did you?' Poor Noggs literally gasped for breath as this flood of questions rushed upon him, and moved spasmodically in his chair at every fresh inquiry, staring at Nicholas meanwhile with a most ludicrous expression of perplexity. "'No,' said Newman. "'I didn't tell her that.' "'Didn't tell her which?' asked Nicholas. "'About the glimpse of the better world,' said Newman. "'I didn't tell her who you were either, or where you'd seen her. I said you loved her to distraction.' "'That's true, Newman,' replied Nicholas, with his characteristic vehemence. "'Heaven knows I do.' "'I said, too, that you had admired her for a long time in secret,' said Newman. "'Yes, yes, what did she say to that?' asked Nicholas. "'Blushed,' said Newman. "'To be sure, of course she would,' said Nicholas approvingly. Newman then went on to say that the young lady was an only child, that her mother was dead, that she resided with her father, and that she had been induced to allow her lover a secret interview, at the intercession of her servant, who had great influence with her. He further related how it required much moving and great eloquence to bring the young lady to this pass, how it was expressly understood that she merely afforded Nicholas an opportunity of declaring his passion, and how she by no means pledged herself to be favourably impressed with his attentions. The mystery of her visits to the brothers Cheerable remained wholly unexplained, for Newman had not alluded to them either in his preliminary conversations with the servant, or his subsequent interview with the mistress, merely remarking that he had been instructed to watch the girl home, and plead his young friend's cause, and not saying how far he had followed her, or from what point. But Newman hinted that from what had fallen from the confidant, he had been led to suspect that the young lady led a very miserable and unhappy life, under the strict control of her only parent, who was of a violent and brutal temper, a circumstance which he thought might in some degree account, both for her having sought the protection and friendship of the brothers, and her suffering herself to be prevailed upon to grant the promised interview. The last he held to be a very logical deduction from the premises, inasmuch as it was but natural to suppose that a young lady, whose present condition was so unenviable, would be more than commonly desirous to change it. It appeared, on further questioning, for it was only by a very long and arduous process that all this could be got out of Newman Noggs, that Newman, in explanation of his shabby appearance, had represented himself as being, for certain wise and indispensable purposes, connected with that intrigue, in disguise, 
and being questioned how he had come to exceed his commission so far as to procure an interview, he responded that the lady appearing willing to grant it, he considered himself bound, both in duty and gallantry, to avail himself of such a golden means of enabling Nicholas to prosecute his addresses. After these and all possible questions had been asked and answered twenty times over, they parted, undertaking to meet on the following night at half-past ten, for the purpose of fulfilling the appointment, which was for eleven o'clock. "'Things come about very strangely,' thought Nicholas, as he walked home. "'I never contemplated anything of this kind, never dreamt of the possibility of it. To know something of the life of one in whom I felt such interest, to see her in the street, to pass the house in which she lived, to meet her sometimes in her walks, to hope that a day might come when I might be in a condition to tell her of my love, this was the utmost extent of my thoughts. Now, however, but I should be a fool indeed to repine my own good fortune.' Still, Nicholas was dissatisfied, and there was more in the dissatisfaction than mere revulsion of feeling. He was angry with the young lady for being so easily won, because, reasoned Nicholas, it is not as if she knew it was I, but it might have been anybody, which was certainly not pleasant. The next moment he was angry with himself for entertaining such thoughts, arguing that nothing but goodness could dwell in such a temple, and that the behavior of the brothers sufficiently showed the estimation in which they held her. "'The fact is, she's a mystery altogether,' said Nicholas. This was not more satisfactory than his previous course of reflection, and only drove him out upon a new sea of speculation and conjecture, where he tossed and tumbled, in great discomfort of mind, until the clock struck ten, and the hour of meeting drew nigh. Nicholas had dressed himself with great care, and even Newman Noggs had trimmed himself up a little, his coat presenting the phenomenon of two consecutive buttons, and the supplementary pins being inserted at tolerably regular intervals. He wore his hat, too, in the newest taste, with a pocket-handkerchief in the crown, and a twisted end of it straggling out behind after the fashion of a pigtail, though he could scarcely lay claim to the ingenuity of inventing this latter decoration, inasmuch as he was utterly unconscious of it being in a nervous and excited condition, which rendered him quite insensible to everything but the great object of the expedition. They traversed the streets in profound silence, and after walking at a round pace for some distance, arrived in one, of a gloomy appearance and very little frequented, near the Edgware Road. "'Number twelve, said Newman. "'Oh,' replied Nicholas, looking about him. "'Good street?' said Newman. "'Yes,' returned Nicholas. "'Rather dull.' Newman made no answer to this remark but halting abruptly, planted Nicholas with his back to some area railings, and gave him to understand that he was to wait there, without moving hand or foot, until it was satisfactorily ascertained that the coast was clear. This done, Noggs limped away with great alacrity, looking over his shoulder every instant to make quite certain that Nicholas was obeying his directions, and, ascending the steps of a house some half-dozen doors off, was lost to view. After a short delay he reappeared, and limping back again, halted midway, and beckoned Nicholas to follow him. "'Well,' said Nicholas, advancing towards him on tiptoe. "'All right,' replied Newman, in high glee. "'All ready. Nobody at home. Couldn't be better. Ha, ha!' With this fortifying assurance, he stole past a street door, on which Nicholas caught a glimpse of a brass plate with Bobster in very large letters, and stopping at the area gate, which was open, signed to his young friend to descend. "'What the devil!' cried Nicholas, drawing back. "'Are we to sneak into the kitchen, as if we came after the forks?' "'Hush!' replied Newman. "'Old Bobster! Ferocious Turk! He'd kill em all! Box the young lady's ears! He does! Often!' "'What!' cried Nicholas, in high wrath. "'Do you mean to tell me that any man would dare to box the ears of such a—' He had no time to sing the praises of his mistress just then, for Newman gave him a gentle push, which had nearly precipitated him to the bottom of the area steps. Thinking it best to take the hint in good part, Nicholas descended, without further remonstrance, but with a countenance bespeaking anything rather than the hope and rapture of a passionate lover. Newman followed. He would have followed head first, but for the timely assistance of Nicholas, and taking his hand, led him through a stone passage, profoundly dark, into a back kitchen or cellar, of the blackest and most pitchy obscurity, where they stopped. "'Well,' said Nicholas, in a discontented whisper, "'this is not all, I suppose, is it?' "'No, no,' rejoined Noggs. "'They'll be here directly. It's all right.' "'I am glad to hear it,' said Nicholas. "'I shouldn't have thought it, I confess.' 
they exchanged no further words and there nicholas stood listening to the loud breathing of newman noggs and imagining that his nose seemed to glow like a red-hot coal even in the midst of the darkness which enshrouded them suddenly the sound of cautious footsteps attracted his ear and directly afterwards a female voice inquired if the gentleman was there yes replied nicholas turning towards the corner from which the voice proceeded who is that only me sir replied the voice now if you please ma'am a gleam of light shone into the place and presently the servant girl appeared bearing a light and followed by her young mistress who seemed to be overwhelmed by modesty and confusion at sight of the young lady nicholas started and changed colour his heart beat violently and he stood rooted to the spot at that instant and almost simultaneously with her arrival and that of the candle there was heard a loud and furious knocking at the street door which caused newman noggs to jump up with great agility from a beer-barrel on which he had been seated astride and to exclaim abruptly and with a face of ashy paleness bobster by the lord the young lady shrieked, the attendant wrung her hands, Nicholas gazed from one to the other in apparent stupefaction, and Newman hurried to and fro, thrusting his hands into all his pockets successively, and drawing out the linings of every one in the excess of his irresolution. It was but a moment, but the confusion crowded into that one moment no imagination can exaggerate. "'Leave the house, for heaven's sake! We have done wrong, we deserve it all!' cried the young lady. "'Leave the house, or I am ruined and undone for ever!' will you hear me say but one word cried nicholas only one i will not detain you will you hear me say one word in explanation of this mischance but nicholas might as well have spoken to the wind for the young lady with distracted looks hurried up the stairs he would have followed her but newman twisting his hand in his coat collar dragged him towards the passage by which they had entered let me go newman in the devil's name cried nicholas i must speak to her i will i will not leave this house without reputation character violence consider said newman clinging round him with both arms and hurrying him away let them open the door we'll go as we came directly it's shut come this way here overpowered by the remonstrances of newman and the tears and prayers of the girl and the tremendous knocking above which had never ceased and precisely as mr bobster made his entrance by the street door he and noggs made their exit by the area gate they hurried away through several streets without stopping or speaking at last they halted and confronted each other with blank and rueful faces never mind said newman gasping for breath don't be cast down it's all right more fortunate next time it couldn't be helped i did my part excellently replied nicholas taking his hand excellently and like the true and zealous friend you are only mind i am not disappointed newman and feel just as much indebted to you only it was the wrong lady eh cried newman noggs taken in by the servant newman newman said nicholas laying his hand upon his shoulder it was the wrong servant too newman's under jaw dropped and he gazed at nicholas with his sound eye fixed fast and motionless in his head don't take it to heart said nicholas it's of no consequence you see i don't care about it you followed the wrong person that's all that was all whether newman noggs had looked round the pump in a slanting direction so long that his sight became impaired or whether finding that there was time to spare he had recruited himself with a few drops of something stronger than the pump could yield by whatsoever means it had come to pass this was his mistake and nicholas went home to brood upon it and to meditate upon the charms of the unknown young lady now as far beyond his reach as ever End of chapter 40. Recording by Ariel Lipshaw in New York City. Chapter 41 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens Chapter 41 Containing some romantic passages between Mrs. Nickleby and the gentleman in the small clothes next door. Ever since her last momentous conversation with her son, Mrs. Nickleby had begun to display unusual care in the adornment of her person, 
gradually superadding to those staid and matronly habiliments which had up to that time formed her ordinary attire, a variety of embellishments and decorations, slight perhaps in themselves, but, taken together and considered with reference to the subject of her disclosure, of no mean importance. Even her black dress assumed something of a deadly lively air from the jointy style in which it was worn, and, eked out as its lingering attractions were, by a prudent, prudent disposal here and there of certain juvenile ornaments of little or no value, which had, for that reason alone, escaped the general wreck, and been permitted to slumber peacefully in odd corners of old drawers and boxes where daylight seldom shone, her morning garments assumed quite a new character. From being the outward tokens of respect and sorrow for the dead, they became converted into signals of very slaughterous and killing designs upon the living. Mrs. Nickleby might have been stimulated to this proceeding by a lofty sense of duty and impulses of unquestionable excellence. She might by this time have become impressed with the sinfulness of long indulgence in unavailing woe, or the necessity of setting a proper example of neatness and decorum to her blooming daughter. Considerations of duty and responsibility apart, the change might have taken its rise in feelings of the purest and most disinterested charity. The gentleman next door had been vilified by Nicholas, rudely stigmatised as a dotard and an idiot, and for these attacks upon his understanding Mrs. Nickleby was in some sort accountable. She might have felt that it was the act of a good Christian to show by all means in her power that the abused gentleman was neither the one nor the other. And what better means could she adopt towards so virtuous and laudable an end than proving to all men, in her own person, that his passion was the most rational and reasonable in the world, and just the very result of all others which discreet and thinking persons might have foreseen, from her incautiously displaying her matured charms without reserve, under the very eye, as it were, of an ardent and too susceptible man. "'Ah!' said Mrs. Nickleby, gravely shaking her head. "'If Nicholas knew what his poor dear papa suffered before we were engaged, when I used to hate him, he would have a little more feeling. Shall I ever forget the morning I looked scornfully at him when he offered to m carry my parasol, or that night when I frowned at him? It was a mercy he didn't emigrate. It very nearly drove him to it.' Whether the deceased might not have been better off if he had emigrated in his bachelor days was a question which his relict did not stop to consider, for Kate entered the room with her work-box in this stage of her reflections, and a much slighter interruption or no interruption at all would have diverted Mrs. Nickleby's thoughts into a new channel at, at any time. "'Kate, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'I don't know how it is, but a fine warm summer day like this, with the birds singing in every direction, always put me, puts me in mind of roast pig with sage and onion sauce and made gravy. "'That's a curious association of ideas, is it not, Mamma? "'Upon my word, my dear, I don't know,' replied Mrs. Nickleby. "'Roast pig, let me see. "'On the day, five weeks after you were christened, we had a roast— "'No, that couldn't have been a pig either, "'because I recollect there were a pair of them to carve, "'and your poor papa and I could never have thought of sitting down to two pigs. "'There must have been partridges.' "'Roast pig! I hardly think we ever could have had one, now I come to remember, for your papa could never bear the sight of them in the shops, and used to say that they always put him in mind of very little babies, only the pigs have much fairer complexions. And he had a horror of little babies, too, because he couldn't very well afford any increase in his family, and had a natural dislike to the subject. It's very odd now. What could have put that in my head? I recollect dining once at Mrs. Bevan's in that broad street round the corner by the coachmakers, where the tipsy man fell through the cellar flap of an empty house nearly a week before the quarter day, and wasn't found till the new tenant went in. And we had roast pig there. It must be that, I think, that reminds me of it, especially as there was a little bird in the room that would keep on singing all the time of dinner. At least not a little bird, for it was a parrot, and he didn't sing exactly, for he talked and swore dreadfully. But I think it must be that. Indeed, I'm sure it must. "'Shouldn't you say so, my dear?' "'I should say there was not a doubt about it, mamma. returned Kate, with a cheerful smile. "'No, but do you think so, Kate?' said Mrs. Nickleby, with as much gravity as if it were a question of the most imminent and thrilling interest. 
"'If you don't, say at once, you know, because it's just as well to be correct, particularly on a point of this kind, which is very curious and worth settling while one thinks about it.' Kate laughingly replied that she was quite convinced, and as her mamma still appeared undetermined whether it was not absolutely essential that the subject should be renewed, proposed that they should take their work into the summer-house and enjoy the beauty of the afternoon. Mrs. Nickleby readily assented, and to the summer-house they repaired without further discussion. "'Well, I will say,' observed Mrs. Nickleby, as she took her seat, "'that there never was such a good creature as Smike. Upon my word, the pains he has taken in putting this little arbour to rights, and training the sweetest flowers about it, are beyond anything I could have—' "'I wish he wouldn't put all the gravel on your side, Kate, my dear, though, and leave nothing but mould for me.' Uh, uh, "'Dear mamma," returned Kate hastily, T "'take these seats, do, do, to, to oblige me, mamma." "'No, indeed, my dear, I shall keep my own side,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Well, I declare!' Kate looked up inquiringly. "'If it hasn't been,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'and got from somewhere or other a couple of roots of those flowers "'that I said I was so fond of the other night, "'and ask you if you were not—' "'No, that you said you were so fond of the other night, "'and asked me if I wasn't—' "'Oh, it's the same thing. "'Now, upon my word, I take that as very kind and attentive indeed. "'I don't see,' added Mrs. Nickleby, looking narrowly about her, "'any of them on my side, but I suppose they grow best near the gravel. "'You may depend upon it they do, Kate, "'and that's the reason they are all near you, "'and he's put the gravel there because it's the sunny side. "'Upon my word, that's very clever now. "'I shouldn't have had half as much thought myself.' Mamma, said Kate, bending over her work, so that her face was almost hidden, "'before you were married—' "'Dear me, Kate,' interrupted Mrs. Nickleby, "'what in the name of goodness graciousness makes you fly off to the time before I was married, when I am talking to you about his thoughtfulness and attention to me? You don't seem to take the smallest interest in the garden.' "'Oh, mamma," said Kate, raising her face again, "'you know I do.' "'Well, then, my dear, why don't you praise the neatness and prettiness with which it's kept?' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'How very odd you are, Kate!' "'I do praise it, mamma," answered Kate gently. "'Poor fellow!' "'I scarcely ever hear you, my dear,' retorted Mrs. Nickleby. "'That's all I've got to say.' By this time the good lady had been a long while upon one topic, so she fell at once into her daughter's little trap, if trap it were, and inquired what she had been going to say. "'About what, mamma? said Kate, who had apparently quite forgotten her diversion. "'Law, Kate, my dear,' returned her mother, "'why, you're asleep or stupid, about the time before I was married.' "'Oh, yes,' said Kate. "'I remember. I was going to ask, mamma, before you were married, had you many suitors?' "'Suitors, my dear,' cried Mrs. Nickleby, with a smile of wonderful complacency. First and last, Kate, I must have had a dozen at least.' Mamma returned Kate, in a tone of remonstrance. "'I had indeed, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'not including your poor papa, or a young gentleman who used to go at that time to the same dancing-school, and who would send gold watches and bracelets to our house in gilt-edge paper, which was always returned, and who afterwards, unfortunately, went out to Botany Bay in a cadet ship, a convict ship, I mean, and escaped into a bush and killed sheep. I don't know how they got there, and was going to be hung, only accidentally choked himself, and the government pardoned him.' "'Then there was young Lukin,' said Mrs. Nickleby, beginning with her left thumb and checking off the names on her fingers. "'Mowgli, Tipslark, Cabri, Smithser.' Having now reached her little finger, Mrs. Nickleby was carrying the account over to the other hand, when a loud <coughs> which appeared to come from the very foundation of the garden wall, gave both herself and her daughter a violent start. "Mamma, what was that?' said Kate, in a low tone of voice. "'Upon my word, my dear!' returned Mrs. Nickleby, considerably startled. "'Unless it was the gentleman belonging to the next house, I don't know what it could possibly—' "'Ahem! Uh, <laughs> cried the same voice. And that, not in the tone of an ordinary clearing of the throat, but in a kind of bellow, which woke up all the echoes in the neighbourhood, and was prolonged to an extent which must have made the unseen bellower quite black in the face. "'I understand it now, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, laying her hand on Kate's. "'Don't be alarmed, my love. It's not directed to you, and is not intended to frighten anybody. Let us give everybody their due, Kate. I am bound to say that.' So saying, Mrs. Nickleby nodded her head, and patted the back of her daughter's hand a great many times, and looked as if she could tell something vastly important if she chose, but had self-denial, thank heaven, and wouldn't do it. 
"'What do you mean, mamma? demanded Kate, in evident surprise. "'Don't be flurried, my dear,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, looking towards the garden wall, "'for you see I am not, and if it would be excusable in anybody to be flurried, it certainly would, under all these circumstances, be excusable in me. But I am not, Kate, n not at all.' "'It uh, seems designed to attract our attention, mamma," said Kate. "'It is designed to attract our attention, my dear. At least—' rejoined Mrs. Nickleby, drawing herself up and patting her daughter's hand more blandly than before, to attract the attention of one of us. <coughs> you needn't be at all uneasy, my dear. Kate looked very much perplexed, and was apparently about to ask for further explanation, when a shouting and scuffling noise, as of an elderly gentleman whooping and kicking up his legs on loose gravel with great violence, was heard to proceed from the same direction as the former sounds. And before they had subsided, a large cucumber was seen to shoot up in the air with the velocity of a sky-rocket, whence it descended, tumbling over and over, until it fell at Mrs. Nickleby's feet. This remarkable appearance was succeeded by another of a precisely similar description. Then a fine vegetable marrow, of unusually large dimensions, was seen to whirl aloft and come toppling down. Then Several cucumbers shot up together, and finally the air was darkened by a shower of onions, turnip radishes, and other small vegetables, which fell rolling and scattering and bumping about in all directions. As Kate rose from her seat in some alarm, and caught her mother's hand to run with her into the house, she felt herself rather retarded than assisted in her intention, and following the direction of Mrs. Nickleby's eyes, was quite terrified by the apparition of an old black velvet cap, which, by slow degrees, as if its wearer were ascending a ladder or pair of steps, rose above the wall dividing their garden from that of the next cottage, which, like their own, was a detached building, and was gradually followed by a very large head and an old face, in which were a pair of most extraordinary grey eyes, very wild, very wide open, and rolling in their sockets with a dull, languishing, leering look most ugly to behold. Uh, mamma, cried Kate, really terrified for the moment, "'why do you stop? Why do you lose an instant? Mamma, pray, come in!' "'Kate, my dear,' returned her mother, still holding back, "'how can you be so foolish? I am ashamed of you. How do you suppose you are ever to get through life if you are such a coward as this?' "'What do you want, sir?' said Mrs. Nickleby, addressing the intruder with a sort of simpering displeasure. "'How dare you look into this garden?' "'Queen of my soul!' replied the stranger, folding his hands together. "'This goblet sip!' "'Nonsense, sir,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Kate, my love, pray be quiet.' "'Won't you sip the goblet?' urged the stranger, with his head imploringly on one side, and his right hand on his breast. "'Oh, do sip the goblet!' "'I shall not consent to do anything of the kind, sir,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Pray be gone.' "'Why is it?' said the old gentleman coming up a step higher, and leaning his elbows on the wall, with its much complacency, as if he were looking out of a window. Why is it that beauty is always obdurate, even when admiration is as honourable and respectful as mine? Here he smiled, kissed his hand, and made several low bows. Is it owing to the bees, who, when the honey season is over, and they are supposed to have been killed with brimstone, in reality fly to Barbary and lull the captive moors to sleep with their drowsy songs? Or is it, he added, dropping his voice almost to a whisper, in consequence of the statue at Charing Cross having been lately seen on the stock exchange at midnight, walking arm in arm with the pump from Aldgate in a riding habit? Mamma, murmured Kate, D -d -d do you hear him? Hush, my dear, replied Mrs. Nickleby, in the same tone of voice. He is very polite, and I think that was a quotation from the poets. "'Pray don't worry me so. You'll pinch my arm, back, black and blue. Go away, sir.' "'Quite away?' said the gentleman, with a languishing look. "'Oh, quite away?' "'Yes,' returned Mrs. Nickleby. "'Certainly. You have no business here. This is private property, sir. You ought to know that.' "'I do know,' said the old gentleman, laying his finger on his nose, with an air of familiarity most reprehensible that this is a sacred and enchanted spot where the most divine charms here he kissed his hand and bowed again waft mellifluousness over the neighbours' gardens and force the fruit and vegetables into premature existence that fact i am acquainted with but will you permit me fairest creature 
to ask you one question in the absence of the planet Venus, who has gone on business to the horse guards and would otherwise, jealous of your superior charms, interpose between us? Kate, observed Mrs. Nickleby, turning to her daughter, it's very awkward, positively. I really don't know what to say to this gentleman. One ought to be civil, you know. Dear Mamma, rejoined Kate, don't say a word to him, but let us run away as fast as we can and shut ourselves up till Nicholas comes home. Mrs. Nickleby looked very grand, not to say contemptuous, at this humiliating proposal, and turning to the old gentleman who had watched them during these whispers with absorbing eagerness, said, "'If you will conduct yourself, sir, like the gentleman I should imagine you to be from your language and, uh, and appearance, quite the counterpart of your grandpapa, Kate, my dear, in his best days, and will put your question to me in plain words, I will answer it.' If Mrs. Nickleby's excellent papa had borne in his best days a resemblance to the neighbour now looking over the wall, he must have been, to say the least, a very queer-looking old gentleman in his prime. Perhaps Kate thought so, for she ventured to glance at his living portrait with some attention, as he took off his black velvet cap, and exhibiting a perfectly bald head, made a long series of bows, each accompanied with a fresh kiss of the hand. After exhausting himself to all appearance with this fatiguing performance, he covered his head once more, pulled the cap very carefully over the tips of his ears, and resuming his former attitude, said, "'The question is—' Here he broke off to look round in every direction, and satisfy himself beyond all doubt that there were no listeners near. Assured that there were not, he tapped his nose several times, accompanying the action with a cunning look, as though congratulating himself on his caution and stretching out his neck, said in a loud whisper, "'Are you a princess?' "'You are mocking me, sir,' replied Mrs. Nickleby, making a feint of retreating towards the house. "'No, but are you?' said the old gentleman. "'You know I am not, sir,' replied Mrs. Nickleby. "'Then are you any relation to the Archbishop of Canterbury?' inquired the old gentleman with great anxiety. "'Or to the Pope of Rome, or, or the Speaker of the House of Commons?' "'Forgive me if I am wrong, but I was told you were niece to the Commissioners of Paving, and daughter-in-law to the Lord Mayor and Court of Common Council, which would account for your relationship to all three. "'Whoever has spread such reports, sir,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, with some warmth, "'has taken great liberties with my name, and one which I am sure my son Nicholas, if he was aware of it, would not allow for an instant.' "'The idea,' said Mrs. Nickleby, drawing herself up, "'niece to the Commissioners of Paving.' "'Pray, mamma, come away!' whispered Kate. "'Pray, mamma, nonsense, Kate!' said Mrs. Nickleby angrily. "'But that's just the way. "'If they had said I was niece to a piping bullfinch, what would you care?' "'But I have no sympathy,' whimpered Mrs. Nickleby. "'I don't expect it. That's one thing.' "'Tears!' cried the old gentleman, with such an energetic jump that he fell down two or three steps and grated his chin against the wall. "'Catch the crystal globules! Catch them! Bottle them up! Cork em tight! Put sealing wax on the top! Seal them with a cupid! Label them best quality! And stir em away in the fourteen bin with a bar of iron on the top to keep the thunder off!' Issuing these commands, as if there were a dozen attendants all actively engaged in their execution, he turned his velvet cap inside out, put it on with great dignity so as to obscure his right eye and three-fourths of his nose, and sticking his arms akimbo, looked very fiercely at a sparrow hard by till the bird flew away, when he put his cap in his pocket with an air of great satisfaction, and addressed himself with respectful demeanour to Mrs. Nickleby. "'Beautiful madam,' such were his words, "'if I have made a mistake with regard to your family or connections, I humbly beseech you to pardon me. If I suppose you to be related to foreign powers or native boards, it is because you have a manner, a carriage, a dignity, which you will excuse my saying that none but yourself, with the single exception perhaps of the tragic muse when playing extemporaneously on the barrel organ before the East India Company, can parallel. I am not a youth, ma'am, as you see, and although beings like you can never grow old, I venture to presume that we are fitted for each other. Really, Kate, my love, said Mrs. Nickleby faintly, and looking another way. "'I have estates, ma'am,' said the old gentleman, 
flourishing his right hand negligently, as if he made very light of such matters, and speaking very fast. "'Jules, lighthouses, fish-ponds, a whalery of my own in the North Sea, and several oyster-beds of great profit in the Pacific Ocean. If you will have the kindness to step down to the Royal Exchange and to take the cocked hat off the stoutest beetle's head, you will find my card in the lining of the crown wrapped up in a piece of blue paper. My walking-stick is also to be seen on application to the chapter of the House of Commons, who is strictly forbidden to take any money for showing it. I have enemies about me, ma'am, he looked towards his house and spoke very low, who attack me on all occasions and wish to secure my property. If you bless me with your hand and heart, you can apply to the Lord Chancellor, or call out the military if necessary. Sending my toothpick to the Commander-in-Chief will be sufficient, and so clear the house of them before the ceremony is performed. After that, love, bliss, and rapture, rapture, love, and bliss, be mine, be mine. Repeating these last words with great rapture and enthusiasm, the old gentleman put on his black velvet cap again, and looking up to the sky in a hasty manner, said something that was not quite intelligible concerning a balloon he expected, and which was rather after its time. "'Be mine, be mine!' repeated the old gentleman. Uh, "'Kate, my dear,' said Mrs. Nickleby, "'I have hardly the power to speak. But it is necessary for the happiness of all parties that this matter should be set at rest for ever.' "'Surely there is no necessity for you to say one word, mamma," reasoned Kate. "'You allow me, my dear, if you please, to judge for myself,' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'Be mine, be mine!' cried the old gentleman. "'It can scarcely be expected, sir,' said Mrs. Nickleby, fixing her eyes modestly on the ground, "'that I should tell a stranger whether I feel flattered and obliged by such proposals or not. "'They certainly are made under very singular circumstances. "'Still, at the same time, as far as it goes, and to a certain extent, of course,' "'Mrs. Nickleby's customary qualification,' They must be gratifying and agreeable to one's feelings. "'Be mine, be mine!' cried the old gentleman. "'Gog and Magog, Gog and Magog, be mine, be mine!' "'It will be sufficient for me to say, sir,' resumed Mrs. Nickleby, with perfect seriousness, "'and I am sure you'll see the propriety of taking an answer and going away, "'that I have made up my mind to remain a widow and to devote myself to my children.' You may not suppose I am the mother of two children. Indeed, many people have doubted it, and said that nothing on earth could ever make them believe it possible. But it is the case, and they are both grown up. We shall be very glad to have you for a neighbour, very glad, uh, delighted, I am sure, but in any other character it is quite impossible, quite. As to my being young enough to marry again, that perhaps may be so, or it may not be. But I couldn't think it for an instant, not on any account whatever. I said I never would, and I never will. It's a very painful thing to have to reject proposals, and I would much rather that none were made. At the same time, this is the answer that I determined long ago to make, and this is the answer I shall always give. These observations were partly addressed to the old lady, partly to Kate, and partly delivered in soliloquy. Towards their conclusion the suitor evinced a very irreverent degree of inattention and Mrs. Nickleby had scarcely finished speaking when, to the great terror both of that lady and her daughter, he suddenly flung off his coat, and springing on the top of the wall, threw himself into an attitude which displayed his small clothes and grey worsteds to the fullest advantage, and concluded by standing on one leg and repeating his favourite bellow with increased vehemence. While he was still dwelling on the last note and embellishing it with a prolonged flourish, a dirty ham was observed to glide stealthily and swiftly along the top of the wall, as if in pursuit of a fly, and then to clasp, with the utmost dexterity, one of the old gentleman's ankles. This done, the companion hand appeared and clasped the other ankle. Thus encumbered, the old gentleman lifted his legs awkwardly once or twice, as if they were very clumsy and imperfect pieces of machinery, and then, looking down at his own side of the wall, burst into a loud laugh. "'It's you, is it?' said the old gentleman. "'Yes, it's me,' replied a gruff voice. "'How's the Emperor of Tartary?' said the old gentleman. "'Oh, he's much the same as usual,' was the reply. "'No better and no worse.' "'The young Prince of China,' said the old gentleman, with much interest, "'is he reconciled to his father-in-law, the great potato-salesman?' "'No,' answered the gruff voice. 
and he says he never will be, that's more. "'If that's the case,' observed the old gentleman, "'perhaps I'd better come down.' "'Well,' said the man on the other side, "'I think you had, perhaps.' One of the hands being then cautiously unclasped, the old gentleman dropped into a sitting posture, and was looking round to smile and bow to Mrs. Nickleby, when he disappeared with some precipitation, as if his legs had been pulled from below. Very much relieved by his disappearance, Kate was turning to speak to her mamma, when the dirty hands again became visible, and were immediately followed by the figure of a coarse, squat man, who ascended by the steps which had been recently occupied by their singular neighbour. "'Beg your pardon, ladies,' said this newcomer, grinning and touching his hat. "'Has he been making love to either of you?' "'Yes,' said Kate. "'Ah,' rejoined the man, taking his handkerchief out of his hat and wiping his face. "'He always will, you know. Nothing will prevent his making love.' "'I need not ask you if he is out of his mind, poor creature,' said Kate. "'Why, no,' replied the man, looking into his hat, throwing his handkerchief in at one dab and putting it on again. "'That's pretty plain, that is.' "'Has he been long so?' said Kate. "'A long while.' "'And is there no hope for him?' said Kate, compassionately. "'Not a bit. Don't deserve to be,' replied the keeper. "'He's a deal pleasanter without his senses than with them. He was the cruelest, wickedest, out-and-outerest old flint that ever drawed breath.' "'Indeed,' said Kate. "'By George!' replied the keeper, shaking his head so emphatically that he was obliged to frown to keep his hat on. "'I never come across such a vagabond, and my mate says the same. Broke his poor wife's heart, turned his daughter out of doors, drove his sons into the streets. It was a blessing he went mad at last, through evil tempers and covetousness and selfishness and guzzling and drinking, or he'd have drove many others so. Hope for him and old Rip!' There isn't too much hope going, but I'll bet a crown that what there is saved for more deserving chaps than him, anyhow. With which confession of his face, the deep-keeper shook his head again, as much as to say that nothing short of this would do, if things were to go on at all. And, touching his hat sulkily, not that he was in an ill humour, but that his subject ruffled him, descended the ladder and took it away. During this conversation Mrs. Nickleby had regarded the man with a severe and steadfast look. She now heaved a profound sigh, and, pursing up her lips, shook her head in a slow and doubtful manner. "'Poor creature,' said Kate. "'Ah, poor indeed,' rejoined Mrs. Nickleby. "'It's shameful that such things should be allowed. Shameful!' "'How can they be helped, mamma? said Kate mournfully. "'The infirmities of nature—' "'Nature?' said Mrs. Nickleby. "'What? Do you suppose this poor gentleman is out of his mind?' "'Can anybody who see him entertain any other opinion, mamma? "'Why, then, I just tell you this, Kate,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, "'that he is nothing of the kind, and I am surprised you can be so imposed upon. "'It's some plot of these people to possess themselves of his property. "'Didn't he say so himself? "'He may be a little odd and flighty, perhaps. "'Many of us are that. "'But downright mad?' and express himself as he does, respectfully and in quite poetical language, and making offers with so much thought and care and prudence, not as if he ran into the streets and went down upon his knees to the first chit of a girl he met, as a madman would. No, no, Kate, there's a great deal too much method in his madness. Depend upon that, my dear. End of chapter 41 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 42 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Pinkham. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 42. Illustrative of the convivial sentiment that the best of friends must sometimes part. The pavement of Snow Hill had been baking and frying all day in the heat, and the twain Saracens' heads guarding the entrance to the hostelry of whose name and sign they are the duplicate presentments, looked, or seemed in the eyes of jaded and footsore passers-by to look, more vicious than usual, after blistering and scorching in the sun, when in one of the inn's smallest sitting-rooms, through whose open window there rose in a palpable steam wholesome exhalations from reeking coach-horses, the usual furniture of a tea-table was displayed in neat and inviting order. 
flanked by large joints of roast and boiled, a tongue, a pigeon pie, a cold fowl, a tankard of ale, and other little matters of the like kind, which, in degenerate towns and cities, are generally understood to belong more particularly to solid lunches, stagecoach dinners, or unusually substantial breakfasts. Mr. John Brodie, with his hands in his pockets, hovered restlessly about these delicacies, stopping occasionally to whisk the flies out of the sugar basin with his wife's pocket handkerchief, or to dip a teaspoon in the milk pot and carry it to his mouth, or to cut off a little knob of crust and a little corner of meat and swallow them at two gulps like a couple of pills. After every one of these flirtations with the eatables, he pulled out his watch and declared with an earnestness quite pathetic that he couldn't undertake to hold out two minutes longer. Tilly, said John to his lady, who was reclining half awake and half asleep upon a sofa. Well, John. Well, John, retorted her husband impatiently. Dost thou feel hungry, lass? Not very, said Mrs. Brodie. Not very, repeated John, raising his eyes to the ceiling. Hear her say not very, and us dining at three, and lunching off pestry that aggravates a man stead of pacifying him. Not very. Here's a gentleman for you, sir, said the waiter, looking in. A what for me? cried John, as though he thought it must be a letter or a parcel. A gentleman, sir. Stars and garters, chap, said John. What dost thou come and say that for? In Witten. Are you at home, sir? At home, cried John. I wish I were. I'd had taid two hour ago. Why, I told the other chap to look sharp outside door and tell him directly he come that we were faint with hunger. In Witten. Aha! The hand, Mr. Nickleby. This is nigh to be the proudest day o' my life, sir. Who be all wit ye? Ding! But I'm glad o' this! Quite forgetting even his hunger in the heartiness of his salutation, John Brodie shook Nicholas by the hand again and again, slapping his palm with great violence between each shake, to add warmth to the reception. Ah, there she be, said John, observing the look which Nicholas directed towards his wife. There she be. We shan't quarrel about her no, eh? It caught when I think o' that. But thou wants so much to eat. Fall to, man, fall to. And for what we are about to receive... No doubt the grace was properly finished, but nothing more was heard, for John had already begun to play such a knife and fork that his speech was, for the time, gone. "'I shall take the usual license, Mr. Brodie,' said Nicholas as he placed a chair for the bride. "'Tack whatever thou likest,' said John. "'And when ask gain, car for more.' Without stopping to explain, Nicholas kissed the blushing Mrs. Brodie and handed her to her seat. "'I say,' said John, rather astounded for the moment, Mac thee self quite at home, will he? You may depend upon that, replied Nicholas, on one condition. And what may that be? asked John. That you make me a godfather the very first time you have occasion for one. Eh, hey, do you hear that? cried John, laying down his knife and fork. A godfather! Ha! <laughs> Tilly! Here, Tillin! A godfather! Didn't say a word more. You'll never be at that. Occasion for an. A godfather! <laughs> never was man so tickled with a respectable old joke as John Brodie was with this. He chuckled, roared, half suffocated himself by laughing large pieces of beef into his windpipe, roared again, persisted in eating at the same time, got red in the face and black in the forehead, coughed, cried, got better, went off again laughing inwardly, got worse, choked, had his back thumped, stamped about, frightened his wife, and at last recovered in a state of the last exhaustion and with the water streaming from his eyes, but still faintly ejaculating, A godfather! A godfather, Tilly! in a tone bespeaking an exquisite relish of the sally which no suffering could diminish. You remember the night of our first tea-drinking? said Nicholas. Shall I e'er forget it, man? replied John Brodie. He was a desperate fellow that night, though, was he not, Mrs. Brodie? said Nicholas. Quite a monster. If you had only heard him as we were going home, Mr. Nickleby, you'd have said so indeed, returned the bride. I never was so frightened in all my life. Come, come, 
said john with a broad grin thou knowst better than that tilly so i was replied mrs brodie i almost made up my mind never to speak to you again i most said john with a broader grin than the last i most made up her mind and she were coaxin and coaxin and wheedlin and wheedlin out a blessed way what didst thou let yon chap make up to thee for says i i didn't john says she a squeedgin my arm you didn't says i nor says she a squeedgin of me again lord john interposed his wife colouring very much how can you talk such nonsense as if i should have dreamt of such a thing i did not know whether thou ever dreamt of it though i think that's like a nerf mind retorted john but thou didst it you're a fecal changeable weathercock lass says i not fecal john says she yes says i fecal don't fecal do not tell me thou bent after yon chap at school mesters says i him says she quite screechin ah him says i why john says she and she come a deal closer and squeedged a deal harder than she dare afore dost thou think it's natural no that having such a proper man as thou to keep company wit i'd ever take up with such a little scanty whippersnapper as yon she says ha <laughs> ha she said whippersnapper ecod i says after that name the day and let's have a tour <laughs> nicholas laughed very heartily at this story both on account of its telling against himself and his being desirous to spare the blushes of mrs brodie whose protestations were drowned in peals of laughter from her husband his good nature soon put her at ease and although she still denied the charge she laughed so heartily at it that nicholas had the satisfaction of feeling assured that in all essential respects it was strictly true this is the second time said nicholas that we have ever taken a meal together and only third i have ever seen you and yet it really seems to me as if i were among old friends well observed the yorkshireman so i say and i am sure i do added his young wife i have the best reason to be impressed with the feeling mind said nicholas for if it had not been for your kindness of heart my good friend when i had no right or reason to expect it i know not what might have become of me or what plight i should have been in by this time talk about summer else replied john gruffly and do not bother it must be a new song to the same tune then said nicholas smiling i told you in my letter that i deeply felt and admired your sympathy with that poor lad whom you released at the risk of involving yourself in trouble and difficulty but i can never tell you how grateful he and i and others whom you don't know are to you for taking pity on him ecod rejoined john Brodie, drawing up his chair and i can never tell you who grateful some folks that we do know would be likewise if they knowed i had taken pity on him ah exclaimed mrs Brodie, what a state i was in that night were they at all disposed to give you credit for assisting in the escape inquired nicholas of john Brodie. not a bit replied the yorkshireman extending his mouth from ear to ear there i lay snug in schoolmaster's bed long after it was dark and nobody come nigh the place well thinks i he's got a pretty good start and if he bain't home by noo he never will be so you may come as quick as you like and find us ready that is you know schoolmaster might come i understand said nicholas presently resumed john he did come i heard the door shut downstairs and him a warkin open the dark slow and steady i says to meself take your time sir no hurry he comes to the door turns the key turns the key when there warn't nothing to hold the lock and calls out hallo there yes thinks i you may do that again and not waken anybody sir hallo there he says and then he stops thou'd better not aggravate me says schoolmaster after a little time i'll break every bone in your body smite he says after another little time then all of a sudden he sings out for a light and when it comes it cod such a hurly burly what's the matter says i is gain says he start mad with vengeance have you ear not e says i 
I heard street door shut no time at all ago. I heard a person run down there, pointing to other way, eh? Help, he cries. I'll help you, says I, and off we set the wrong way. Ho, ho, ho. Did you go far? asked Nicholas. Far, replied John. I run him clean off his legs in quarter of an hour. To see old schoolmaster wet out his head, skimming along up to his knees in mud and water, tumbling over fences and rolling into ditches, and bawling out like mad with his one eye looking sharp out for the lad, and his coat tails flying out behind, and him spattered wet mud all o'er, face and all. I thought I should ha' dropped doon and killed myself with laughing. John laughed so heartily at the mere recollection that he communicated the contagion to both his hearers, and all three burst into peals of laughter, which were renewed again and again, until they could laugh no longer. "'He is a bad un,' said John, wiping his eyes. "'A very bad un, is schoolmaster.' "'I can't bear the sight of him, John,' said his wife. "'Come,' retorted John. "'That's tidy in you, that is. If it weren't along o' you, we shouldn't know not a boot un. Thou knowed un first, Tilly, didn't thou?' "'I couldn't help knowing Fanny Squeers, John,' returned his wife. "'She was an old playmate of mine, you know.' "'Well,' replied John, "'daren't I say so, lass? "'It's best to be neighbourly and to keep up old acquaintance, like. "'And what I say is, daren't quarrel if he can help it. "'Do not think so, Mr. Nickleby?' "'Certainly,' returned Nicholas. "'And you acted upon that principle when I met you on horseback on the road, "'after our memorable evening.' surely said john what well, i say i stick by and that's a fine thing to do and manly too said nicholas though it's not exactly what we understand by coming yorkshire over us in london miss squeers is stopping with you you said in your note yes replied john tilly's bridesmaid and a queer bridesmaid she be too she won't be a bride in a hurry i reckon for shame john said Mrs. Brodie, with an acute perception of the joke, though, being a bride herself. "'The groom'll be a blessed man,' said John, his eyes twinkling at the idea. "'He'll be in luck, he will.' "'You see, Mr. Nickleby,' said his wife, "'that it was in consequence of her being here that John wrote to you and fixed tonight, because we thought that it wouldn't be pleasant for you to meet after what has passed.' "'Unquestionably. You were quite right in that,' said Nicholas, interrupting. "'Especially—' observed Mrs. Brodie, looking very sly, after what we know about past and gone love matters. We know indeed, said Nicholas, shaking his head. You behaved rather wickedly there, I suspect. Of course she did, said John Brodie, passing his huge forefinger through one of his wife's pretty ringlets and looking very proud of her. She were always as skittish and full of tricks as a— Well, as a what? said his wife. As a woman, returned John. Ding, but I do not know what else that comes near it. You were speaking about Miss Squeers, said Nicholas, with the view of stopping some slight connubialities which had begun to pass between Mr. and Mrs. Brodie, and which rendered the position of a third party in some degree embarrassing, as occasioning him to feel rather in the way than otherwise. Oh, yes, rejoined Mrs. Brodie. John had done. John fixed tonight because she had settled that she would go and drink tea with her father and to make quite sure of there being nothing amiss, and of your being quite alone with us, he settled to go out there and fetch her home. That was a very good arrangement, said Nicholas, though I am sorry to be the occasion of so much trouble. Not the least in the world, returned Mrs. Brodie. For we have looked forward to see you, John and I have, with the greatest possible pleasure. Do you know, Mr. Nickleby, said Mrs. Brodie, with her archest smile, that I really think Fanny Squeers was very fond of you? "'I am very much obliged to her,' said Nicholas. "'But upon my word I never aspired to making any impression upon her virgin heart.' "'How you talk!' tittered Mrs. Brodie. "'No, but do you know that really? "'Seriously now, and without any joking, "'I was given to understand by Fanny herself that you had made an offer to her, "'and that you two were going to be engaged quite solemn and regular.' "'Was you, ma'am? Was you?' cried a shrill female voice. "'Was you given to understand that I, I, was going to be engaged to an assassinating thief that shed the gore of my paw? 
do you do you think ma'am that i was very fond of such dirt beneath my feet as i couldn't condescend to touch with kitchen tongs without blacking and crocking myself by the contract do you ma'am do you oh base and degrading tilda with these reproaches miss squeers flung the door wide open and disclosed to the eyes of the astonished brodies and nicholas not only her own symmetrical form arrayed in the chaste white garments before described a little dirtier but the form of her brother and father the pair of wackfords this is the hend is it continued miss squeers who being excited aspirated her h's strongly this is the hend is it of all my forbearance and friendship for that double-faced thing that viper that that mermaid miss squeers hesitated a long time for this last epithet and brought it out triumphantly at last as if it quite clinched the business this is the hend is it of all my bearing with her deceitfulness her lowness her falseness her laying herself out to catch the admiration of vulgar minds in a way which made me blush for my for my gender suggested mr squeers regarding the spectators with a malevolent eye literally a malevolent eye yes said miss squeers but i think my stars and my mars of the same here here remarked mr squeers and i wish she was here to have a scratch at this company this is the hend is it said miss squeers tossing her head and looking contemptuously at the floor of my taking notice of that rubbishing creature and demeaning myself to patronize her oh come rejoined mrs Brodie, disregarding all the endeavours of her spouse to restrain her and forcing herself into a front row don't talk such nonsense as that have i not patronized you ma'am demanded miss squeers no returned mrs Brodie. i will not look for blushes in such a quarter said miss squeers haughtily for that countenance is a stranger to everything but ignominiousness and red-faced boldness i say interposed john Brodie, nettled by these accumulated attacks on his wife draw it mild draw it mild you mr Brodie," said miss squeers taking him up very quickly i pity i have no feeling for you sir but one of unliquidated pity oh said john no said miss squeers looking sideways at her parent although i am a queer bridesmaid and shan't be a bride in a hurry and although my husband will be in luck i entertain no sentiments towards you sir but sentiments of pity here miss squeers looked sideways at her father again who looked sideways at her as much as to say there you had him i know what you've got to go through said miss squeers shaking her curls violently i know what life is before you and if you was my bitterest and deadliest enemy i could wish you nothing worse couldn't you wish to be married to him yourself if that was the case inquired mrs Brodie with great suavity of manner oh ma'am how witty you are retorted miss squeers with a low curtsey almost as witty ma'am as you are clever how very clever it was in you ma'am to choose a time when i had gone to tea with my pa and was sure not to come back without being fetched what a pity you never thought that other people might be as clever as yourself and spoil your plans you won't vex me child with such airs as these said the late miss price assuming the matron don't misses me ma'am if you please returned miss squeers sharply i'll not bear it is this the hend dang it all cried john Brodie impatiently say thee say out fanny and make sure it's the end and do not ask nobody whether it is or not thanking you for your advice which was not required mr Brodie," returned miss squeers with laborious politeness have the goodness not to presume to meddle with my christian name even my pity shall never make me forget what's due to myself mr Brodie. tilda said miss squeers with such a sudden accession of violence that john started in his boots i throw you off for ever miss i abandon you i renounce you i wouldn't cried miss squeers in a solemn voice have a child named tilda not to save it from its grave as for the matter o that observed john 
It'll be time enough to think about naming of it when it comes. John, interposed his wife, don't tease her. Oh, tease indeed, cried Miss Squeers, bridling up. Tease indeed, <laughs> tease too. No, don't tease her. Consider her feelings, pray. If it's fated that listeners are never to hear any good of themselves, said Miss Brodie, I can't help it, and I am very sorry for it. But I will say, Fanny, that times out of number I have spoken so kindly of you behind your back that even you could have found no fault with what I said. Oh, I dare say not, ma'am, cried Miss Squeers with another curtsey. Best thanks to you for your goodness and begging and praying you not to be hard upon me another time. I don't know, resumed Mrs. Brodie, that I have said anything very bad of you even now. At all events, what I did say was quite true. But if I have, I am very sorry for it, and I beg your pardon. You have said much worse of me scores of times, Fanny. But I have never borne any malice to you, and I hope you'll not bear any to me. Miss Squeers made no more direct reply than surveying her former friend from top to toe, and elevating her nose in the air with ineffable disdain. But some indistinct allusions to a puss, and a minx, and a contemptible creature, escaped her. And this, together with a severe biting of the lips, great difficulty in swallowing, and very frequent comings and goings of breath, seemed to imply that feelings were swelling in Miss Squeers's bosom too great for utterance. While the foregoing conversation was proceeding, Master Wackford, finding himself unnoticed, and feeling his preponderating inclination strong upon him, had by little and little sidled up to the table, and attacked the food with such slight skirmishing as drawing his fingers round and round the inside of the plates, and afterwards sucking them with infinite relish, picking the bread, and dragging the pieces over the surface of the butter, pocketing lumps of sugar, pretending all the time to be absorbed in thought, and so forth. Finding that no interference was attempted with these small liberties, he gradually mounted to greater, and after helping himself to a moderately good cold collation, was by this time deep in the pie. Nothing of this had been unobserved by Mr. Squeers, who, so long as the attention of the company was fixed upon other objects, hugged himself to think that his son and heir should be fattening at the enemy's expense. But there being now an appearance of a temporary calm, in which the proceedings of little Wackford could scarcely fail to be observed, he feigned to be aware of the circumstance for the first time, and inflicted upon the face of that young gentleman a slap that made the very teacups ring. Eating! cried Mr. Squeers. Of what his father's enemies has left, it's fit to go and poison you, you unnatural boy. It won't hurt him, said John, apparently very much relieved by the prospect of having a man in the quarrel. Let him eat. I wish the whole school was here. I'd give him summat to stay their unfortunate stomachs wit, if I spent the last penny I had. Squeers scowled at him with the worst and most malicious expression of which his face was capable. It was a face of remarkable capability, too, in that way, and shook his fist stealthily. "'Come, come, schoolmaster,' said John. "'Do not make a fool of thyself, for if I was to shake mine only once, thou'd fud down wit the wind o' it.' "'It was you, was it?' returned Squeers. "'That helped off my runaway boy. It was you, was it?' "'Me,' returned John in a loud tone. "'Yes,' It war me, coom. What o that? It war me. No, then. You hear him say he did it, my child, said Squeers, appealing to his daughter. You hear him say he did it? Did it? cried John. I'll tell him more. Hear this, too. If thou'd got another runaway boy, I'd do it again. If thou'd got twenty runaway boys, I'd do it twenty times o'er, and twenty more to that. And I tell thee more said john no my blood is up that thou art an old rascal and that is weel for thou thou beest an old un or i'd have pounded thee to flour when thou told an honest man who thou licked that poor chap into courch an honest man cried squeers with a sneer ah an honest man replied john honest in aught but ever puttin legs on their same table with such as thou scandal said squeers exultingly Two witnesses to it. Wackford knows the nature of an oath he does. We shall have you there, sir. Rascal, eh? 
Mr. Squeers took out his pocket-book and made a note of it. "'Very good. I should say that was worth full twenty pound at the next assizes, without the honesty, sir.' "'Sizes,' cried John. "'Thou'd better not talk to me of sizes. Yorkshire schools have been shown up at sizes afore new, man, and it's a ticklish subject to revive, I can tell ye.' Mr. Squeers shook his head in a threatening manner, looking very white with passion, and taking his daughter's arm and dragging little Wackford by the hand, retreated towards the door. "'As for you,' said Squeers, turning round and addressing Nicholas, who, as he had caused him to smart pretty soundly on a former occasion, purposely abstained from taking any part in the discussion. "'See if I ain't down upon you before long. You'll go a-kidnapping of boys, will you?' Take care their fathers don't turn up. Mark that. Take care their fathers don't turn up, and send them back to me to do as I like with in spite of you. I am not afraid of that, replied Nicholas, shrugging his shoulders contemptuously and turning away. Ain't you? retorted Squeers with a diabolical look. Now then, come along. I leave such society with my pa for ever said Miss Squeers, looking contemptuously and loftily round. "'I am defiled by breathing the air with such creatures. Poor Mr. Brodie! <laughs> I do pity him, that I do. He's so deluded. <laughs> Artful and designing Tilda!' With this sudden relapse into the sternest and most majestic wrath, Miss Squeers swept from the room, and having sustained her dignity until the last possible moment, was heard to sob and scream and struggle in the passage. John Brodie remained standing behind the table, looking from his wife to Nicholas, and back again, with his mouth wide open, until his hand accidentally fell upon the tankard of ale when he took it up, and having obscured his features therewith for some time, drew a long breath, handed it over to Nicholas, and rang the bell. "'Here, waiter,' said John briskly. "'Look alive here.' Tack these things away, and let's have some at broil for supper. Very comfortable and plenty o' it. At ten o'clock, bring some brandy and some water and a pair of slippers, the largest pair in the house, and be quick about it. Dash my wig, said John, rubbing his hands. There's no gang o' to neat, no, to fetch anybody home, and e cod, we'll begin to spend the evening in earnest. End of chapter 42 Recording by Timothy Pinkham, Timothy P I N K H A M dot com, La Palma, California, May two thousand nine. Chapter forty three of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org. Recording by Simon Evers. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 43. Officiates as a kind of gentleman usher in bringing various people together. The storm had long given place to a calm, the most profound, and the evening was pretty far advanced. Indeed, supper was over, and the process of digestion proceeding as favourably as, under the influence of complete tranquillity, cheerful conversation, and a moderate allowance of brandy and water, most wise men, conversant with the anatomy and functions of the human frame, will consider that it ought to have proceeded. When the three friends, or as one might say, both in a civil and religious sense, and with proper deference and regard to the holy state of matrimony, the two friends, Mr. and Mrs. Browdie counting as no more than one, were startled by the noise of loud and angry threatenings below stairs, which presently attained so high a pitch, and were conveyed besides in language so tiring, sanguinary, and ferocious, that it could hardly have been surpassed, if there had actually been a Saracen's head then present in the establishment, supported on the shoulders and surmounting the trunk of a real, live, furious, and most unappeasable Saracen. This turmoil, instead of quickly subsiding after the first outburst, as turmoils not unfrequently do, whether in taverns, legislative assemblies, or elsewhere, into a mere grumbling and growling squabble, increased every moment, and although the whole din appeared to be raised by but one pair of lungs, yet that one pair was of so powerful a quality, and repeated such words as, "'Scoundrel! Rascal! Insolent puppy!' 
and a variety of expletives no less flattering to the party addressed, with such great relish and strength of tone, that a dozen voices raised in concert under any ordinary circumstances would have made far less uproar and created much smaller consternation. "'Why, what's the matter?' said Nicholas, moving hastily towards the door. John Browdie was striding in the same direction, when Mrs. Browdie turned pale, and leaning back in her chair requested him with a faint voice to take notice that if he ran into any danger it was her intention to fall into hysterics immediately, and that the consequences might be more serious than he thought for. John looked concerted by this intelligence, though there was a lurking grin on his face at the same time. But, being quite unable to keep out of the fray, he compromised the matter by tucking his wife's arm under his own, and thus accompanied, followed Nicholas downstairs with all speed. The passage outside the coffee-room door was the scene of disturbance, and here were congregated the coffee-room customers and waiters, together with two or three coachmen and helpers from the yard. These had hastily assembled round a young man who from his appearance might have been a year or two older than Nicholas, and who, besides having given utterance to the defiances just now described, seemed to have proceeded to even greater lengths in his indignation, inasmuch as his feet had no other covering than a pair of stockings, while a couple of slippers lay at no great distance from the head of a prostrate figure in an opposite corner, who bore the appearance of having been shot into his present retreat by means of a kick, and complimented by having the slippers flung about his ears afterwards. The coffee-room customers, and the waiters, and the coachman, and the helpers, not to mention a barmaid who was looking on from behind an open sash window, seemed at that moment, if a spectator might judge from their winks, nods, and muttered exclamations, strongly disposed to take part against the young gentleman in the stockings. Observing this, and that the young gentleman was nearly of his own age, and had in nothing the appearance of an habitual brawler, Nicholas, impelled by such feelings as will influence young men sometimes, felt a very strong disposition to side with the weaker party, and so thrust himself at once into the centre of the group, and in a more emphatic tone, perhaps, than circumstances might seem to warrant, demanded what all that noise was about. "'Hello,' said one of the men from the yard. "'This is somebody in disguise, this is.' "'Room for the oldest son of the Emperor of Russia, gentlemen!' cried another voice. Disregarding these sallies, which were uncommonly well received, as sallies at the expense of the bestest young persons in a crowd usually are, Nicholas glanced carelessly round, and, addressing the young gentleman, who had by this time picked up his slippers and thrust his feet into them, repeated his inquiries with a courteous air. "'A mere nothing,' he replied. At this a murmur was raised by the lookers-on, and some of the boldest cried, "'Oh, indeed, wasn't it, though? Nothing, eh? He called that nothing, did he? Lucky for him if he found it nothing.' These, and many other expressions of ironical disapprobation having been exhausted, two or three of the out-of-door fellows began to hustle Nicholas and the young gentleman who had made the noise, stumbling against them by accident, and treading on their toes, and so forth. But, this being a round game, and one not necessarily limited to three or four players, was open to John Browdie too, who, bursting into the little crowd, to the great terror of his wife, and falling about in all directions, now to the right, now to the left, now forwards, now backwards, and accidentally driving his elbow through the hat of that tallest helper who had been particularly active, speedily caused the odds to wear a very different appearance. While more than one stout fellow limped away to a respectful distance, anathematising with tears in his eyes the heavy tread and ponderous feet of the burly Yorkshireman. "'Let me see him do it again,' said he, who had been kicked into the corner, rising as he spoke, apparently more from the fear of John Browdie's inadvertently treading upon him than from any desire to place himself on equal terms with his late adversary. "'Let me see him do it again, that's all.' "'Let me hear you make those remarks again.' said the young man, and I'll knock that head of yours in among the wine-glasses behind you there. Here, a waiter, who had been rubbing his hands in excessive enjoyment of the scene, so long as only the breaking of heads was in question, adjured the spectators with great earnestness to fetch the police, declaring that otherwise murder would surely be done, and that he was responsible for all the glass and china on the premises. "'No one need trouble himself to stir,' said the young gentleman. "'I am going to remain in the house all night, and shall be found here in the morning, if there is any assault to answer for.' "'What did you strike him for?' asked one of the bystanders. Ah, what did you strike him for?' demanded the others. The unpopular gentleman looked coolly round, and, addressing himself to Nicholas, said, 
"'You inquired just now what was the matter here. "'The matter is simply this. "'Yonder person, who was drinking with a friend in the coffee-room "'when I took my seat there for half an hour before going to bed, "'for I have just come off a journey, "'and preferred stopping here to-night to going home at this hour "'when I was not expected until to-morrow, "'chose to express himself in very disrespectful "'and insolently familiar terms of a young lady, "'whom I recognise from his description and other circumstances, "'and whom I have the honour to know.' As he spoke loud enough to be overheard by the other guests who were present, I informed him most civilly that he was mistaken in his conjectures, which were of an inoffensive nature, and requested him to forbear. He did so for a little time, but as he chose to renew his conversation when leaving the room in a more offensive strain than before, I could not refrain from making after him and facilitating his departure by a kick, which reduced him to the posture in which you saw him just now. "'I am the best judge of my own affairs, I take it,' said the young man, who had certainly not quite recovered from his recent heat. "'If anybody here thinks proper to make this quarrel his own, I have not the smallest earthly objection, I do assure him.' Of all possible courses of proceeding under the circumstances detailed, there was certainly not one which, in his then state of mind, could have appeared more laudable to Nicholas than this. There were not many subjects of dispute which at that moment could have come home to his own breast more powerfully, for, having the unknown uppermost in his thoughts, it naturally occurred to him that he would have done just the same, if any audacious gossiper durst have presumed in his hearing to speak lightly of her. Influenced by these considerations, he espoused the young gentleman's quarrel with great warmth, protesting that he had done quite right, and that he respected him for it, which John Browdie, albeit not quite clear as to the merits, immediately protested too, with not inferior vehemence. "'Let him take care, that's all,' said the defeated party, who has been rubbed down by a waiter after his recent fall on the dusty boards. "'He don't knock me about for nothing, I can tell him that. A pretty state of things if a man isn't to admire a handsome girl without being beat to pieces for it.' This reflection appeared to have great weight with the young lady in the bar, who, adjusting her cap as she spoke and glancing at the mirror, declared that it would be a very pretty state of things indeed, and that if people were to be punished for actions so innocent and natural as that, there would be more people to be knocked down than there would be people to knock them down and that she wondered what the gentleman meant by it, that she did. "'My dear girl,' said the young gentleman, in a low voice, advancing towards the sash-window. "'Nonsense, sir,' replied the young lady sharply, smiling, though she turned aside and biting her lip, whereat Mr. Mrs. Browdie, who was still standing on the stairs, glanced at her with disdain, and called to her husband to come away. "'No, but listen to me,' said the young man. If admiration of a pretty face were criminal, I should be the most hopeless person alive, for I cannot resist one. It has a most extraordinary effect upon me, checks and controls me in the most furious and obstinate mood. You see what an effect yours has had upon me already. Oh, that's very pretty, replied the young lady, tossing her head, but— Yes, I know it's very pretty, said the young man, looking with an air of admiration in the barmaid's face. I said you, you know, just at this moment, but beauty should be spoken of respectfully respectfully and in proper terms, and with a becoming sense of its worth and excellence, whereas this fellow has no more notion—' The young lady interrupted the conversation at this point by thrusting her head out of the bar-window, and inquiring of the waiter in a shrill voice whether that young man who had been knocked down was going to stand in the passage all night, or whether the entrance was to be left clear for other people. The waiters, taking the hint and communicating it to the hostlers, were not slow to change their tone too and the result was that the unfortunate victim was bundled out in a twinkling. "'I'm sure I've seen that fellow before,' said Nicholas. "'Indeed,' replied his new acquaintance. "'I'm certain of it,' said Nicholas, pausing to reflect. "'Where can I have—' "'Stop! Yes, to be sure, he belongs to a register office up at the west end of the town. I knew I recollected the face.' It was indeed Tom, the ugly clerk. "'That's odd enough.' said Nicholas, ruminating upon the strange manner in which the registry office seems to start up and stare him in the face every now and then, and when he least expected it. "'I am much obliged to you for your kind advocacy of my cause, when it is most needed an advocate,' said the young man, laughing and drawing a card from his pocket. "'Perhaps you'll do me the favour to let me know where I can thank you.' Nicholas took the card, and glancing at it involuntarily as he returned the compliments, evinced very great surprise. "'Mr. Frank Cheeryble,' said Nicholas. "'Surely not the nephew of Cheeryble Brothers, who is expected to-morrow.' 
"'I don't usually call myself the nephew of the firm,' returned Mr. Frank, good-humouredly. "'But of the two excellent individuals who compose it, I am proud to say I am the nephew. "'And you, I see, are Mr. Nickleby, of whom I have heard so much. "'This is a most unexpected meeting, but not the less welcome, I assure you.' Nicholas responded to these compliments with others of the same kind, and they shook hands warmly. Then he introduced John Browdie, who had remained in a state of great admiration ever since the young lady in the bar had been so skilfully won over to the right side. Then Mrs. John Browdie was introduced, and finally they all went upstairs together and spent the next half-hour with great satisfaction and mutual entertainment, Mrs. John Browdie beginning the conversation by declaring that of all the made-up things she ever saw, that young woman below stairs was the vainest and plainest. This, Mr. Frank Cheerable, although, to judge from what had recently taken place, a hot-headed young man, which is not an absolute miracle and phenomenon in nature, was a sprightly, good-humoured, pleasant fellow, with much both in his countenance and disposition that reminded Nicholas very strongly of the kind-hearted brothers. His manner was as unaffected as theirs, and his demeanour full of that heartiness, which to most people who have anything generous in their composition is peculiarly prepossessing. Add to this, that he was good-looking and intelligent, had a plentiful share of vivacity, was extremely cheerful, and accommodated himself in five minutes' time to all John Browdie's oddities with as much ease as if he had known him from a boy, and it would be a source of no great wonder that, when they parted for the night, he had produced a most favourable impression, not only upon the worthy Yorkshireman and his wife, but upon Nicholas also, who, revolving all these things in his mind as he made the best of his way home, arrived at the conclusion that he laid the foundation of a most agreeable and desirable acquaintance. "'But it's the most extraordinary thing about that register office, fellow,' thought Nicholas. "'Is it likely that this nephew can know anything about that beautiful girl? "'When Tim Linkinwater gave me to understand the other day that he was coming to take a share in the business here, "'he said he had been superintending it in Germany for four years, "'and that during the last six months he had been engaged in establishing an agency in the north of England. "'That's... Four years and a half. Four years and a half. She can't be more than seventeen, say, eighteen at the outside. She was quite a child when he went away. I should say he knew nothing about her, and had never seen her, so he can give me no information. At all events, thought Nicholas, coming to the real point in his mind, there can be no danger of any prior occupation of her affections in that quarter. That's quite clear. Is selfishness a necessary ingredient in the composition of that passion called love, or does it deserve all the fine things which poets, in the exercise of their undoubted vocation, have said of it? There are, no doubt, authenticated instances of gentlemen having given up ladies and ladies having given up gentlemen to meritorious rivals, under circumstances of great high-mindedness. But it is quite established that the majority of such ladies and gentlemen have not made a virtue of necessity, and nobly resigned what was beyond their reach, as a private soldier might register a vow never to accept the order of the garter, or a pure curate of great piety and learning, but of no family, save a very large family of children, might renounce a bishopric. Here was Nicholas Nickleby, who would have scorned the thought of counting how the chances stood of his rising in favour or fortune with the brothers Cheerable, now that their nephew had returned, already deep in calculations whether that same nephew was likely to rival him in the affections of the fair unknown, discussing the matter with himself, too, as gravely as if, with that one exception, it were all settled, and, recurring to the subject again and again, and feeling quite indignant and ill-used at the notion of anybody else making love to one with whom he had never exchanged a word in all his life. To be sure, he exaggerated, rather than depreciated the merits of his new acquaintance. But still he took it as a kind of personal offence that he should have any merits at all. In the eyes of this particular young lady, that is, for elsewhere he was quite welcome to have as many as he pleased. There was undoubted selfishness in all this, and yet Nicholas was of a most free and generous nature, with as few mean or sordid thoughts, perhaps, as ever fell to the lot of any man. And there is no reason to suppose that, being in love, he felt and thought differently from other people in the like sublime condition. He did not stop to set on foot an inquiry into his train of thought or state of feeling, however, but went thinking on all the way home, and continued to dream on in the same strain all night. For, 
Having satisfied himself that Frank Cheeryble could have no knowledge of, or acquaintance with, the mysterious young lady, it began to occur to him that even he himself might never see her again. Upon which hypothesis he built up a very ingenious succession of tormenting ideas which answered his purpose even better than the vision of Mr. Frank Cheeryble, and tantalised and worried him, waking and sleeping. Notwithstanding all that has been said and sung to the contrary, there is no well-established case of mourning having either deferred or hastened its approach by the term of an hour or so for the mere gratification of a splenetic feeling against some unoffending lover. The son, having, in the discharge of his public duty, as the books of precedent report, invariably risen according to the almanacs, and without suffering himself to be swayed by any private considerations. So morning came, as usual, and with it business hours, and with them Mr. Frank Cheeryble, and with him a long train of smiles and welcomes from the worthy brothers, and a more grave and clerk-like but scarcely less hearty reception from Mr. Timothy Lincolnwater. "'That Mr. Frank and Mr. Nickleby should have met last night,' said Tin Lincolnwater, getting slowly off his stool, and looking round the counting-house with his back planted against the desk, as was his custom when he had anything very particular to say. "'That those two young men should have met last night in that manner is, I say, a coincidence, a remarkable coincidence.' "'Why, I don't believe now,' added Tim, taking off his spectacles and smiling as with gentle pride, "'that there's such a place in all the world for coincidences as London is.' "'I don't know about that,' said Mr. Frank, but—' "'Don't know about it, Mr. Francis?' interrupted Tim, with an obstinate air. "'Well, but let us know. If there is any better place for such things, where is it? Is it in Europe? No, that it isn't. Is it in Asia? Why, of course it's not. Is it in Africa? Not a bit of it. Is it in America? You know better than that, at all events.' "'Well, then,' said Tim, folding his arms resolutely, "'where is it?' "'I was not about to dispute the point, Tim,' said young Cheeryble, laughing. "'I am not such a heretic as that. All I was going to say was that I hold myself under any obligation to the coincidence, that's all.' "'Oh, if you don't dispute it,' said Sir Tim, quite satisfied, "'that's another thing. I'll tell you what, though. I wish you had. I wish you or anybody would. I would so put that man down.' said Tim, tapping the forefinger of his left hand emphatically with his spectacles, "'so put that man down by argument.' It was quite impossible to find language to express the degree of mental prostration to which such an adventurous wight would be reduced in the keen encounter with Tin Lincolnwater. So Tin gave up the rest of his declaration in pure lack of words, and mounted his stool again. "'We may consider ourselves, Brother Ned,' said Charles, after he patted Tim Lincolnwater approvingly on the back, "'very fortunate in having two such young men about us as our nephew Frank and Mr. Nickleby. It should be a source of great satisfaction and pleasure to us.' Uh, "'Certainly, Charles, certainly,' returned the other. "'Of Tim,' added Brother Ned, "'I say nothing whatever, because Tim is a mere child, an infant, a, a nobody that we never think of or take into account at all. Tim, you villain, what do you say to that, sir?' "'I am jealous of both of them,' said Tim, "'and mean to look out for another situation. So provide yourself, gentlemen, if you please.' Tim thought this such an exquisite, unparalleled, and most extraordinary joke— that he laid his pen upon the inkstand, and, rather tumbling off his stool than getting down with his usual deliberation, laughed till he was quite faint, shaking his head all the time so that little particles of powder flew palpably about the office. Nor were the brothers at all behindhand, for they laughed almost as heartily at the ludicrous idea of any voluntary separation between themselves and old Tim. Nicholas and Mr. Frank laughed quite boisterously, perhaps to conceal some other emotion awakened by this little incident and so indeed did the three old fellows after the first burst. So perhaps there was as much keen enjoyment and relish in that laugh altogether as the politest assembly ever derived from the most poignant witticism uttered at any one person's expense. Uh, "'Mr. Nickleby,' said Brother Charles, calling him aside and taking him kindly by the hand, I, "'I am anxious, my dear sir, to see that you are properly and comfortably settled in the cottage.' We cannot allow those who serve us well to labour under any privation or discomfort that it is in our power to remove. I wish, too, to see your mother and sister, to know them, Miss Nickleby, and have an opportunity of relieving their minds by assuring them that any trifling service we have been able to do them is a great deal more than repaid by the zeal and ardour you display. Uh, not a word, my dear sir, I beg. 
"'Tomorrow is Sunday. I shall make bold to come out at tea-time, and take the chance of finding you at home. If you are not, you know, or the ladies should feel a delicacy and be intruded on, and would rather not be known to me just now, why, I can come again another time, any other time would do for me. Let it remain upon that understanding. Uh, uh, Brother Ned, my dear fellow, uh, let me have a word with you this way.' The twins went out of the office arm in arm, and Nicholas, who saw in this act of kindness and many others of which he had been the subject that morning, only so many delicate renewals on the arrival of their nephew of the kind assurance which the brothers had given him in his absence, could scarcely feel sufficient admiration and gratitude for such extraordinary consideration. The intelligence that they were to have a visitor, and such a visitor, next day, awakened in the breast of Mrs. Nickleby mingled feelings of exultation and regret. For whereas on the one hand she hailed it as an omen of her speedy restoration to good society, and the almost forgotten pleasures of morning calls and evening tea-drinkings, she could not, on the other, but reflect with bitterness of spirit on the absence of a silver teapot with an ivory knob on the lid, and a milk-jug to match, which had been the pride of her heart in days of yore, and had been kept from year's end to year's end wrapped up in wash-leather on a certain top shelf, which now presented itself in lively colours to her sorrowing imagination. "'I wonder who's got that spice-box?' said Mrs. Nickleby, shaking her head. "'It used to stand in the left-hand corner, next but two to the pickled onions. Uh, you remember that spice-box, Kate?' "'Perfectly well, mamma. "'I shouldn't think you did, Kate,' returned Mrs. Nickleby, in a severe manner, "'talking about it in that cold and unfeeling way.' If there is any one thing that vexes me in these losses more than the losses themselves, I do protest and declare, said Mrs. Nickleby, rubbing her nose with an impassioned air, that it is to have people about me who take things with such provoking calmness. My dear mamma, said Kate, stealing her arm round her mother's neck, why do you say what I know you cannot seriously mean or think, or why be angry with me for being happy and content? You and Nicholas are left to me. We are together once again, and what regard can I have for a few trifling things of which we never feel the want? When I have seen all the misery and desolation that death can bring, and know the lonesome feeling of being solitary and alone in crowds, and all the agony of separation and grief and poverty, when we most needed comfort and support from each other, can you wonder that I look upon this as a place of such delicious quiet and rest, that with you beside me, I have nothing to wish for or regret. There was a time, and not long since, when all the comforts of our old home did come back upon me, I own, very often, oftener than you would think, perhaps. But I affected to care nothing for them, in the hope that you would not so be brought to regret them the less. I was not insensible, indeed. I might have felt happier if I had been. Dear Mamma, said Kate, in great agitation, I know no difference between this home and in that in which we were all so happy for so many years, except that the kindest and gentlest heart that ever ached on earth has passed in peace to heaven. "'Kate, my dear Kate,' cried Mrs. Nickleby, folding her in her arms. "'I have so often thought,' sobbed Kate, "'of all his kind words, of the last time he looked into my little room as he passed upstairs to bed and said, "'God bless you, darling.' There was a paleness in his face, Mamma, the broken heart. I know it was. I little thought so, then. A gush of tears came to her relief, and Kate laid her head upon her mother's breast, and wept like a little child. It is an exquisite and beautiful thing in our nature that when the heart is touched and softened by some tranquil happiness or affectionate feeling, the memory of the dead comes over it most powerfully and irresistibly. It would almost seem as though our better thoughts and sympathies were charms, in virtue of which the soul is enabled to hold some vague and mysterious intercourse with the spirit of those whom we loved in life. Alas! How often and how long may those patient angels hover above us, watching for the spell which is so seldom uttered, and so soon forgotten! Poor Mrs. Nickleby! accustomed to give ready utterance to whatever came uppermost in her mind, had never conceived the possibility of her daughter's dwelling upon these thoughts in secret, the more especially as no hard trial or querulous reproach had ever drawn them from her. But now, when the happiness of all that Nicholas had just told them, and of their new and peaceful life, 
brought these recollections so strongly upon Kate that she could not suppress them, Mrs. Nickleby began to have a glimmering that she had been rather thoughtless now and then, and was conscious of something like self-reproach as she embraced her daughter, and yielded to the emotions which such a conversation naturally awakened. There was a mighty bustle that night, and a vast quantity of preparation for the expected visitor, and a very large nosegay was brought from a gardener's hard by, and cut up into a number of very small ones, with which Mrs. Nickleby would have garnished the little sitting-room, in a style that certainly could not have failed to attract anybody's attention, if Kate had not offered to spare her the trouble, and arranged them in the prettiest and neatest manner possible. If the cottage ever looked pretty, it must have been on such a bright and sunshiny day as the next day was. But Smike's pride in the garden, or Mrs. Nickleby's in the condition of the furniture, or Kate's in everything, was nothing to the pride with which Nicholas looked at Kate herself. And surely the costliest mansion in all England might have found in her beautiful face and graceful form its most exquisite and peerless ornament. About six o'clock in the afternoon, Mrs. Nickleby was thrown into a great flutter of spirits by the long-expected knock at the door, nor was this flutter at all composed by the audible tread of two pairs of boots in the passage, which, Mrs. Nickleby augured in a breathless state, must be the two Mr. Cheerybles, as it certainly was. They're not the two Mrs. Nickleby expected, because it was Mr. Charles Cheeryble and his nephew, Mr. Frank, who made a thousand apologies for his intrusion, which Mrs. Nickleby, having teaspoons enough and to spare for all, most graciously received. Nor did the appearance of this unexpected visitor occasion the least embarrassment, save in Kate, and that only to the extent of a blush or two at first. For the old gentleman was so kind and cordial, and the young gentleman imitated him in this respect so well, that the usual stiffness and formality of a first meeting showed no signs of appearing, and Kate really more than once detected herself in the very act of wondering when it was going to begin. At the tea-table there was plenty of conversation on a great variety of subjects, nor were there wanting jocko's matters of discussion such as they were, for young Mr. Cheeryble's recent stay in Germany happening to be alluded to, old Mr. Cheeryble informed the company that the aforesaid young Mr. Cheeryble was suspected to have fallen deeply in love with the daughter of a certain German burgomaster. This accusation young Mr. Cheeryble most indignantly repelled, upon which Mrs. Nickleby slyly remarked that she suspected from the very warmth of the denial there must be something in it. Young Mr. Cheeryble then earnestly entreated old Mr. Cheeryble to confess that it was all a jest, which old Mr. Cheeryble at last did, young Mr. Cheeryble being so much in earnest about it that, as Mrs. Nickleby said many thousand times afterwards in recalling the scene, he quite coloured, which she rightly considered a memorable circumstance, and one worthy of remark, young men not being as a class remarkable for modesty or self-denial, especially when there is a lady in the case when, if they colour at all, it is rather their practice to colour the story, and not themselves. After tea there was a walk in the garden, and the evening being very fine they strolled out at the garden gate into some lanes and by-roads, and sauntered up and down until it grew quite dark. The time seemed to pass very quickly with all the party. Kate went first, leaning upon her brother's arm, and talking with him and Mr. Frank Cheerable and Mrs. Nickleby and the elder gentleman followed at a short distance. The kindness of the good merchant, his interest in the welfare of Nicholas, and his admiration of Kate, so operating upon the good lady's feelings, that the usual current of her speech was confined within very narrow and circumscribed limits. Smike, who, if he had ever been an object of interest in his life, had been one that day, accompanied them, joining sometimes one group and sometimes the other, as Brother Charles, laying his hand upon his shoulder, bade him walk with him, or Nicholas, looking smilingly round, beckoned him to come and talk with the old friend who understood him best, and who could win a smile into his careworn face when none else could. Pride is one of the seven deadly sins, but it cannot be the pride of a mother in her children, for that is a compound of two cardinal virtues, faith and hope. This was the pride which swelled Mrs. Nickleby's heart that night, and this it was which left upon her face, glistening in the light when they returned home, traces of the most grateful tears she had ever shed. 
There was a quiet mirth about the little supper, which harmonised exactly with this tone of feeling, and at length the two gentlemen took their leave. There was one circumstance in the leave-taking which occasioned a vast deal of smiling and pleasantry, and that was that Mr. Frank Cheeryble offered his hand to Kate twice over, quite forgetting that he had bade her adieu already. This was held by the elder Mr. Cheeryble to be a convincing proof that he was thinking of his German flame, and the jest occasioned immense laughter. So easy is it to move light hearts. In short, it was a day of serene and tranquil happiness, and as we all have some bright day, many of us let us hope among a crowd of others, to which we revert with particular delight, so this one was often looked back to afterwards as holding a conspicuous place in the calendar of those who shared it. Was there one exception, and that one he who needed to have been most happy? Who was that? who, in the silence of his own chamber, sunk upon his knees to pray as his first friend had taught him, and folding his hands and stretching them wildly in the air, fell upon his face in a passion of bitter grief. End of chapter 43 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 44 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 44. Mr. Ralph Nickleby cuts an old acquaintance. It would also appear from the contents hereof that a joke, even between husband and wife, may be sometimes carried too far. There are some men who, living with the one object of enriching themselves, no matter by what means, and being perfectly conscious of the baseness and rascality of the means which they will use every day towards his then, affect nevertheless, even to themselves, a high tone of moral rectitude, and shake their heads and sigh over the depravity of the world. Some of the craftiest scoundrels that ever walked this earth, or rather, for walking implies at least an erect position and the bearing of a man, that ever crawled and crept through life by its dirtiest and narrowest ways, will gravely jot down in diaries the events of every day, and keep a regular debtor and creditor account with heaven, which will always show a floating balance in their own favour. Whether this is a gratuitous, the only gratuitous, part of the falsehood and trickery of such men's lives, or whether they really hope to cheat heaven itself, and lay up treasure in the next world by the same process which has enabled them to lay up treasure in this? Not to question how it is, so it is. And, doubtless, such book-keeping, like certain autobiographies which have enlightened the world, cannot fail to prove serviceable in the one respect of sparing the recording angel some time and labour. Ralph Nickleby was not a man of this stamp. Stern, unyielding, dogged and impenetrable. Ralph cared for nothing in life, or beyond it, save the gratification of two passions, avarice, the first and predominant appetite of his nature, and hatred, the second. Affecting to consider himself but a type of all humanity, he was at little pains to conceal his true character from the world in general, and in his own heart he exulted over and cherished every bad design as it had birth. The only scriptural admonition that Ralph Nickleby heeded in the letter was, Know thyself. He knew himself well, and, choosing to imagine that all mankind were cast in the same mould, hated them. For, though no man hates himself, the coldest amongst us having too much self-love for that, yet most men unconsciously judge the world from themselves, and it will be very generally found that those who sneer habitually at human nature, and affect to despise it, are among its worst and least pleasant samples. But the present business of these adventures is with Ralph himself, who stood regarding Newman Noggs with a heavy frown, while that worthy took off his fingerless gloves, and, spreading them carefully on the palm of his left hand, and flattening them with his right to take the creases out, 
proceeded to roll them up with an absent air, as if he were utterly regardless of all things else, in the deep interest of the ceremonial. "'Gone out of town,' said Ralph slowly. "'A mistake of yours. Go back again.' "'No mistake,' returned Newman. "'Not even going. Gone.' "'Has he turned girl or baby?' muttered Ralph, with a fretful gesture. "'I don't know,' said Newman. "'But he's gone.' The repetition of the word gone seemed to afford Newman Noggs inexpressible delight, in proportion as it annoyed Ralph Nickleby. He uttered the word with a full, round emphasis, dwelling upon it as long as he decently could, and when he could hold out no longer without attracting observation, stood gasping it to himself, as he even that were a satisfaction. "'And where has he gone?' said Ralph. "'France,' replied Newman. "'Danger of another attack of erysipelas.' A worse attack, in the head, so the doctors ordered him off. And he's gone. And Lord Frederick? began Ralph. He's gone, too, replied Newman. And he carries his drubbing with him, does he? said Ralph, turning away. Pockets his bruises and sneaks off without the retaliation of a word, or seeking the smallest reparation. He's too ill, said Newman. Too ill? repeated Ralph. Why, I would have it if I were dying. In that case I should only be the more determined to have it, and that without delay. I mean if I were he. But he's too ill. Poor Sir Mulberry, too ill. Uttering these words with supreme contempt and great irritation of manner, Ralph signed hastily to Newman to, to leave the room, and throwing himself into his chair, beat his foot impatiently upon the ground. There is some spell about that boy said Ralph, grinding his teeth. Circumstances conspire to help him. Talk of fortune's favours. What is even money to such devil's luck as this? He thrust his hands impatiently into his pockets, but, notwithstanding his previous reflection, there was some consolation there, for his face relaxed a little, and although there was still a deep frown upon the contracted brow, it was one of calculation and not of disappointment. This hawk will come back, however, muttered Ralph, and if I know the man, and I should by this time, his wrath will have lost nothing of its violence in the meanwhile. Obliged to live in retirement, the monotony of a sick-room to a man of his habits, no life, no drink, no play, nothing that he likes and lives by, he's not likely to forget his obligations in the cause of all this. Few men would, but he of all others, no, no. He smiled and shook his head, and resting his chin upon his hand, fell amusing, and smiled again. After a time he rose and rang the bell. "'That Mr. Squeers, has he been here?' said Ralph. "'He was here last night. I, I left him here when I went home,' returned Newman. "'I know that fool, do I not?' said Ralph, irascibly. "'Has he been here since? Was he here this morning?' "'No!' bawled Newman, in a very loud key. "'If he comes while I'm out, he's pretty sure to be here by nine tonight. Let him wait. And if there's another man with him, as there will be—' "'Perhaps,' said Ralph, checking himself. "'Let him wait, too.' "'Let them both wait,' said Newman. "'Aye,' replied Ralph, turning upon him with an angry look. "'Help me on with this, Spencer, and don't repeat after me like a croaking parrot.' "'I wish I was a parrot,' Newman, sulkily. "'I wish you were,' rejoined Ralph, drawing his Spencer on. "'I'd have wrung your neck long ago.' Newman returned no answer to this compliment, but looked over Ralph's shoulder for an instant. He was adjusting the collar of the Spencer behind just then, as if he was strongly disposed to tweak him by the nose. Meeting Ralph's eye, however, he suddenly recalled his wandering fingers, and rubbed his own red nose with a vehemence quite astonishing. Bestowing no further notice upon his eccentric follower than a threatening look, and an admonition to be careful and make no mistake, Ralph took his hat and gloves, and walked out. He appeared to have a very extraordinary and miscellaneous connection, and very odd calls he made, some at great rich houses and some at small poor ones, but all upon one subject—money. His face was a talisman to the porters and servants of his more dashing clients, and procured him ready admission, though he trudged on foot, and others who were denied rattled to the door in carriages. Here he was all softness and cringing civility his step so light that it scarcely produced a sound upon the thick carpets, his voice so soft that it was not audible beyond the person to whom it was addressed. 
But, in the poorer habitations, Ralph was another man. His boots creaked upon the passage floor as he walked boldly in. His voice was harsh and loud as he demanded the money that was overdue. His threats were coarse and angry. With another class of customers, Ralph was again another man. These were attorneys of more than doubtful reputation, who helped him to new business, or raised fresh profits upon old. With them, Ralph was familiar and jocose, humorous upon the topics of the day, and especially pleasant upon bankruptcies and pecuniary difficulties that made good for trade. In short, it would have been difficult to have recognised the same man under these various aspects, but for the bulky leather case full of bills and notes which he drew from his pocket at every house, and the constant repetition of the same complaint, varied only in tone and style of delivery, that the world thought him rich, and that perhaps he might be if he had his own, but there was no getting money in when it was out once out, either principal or interest, and it was a hard matter to live, even to live from day to day. It was evening before a long round of such visits, interrupted only by a scanty dinner at an eating-house, terminated at Pimlico, and Ralph walked along St. James's Park on his way home. There were some deep schemes in his head, as the puckered brow and firmly set mouth would have abundantly testified, even if they had been unaccompanied by a complete indifference to, or unconsciousness of, the objects about him. So complete was his abstraction, however, that Ralph, usually as quick-sighted as any man, did not observe that he was followed by a shambling figure, which at one time stole behind him with noiseless footsteps, at another crept a few paces before him, and at another glided along by his side, at all times regarding him with an eye so keen and a look so eager and attentive that it was more like the expression of an intrusive face in some powerful picture or strongly marked dream than the scrutiny even of a most interested and anxious observer. The sky had been lowering and dark for some time, and the commencement of a violent storm of rain drove Ralph for shelter to a tree. He was leaning against it with folded arms, still buried in thought, when, happening to raise his eyes, he suddenly met those of a man who, creeping round the trunk, peered into his face with a searching look. There was something in the usurer's expression at the moment, which the man appeared to remember well, for it decided him, and stepping close up to Ralph, he pronounced his name. Astonished for the moment, Ralph fell back a couple of paces and surveyed him from head to foot. A spare, dark, withered man, of about his own age, with a stooping body, and a very sinister face, rendered more ill-favoured by hollow and hungry cheeks, deeply sunburnt, and thick black eyebrows, blacker in contrast with the perfect whiteness of his hair, roughly clothed in shabby garments of a strange and uncouth make, and having about him an indefinable manner of depression and degradation. This, for a moment, was all he saw. But he looked again, and the face and person seemed gradually to grow less strange, to change as he looked, to subside and soften into lineaments that were familiar, until at last they resolved themselves, as if by some strange optical illusion, into those of one whom he had known for many years, and forgotten and lost sight of for nearly as many more. The man saw that the recognition was mutual, and beckoning to Ralph to take his former place under the tree, and not to stand in the falling rain, of which in his first surprise he had been quite regardless, addressed him in a hoarse, faint tone. "'You would hardly have known me from my voice, I suppose, Mr. Nickleby,' he said. "'No,' returned Ralph, bending a severe look upon him, though there is something in that that I remember now. There is little in me that you can call to mind as having been there eight years ago, I dare say, observed the other. Quite enough, said Ralph, carelessly and averting his face. More than enough. If I had remained in doubt about you, Mr. Nickleby, said the other, this reception and your manner would have decided me very soon. Did you expect any other? asked Ralph sharply. "'No,' said the man. "'You were right,' retorted Ralph, "'and as you feel no surprise, need express none.' Uh, "'Mr. Nickleby,' said the man bluntly, after a brief pause, during which he had seemed to struggle with an inclination to answer him by some reproach, "'will you hear a few words that I have to say?' "'I am obliged to wait here till the rain holds a little,' said Ralph, 
looking abroad. "'If you talk, sir, I shall not put my fingers in my ears, though your talking may have as much effect as if I did.' "'I was once in your confidence,' thus his companion began. Ralph looked round and smiled involuntarily. "'Well,' said the other, "'as much in your confidence as you ever chose to let anybody be.' "'Ah!' rejoined Ralph, folding his arms. "'That's another thing, quite another thing.' "'Don't let us play upon words, Mr. Nickleby, in the name of humanity.' "'Of what?' said Ralph. "'Of humanity,' replied the other sternly. "'I am hungry and in want. "'If the change that you must see in me after so long an absence—' "'Must see, for I, upon whom it has come by slow and hard degrees, see it and know it well, "'will not move you to pity. "'Let the knowledge that bread, not the daily bread of the Lord's Prayer, "'which, as it is offered up in cities like this, is understood to include half the luxuries of the world for the rich, "'and just as much coarse food as will support life for the poor, "'not that, of bread, a crust of dry hard bread, is beyond my reach to-day. "'Let that have some weight with you, if nothing else has.' "'If this is the usual form in which you beg, sir,' said Ralph, "'you have studied your part well. "'But if you will take advice from one who knows something of the world and its ways, "'I should recommend a lower tone, a little lower tone, "'or you stand a fair chance of being starved in good earnest.' "'As he said this, Ralph clenched his left wrist tightly with his right hand, "'and inclining his head a little on one side and dropping his chin upon his breast, "'looked at him whom he addressed with a frowning, sullen face.' the very picture of a man whom nothing could move or soften. "'Yesterday was my first day in London,' said the old man, glancing at his travel-stained dress and worn shoes. "'It would have been better for you, I think, if it had been your last also,' replied Ralph. "'I have been seeking you these two days, where I thought you were most likely to be found,' resumed the other more humbly, "'and I met you here at last.' "'when I had almost given up the hope of encountering you, Mr. Nickleby.' "'He seemed to wait for some reply. "'But, Ralph giving him none, he continued, "'I am a most miserable and wretched outcast, nearly sixty years old, "'and as destitute and helpless as a child of six. "'I am sixty years old, too,' replied Ralph, "'and am neither destitute nor helpless. "'Work. Don't make fine play-acting speeches about bread, but earn it.' "'How?' cried the other. "'Where? Show me the means. "'Will you give them to me, will you?' "'I did once,' replied Ralph composedly. "'You scarcely need ask me whether I will again.' "'It's twenty years ago or more,' said the man in a suppressed voice, "'since you and I fell out. "'Do you remember that? "'I claimed a share in the profits of some business I brought to you, "'and as I persisted you arrested me for an old advance of ten pounds odd shillings, "'including interests of fifty per cent or so.' "'I remember something of it,' replied Ralph, carelessly. "'What, then?' "'That didn't part us,' said the man. "'I made submission being on the wrong side of the bolts and bars. "'And as you were not the made man then that you are now, "'you were glad enough to take back a clerk who wasn't over nice "'and who knew something of the trade you drove.' "'You begged and prayed, and I consented,' returned Ralph. "'That was kind of me.' "'Perhaps I did want you. I forget. "'I should think I did, or you would have begged in vain. "'You were useful, not too honest, not too delicate, "'not too nice of hand or heart, but useful.' "'Useful indeed,' said the man. "'Come, you have pinched and ground me down for some years before that, "'but I had served you faithfully up to that time, "'in spite of all your dog's usage. "'Had I?' "'Ralph made no reply. "'Had I?' said the man again. "'You had had your wages,' rejoined Ralph, "'and had done your work. "'We stood on equal ground so far, "'and could both cry quits.' "'Then, but not afterwards,' said the other. "'Not afterwards, certainly, not even then, "'for, as you've just said, you owed me money, "'and do still,' replied Ralph. "'That's not all,' said the man eagerly. "'That's not all. Mark that. "'I didn't forget that old saw, trust me.' Partly in remembrance of that, and partly in the hope of making money some day by the scheme, I took advantage of my position about you, and possessed myself of a hold upon you, which you would give half of all you have to know, and never can know but through me. I left you, long after that time, remember, 
And as for some poor trickery that came within the law, but was nothing to what you money-makers daily practice just outside his bounds, was sent away a convict for seven years. I have returned what you see me. Now, Mr. Nickleby, said the man, with a strange mixture of humility and sense of power, what help and assistance would you give me? What bribe, to speak out plainly? My expectations are not monstrous, but I must live, and to live I must eat and drink. Money is on your side, and hunger and thirst on mine. You may drive an easy bargain. Is that all? said Ralph, still eyeing his companion with the same steady look, and moving nothing but his lips. It depends on you, Mr. Nickleby, whether that's all or not, was the rejoinder. "'Why, then, harky, Mr. I don't know by what name I am to call you,' said Ralph. "'By my old one, if you like.' "'Why, then, harky, Mr. Brooker,' said Ralph, in his harshest accents, "'and don't expect to draw another speech from me. Harky, sir, I know you of old for a ready scoundrel, "'but you never had a stout heart, and hard work with maybe chains upon those legs of yours, "'and shorter food than when I pinched and ground you, has blunted your wits.' or you would not come with such a tale as this to me. You a hold upon me. Keep it, or publish it to the world, if you like. "'I can't do that,' interposed Brooker. "'That wouldn't serve me.' "'Wouldn't it?' said Ralph. "'It will serve you as much as bringing it to me, I promise you. "'To be plain with you, I am a careful man, and know my affairs thoroughly. "'I know the world, and the world knows me. "'Whatever you gleaned, or heard, or saw when you served me, the world knows and magnifies already. You could tell it nothing that would surprise it, unless, indeed, it redounded to my credit or honour, and then it would scout you for a liar. And yet I don't find business slack or clients scrupulous, quite the contrary. I am reviled or threatened every day by one man or another, said Ralph, but things roll on just the same, and I don't grow poorer either. I neither revile nor threaten, rejoined the man. I can tell you of what you have lost by my act, what I can only restore, and what, if I die without restoring, dies with me, and never can be regained. I tell my money pretty accurately, and generally keep it in my own custody, said Ralph. I look sharply after most men that I deal with, and most of all I look sharply after you. You are welcome to all you have kept from me. Are those of your own name dear to you? said the man emphatically. If they are, they are not returned Ralph, exasperated at this perseverance and the thought of Nicholas, which the last question awakened. "'They are not. If you'd come as a common beggar, I might have thrown a sixpence to you in remembrance of the clever knave you used to, to be. But since you tried to palm these stale tricks upon one that you might have known better, I'll not part with a halfpenny, nor would I to save you from rotting. And remember this, scape gallows,' said Ralph, menacing him with his hand, that if we meet again, and you so much as notice me by one begging gesture, you shall see the inside of a jail once more, and tighten this hold upon me in intervals of the hard labour that vagabonds are put to. There's my answer to your trash. Take it. With a disdainful scowl at the object of his anger, who met his eye but uttered not a word, Ralph walked away at his usual pace, without manifesting the slightest curiosity to see what became of his late companion, or indeed once looking behind him. The man remained on the same spot, with his eyes fixed upon his retreating figure, until it was lost to view, and then, drawing his arm about his chest as if the damp and lack of food struck coldly to him, lingered with slouching steps by the wayside, and begged of those who passed along. Ralph in no wise moved by what had lately passed, further than he had already expressed himself, walked deliberately on, and, turning out of the park and leaving Golden Square on his right, took his way through some streets at the west end of the town, until he arrived at that particular one in which stood the residence of Madame Mantalini. The name of that lady no longer appeared on the flaming door-plate, that of Miss Nag being substituted in its stead, but the bonnets and dresses were still dimly visible in the first-floor windows by the decaying light of a summer's evening, and, accepting this ostensible alteration in the proprietorship, the establishment wore its old appearance. Huh, muttered Ralph, drawing his hand across his mouth with a connoisseur-like air, and surveying the house from top to bottom. These people look pretty well. They can't last long. 
but if I know of their going in good time, I am safe, and a fair profit, too. I must keep them closely in view, that's all. So, nodding his head very complacently, Ralph was leaving the spot, when his quick ear caught the sound of a confused noise and hubbub of voices, mingled with a great running up and down stairs, in the very house which had been the subject of his scrutiny. And, while he was hesitating whether to knock at the door or listen at the keyhole a while longer, a female servant of Madame Mantalini's, whom he had often seen, opened it abruptly and bounced out, with her blue cap ribbon screaming in the air. Uh, "'Hello there! Stop!' cried Ralph. W "'What's the matter? Here I am. Didn't you hear me knock?' "'Oh, Mr. Nickleby, sir,' said the girl, "'go up for the love of gracious master's been and done it again!' "'Done what?' said Ralph tartly. "'What do you mean?' "'I knew he would if he was drove to it,' cried the girl. "'I said so all along.' Oh, "'Come here, you silly wench,' said Ralph, catching her by the wrist. "'And don't carry family matters to the neighbours, destroying the credit of this establishment. Come here. Do you hear me, girl?' Without any further expostulation, he led, or rather pulled, the frightened handmaid into the house and shut the door. Then, bidding her walk upstairs before him, followed without more ceremony. Guided by the noise of a great many voices all talking together, and passing the girl in his impatience, before they had ascended many steps, Ralph quickly reached the private sitting-room, when he was rather amazed by the confused and inexplicable scene in which he suddenly found himself. There were all the young lady workers, some with bonnets and some without, in various attitudes expressive of alarm and consternation. Some gathered round Madame Mantalini, who was in tears upon one chair, and others round Miss Nag, who was in opposition tears upon another, and others round Mr. Mantalini, who was perhaps the most striking figure in the whole group, for Mr. Lant Mantalini's legs were extended at full length upon the floor, and his head and shoulders were supported by a very tall footman, who didn't seem to know what to do with them, and Mr. Mantalini's eyes were closed, and his face was pale, and his hair was comparatively straight, and his whiskers and moustache were limp, and his teeth were clenched, and he had a little bottle in his right hand, and a little teaspoon in his left, and his hands, arms, legs, and shoulders were all stiff and powerless. And yet Madame Mantalini was not weeping upon the body, but was scolding violently upon her chair, and all this amidst a clamour of tongues perfectly deafening, and which really appeared to have driven the unfortunate footman to the utmost verge of distraction. "'What is the matter here?' said Ralph, pressing forward. At this inquiry the clamour was increased twentyfold, and an astounding string of such shrill contradictions as, "'He's poisoned himself. He hasn't. Send for a doctor. Don't. He's dying. He isn't. He's only pretending.' With various other cries, poured forth with bewildering volubility, until Madame Mantalini was seen to address herself to Ralph, when female curiosity to know what she would say prevailed, and as if by general consent, a dead silence unbroken by a single whisper instantaneously succeeded. "'Mr. Nickleby,' said Madame Mantalini, "'by what chance you came here I don't know.' Here a gurgling voice was heard to ejaculate, as part of the wanderings of a sick man, the words, "'Demnition sweetness!' But nobody heeded them except the footman, who, being startled to hear such awful tones proceeding, as it were, from between his very fingers, dropped his master's head upon the floor with a pretty loud crash, and then, without an effort to lift it up, gazed upon the bystanders, as if he had done something rather clever than otherwise. "'I will, however,' continued Madame Mantalini, drying her eyes and speaking with great indignation, "'say before you and before everybody here, for the first time and once for all, that I never will supply that man's extravagances and viciousness again. I have been a dupe and a fool to him long enough. In future he shall support himself if he can, and then he may spend what money he pleases upon whom and how he pleases, but it shall not be mine, and therefore you had better pause before you trust him further." Thereupon Madame Mantalini, quite unmoved by some most pathetic lamentations on the part of her husband, that the apothecary had not mixed the prussic acid strong enough, and that he must take another bottle or two to finish the work he had in hand, entered into a catalogue of that amiable gentleman's gallantries, deceptions, extravagances, and infidelities, especially the last, winding up with a protest against being supposed to entertain the smallest remnant of regard for him, and adducing 
in proof of the altered state of her affections, the circumstances is his having poisoned himself in private no less than six times within the last fortnight, and her not having once interfered by word or deed to save his life. "'And I insist on being separated and left to myself,' said Madame Mantalini, sobbing. "'If he dares to refuse me a separation, I'll have one in law. I can, and I hope this will be a warning to all girls who have seen this disgraceful exhibition.' Miss Nagg, who was unquestionably the oldest girl in company, said with great solemnity that it would be a warning to her, and so did the young ladies generally, with the exception of one or two who appeared to entertain some doubts whether such whispers could do wrong. "'Why do you say all this before so many listeners?' said Ralph, in a low voice. "'You know you are not in earnest.' "'I am in earnest,' replied Madame Mantalini aloud, and retreating towards Miss Nagg. "'Well, but consider,' reasoned Ralph, who had a great interest in the matter, "'it would be well to reflect. A married woman has no property.' "'Not a solitary single individual, dear my soul,' said Mr. Mantalini, raising himself upon his elbow. "'I am quite aware of that,' retorted Madame Mantalini, tossing her head, "'and I have none. The business, the stock, this house, and everything in it, all belong to Miss Nagg.' "'That's quite true, Madame Mantalini.' said Miss Nagg, with whom her late employer had secretly come to an amicable understanding on this point. "'Very true indeed, Madame Antonini, very true. And I never was more glad in all my life that I had strength of mind to resist matrimonial offers, no matter how advantageous, that I am when I think of my present position as compared with your most unfortunate and most undeserved one, Madame Mantellini. "'Damn it!' cried Mr. Mantellini, turning his head towards his wife. "'Will it not slap and pinch the Evian's dowager that dares to reflect upon its own delicious?' But the day of Mr. Mantellini's blandishments had departed. "'Miss Nag, sir,' said his wife, "'is my particular friend.' And although Mr. Mantellini leered till his eyes seemed in danger of never coming back to their right places again, Madame Mantellini showed no signs of softening. To do the excellent Miss Nag justice, she had been mainly instrumental in bringing about this altered state of things, for, finding by daily experience that there was no chance of the business thriving, or even continuing to exist, while Mr. Mantellini had any hand in the expenditure, and having now a considerable interest in its well-doing, she had sedulously applied herself to the investigation of some little matters connected with that gentleman's private character, which she had so well elucidated, and artfully imparted to Madame Mantellini, as to open her eyes more effectually than the closest and most philosophical reasoning could have done in a series of years. To which end, the accidental discovery by Miss Nagg of some tender correspondence, in which Madame Mantellini was described as old and ordinary, have most providentially contributed. However, notwithstanding her firmness, Madame Mantellini wept very piteously, and as she leant upon Miss Nagg and signed towards the door, that young lady, and all the other young ladies with sympathising faces, proceeded to bear her out. "'Nickleby,' said Mr. Mantellini, in tears, "'you have been made a witness to this demnition cruelty on the part of the demnest enslaver and captivator that never was, oh, dem! I forgive that woman.' "'Forgive?' repeated Madame Mantellini, angrily. "'I do forgive her, Nickleby,' said Mr. Mantellini. "'You will blame me, the world will blame me, the women will blame me, "'everybody will laugh and scoff and smile and grin most demnably. "'They will say, she had a blessing, she did not know it. "'He was too weak, he was too good, he was a demned fine fellow, "'but he loved too strong, he could not bear her to be cross and call him wicked names. "'It was a demned case that never was a demder. "'But I forgive her.' With this affecting speech Mr. Mantellini fell down again very flat, and lay to all appearance without sense or motion, until all the females had left the room, when he came cautiously into a sitting posture, and confronted Ralph with a very blank face, and the little bottle still in one hand and the teaspoon in the other. "'You may put away those fooleries now, and live by your wits again,' said Ralph, coolly putting on his hat. "'Dim it, Nickleby, you're not serious.' "'I seldom joke,' said Ralph. "'Good night.' "'No, but Nickleby,' said Mantellini. "'I am wrong, perhaps,' rejoined Ralph. "'I hope so. You should know best. Good night.' Affecting not to hear his entreaties that he would stay and advise with him, Ralph left the crestfallen Mr. Mantellini to his meditations, and left the house quietly. 
Oh, he said, sets the wind that way so soon. Half knave and half fool and detected in both characters. I think your day is over, sir. As he said this, he made some memorandum in his pocket-book in which Mr. Mantalini's name figured conspicuously, and finding by his watch that it was between nine and ten o'clock, made all speed home. "'Are they here?' was the first question he asked of Newman. Newman nodded. "'Been here half an hour.' Two of them? One a fat, sleek man?' "'Aye,' said Newman. "'In your room now.' "'Good,' rejoined Ralph. "'Get me a coach.' "'A, a coach? What, what, you, what are you going to do, eh?' stammered Newman. Ralph angrily repeated his orders, and Noggs, who might well have been excused for wondering at such an unusual and extraordinary circumstance, for he had never seen Ralph in a coach in his life, departed on his errand, and presently returned with the conveyance. Into it went Mr. Squeers, and Ralph, and the third man whom Newman Noggs had never seen. Newman stood upon the doorstep to see them off, not troubling himself to wonder where or upon what business they were going, until he chanced by mere accident to hear Ralph name the address whither the coachman was to drive. Quick as lightning, and in a state of the most extreme wonder, Newman darted into his little office for his hat, and limped after the coach, as if with the intention of getting up behind. But in this design he was balked, for it had too much the start of him, and was soon hopelessly ahead, leaving him gaping in the empty street. "'I don't know, though,' said Noggs, stopping for breath, "'any good that I could have done by going to. He would have seen me if I had. "'Drive there? What can come of this?' If I'd only known it yesterday, I could have told, Drive there! There's mischief in it. There must be. His reflections were interrupted by a grey-haired man of a very remarkable, though far from prepossessing, appearance, who, coming stealthily towards him, solicited relief. Newman, still cogitating deeply, turned away. But the man followed him, and pressed him with such a tale of misery that Newman, who might have been considered a hopeless person to beg from, and who had little enough to give, looked into his hat for some half-pence which he usually kept screwed up when he had any in a corner of his potted handkerchief. While he was busily untwisting the knot with his teeth, the man said something which attracted his attention. Whatever that something was, it led to something else, and in the end he and Newman walked away side by side, the strange man talking earnestly, and Newman listening. End of chapter 44 Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 45 of Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens. Chapter 45. Containing Matter of a Surprising Kind. As we gang awa fra Lunnon to morrow neat, and as I did not know that I was e'er so happy in all my days, Mr. Nickleby, ding, but I will tack another glass to our next merry meeting. So said John Browdy, rubbing his hands with great joyousness, and looking round him with a ruddy shining face, quite in keeping with the declaration. The time at which John found himself in this enviable condition was the same evening to which the last chapter bore reference. The place was the cottage, and the assembled company were Nicholas, Mrs. Nickleby, Mrs. Browdy, Kate Nickleby, and Smike. A very merry party they had been. Mrs. Nickleby, knowing of her son's obligations to the honest Yorkshireman, had, after some demur, yielded her consent to Mr. and Mrs. Browdie being invited out to tea. In the way of which arrangement there were at first sundry difficulties and obstacles, arising out of her not having had an opportunity of calling upon Mrs. Browdie first. For although Mrs. Nickleby very often observed, with much complacency, as most punctilious people do, that she had not an atom of pride or formality about her, still she was a great stickler for dignity and ceremonies and as it was manifest that until a call had been made she could not be politely speaking and according to the laws of society even cognizant of the fact of mrs browdie's existence she felt her situation to be one of peculiar delicacy and difficulty the call must originate with me my dear said mrs nickleby that's indispensable 
the fact is my dear that it's necessary there should be some sort of condescension on my part and that i should show this young person that i am willing to take notice of her there's a very respectable-looking young man added mrs nickleby after a short consideration who is conductor to one of the omnibuses that go by here and who wears a glazed hat your sister and i have noticed him very often he has a wart upon his nose kate you know exactly like a gentleman's servant have all gentlemen's servants warts upon their noses mother asked nicholas nicholas my dear how very absurd you are returned his mother of course i mean that his glazed hat looks like a gentleman's servant and not the wart upon his nose though even that is not so ridiculous as it may seem to you for we had a footboy once who had not only a wart but a wen also and a very large wen too and he demanded to have his wages raised in consequence because he found it came very expensive let me see what was i oh yes i know the best way that i can think of would be to send a card and my compliments i've no doubt he'd take em for a spot of porter by this young man to the saracen with two necks if the waiter took him for a gentleman's servant so much the better then all mrs browdie would have to do would be to send her card back by the carrier he could easily come with a double knock and there's an end of it my dear mother said nicholas i don't suppose such unsophisticated people as these ever had a card of their own or ever will have oh that indeed nicholas my dear returned mrs nickleby that's another thing if you put it upon that ground why of course i have no more to say than that i have no doubt that they are very good sort of persons and that i have no kind of objection to their coming here to tea if they like and shall make a point of being very civil to them if they do the point being thus effectually set at rest and mrs nickleby duly placed in the patronizing and mildly condescending position which became her rank and matrimonial years mr and mrs browdie were invited and came and as they were very deferential to mrs nickleby and seemed to have a becoming appreciation of her greatness and were very much pleased with everything the good lady had more than once given kate to understand in a whisper that she thought they were the very best meeting people she had ever seen and perfectly well behaved and thus it came to pass that john browdie declared in the parlour after supper to wit and twenty minutes before eleven o'clock p m that he had never been so happy in all his days nor was mrs browdie much behind her husband in this respect for that young matron whose rustic beauty contrasted very prettily with the more delicate loveliness of kate and without suffering by the contrast either for each served as it were to set off and decorate the other could not sufficiently admire the gentle and winning manners of the young lady or the engaging affability of the elder one then kate had the art of turning the conversation to subjects upon which the country girl bashful at first in strange company could feel herself at home and if mrs nickleby was not quite so felicitous at times in the selection of topics of discourse or if she did seem as mrs browdie expressed it rather high in her notions still nothing could be kinder and that she took considerable interest in the young couple was manifest from the very long lectures on housewifery with which she was so obliging as to entertain mrs browdie's private ear which were illustrated by various references to the domestic economy of the cottage in which those duties falling exclusively upon kate the good lady had about as much share either in theory or practice as any one of the statues of the twelve apostles which embellish the exterior of st paul's cathedral mr browdie said kate addressing his young wife is the best humoured the kindest and heartiest creature i ever saw if i were oppressed with i don't know how many cares it would make me happy only to look at him he does seem indeed upon my word a most excellent creature kate said mrs nickleby most excellent and i am sure that at all times it will give me pleasure really pleasure now to have you mrs browdie to see me in this plain and homely manner we make no display said mrs nickleby with an air which seemed to insinuate that they could make a vast deal if they were so disposed no fuss no preparation i wouldn't allow it i said kate my dear you will only make mrs browdie feel uncomfortable and how very foolish and inconsiderate that would be i am very much obliged to you i am sure ma'am returned mrs browdie gratefully it's nearly eleven o'clock john i am afraid we are keeping you up very late ma'am late cried mrs nickleby with a sharp thin laugh and one little cough at the end like a note of admiration expressed this is quite early for us we used to keep such hours 
twelve one two three o'clock was nothing to us balls dinners card parties never were such rakes as the people about where we used to live i often think now i am sure that how we ever could go through with it is quite astonishing and that is just the evil of having a large connection and being a great deal sought after which i would recommend all young married people steadily to resist though of course and it's perfectly clear and a very happy thing too i think that a very few young married people can be exposed to such temptations there was one family in particular that used to live about a mile from us not straight down the road but turning sharp off to the left by the turnpike where the plymouth mail ran over the donkey that were quite extraordinary people for giving the most extravagant parties with artificial flowers and champagne and variegated lamps and in short every delicacy of eating and drinking that the most singular epicure could possibly require i don't think that there ever were such people as those pelteroguses you remember the pelteroguses kate kate saw that for the ease and comfort of the visitors it was high time to stay this flood of recollection so answered that she entertained of the pelteroguses a most vivid and distinct remembrance and then said that mr browdie had half promised early in the evening that he would sing a yorkshire song and that she was most impatient that he should redeem his promise because she was sure it would afford her mamma more amusement and pleasure than it was possible to express mrs nickleby confirming her daughter with the best possible grace for there was patronage in that too and a kind of implication that she had a discerning taste in such matters and was something of a critic john browdie proceeded to consider the words of some north country ditty and to take his wife's recollection respecting the same this done he made diverse ungainly movements in his chair and singling out one particular fly on the ceiling from the other flies there asleep fixed his eyes upon him and began to roar a meek sentiment supposed to be uttered by a gentle swain fast pining away with love and despair in a voice of thunder at the end of the first verse as though some person without had waited until then to make himself audible was heard a loud and violent knocking at the street door so loud and so violent indeed that the lady started as by one accord and john browdie stopped it must be some mistake said nicholas carelessly we know nobody who would come here at this hour mrs nickleby surmised however that perhaps the counting-house was burnt down or perhaps the mr cheerybles had sent to take nicholas into partnership which certainly appeared highly probable at that time of night or perhaps mr linkinwater had run away with the property or perhaps miss la creevy was taken in or perhaps but a hasty exclamation from kate stopped her abruptly in her conjectures and ralph nickleby walked into the room stay said ralph as nicholas rose and kate making her way towards him threw herself upon his arm before that boy says a word hear me nicholas bit his lip and shook his head in a threatening manner but appeared for the moment unable to articulate a syllable kate clung closer to his arm smike retreated behind them and john browdie who had heard of ralph and appeared to have no great difficulty in recognizing him stepped between the old man and his young friend as if with the intention of preventing either of them from advancing a step further hear me i say said ralph and not him say what thou'st gotten to say then sir retorted john and tak care thou didn't put up angry blood which thou'dst better try to quiet i should know you said ralph by your tongue and him pointing to smike by his looks don't speak to him said nicholas recovering his voice i will not have it i will not hear him i do not know that man i cannot breathe the air that he corrupts his presence is an insult to my sister it is a shame to see him i will not bear it stand cried john laying his heavy hand upon his chest then let him instantly retire said nicholas struggling i am not going to lay hands upon him but he shall withdraw i will not have him here john john browdie is this my house am i a child if he stands there cried nicholas burning with fury looking so calmly upon those who know his black and dastardly heart he'll drive me mad to all these exclamations john browdie answered not a word but he retained his hold upon nicholas and when he was silent again spoke there's more to say in here than thou thinkest for said john i tell ee i ha gotten sent o' that already what be that shadow outside door there no schoolmaster show thyself mun do not be sham-faced no all gentlemen let's have schoolmaster come 
hearing this adjuration mr squeers who had been lingering in the passage until such time as it should be expedient for him to enter and he could appear with effect was fain to present himself in a somewhat undignified and sneaking way at which john browdie laughed with such keen and heartfelt delight that even kate in all the pain anxiety and surprise of the scene and though the tears were in her eyes felt a disposition to join him have you done enjoying yourself sir said ralph at length pretty nigh for the present time sir replied john i can wait said ralph take your own time pray ralph waited until there was a perfect silence and then turning to mrs nickleby but directing an eager glance at kate as if more anxious to watch his effect upon her said now ma'am listen to me i don't imagine that you were a party to a very fine tirade of words sent me by that boy of yours because i don't believe that under his control you have the slightest will of your own or that your advice your opinion your wants your wishes anything which in nature and reason or of what use is your great experience ought to weigh with him has the slightest influence or weight whatever or is taken for a moment into account mrs nickleby shook her head and sighed as if there were a good deal in that certainly for this reason resumed ralph i address myself to you ma'am for this reason partly and partly because i do not wish to be disgraced by the acts of a vicious stripling whom i was obliged to disown and who afterwards in his boyish majesty feigns to <laughs> to disown me i present myself here to-night i have another motive in coming a motive of humanity i come here said ralph looking round with a biting and triumphant smile and gloating and dwelling upon the words as if he were loath to lose the pleasure of saying them to restore a parent his child ay sir he continued bending eagerly forward and addressing nicholas as he marked the change of his countenance to restore a parent his child his son sir trepanned waylaid and guarded at every turn by you with the base design of robbing him some day of any little wretched pittance of which he might become possessed in that you know you lie said nicholas proudly in this i know i speak the truth i have his father here retorted ralph here sneered squeers stepping forward do you hear that here didn't i tell you to be careful that his father didn't turn up and send him back to me why his father's my friend he's to come back to me directly he is now what do you say eh now come what do you say to that ain't you sorry you took so much trouble for nothing ain't you ain't you you bear upon your body certain marks i gave you said nicholas looking quietly away and may talk in acknowledgment of them as much as you please you'll talk a long time before you rub them out mr squeers the estimable gentleman last named cast a hasty look at the table as if he were prompted by this retort to throw a jug or bottle at the head of nicholas but he was interrupted in this design if such design he had by ralph who touching him on the elbow bade him tell the father that he might now appear and claim his son this being purely a labour of love mr squeers readily complied and leaving the room for the purpose almost immediately returned supporting a sleek personage with an oily face who bursting from him and giving to view the form and face of mr snawley made straight up to smike and tucking that poor fellow's head under his arm in a most uncouth and awkward embrace elevated his broad-brimmed hat at arm's length in the air as a token of devout thanksgiving exclaiming meanwhile how little did i think of this here joyful meeting when i saw him last oh how little did i think it be composed sir said ralph with a gruff expression of sympathy you have got him now got him oh haven't i got him have i got him though cried mr snawley scarcely able to believe it yes here he is flesh and blood flesh and blood very little flesh said john browdie mr snawley was too much occupied by his parental feelings to notice this remark and to assure himself more completely of the restoration of his child tucked his head under his arm again and kept it there what was it said snawley that made me take such a strong interest in him when that worthy instructor of youth brought him to my house what was it that made me burn all over with a wish to chastise him severely for cutting away from his best friends his pastors and masters it was parental instinct sir observed squeers 
that's what it was sir rejoined snawley the elevated feeling the feeling of the ancient romans and grecians and of the beasts of the field and birds of the air with the exception of rabbits and tomcats which sometimes devour their offspring my heart yearned towards him i could have i don't know what i couldn't have done to him in the anger of a father it only shows what nature is sir said mr squeers she's a rum un, is nature she is a holy thing remarked snawley i believe you added mr squeers with a moral sigh i should like to know how we should ever get on without her nature said mr squeers solemnly is more easier conceived than described oh what a blessed thing sir to be in a state of nature pending this philosophical discourse the bystanders had been quite stupefied with amazement while nicholas had looked keenly from snawley to squeers and from squeers to ralph divided between his feelings of disgust doubt and surprise at this juncture smike escaping from his father fled to nicholas and implored him in most moving terms never to give him up but to let him live and die beside him if you are this boy's father said nicholas look at the wreck he is and tell me that you purpose to send him back to that loathsome den from which i brought him scandal again cried squeers recollect you ain't worth powder and shot but i'll be even with you one way or another stop interposed ralph as snawley was about to speak let us cut this matter short and not bandy words here with hare-brained profligates this is your son as you can prove and you mr squeers you know this boy to be that same that was with you for so many years under the name of smike do you do i returned squeers don't i good said ralph a very few words will be sufficient here you had a son by your first wife mr snawley i had replied that person and there he stands we'll show that presently said ralph you and your wife were separated and she had the boy to live with her when he was a year old you received a communication from her when you had lived apart a year or two that the boy was dead and you believed it of course i did returned snawley oh the joy of be rational sir pray said ralph this is business and transports interfere with it this wife died a year and a half ago or thereabouts not more in some obscure place where she was housekeeper in a family is that the case that's the case replied snawley having written on her deathbed a letter or confession to you about this very boy which as it was not directed otherwise than in your name only reached you and that by a circuitous course a few days since just so said snawley correct in every particular sir and this confession resumed ralph is to the effect that his death was an invention of hers to wound you was a part of a system of annoyance in short which you seem to have adopted towards each other that the boy lived but was of weak and imperfect intellect that she sent him by a trusty hand to a cheap school in yorkshire that she had paid for his education for some years and then being poor and going a long way off gradually deserted him for which she prayed forgiveness snawley nodded his head and wiped his eyes the first slightly the last violently the school was mr squeers's continued ralph the boy was left there in the name of smike every description was fully given dates tally exactly with mr squeers's books mr squeers is lodging with you at this time you have two other boys at his school you communicated the whole discovery to him he brought you to me as the person who had recommended to him the kidnapper of his child and i brought you here is that so you talk like a good book sir that's got nothing in its inside but what's the truth replied snawley this is your pocket-book said ralph producing one from his coat the certificates of your first marriage and of the boy's birth and your wife's two letters and every other paper that can support these statements directly or by implication are here are they every one of them sir and you don't object to their being looked at here so that these people may be convinced of your power to substantiate your claim at once in law and reason and you may resume your control over your son without more delay do i understand you i couldn't have understood myself better sir there then said ralph tossing the pocket-book upon the table let them see them if they like and as those are the original papers i should recommend you to stand near while they are being examined or you may chance to lose some with these words ralph sat down unbidden and compressing his lips which were for the moment slightly parted by a smile folded his arms and looked for the first time at his nephew 
nicholas stung by the concluding taunt darted an indignant glance at him but commanding himself as well as he could entered upon a close examination of the documents at which john browdie assisted there was nothing about them which could be called in question the certificates were regularly signed as extracts from the parish books the first letter had a genuine appearance of having been written and preserved for some years the handwriting of the second tallied with it exactly making proper allowance for its having been written by a person in extremity and there were several other corroboratory scraps of entries and memoranda which it was equally difficult to question dear nicholas whispered kate who had been looking anxiously over his shoulder can this really be the case is this statement true i fear it is answered nicholas what say you john john scratched his head and shook it but said nothing at all you will observe ma'am said ralph addressing himself to mrs nickleby that this boy being a minor and not of strong mind we might have come here to-night armed with the powers of the law and backed by a troop of its myrmidons i should have done so ma'am unquestionably but for my regard for the feelings of yourself and your daughter you have shown your regard for her feelings well said nicholas drawing his sister towards him thank you replied ralph your praise sir is commendation indeed well said squeers what's to be done them hackney coach horses will catch cold if we don't think of moving there's one of em a sneezing now so that he blows the street door right open what's the order of the day is master snawley to come along with us no 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 replied smike drawing back and clinging to nicholas no pray no i will not go from you with him no no this is a cruel thing said snawley looking to his friends for support do parents bring children into the world for this do parents bring children into the world for that said john browdie bluntly pointing as he spoke to squeers never you mind retorted that gentleman tapping his nose derisively never i mind said john no nor never nobody mind sayest thou schoolmaster it's nobody's minding that keeps sech men as thou afloat nu then where beest thou coomin to dang it dunna come treadin over me mun suiting the action to the word john browdie just jerked his elbow into the chest of mr squeers who was advancing upon smike with so much dexterity that the schoolmaster reeled and staggered back upon ralph nickleby and being unable to recover his balance knocked that gentleman off his chair and stumbled heavily upon him this accidental circumstance was the signal for some very decisive proceedings in the midst of a great noise occasioned by the prayers and entreaties of smike the cries and exclamations of the women and the vehemence of the men demonstrations were made of carrying off the lost son by violence squeers had actually begun to haul him out when nicholas who until then had been evidently undecided how to act took him by the collar and shaking him so that such teeth as he had chattered in his head politely escorted him to the room door and thrusting him into the passage shut it upon him now said nicholas to the other two have the goodness to follow your friend i want my son said snawley your son replied nicholas chooses for himself he chooses to remain here and he shall you won't give him up said snawley i would not give him up against his will to be the victim of such brutality as that to which you would consign him replied nicholas if he were a dog or a rat knock that nickleby down with a candlestick cried mr squeers through the keyhole and bring out my hat somebody will you unless he wants to steal it i am very sorry indeed said mrs nickleby who with mrs browdie had stood crying and biting her fingers in a corner while kate very pale but perfectly quiet had kept as near her brother as she could i am very sorry indeed for all this i really don't know what would be best to do and that's the truth nicholas ought to be the best judge and i hope he is of course it's a hard thing to have to keep other people's children though young mr snawley is certainly as useful and willing as it's possible for anybody to be but if it could be settled in any friendly manner if old mr snawley for example would settle to pay something certain for his board and lodging and some fair arrangement was come to so that we undertook to have fish twice a week and a pudding twice or a dumpling or something of that sort i do think it might be very satisfactory and pleasant for all parties this compromise which was proposed with abundance of tears and sighs not exactly meeting the point at issue nobody took any notice of it and poor mrs nickleby accordingly proceeded to enlighten mrs browdie upon the advantages of such a scheme and the unhappy results flowing on all occasions from her not being attended to when she proffered her advice 
you sir said snawley addressing the terrified smike are an unnatural ungrateful unlovable boy you won't let me love you when i want to won't you come home won't you no 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 cried smike shrinking back he never loved nobody bawled squeers through the keyhole he never loved me he never loved wackford who is next door but one to a cherubim how can you expect that he'll love his father he'll never love his father he won't he don't know what it is to have a father he don't understand it it ain't in him mr snawley looked steadfastly at his son for a full minute and then covering his eyes with his hand and once more raising his hat in the air appeared deeply occupied in deploring his black ingratitude then drawing his arm across his eyes he picked up mr squeers's hat and taking it under one arm and his own under the other walked slowly and sadly out your romance sir said ralph lingering for a moment is destroyed i take it no unknown no persecuted descendant of a man of high degree but the weak imbecile son of a poor petty tradesman we shall see how your sympathy melts before plain matter of fact you shall said nicholas motioning towards the door and trust me sir added ralph that i never supposed you would give him up to-night pride obstinacy reputation for fine feeling were all against it these must be brought down sir lowered crushed as they shall be soon the protracted and wearing anxiety and expense of the law in its most oppressive form its torture from hour to hour its weary days and sleepless nights with these i'll prove you and break your haughty spirit strong as you deem it now and when you make this house a hell and visit these trials upon yonder wretched object as you will i know you and those who think you now a young fledged hero we'll go into old accounts between us two and see who stands the debtor and who comes out best at last even before the world ralph nickleby withdrew but mr squeers who had heard a portion of this closing address and was by this time wound up to a pitch of impotent malignity almost unprecedented could not refrain from returning to the parlour door and actually cutting some dozen capers with various wry faces and hideous grimaces expressive of his triumphant confidence in the downfall and defeat of nicholas having concluded this war dance in which his short trousers and large boots had borne a very conspicuous figure mr squeers followed his friends and the family were left to meditate upon recent occurrences End of chapter 45chapter forty six of nicholas nickleby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org nicholas nickleby by charles dickens chapter forty six throws some light upon nicholas's love but whether for good or evil the reader must determine after an anxious consideration of the painful and embarrassing position in which he was placed, Nicholas decided that he ought to lose no time in frankly stating it to the kind brothers. Availing himself of the first opportunity of being alone with Mr. Charles Cheerable at the close of next day, he accordingly related Smike's little history, and modestly but firmly expressed his hope that the good old gentleman would, under such circumstances as he described, hold him justified in adopting the extreme course of interfering between parent and child, and upholding the latter in his disobedience, even though his horror and dread of his father might seem, and would doubtless be represented as, a thing so repulsive and unnatural as to render those who countenanced him in it fit objects of general detestation and abhorrence. "'So deeply rooted does this horror of the man appear to be,' said Nicholas, that I can hardly believe he really is his son. Nature does not seem to have implanted in his breast one lingering feeling of affection for him, and surely she can never err. My dear sir, replied brother Charles, you fall into the very common mistake of charging upon nature matters with which she has not the smallest connection, and for which she is in no way responsible. Men talk of nature as an abstract thing, and lose sight of what is natural while they do so. 
Here is a poor lad who has never felt a parent's care, who has scarcely known anything all his life but suffering and sorrow, presented to a man who is told is his father, and whose first act is to signify his intention of putting an end to his short term of happiness, of consigning him to his old fate, and taking him from the only friend he has ever had, which is yourself. If nature in such a case put into that lad's breast but one secret prompting which urged him towards his father and away from you, she would be a liar and an idiot. Nicholas was delighted to find that the old gentleman spoke so warmly, and in the hope that he might say something more to the same purpose, made no reply. "'The same mistake presents itself to me in one shape or other at every turn,' said Brother Charles. "'Parents who never showed their love complain of want of natural affection in their children. Children who never showed their duty complain of want of natural feeling in their parents. Lawmakers who find both so miserable that their affections have never had enough of life's sun to develop them are loud in their moralizings over parents and children, too and cry that the very ties of nature are disregarded. Natural affections and instincts, my dear sir, are the most beautiful of the Almighty's works, but like other beautiful works of His, they must be reared and fostered, or it is as natural that they should be wholly obscured, and that new feelings should usurp their place, as it is that the sweetest productions of the earth, left untended, should be choked with weeds and briars. I wish we could be brought to consider this, and remembering natural obligations a little more at the right time, talk about them a little less at the wrong one. After this, Brother Charles, who had talked himself into a great heat, stopped to cool a little, and then continued, I dare say you are surprised, my dear sir, that I have listened to your recital with so little astonishment. That is easily explained. Your uncle has been here this morning. Nicholas colored, and drew back a step or two. Yes, said the old gentleman, tapping his desk emphatically. Here, in this room. He would listen neither to reason, feeling, nor justice. But Brother Ned was hard upon him. Brother Ned, sir, might have melted a paving stone. He came to, said Nicholas, to complain of you, returned Brother Charles, to poison our ears with calumnies and falsehoods. But he came on a fruitless errand, and went away with some wholesome truths in his ear besides. Brother Ned, my dear, my Nickleby, Brother Ned, sir, is a perfect lion. So is Tim Lincolnwater. Tim is quite a lion. We had Tim in to face him at first, and Tim was at him, sir, before you could say Jack Robinson. How can I ever thank you all for the deep obligations you oppose upon me every day, said Nicholas. By keeping silence upon this subject, my dear sir, returned Brother Charles, you shall be righted. At least you shall not be wronged. Nobody belonging to you shall be wronged. They shall not hurt a hair of your head, or the boy's head, or your mother's head, or your sister's head. I have said it. Brother Ned has said it. Tim Lincolnwater has said it. We have all said it, and will all do it. I have seen the father, if he is the father, and I suppose he must be. He is a barbarian and a hypocrite, Mr. Nickleby. I told him, you are a barbarian, sir. I did. I said, you are a barbarian, sir, and I am glad of it. I am very glad I told him he was a barbarian, very glad indeed. By this time Brother Charles was in such a very warm state of indignation that Nicholas thought he might venture to put in a word, but the moment he essayed to do so, Mr. Cheerable laid his hand softly upon his arm and pointed to a chair. "'The subject is at an end for the present,' said the old gentleman, wiping his face. "'Don't revive it by a single word. I am going to speak upon another subject, a confidential subject, Mr. Nickleby. We must be cool again. We must be cool.' After two or three turns across the room, he resumed his seat, and drawing his chair nearer to that on which Nicholas was seated, said, I am about to employ you, my dear sir, on a confidential and delicate mission. You might employ many a more able messenger, sir, said Nicholas, but a more trustworthy or zealous one, I may be bold to say you could not find. Of that I am well assured, returned Brother Charles, well assured. You will give me credit for thinking so, when I tell you that the object of this mission is a young lady. "'A young lady, sir!' cried Nicholas, quite trembling for the moment with his eagerness to hear more. "'A very beautiful young lady,' said Mr. Cheerable, gravely. "'Pray go on, sir,' returned Nicholas. "'I am thinking how to do so,' said Brother Charles, sadly as it seemed to his young friend, and with an expression allied to pain. "'You accidentally saw a young lady in this room one morning, my dear sir, in a fainting fit. Do you remember? Perhaps you have forgotten.' 
Oh, no, replied Nicholas hurriedly. I, I remember it very well indeed. She is the lady I speak of, said Brother Charles. Like the famous parrot, Nicholas thought a great deal, but was unable to utter a word. She is the daughter, said Mr. Cheeryble, of a lady who, when she was a beautiful girl herself, and I was very many years younger, I, it seems a strange word for me to utter now, I loved very dearly. You will smile, perhaps, to hear a grey-headed man talk about such things. You will not offend me, for when I was as young as you, I dare say I should have done the same. I have no such inclination indeed, said Nicholas. My dear brother Ned, continued Mr. Cheeryble, was to have married her sister, but she died. She is dead now, too, and has been for many years. She married her choice, and I wish I could add that her afterlife was as happy as God knows I ever prayed it might be. A short silence intervened, which Nicholas made no effort to break. If trial and calamity had fallen as lightly on his head as in the deepest truth of my own heart I ever hoped, for her sake it would. His life would have been one of peace and happiness, said the old gentleman calmly. It will be enough to say that this was not the case, that she was not happy, that they fell into complicated distresses and difficulties, that she came twelve months before her death to appeal to my old friendship sadly changed, sadly altered, broken-spirited from suffering and ill-usage, and almost broken-hearted. He readily availed himself of the money which, to give her but one hour's peace of mind, I would have poured out as freely as water. Nay, he often sent her back for more, and yet even while he squandered it, he made the very success of these, her applications to me, the groundwork of cruel taunts and jeers, protesting that he knew she thought with bitter remorse of the choice she had made that she had married him from motives of interest and vanity. He was a gay young man with great friends about him when she chose him for her husband, and venting in short upon her by every unjust and unkind means the bitterness of that ruin and disappointment which had been brought about by his profligacy alone. In those times this young lady was a mere child. I never saw her again until that morning when you saw her also, but my nephew, Frank, Nicholas started, and indistinctly apologizing for the interruption, begged his patron to proceed. My nephew Frank, I say, resumed Mr. Cheeryble, encountered her by accident and lost sight of her almost in a minute afterwards, within two days after he returned to England. Her father lay in some secret place to avoid his creditors, reduced between sickness and poverty to the verge of death, and she a child. We might almost think, if we did not know the wisdom of all heaven's decrees, who should have blessed a better man, was steadily braving privation, degradation, and everything most terrible to such a young and delicate creature's heart, for the purpose of supporting him. She was attended, sir, said Brother Charles, in these reverses, by one faithful creature, who had been, in old times, a poor kitchen wench in the family, who was then their solitary servant, but who might have been, for the truth and fidelity of her heart, who might have been, ah, the wife of Tim Lincolnwater himself, sir, Pursuing this encomium upon the poor follower with such energy and relish as no words can describe, Brother Charles leant back in his chair and delivered the remainder of his relation with greater composure. It was in substance this, that, proudly resisting all offers of permanent aid and support from her late mother's friends, because they were made conditional upon her quitting the wretched man, her father, who had no friends left, and shrinking with instinctive delicacy from appealing in their behalf, to that true and noble heart which he hated, and had, through its greatest and purest goodness, deeply wronged by misconstruction and ill report, this young girl had struggled alone and unassisted to maintain him by the labor of her hands, that through the utmost depths of poverty and affliction she had toiled, never turning aside for an instant from her task, never wearied by the petulant gloom of a sick man, sustained by no consoling recollections of the past or hopes of the future never repining for the comforts she had rejected, or bewailing the hard lot she had voluntarily incurred. That every little accomplishment she had acquired in happier days had been put into requisition for this purpose, and directed to this one end. That for two long years, toiling by day and often too by night, working at the needle, the pencil, and the pen, and submitting, as a daily governess, to such caprices and indignities as women, with daughters, too, too often love to inflict upon their own sex when they serve in such capacities, as though in jealousy of the superior intelligence which they are necessitated to employ, 
indignities in ninety-nine cases out of every hundred, heaped upon persons immeasurably and incalculably their betters, but outweighing in comparison any that the most heartless blackleg would put upon his groom, that for two long years, by dint of laboring in all these capacities, and wearying in none, she had not succeeded in the sole aim and object of her life, but that, overwhelmed by accumulated difficulties and disappointments, she had been compelled to seek out her mother's old friend, and with a bursting heart, to confide in him at last. "'If I had been poor,' said Brother Charles, with sparkling eyes, "'if I had been poor, Mr. Nickleby, my dear sir, which thank God I am not, I would have denied myself, of course anybody would, under such circumstances, the commonest necessaries of life to help her. As it is, the task is a difficult one. If her father were dead, nothing could be easier, for then she should share and cheer the happiest home that Brother Ned and I could have, as if she were our child or sister. But he is still alive. Nobody can help him. That has been tried a thousand times. He was not abandoned by all without good cause, I know. Cannot she be persuaded to... Nicholas hesitated when he had got thus far. "'To leave him?' said Brother Charles. "'Who could entreat a child to desert her parent? "'Such entreaties, limited to her seeing him occasionally, "'have been urged upon her, not by me, "'but always with the same result. "'Is he kind to her?' said Nicholas. "'Does he requite her affection?' "'True kindness, considerate self-denying kindness, "'is not in his nature,' returned Mr. Cheerable. "'Such kindness as he knows he regards her with, I believe. "'The mother with it was a gentle, loving, confiding creature,' and although he wounded her from their marriage till her death as cruelly and wantonly as ever did man, she never ceased to love him. She commanded him on her deathbed to her child's care. Her child has never forgotten it, and never will. "'Have you no influence over him?' asked Nicholas. "'I, my dear sir, the last man in the world. Such are his jealousy and hatred of me that he, if he knew his daughter had opened her heart to me, he would render her life miserable with his reproaches, although this is the inconsistency and selfishness of his character, although if he knew that every penny she had had came from me, he would not relinquish one personal desire that the most reckless expenditure of her scanty stock could gratify. "'An unnatural scoundrel!' said Nicholas, indignantly. "'We will use no harsh terms,' said Brother Charles in a gentle voice, "'but accommodate ourselves to the circumstances in which this young lady is placed.' Such assistance as I have prevailed upon her to accept, I have been obliged, at her own earnest request, to dole out in the smallest portions, lest he, finding how easily money was procured, should squander it even more lightly than he is accustomed to. She has come to and fro, to and fro, secretly and by night, to take even this, and I cannot bear that things should go on this way, Mr. Nickleby, I really cannot bear it. Then it came out by little and little, how that the twins had been revolving in their good old heads manifold plans and schemes for helping this young lady in the most delicate and considerate way, and so that her father should not suspect the source whence the aid was derived, and how they had at last come to the conclusion that the best course would be to make a feint of purchasing her little drawings and ornamental work at a high price, and keeping up a constant demand for the same for the furtherance of which end and object it was necessary that somebody should represent the dealer in such commodities, and after great deliberation they had pitched upon Nicholas to support this character. "'He knows me,' said Brother Charles, "'and he knows my brother Ned. Neither of us would do. Frank is a very good fellow, a very fine fellow, but we are afraid that he might be a little flighty and thoughtless in such a delicate matter, and that he might, perhaps, that he might, in short, be too susceptible. For she is a beautiful creature, sir.' just what her poor mother was, and falling in love with her before he knew well his own mind, carry pain and sorrow into that innocent breast, which we would be the humble instruments of gradually making happy. He took an extraordinary interest in her fortunes when he first happened to encounter her, and we gather from the inquiries we have made of him that it was she in whose behalf he made the turmoil which led to your first acquaintance. Nicholas stammered out that he had before suspected the possibility of such a thing, and in explanation of its having occurred to him, described when and where he had seen the young lady himself. "'Well, then you see,' continued Brother Charles, "'that he wouldn't do. Tim Lincolnwater is out of the question, for Tim, sir, is such a tremendous fellow that he could never contain himself, but would go to loggerheads with the father before he had been in the place five minutes. 
You don't know what Tim is, sir, when he is aroused by anything that appeals to his feelings very strongly. Then he is terrific, sir, is Ting Tim Lincolnwater, absolutely terrific. Now in you we can repose the strictest confidence. In you we have seen, or at least I have seen, and that's the same thing, for there's no difference between me and my brother Ned, except that he is the finest creature that ever lived, and that there is not, and never will be, anybody like him in all the world. In you we have seen domestic virtues and affections, and delicacy of feeling, which exactly qualify you for such an office. And you are the man, sir. The young lady, sir, said Nicholas, who felt so embarrassed that he had no small difficulty in saying anything at all. Does, is, is she a party to this innocent deceit? Yes, yes, returned Mr. Cheeryble, at least she knows you come from us. She does not know, however, but that we shall dispose of these little productions that you'll purchase from time to time, and perhaps if you did it very well, that is, very well indeed, perhaps she might be brought to believe that we, that we made a profit of them, eh, eh? In this guileless and most kind simplicity, Brother Charles was so happy, and in this possibility of the young lady being led to think that she was under no obligation to him, he evidently felt so sanguine and had so much delight that Nicholas would not breathe a doubt upon the subject. All this time, however, there hovered upon the tip of his tongue a confession that the very same objections which Mr. Cheeryble had stated to the employment of his nephew in this commission applied with at least equal force and validity to himself, and a hundred times had he been upon the point of avowing the real state of his feelings and entreating to be released from it. But, as often, treading upon the heels of this impulse came another which urged him to refrain and to keep his secret to his own breast. Why should I, thought Nicholas, why should I throw difficulties in the way of this benevolent and high-minded design? What if I do love and reverence this good and lovely creature? Should I not appear a most arrogant and shallow coxcomb if I gravely represented that there was any danger of her falling in love with me? Besides, have I no confidence in myself? Am I not now bound in honor to repress these thoughts? Has not this excellent man a right to my best and heartiest services, and should any considerations of self deter me from rendering them? Asking himself such questions as these, Nicholas mentally answered with great emphasis, No! And persuading himself that he was a most conscientious and glorious martyr, nobly resolved to do what, if he had examined his own heart a little more carefully, he would have found he could not resist. Such is the sleight of hand by which we juggle with ourselves, and change our very weaknesses into stanch and most magnanimous virtues. Mr. Cheeryble, being of course wholly unsuspicious that such reflections were presenting themselves to his young friend, proceeded to give him the needful credentials and directions for his first visit, which was to be made next morning, and all preliminaries being arranged, and the strictest secrecy enjoined, Nicholas walked home for the night very thoughtfully indeed. The place to which Mr. Cheeryble had directed him was a row of mean and not over-cleanly houses situated within the rules of the King's Bench Prison, and not many hundred paces distant from the obelisk in St. George's Fields. The rules are a certain liberty adjoining the prison, and comprising some dozen streets in which debtors who can raise money to pay large fees, from which their creditors do not derive any benefit, are permitted to reside by the wise provisions of the same enlightened laws which leave the debtor who can raise no money to starve in jail, without the food, clothing, lodging, or warmth which are provided for felons convicted of the most atrocious crimes that can disgrace humanity. There are many pleasant fictions of the law in constant operation, but there is not one so pleasant or practically humorous as that which supposes every man to be of equal value in its impartial eye, and the benefits of all laws to be equally attainable by all men, without the smallest reference to the furniture of their pockets. To the row of houses indicated to him by Mr. Charles Cheeryble, Nicholas directed his steps, without much troubling his head with such matters as these, and at this row of houses, after traversing a very dirty and dusty suburb, of which minor theatricals, shellfish, ginger beer, spring vans, green grocery and broker's shops, appeared to have to compose the main and most prominent features, he at length arrived with a palpitating heart. There were small gardens in front, which, being wholly neglected in all other respects, served as little pens for the dust to collect in, until the wind came round the corner and blew it down the road. Opening the rickety gate which, dangling on its broken hinges before one of these, 
half admitted and half repulsed the visitor, Nicholas knocked at the street door with a faltering hand. It was in truth a shabby house outside, with very dim parlor windows and very small show of blinds, and very dirty muslin curtains dangling across the lower panes on very loose and limp strings. Neither, when the door was opened, did the inside appear to belie the outward promise, as there were fading carpeting on the stairs and faded oilcloth in the passage, in addition to which discomforts a gentleman ruler was smoking hard in the front parlor, though it was not yet noon, while the lady of the house was busily engaged in turpentining the disjointed fragments of a tent bedstead at the door of the back parlor, as if in preparation for the reception of some new lodger who had been fortunate enough to engage it. Nicholas had ample time to make these observations, while the little boy, who went on errands for the lodgers, clattered down the kitchen stairs and was heard to scream, as in some remote cellar, for Miss Bray's servant, who, presently appearing and requesting him to follow her, caused him to evince greater symptoms of nervousness and disorder than so natural a consequence of his having inquired for that young lady would seem calculated to occasion. Upstairs he went, however, and into a front room he was shown, and there, seated at a little table by the window, on which were drawing materials with which she was occupied, sat the beautiful girl who had so engrossed his thoughts, and who, surrounded by all the new and strong interest which Nicholas attached to her story, seemed now, in his eyes, a thousand times more beautiful than he had yet ever supposed her. But how the graces and elegancies which she had dispersed about the poorly furnished room went to the heart of Nicholas! Flowers, plants, birds, the harp, the old piano whose notes had sounded so much sweeter in bygone times! How many struggles had it cost her to keep these two last links of that broken chain which bound her yet to home? With every slender ornament, the occupation of her leisure hours, replete with that graceful charm which lingers in every little tasteful work of women's hands, how much patient endurance and how many gentle affections were entwined! He felt as though the smile of heaven were on the little chamber, as though the beautiful devotion of so young and weak a creature had shed a ray of its own on the inanimate things around, and made them beautiful as itself, as though the halo which, with which old painters surrounded the bright angels of a sinless world played about a being akin in spirit to them, and its light were visibly before him. And yet Nicholas was in the rules of the king's bench prison. If he had been in Italy indeed, and the time had been sunset, and the scene a stately terrace, but there is one broad sky over all the world, and whether it be blue or cloudy, the same heaven beyond it. So, perhaps, he had no need of compunction for thinking as he did. It is not to be supposed that he took in everything at one glance, for he had as yet been unconscious of the presence of a sick man propped up with pillows in an easy chair, who, moving restlessly and impatiently in his seat, attracted his attention. He was scarce fifty, perhaps, but so emaciated as to appear much older. His features presented the remains of a handsome countenance, but one in which the embers of strong and impetuous passions were easier to be traced than any expression which would have rendered a far plainer face much more prepossessing. His looks were very haggard, and his limbs and body literally worn to the bone, but there was something of the old fire in the large sunken eye notwithstanding and it seemed to kindle afresh as he struck a thick stick with which he seemed to have supported himself in his seat, impatiently on the floor twice or thrice, and called his daughter by her name. "'Madeline, who is this? What does anybody want here? Who told a stranger we could be seen? What is it?' "'I believe the young lady began, as she inclined her head with an air of some confusion, in reply to the salutation of Nicholas. "'You always believe,' returned her father petulantly. "'What is it?' By this time Nicholas had recovered sufficient presence of mind to speak for himself, so he said, as it had been agreed he should say, that he had called about a pair of hand-screens and some painted velvet for an ottoman, both of which were required to be of the most elegant design possible, neither time nor expense being of the smallest consideration. He had also to pay for the two drawings with many thanks, and advancing to the little table, he laid upon it a bank-note, folded in an envelope and sealed. "'See that the money is right, Madeline,' said the father. "'Open the paper, my dear.' "'It's quite right, Papa, I'm sure.' "'Here,' said Mr. Bray, putting out his hand and opening and shutting his bony fingers with irritable impatience. "'Let me see. What are you talking about, Madeline? You're sure? 
How can you be sure of any such thing? Five pounds. Well, is that right? Quite, said Madeline, bending over him. She was so busily employed in arranging the pillows that Nicholas could not see her face, but as she stooped he thought he saw a tear fall. "'Ring the bell, ring the bell,' said the sick man with the same nervous eagerness, and motioning towards it with such a quivering hand that the bank-note rustled in the air. "'Tell her to get it changed, to get me a newspaper, to buy me some more grapes, another bottle of that wine that I had last week, and, and I forget half I want just now, but she can go out again. Let her get those first, those first. Now, Madeline, my love, quick, quick, good God, how slow you are!' "'He remembers nothing that she wants,' thought Nicholas." Perhaps something of what he thought was expressed in his countenance, for the sick man, turning towards him with great asperity, demanded to know if he waited for a receipt. "'It is no matter at all,' said Nicholas. "'No matter? What do you mean, sir?' was the tart rejoinder. "'No matter? Do you think you bring your paltry money here as a favor, or a gift, or as a matter of business, and in return for value received? Damn you, sir, because you can't appreciate the time and taste which are bestowed upon the goods you deal in, do you think you give your money away? Do you know that you are talking to a gentleman, sir, who at one time could have bought up fifty such men as you and all you have? What do you mean? I merely mean that as, as I shall have many dealings with this lady, if she will kindly allow me, I will not trouble her with such forms, said Nicholas. Then I mean, if you please, that we'll have as many forms as we can, returned the father. My daughter, sir, requires no kindness from you or anybody else. Have the goodness to confine your dealings strictly to trade and business, and not to travel beyond it. Every petty tradesman is to begin to pity her now, is he? Upon my soul, very pretty. Madeline, my dear, give him a receipt, and mind you always do so. While she was feigning to write it, and Nicholas was ruminating upon the extraordinary, but by no means uncommon character that presented to his observation, the invalid, who appeared at times to suffer great bodily pain, sank back in his chair and moaned out a feeble complaint that the girl had been gone an hour and that everybody conspired to goad him when said nicholas as he took the piece of paper when shall i call again this was addressed to the daughter but the father answered immediately when you're requested to call sir and not before don't worry and persecute madeline my dear when is this person to call again oh not for a long time not for three or four weeks it is not necessary indeed i can do without said the young lady with great eagerness. "'Why, how are we to do without?' urged her father, not speaking above his breath. Three or four weeks, Madeline. Three or four weeks.' "'Then sooner, sooner, if you please,' said the young lady, turning to Nicholas. Three or four weeks,' muttered the father. "'Madeline, what on earth? Do nothing for three or four weeks?' "'It is a long time, ma'am,' said Nicholas. "'You think so, do you?' retorted the father angrily. If I chose to beg, sir, and stoop to ask assistance from people I despise, three or four months none would not be a long time. Three or four years would not be a long time. Understand, sir, that if I chose to be dependent, but as I don't, you may call in a week. Nicholas bowed to the young lady and retired, pondering upon Mr. Bray's ideas of independence, and devoutly hoping that there might be few such independent spirits as he mingling with the baser clay of humanity. He heard a light footstep above him as he descended the stairs, and looking round saw that the young lady was standing there, and glancing timidly towards him, seemed to hesitate whether she should call him back or no. The best way of settling the question was to turn back at once, which Nicholas did. "'I don't know whether I do right in asking you, sir,' said Madeline hurriedly, "'but pray, pray, do not mention to my poor mother's dear friends what has passed here to-day. He has suffered much, and is worse this morning. I beg you, sir, as a boon, a favor to myself.' "'You have but to hint a wish,' returned Nicholas fervently, "'and I would hazard my life to gratify it. "'You speak hastily, sir.' "'Truly and sincerely,' rejoined Nicholas, "'his lips trembling as he formed the words. "'If ever man spoke truly yet. "'I am not skilled in disguising my feelings, "'and if I were, I could not hide my heart from you. "'Dear madam, as I know your history, "'and feel as men and angels must who hear and see such things, I do entreat you to believe that I would die to serve you. The young lady turned away her head, and was plainly weeping. Forgive me, said Nicholas, with respectful earnestness, if I seem to say too much, or to presume upon the confidence which has been entrusted to me. But I could not leave you as if my interest and sympathy expired with the commission of the day. I am your faithful servant, 
humbly devoted to you from this time, from this hour, devoted in strict truth and honor to him who sent me here, and in pure integrity of heart, and distant respect for you. If I meant more or less than this, I should be unworthy his regard, and false to the very nature that prompts the honest words I utter. She waved her hand, entreating him to be gone, but answered not a word. Nicholas could say no more, and silently withdrew, and thus ended his first interview with Madeline Bray. End of chapter 46 of Nicholas Nickleby Read by Richard Wallace, Liberty, Missouri 19 March 2009